This is Leonard Nimoy. Our story concerns man's relationship to the incomprehensible. The incomprehensible is that which we ethnocentric earthlings know nothing of, flattering ourselves with the peculiar notion that we are the only beings in the general scheme of things. From time to time, taking a few seconds from their daily activities, they, the space travelers, make an effort to correct our earthly nearsightedness. They come to visit and advise. It was a weird scene in a whole bunch of ways. Number one, I didn't want to go. I had a painting to finish. Number two, the theme of the whole business, a costume ball, a bow mask, the invitation called it. Struck a funny note in my mind. I mean, I don't know, call it prejudice or whatever, but in the back of my mind, all I could visualize was a bunch of pseudo artsy craftsy types tripping around in thrift shop get-ups trying to impersonate people who were supposed to be having a good time. Oh, come on, Bridge. Don't be such a jive dude. The whole thing will just be pure kicks. You know, I've never seen a guy so glued to his workbench that he couldn't go out and have a little fun. <laughs> you, you, you call yourself an artist? I thought artists were supposed to be the guys who were going to teach the rest of us how to live it up. Drink wine, eat good food, party, hearty. <laughs> I was persuaded by superior rhetoric. And after the first hour had passed, decided to enjoy myself. Costumed as oddly as everybody, with a Fulani straw hat on my head and Mexican poncho on my shoulders. I strolled around the huge hall. Our bow mask was being staged in, enjoying the weird outfits and the art school behavior. You know, the wow artistic stuff. Well, well, old Bridge has finally decided to let his hair down. If that's supposed to be a pun, the phrasing is wrong. Now, what he means, Bridge, is that you seem to be enjoying yourself. <laughs> well, maybe you could say that. <laughs> well, stick it out. The best is yet to come. Come on, Bill. Let's join the wild bunch. He spotted her the minute his friends danced away. She was there, leaning against one of the festooned pillars of the ballroom. I was certain she hadn't been there a second before. They looked at each other and exchanged warm smiles. I studied her costume. She seemed to be impersonating Joan of Arc, but with a difference. Her outfit seemed real. I mean, it looked absolutely authentic. As the evening danced on, he found himself drawn to the lady in the chain mail getup. Five steps away, bumped and circled by the wild bunch, he studied her. Small woman, fine bones, a profile that seemed to have been chipped from a Mayan temple wall. I think the thing that jolted me the most were her eyes. She had eyes like a big cat, a tiger, or a leopard. Yellowish and gleaming, different. Hey, Bridge, come on. We're going over to Flapjacks for breakfast. Hey, bring, bring your friend with you. What friend? He means me. Roland Bridge, artist turned to stare into the strange eyes of the woman reaching her hand out to him. I should have known something different was in store for me when I felt this electrical charge travel up my arm. And that's only the beginning of our story. <laughs> Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Gen G, a space traveler by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Robert Doki, Kim Hamilton, and Nick Latour. Roland Bridge, artist found himself centered in a situation that seemed to have no walls. Suddenly, it was there, and it had his right hand, quietly charging his being with a tranquilizing voltage. As an artist and a sensitive person, he found an abstract fascination in the sensation. We stared at each other across the restaurant table, alternately watching Bill wipe out a short stack and Dave attempt to blow up one of his socks like a balloon. What you might call the bell of mass aftermath. He couldn't figure out his involved feelings. It wasn't love at first sight or any kind of physical attraction. 
But with all the commotion going on around us, it was kind of hard to figure out what my feelings were. She was attractive, no doubt about that. But that wasn't the way she appealed to me. I felt that she had something to tell me, something terribly important. Dregs of the Bal Mosque on the beach at dawn. Who are you? My name is Genji. That's your name. Who are you? They sat next to each other on the dawn streaked beach, digging their toes into the cold sand. I am a space traveler, Roland. He made an instant decision to keep it light, to not bog the situation down. Space traveler, huh? Well, I don't think I've ever met one before. <laughs> I know. You know quite a few things, don't you? Yes. Hey, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a little tired of being the dregs of the ball mass. Uh, now, why don't we call it dawn? <gasps> oh, my head is beginning to throb already. She eased out of the car and stood on the curb, looking back into the car at me, waiting. He felt compelled to get out of the car. His friends cast a hard, sympathetic look in his direction before taking their leave. Uh, see you later, Briggs. Yeah, take it easy. Feeling vaguely scared and extremely curious about what was going on, I followed her as she walked backwards up a path with shells that looked like small, luminous turtlebacks. She led him to the door of a small cottage behind a larger structure. The cottage had obviously been a garage at some point in the past. I didn't know where I was. Literally, I didn't know where I was. She had given Dave some off-brand directions, and now we were there. He stared at the door, at the large pink eye swiveling at him from the center of the door. Open it. The eye softened to a ripe yellow as he reached for the gold-plated knob. The inside really overwhelmed me. It was like walking into the weirdest collage I had ever seen. I couldn't tell how large or how small the place was because the pictures, the expressions that covered every inch of the walls and ceiling ruled out simple measurement or dimensions. Bulgarian license plates, fashion magazine ads, African graffiti, labels from Swedish cornflake boxes, I mean, that kind of thing. Roland Bridge stood in one spot, his eyes dazzled by the spectrum of colors and items that surrounded him, while Ginger slowly walked in a circle around him as though she were a spider weaving a web. Please, feel at ease. This will be your home for the next two days. Bridge certainly felt frightened. Two days? Oh, no. No, I have to... No, I, no, I, I have to go. I, I, I have to. Oh, you couldn't leave now, could you? In the middle of a rainstorm? Rain? I couldn't believe it. Aside from the fact that we hadn't had any rain for months, aside from that, I... No, no, I, I, I don't... Oh, make yourself at home. I want to change. Despite the fact that he had been awake all night, Roland felt alert, fresh, bewildered. I had no idea how many rooms the house had or how it was constructed. But with the spaced-out decor, and it seemed that when she went to change, she simply melted into another room. I was mystified. He slid into an alcove that resembled a restaurant booth. It was painted mad Russian white with slashes of burgundy polka dots. Collecting himself, he carefully studied this new environment, folded his hands on the table in front of him. I must have stared at one section of a wall for five minutes before I realized she was there. Her paisley caftan blended so naturally. She sat across from him in the alcove with a box of knitting material and began to knit faster than his eyes could follow. What are you doing? <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'm knitting you a suit, or maybe I'm building a house, or connecting today with tomorrow. He stared up at a patch of sky that had suddenly frothed into angry clouds and lightning. A moment before, he could have sworn that a picture by Charles White had covered the space. Look, I surrender, okay? I feel like I'm in outer space somewhere. 
Mm. What do you want with me? I want to discuss your future. I may be able to offer you a few life-changing hints. Who knows? Who can resist the lures of clairvoyancy? How many of us would give almost everything to know what the future holds? Genji, a space traveler, continues. Roland Bridge stared at the odd things happening in the picture frame above Genji's head. The clouds changed from green to a bright orange. The rain splattered against the window pane, big, moist, juicy drops. Oh no! I bet one of those nuts at the bow slipped some kind of weird drug into my drink. No, Roland. It isn't dope or anything. All of what this is about is real. Well, what is it? I mean, what are you talking about? My future. What about my future? I told you, Roland. I'm a space traveler. There. Finished. Go in there and try it on. It should be a perfect fit. He stared at the three-piece banker's pinstripe knitted in gold and fawn brown wool. It wasn't possible. They had just sat down a few minutes before. I found my way into the bathroom. It was decorated, too. The tub was painted zebra aquamarine and had three gorgeously colored fish in it. One of them spat a stream of water up at me as I put the suit on. It was a perfect fit. Weird looking by ordinary standards, but beautiful. I glanced around, looking for a window. I wanted to escape suddenly. I, I didn't want to know what my future would be. There is no place to go, Roland. Please come back and sit down. Ah, uh, I wasn't trying to go anywhere. <laughs> they all say that. What do you mean they all say that? Who? It's a nice fit, isn't it? The suit. Oh, the suit's beautiful. It fits like a glove. But you didn't answer my question. What was your question? My question was, you said they all say that. And I asked who? I don't understand your question. Well, to be frank with you, I don't either. I feel confused. Good. The curious type. I like that. Sit and I'll answer your question. In some way, he found himself sitting on the opposite side of the alcove table staring into a larger window above and behind her head. The clouds that passed seemed to alternately frown and smile at him. I went kind of nutty one time trying to imagine the state of mind Picasso must have been in when he painted the three-faced woman. Or was it one of his other masterpieces? I couldn't remember. I found myself approaching that same state of disorientation again. You look puzzled. Sounds like an understatement, even to me. Would you care for a cup of tea? A cup of tea? What the hell are you talking about? I've been shanghaied from the real world. Everything. I'm sitting across a table from somebody who calls herself a space traveler, and you ask me if I would like a cup of tea? A cup of tea? For a few minutes, Ginger's eyes walled back into her head as though she had become blind, revealing the oddest shape of red he had ever seen. He eased away from the table, determined to escape, but couldn't find a doorknob. He searched frantically for a few moments before returning to his seat. Forgive me, Roland. Your anger reminded me of Napoleon for a moment. Napoleon? Yes, he too was capable of instant rage. Poor fellow. I warned him to stay out of Russia, what with the winter approaching and all. What kind of tea would you like? Chinese, Indian, Japanese? Well, Chinese be fine. He blinked at her movement, which was not so much a movement as it was a reconstruction of molecules from one place to another. She was here and then there, by sections. I love a good cup of tea at the end of a second. What is she talking about? Space travel, Napoleon, the end of a second. Yes, Roland, a second. Hmm, I won't attempt to boggle your mind with our time sense. Simply allow me to assure you that one of your seconds is equivalent to one of our days. 
Well, give or take a moment or two. It's fine tea, isn't it? Roland slumped in place, cradling the steaming cup of tea in his hands, mystified. Now then, where were we? You were going to tell me about my future. I was going to give you a few hints about your future. And you've been wondering, why me? Did I say that? You were thinking it. Well, let's face it. How many people have the opportunity to meet anyone who proposes to predict their future? Good. You said opportunity. That sounds very optimistic to I'm me. I'm an artist. If that doesn't breed optimism, I don't know what does. Ginger fixed a shrewd eye on Roland's face. It had been years since she had met a positive-thinking earth person. Roland, what if I didn't have anything to say to you that was optimistic? I, I don't quite understand. You do understand, don't you? Yes, I think I do. Strange. Down through the ages, the ones who've been the most optimistic were the ones who had the most to lose. Roland tensed up, his mind flashing back to his art school days and the hard times that followed, those bitter days when his best work was rejected or uncharitably compared to better-known artists. For a moment, his eyes dotted around the collard space he found himself in, subconsciously wishing that he weren't where he was, wherever it was. Not to worry, Roland. The future might not be as bad as you would imagine. No, I'm not really worried. Just curious. I like that. A willingness to accept whatever. Would you like another cup of tea? Only if it includes my future. <laughs> Emotional involvements have their own special pitfalls. Those places into which facets of the soul fall, never to be regained. And none has more than the one Roland Bridge, artist, is about to plunge into. Roland stared into the face across from him, at the different shadings and planes that rippled across it as she talked, her knitting needles blurring again. Unreal. Completely unreal. I'm afraid I must hedge a bit concerning the prediction I just made. The telephone. If only I could get far enough away from this one thing, I'd be happy. Hello? Just a sec. It's for you. Couldn't be. I mean, no one, uh, none of my friends has your number. I mean, you didn't give your number to Dave or Bill, did you? Your name is Roland Bridge. Yes. It's for you. Hello? Mr. Rowan Bridge? Yes? And we're pleased to inform you that you've won third prize of our annual Tricky Feats grab bag. I've done what? You've won third prize, a brand spanking new 10-speed De Grazia racing bike. Congratulations. You may pick your prize up by bringing in the ticket stub of your Tricky Feats receipt. And once again, congratulations. Bad news? No, not really. A little confusing, but not bad. Not bad at all. Somebody just informed me that I'd want a bicycle. Sounds great to me. There's nothing better than a bike. Using your own muscles to propel yourself, the wind in your face. Roland slowly shook his head from side to side. I can't make myself believe this. I cannot make myself believe this. Now then, where were we? You were starting to tell me that my life was going to speed up, become faster, that I, I would be covering more ground than I, I, than I, than I have e ever covered. Roland stared at the framed black square of window, at the stars piercing through. Gingy, what time is it? Your time or mine. How long have I been in here? Only a few moments. Hmm, wonder who that could be. He tried to follow the odd, blurring motion that she used to take herself from here to there, and found that he couldn't. Her hand reached out to a section of the wall that was painted a glowing green paisley and pulled open a door. He blinked at the bright sunlight streaming in behind the three people in the doorway, a man, a woman, and a little girl. He glanced up at the window. How can it be night in the window and day in the door? Oh, how nice! Medea, Neptune, cute! 
Cupid, so good to see you again after all this time. Hello. Oh, hi. Roland stared at the faces of the people gathered in front of the place where the door had been seconds before. The man had a beard. The woman was a tall, porcelain-skinned creature with clear green eyes and a fierce mane of jet black hair. Hello. His eyes swept from the doll-like girl at his elbow to the trio having an animated conversation in the middle of the room. Their mouths were moving, but he couldn't hear anything. The little girl climbed onto the seat opposite him. Don't pay them any attention. They always do that when they get together. What's your name? My name? Yes, you do have one, don't you? Sure, yes, of course. Uh, my name is Roland, Roland Bridge. What's yours? Chera, bye-bye. Um, you may call me cute, but everybody does. Has she given you your future yet? Oh, she, she was about to. Well, don't develop any anxieties about it. She will. She always does. Hey, listen. You've got to help me. Oh, well, how can I help you? I'm only a little girl. Please, for the sake of my sanity, tell me where I am. This is another place, Roland. Another place. How do you do? My name is Neptune Smith. Bye-bye. I'm Medea. Bye-bye. And I see you've already met Cupid. Roland was startled to see Ginger and the people who had come to visit her looming over him. The man and woman seemed to be giants until they squeezed into the seat beside their little girl, and then their bodies seemed to shrink to normal size. Well, how do you like it? How do I like what? This other place, Genji's house. Well, maybe I'd like it more if I knew where it was. I mean, you know what I mean? Well, they all say that. It seems that I've heard that before. There, what could be better than a pot of hot tea? Roland stared at the faces across from him. The room seemed to glow from the warm expression on their faces. They were enjoying the hot tea more than he had ever seen anyone enjoy anything. Are, are, are you guys um, space travelers, too? Well, unfortunately, I'm not. I'm just one of your simple earthbound witches. You're a witch? Oh, don't get nervous. I've done all the mischief I could do this morning. You've won third prize, a brand spanking new 10-speed DeGrazia racing bicycle. Congratulations. You may pick your prize up by bringing in the ticket stub of your Tricky Feats receipt. And once again, congratulations. Roland frowned for a second, smiled, and hesitantly <laughs> began to laugh. Ginger, Medea, Neptune, and Cupid, like in his sense of humor, began to laugh with him. A contagious, rib tickling torrent of laughter. Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of Genji, a space traveler. Roland Bridge, multifaceted artist, a creative representative of all of us who've met at some point in our lives, someone from somewhere else. I was talking to George Washington Carver the other day about my plants, and he offered me some perfectly marvelous suggestions. Things like what nutrients would be best for the Jenny, soil you've and... you've completely gotten off the track again. You are explaining yourself to our bewildered friend. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. So I was. Where was I? Watching Ginger's eyes back into their sockets, revealing the incredible redness behind her eyeballs was no longer frightening. He knew now that it was her way of remembering. An eminent mathematician once explained me to myself by explaining that my molecular structure had been spontaneously disjointed eons ago. What? Sounds funny, doesn't it? In effect, he explained that I really didn't exist, except as a composition of eclectic vibrations. Is that what gives you the power to forecast the future? In a sense. It's like a tiny, tiny particle of me has been years ahead. Our years, that is. And because of that, I know something about the future. Just a smidgen. Mostly I know about the past. Uh, let's stay with the future for a bit. You mean you can tell me about my future because you've known me before? Well, not exactly. 
Not in your present form. You have to keep a couple of things in mind, Roland. Number one, you died when you were 85. Remember? Roland Bridge released a deeply held breath, relieved to know that he had 60 years more of life ahead of him. Roland, love, why do you ask so many questions? Because, because this is all completely new to me and I want to find out as much as I can about it. Don't you think you would learn just as much by not asking any questions? What? No questions? Right, no questions. Genji has given your future to you and now we're having tea. Why ask questions? Why not simply be? Oh, God, I must be crazy. I must be crazy. I've been taken away from everything I know. I don't know what time it is or if it's day or night or, or what. And I'm with people who don't even seem to be real people. Oh, I want out of here. I want out, 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 out. Jensley, my dear, Cupid, and Neptune sadly watched Roland pound and scratch at the walls, searching frantically for a doorknob, a way out. Why? Why would anyone want to go back into the past? Why? Maybe they feel safer. Jensley, please let me out. Let me go back to what I know and understand. This is too much for me. But, Roland, I've given you your future. Stay here and you'll arrive much sooner. If you go back, it'll take you ages to get where you were yesterday. Roland clamped his hands over his ears to blot out the strange words, the weird concepts. It seemed to make no sense. Yesterday was tomorrow and today was in the future, or maybe the past. <laughs> Some kind of nut? Get out of the street! Roland unclamped his hands from his ears and looked around him. He was standing in the middle of one of the city's busiest streets. His clothes seemed to be attracting as much attention as his precarious position in the middle of the busy street. He skipped and dodged his way to safety, paused to stare at his reflection in a furniture store window. A Roman soldier? Wow! Where is this? How in the world did I get in this outfit? The store window seemed to melt his Roman soldier outfit back to another time as he stared at his image. Roland, this is my good friend, Julius Caesar. No, no. Sorry, Ginger. You're not going to be able to convince me of anything like this. I got out of your house, remember? No, no, you didn't, Roland. You just found your way into another room. Who is this person, Genji, this plebeian, who does not acknowledge me? Uh, this is Roland Bridge, Julius. You know how you just run into people sometimes. Oh, no! This is Midnight Movie Stop, Julius Caesar? Caesar! Hail, Caesar! You must come to the Senate immediately. Brutus needs you. Brutus, you say? I see, sir. Brutus indeed. Uh, Genji, I must go. Stay a while. We'll lunch out on the terrace upon my return. In the meantime, speak civilly to this person of who I am, of my triumphs, the importance of my presence to Rome, to the whole world. Yep. Will do, Caesar. Rome? Caesar? You stepped into the kitchen. Genji, look, I know I've been a lot of trouble for you, but could, could you could you please put me back where I belong? I'm disappointed in you, Roland. I thought you'd be more than willing to be a space traveler. Space traveler? Me? We try to recruit only the most imaginative. Well, what are the advantages? Well, you get to meet people like Julius Caesar, for example. But don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to build up any dictator as a stellar attraction. But I'm sure you'd like to meet Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci? you got to be kidding me. I've always wanted to meet Leonardo da Vinci. Buongiorno, Roland. Oh, Janzi, it's uh, so good to see you again. Leonardo da Vinci! Hey, wait till I tell David and Bill about this. Hey, hey, wait, 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 wait. Hey, don't, hey, don't go. He's Come back. I want to... He's a person, Roland. You could visit with him longer if you cared to remain in the past future. In space. You mean I'd have a chance to meet Caruso and Coltrane, Matisse, Bird, and people like that? 
As long as you like. And you never get old, Roland. You remain the same age as when you became a space traveler. <laughs> I've been 32 for years. Wish I could say the same for Ginger. Hmm. I'm confused. I'm really confused. Are you guys here in Rome or wherever we were? The furniture store window once again became its normally reflective self. Roland smiled at his Roman soldier image, at the people gathered around him. No matter what you might say about it, folks, at times there's no place like home. Come on in, it's unlocked. Grinch, where have you been? We've been worried sick about you, old buddy. Yeah, where you been, man? Hey, one at a time, please. Where have you been? That better? Right here. I don't believe this guy. We've been all over at least 20 times since last week. No one has seen you in the usual places, and you sprawl out on that, that... that Inverted camel back sofa. Looking up at the ceiling with a goony bird expression on your face. Oh, come on now, Bridge. We're your friends. Where have you been? You can tell us. We're your friends. Did you try Gingy's place? That Joan of Arc person you left with? We couldn't find our house. Roland Bridge slowly sat up on his sofa and stared at his two friends. What do you mean you couldn't find her house? We couldn't find it. We just couldn't. We couldn't even find the street that, that the house was on. I don't know if you remember or not, but the directions that woman gave me to get to her place sounded like the recipe for a banana split or something. Wow! Where did you get that soup, Bridge? i never seen anything like it. Hmm, thought you looked different somehow. Yeah, it is different. Where did you get it? It's a long story, gentlemen. Believe me, a long story. Well, let me pull up a chair. I got more time than anything else. Well, I hardly know where to begin. I mean, you guys might think I'm putting you on or something. Now, don't worry about it, Bridge. A guy who disappears for a week and returns from wherever, wearing a suit like yours, deserves some consideration. Well, let me clear a couple of things up at the beginning. Gingy and I were not lovers or anything like that. She was a spiritual force. She and all the people around him. Yeah, she did have weird-looking eyes. I remember that. What are you trying to tell us, Bridge? I'm trying to tell you that Gingy was a space traveler. Bridge. Uh, hold on. Stop. No, I, I've, I've had enough. Yeah, stop. Stop. Stop what? Well, stop this. Uh, this. You're taking this whole thing too far. What do you take us for? A couple of dummies? Nobody in his right mind would go for a story like that. I know. I know. Cupid and Neptune told me that they had the same problem when they went back. Now, my dear didn't have very many problems at all, strangely enough. Maybe being a witch helped smooth things out. <laughs> These are the people you met at this Genji's house? Right. They had been recruited centuries before. And uh, then... Bridge, uh, huh? I'd like to stay and chat a while longer, but uh, i, I got to run. A couple of things, you know, to, to do. You know how it is. Yeah, uh, me too, Bridge. Well, you got to go. you got to go. Well, thanks for dropping by. Uh, be seeing you, old buddy. Take care of yourself. Uh, yeah, and, and try to relax, Bridge. Now, remember, all work and no play makes for a dull day. What do you think? I don't know what to think. Well, why don't we check on him again uh, tomorrow? He stared at the door, thinking about his friends. Well, what could you expect? How many people would believe that I had met Julius Caesar, Leonardo da Vinci, Geronimo, Gandhi, Malcolm X, Cleopatra, Stravinsky, Duke Ellington, people like that? Yeah. Who would ever believe it? He had also found it hard to believe Ginger's prediction that he would go into politics. From art to politics? No way. Roland strolled along the beach, a shaft of driftwood swinging aimlessly from his hand. He loved the beach at twilight, the incredible tapestry that spilled itself across the horizon... After a few meditative steps, he turned to look back up at his home, a nest of stone and red wood that was so perfectly perched on the hillside above the beach that it seemed a natural part of the landscape. He waved, knowing that Sandra would be looking at him, the way she usually did whenever she didn't accompany him on his evening walk. 
he slowly lowered his arm and stared at his home. What more could I possibly want? A beautiful wife, two lovely children, a home on the ocean, success in my career. His attention was drawn back to the horizon, to a collection of clouds that seemed to form a face. Genji. Genji. The clouds ignored him and slowly drifted on, past a sunset that gleamed like dull gold. Stupid. How could I think a bunch of clouds looked like Genji? He squatted at the ocean's edge to watch the rounded edge of the sun dip below the horizon, his thoughts lazily swirling through the speech he was scheduled to make to the convention. Never can tell how much of my foot I might have to pull out of my mouth. I'd best keep my speech short and sweet. Roland Bridge, unaware till his meeting with the space traveler Genji of what his future held in store for him, gradually made a strange transformation from struggling artist to successful politician, exactly as she had predicted. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow delegates, I'm honored to be standing here before you this evening, privileged to be able to say to you, the best is yet to come, and our party is going to be the one to make it happen. Yes, the best is yet to come, and it is my sincere intention to speed up the process. My distinguished colleague and political opponent has suggested that I might not be capable of making anything happen. I choose not to engage in trivial debate over the right or wrong of that allegation. I simply refer you to my record, to the progressive manner in which I have addressed myself to the issues. There she was, sitting in the first row. The eyes were unmistakably hers. The clothes were from Egypt, but no one seemed to notice except for Congressman Roland Bridge. Gingy. Gingy. She made a big wink with her left eye, gave him an A-OK -okay donut signal with thumb and forefinger, and was gone. Gingy. Wait. I want to ask you something. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Gen G, A Space Traveler, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Livia Granito. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Robert O'Keefe, Kim Hamilton, and Nick Latour. Featured in the cast were David Downing, Ray Tosco, June Foray, Dawes Butler, and Michael Rye. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by CERTA Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations. With the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Lorne Green. Join us again next Monday at this time for another new and original radio play about America's past.
This is Leonard Nimoy. The day is June 15th, the year 3115. You're about to attend a wedding. Those 62,515 men are about to marry those 62,515 women at the 2 o'clock ceremony. At 2.30, a like number of men and women will be wed. This is not an unusual happening. It's common practice to marry people during the month of June. June, you see, is the only month when you're allowed to marry in the year 3115. What happens is, you and your chosen mate make application to the Central Marriage Permission Board. And once they get an okay from the computers who ration out living space, well, then, you and your chosen one show up at the marriage coliseum at the time assigned your wedding. You're each given a short shift or tunic and a garland of artificial flowers to wear or carry. And you take your places in the coliseum for this glorious event. May I have your attention? May I have your attention? We are gathered at this time to join these men and these women in holy matrimonies. It's a touching ceremony, as those things always are, were, and will be. If you'll focus your attention on that corner, near where an end zone might have been at a different time, you'll see the young man and the young woman who specifically are the principles of our story. What you're about to hear is a true tale of the future. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story? Yes, sir, that's my baby by Elliot Lewis. Our stars? Herb Vigran, Noel North, and Robert Towers. Permission to marry was something every young person hoped for in those far distant times, and Edward 23, Glendon 55, and Helga 7, Anderson 5 were not exceptions. Young, in love, they desperately waited. Their application was finally acknowledged. Attention. Your attention, please. Helga 7 and Edward 23 gave their attention. The proper authorities acting under the permission to marry at section 7, subsection 15, paragraph 11, line 8, do now then grant to Helga 7, Anderson 5, and Edward 23, Glendon 55, permission to marry... Helga Seven squealed with delight, and proud Edward Twenty Three beamed, and so they were married at the two o'clock ceremony with sixty two thousand five hundred and fourteen other couples. And here's what happened. To whom it may concern, this document is included in the package to explain the contents, or at least to clarify what's here, so that whoever has to open it and deal with it will be kind and just. My name is Edward 23, Glendon 55, and this is recorded in the year 3115. I am married to Helga 7, Anderson 5. On our wedding day, we went directly from the ceremony to the living tower to which we'd been assigned. We were delighted to find we were to live in rooms 11, for that suite contained two bedrooms. And since resources are strictly limited with space and atmosphere assigned, that could mean only one thing. We've been assigned a family living unit. <laughs> That means they'll let us have a baby. Now, we mustn't jump to conclusions. We haven't received our card yet. Oh, it's probably waiting for us in our rooms. And I don't much care whether it's a blue card or a pink card. Do you? No. Just think. A little baby all our own. A little teeny baby. That's all we cared about, you see. Raising our own little family. And so we waited in our three-room living quarters for our card. We sat in our womb chairs and stared at the message wall and waited for the word. Each day, the great sunlights would blaze on in the morning and simulate old Saul, and then in the evening, the pale moonlights would come on and we'd know it was night. Then, one day... Attention, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Finney, Glendon 59, will report this afternoon between 2.30 and 2.35 to the family card issuance unit. 
We quickly dressed and reported at precisely 2.30, taking our place at the end of one of the many lines. Ahead of us was the machine which distributed the cards. You simply told it your name and what you wanted, and it passed you a blue or a pink card. If you really don't care whether it's pink or blue, then let's ask for pink, all right? Before I could reply, the machine passed us our card. It was yellow. Oh, no! No, 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 no. There, there. Oh, no! no, no, no. <laughs> I led Helga from the room. The other young people who had seen what had happened murmured their sympathy. S so that you will fully understand the extent of our despair, a blue card entitles you to a baby boy, a pink card a baby girl. A yellow card meant that in place of a cuddly baby, you were to take into your family unit an older person who had just been unfrozen. We were about to become the parents of an old thaw eve. Well, there's a well-known rule of thumb that if you've got a problem, you go to the source. For example, if your face itches, you scratch it, or more to the point, if you want a little baby and you're ordered to accept a thawed-out person, find out who gave that order and go to him, which my wife and I did. His name was Mr. Lawrence, 33. Good day. Your card, please. Why can't I have a little baby? Please. Your family unit will include Mr. Ralph Began. Mr. Began was frozen on March 12, 1975, when his heart stopped beating. He was 75 years old at the time. He is to be thawed out this afternoon and will be delivered to you tomorrow morning. Our earliest delivery should bring him to Building 90, Rooms 11 at 7.30, just after the sunlights have been turned on. How can I cuddle a 75-year-old man? Dear, dear. Neither of you knows how important it is for a girl to hold her little baby and feed it and help it grow. And you can't do that with a 75-year-old man who is probably still a little bit cold from having been frozen so long. Ah, Mr. Began will be at nearly body temperature within a few days. It's just not true that these old folks remain icy cold for long periods of time. <laughs> but I just want a little baby. That's certainly not a great deal to ask. If there's room in our quarters and we have food supply to nourish three people, and we've been told another little human being won't disturb the person to atmosphere ratio, then why can't I have a little baby? Madam, the acceptance of an elderly thawie does not preclude your having an infant child of your own at some later date. I want a baby while I'm young. I don't want a 75-year-old man when I'm young and a little infant when I'm old. That's all wrong. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Your government has need for Mr. Began's expertise. The matter is closed. And that was that. No appeal, no changing the orders. So, what we had to do was make the best of it. It wasn't easy. We left the card issuance unit and went directly to our living quarters, trying to see the bright side of things. It's absolutely dreadful. Well, just, just remember what he said. Including an old thaw in our family unit doesn't preclude your having a child of your own at some future date. Oh, well... It's lucky I didn't let you throw away our pills. Did you know? Is that why? No, no, no. I, I just thought better safe than sorry. There's no reason to get into trouble with the authorities at this point in our lives. C can you imagine what would have happened if you'd thrown away our pills and you'd gotten pregnant? Wow, trouble. I suppose. For the first time since our marriage, we slept without touching. Each of us huddled on the side of the wedding bed, half awake, wondering what our life would become in the morning when Mr. Began arrived. We rose with the sunlights, and at 7.30 we were seated in our womb chairs in the first room when... Anybody home? This the right place? Hey! Who is that? Mm -hmm. Well, good morning. Uh, you're the young fella, right? I'm Edward 23, Glendon 55. <laughs> Glad to meet you, Ralph Began. Oh, won't you come in? Right. They told me to tell you there's more chairs and a bed coming. Oh, you're the lady of the house, right? Welcome. Well, yeah, put her there. Oh. Yeah, still a little cold. Yeah, I feel it myself. Like I got a chill. Ooh, you know. <laughs> they said it would take a couple of days. Uh, I see. Well, who would have believed it, huh? Here I am. And then this pump that they gave me, this is a real blessing in disguise. They told me that it never wears out. Lifetime guarantee. Can you imagine? <laughs> no more heartburn. Pump burn, maybe. <laughs> Just think. I am going to be with you from now on out. One of life's most cherished moments is the birth of a child. 
new life begins, a new person is born in the image of his parents. But this was not to be in the case of Edward 23, Glendon 55, and his pretty wife, Helga 7, Anderson 5. They received neither a blue card nor a pink card, but instead the dreaded yellow card. And now, newly arrived and still not completely thawed, the occupant of their extra room sits, rubbing his old hands together for warmth. Oh, it's cold. Hey, any idea how long this lasts? I don't know. They didn't tell us. Attention. Your attention. Huh? Rooms in Ireland. Open your number four. Shoot for eight. Delivery. Huh? What's that? Uh, it's the monitor. It delivers messages. <laughs> Your bed and womb chair and a second chair for in here. Imagine that. Fantastic. We didn't have any furniture for you because we were expecting a permission to bear a child card and, well, we wouldn't have needed anything for nine months. Actually, of course. We thought we were going to be allowed to have a little baby. Newlyweds, correct? Yes. Of course, and you're going to have a baby. Oh, that's great. That's marvelous. Except we can't. No, not for a while. Later, perhaps. Oh, well, don't worry about it. Listen, even in my day, and once in a while, there'd be problems. But they worked it out. You see, your doctor, he does tests, et cetera, prescribes and so forth. And then before you know what you're pregnant, just, just, just don't worry about it. If you don't mind my giving advice of a personal nature. <laughs> We can't because they gave us a yellow card instead. Not a pink or a blue card. A yellow card. You! I'm a yellow card? You you, you mean a, a yellow card is like me? Unfrozen? Instead of a baby? That is sort of it, yes. Well, how come? I mean, what kind of a world is this where you, where you get me instead of a baby? Listen, maybe I better get another room. I, I wouldn't want to be in your way. Even when I was alive before, I didn't stay with my kids. Emily and me, we, we had a place of our own with our own TV, our own radio, the works. On Sundays, maybe, we'd go see the grandchildren. I want you to understand I'm not the sort of a man who intrudes himself. Hmm, we'll just take back this for cock the furniture. I assume the store will take it back in return for the stuff you'll need for the nursery. And I'll look for another place. Uh, has the morning paper come yet? I'll look under the rentals, and I'll pick out something where I'll be comfortable, and I won't get in your hair. That's your room in there. No, 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 no you, you don't understand. I'm, I'm going to move. Where's the morning paper? How can you move? How can I move? What kind of a dumb question is that? I'm, I, by moving, I move. How, how does anyone move? <sighs> you have to get a card which gives you permission to move, tells you where you must go. Applications for the card are available to the Living Assignments Building, but, of course, there's no valid reason for moving. They won't let you move. No one moves unless they need more space. You don't need more space, so since you've already been assigned a room, permission to move wouldn't be granted. I advise you not even to make an application. You'd end up in an undersea camp, and you'd turn orange, and no one would speak to you. I want to tell you something. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. It's too hard to explain. But, as best I could, I told him what the world was like in the year 3115. I described the sunlights and the moonlights. I told him how we get from here to there, and what we ate, and what we did each day, and so on. It was really a very surface sort of briefing, and I cut it short because I noticed his eyes were beginning to glaze. As you've seen, Ralph Began is very, very thin, and getting withered. And when his look grew blank, I stopped. And that began a period of waiting. Each morning, Ralph Began would wait for a morning newspaper that never came, because such a thing didn't exist. Then, out of some old habit, he'd leave the living quarters, saying, See you this evening. When the sunlights had crossed from east to west, he'd return, astonished at the world he'd seen outside. No traffic! He'd yell. There's no cars and no streets, so there's no traffic! One evening, he said, How many people live around here? It's like ants down there. There must be a billion people standing around. <laughs> He'd ventured into the square during friendship hour when everyone who can meets to reassure themselves they're not alone. Then another day... Hey, listen. While we're waiting for that call, why don't we take a little trip? Travel, you know. You could show me what everything looks like. Travel is prohibited. What? Travel is prohibited? Why? And if everyone traveled, those going from here to there would run into those going from there to here. There's no room for them to pass one another, so travel is prohibited. He shook his head in disbelief. 
Then after moping around for a few days, one morning before the sunlight's moved, he said, Okay, I've been thinking, and here's what. No calls today, right? Just like every other day, huh? No calls. Then there never are. I was unfrozen because they needed me, correct? Yes. Okay, then. How come there are no calls? They'll call you when you want it. Who will? They will. Who's they? The people who want you. And who are the people they want me? Those who decided to thaw you out. I understand that. Who wanted me thawed out? The people who needed you. Who are they is what I'm trying to find out. How would I know? We, we've never had this happen to us before. All right. Let's try it this way. Where did you get the yellow card? At the card issuing machine. At the card issuing machine. Right. Were there people there? Of course there were people there. There are people everywhere. That's the problem. The planet's jammed with people. That's why you were assigned to us, because there's no room anywhere for one more person. There's no room on the land or on what's left of the sea or under the land or under what's left of the sea or above the land and the sea. There's nothing but people. Billions of trillions of people all over the place. Hey, that's very good how you got sore. You're a somebody. Yeah. Now, here is what I'm trying to find out. When you got the yellow card, was there someone in authority there? The yellow card had instructions on it. It told us to go to the family unit card issuance station's yellow card section. And you went there and what? What was there? Another machine? A man. A man. A real person. Contact. There's a real honest-to-goodness man around. What's his name? Mr. Lawrence, 33. Well, now, there, you see? What? What you just told me about that man, Mr. Lawrence, 33, that might very well solve everything for all of us. Early the following morning, Mr. Began plastered his thin hair to his bony skull and made his way to the family unit card issuance station. He worked his way through the throngs who filled the area until he reached the yellow card station. There he entered a room which seemed to be occupied only by a computer. After waiting a minute or so, a section of wall opened and admitted Mr. Lawrence 33. He sat opposite Mr. Began. Mr. Lawrence 33? Yes? I suppose you're wondering who I am. I know who you are. But you don't know why I'm here, I'll bet. I want to make a deal. We were about to contact you. There's been a serious mistake for which your government is sorry. Oh, what mistake? Unfreezing you. You don't need me? No. But I'm thawed. Yes, terribly sorry. But your government is benign, your life is not in danger, and you've been supplied with living quarters, food allotment, and share of atmosphere. Is that correct? Yeah, but... Uh... Those are yours. Don't be alarmed. We won't take them from you. Consider yourself part of our life. And good luck. Uh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. When Mr. Beacon came home that day, he was very depressed. Not at all his usual self. He told us how no deal could be made because they didn't need him, how his hopes had been dashed. He apologized over and over again as though the fact that Helga Seven and I couldn't have a baby was his fault. For the next few weeks, he kept to himself, huddled in the womb chair in the third room, his room staring at the sunlights as they swung from east to west, and then at the moonlights as they threw their pale shadows. After a good deal of thought, he joined us one evening in the first room. Listen, I got a brain, and I've been using it. You want to hear what I think? Hey, did you two kids hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what I worked out. Now, I am going to remove myself from your life so you can have a little baby. Now, you want to know how I'm going to do that? A baby. Right, exactly. A little baby. And with me gone, you can do it. A little baby? How? I, I don't understand. All right, here is how. I am going to commit suicide. Uh, you're going to what? Commit commit suicide. Suicide? You, you, you don't know suicide? No. No. Well, I'll be damned. Suicide? I, I'm going to kill myself. Take my life. Zop. How on earth do you do that? Oh, there are hundreds of ways... Jump from a building or a bridge or a tower, shoot yourself with a rifle or a pistol or a shotgun, hang yourself with a rope or a necktie or something like that, take poison, rat or gopher or any kind, insecticide, say, or stab yourself or cut your throat or your wrists or... Uh, let me see, you burn yourself up or lay down in front of a train or a car or a bus or a truck or swallow your tongue like some of the Chinese people used to do even before my time. Or listen, I, I could go on and on. The point is, you'd be rid of me, and I wouldn't mind at all. Honest, I've already lived 75 years, and that's plenty. 
Besides which, I got a chance to look around in the year 3115, which is very unusual. That's more than you can say for most guys my age, so don't you give it another thought. I will commit suicide. How? How? Weren't you listening to me? What'd you do, doze off or something? I just now gave you a dozen examples off the top of my head, and there must be a million more besides what I mentioned. I, I was listening. It's just that I don't understand how it's possible to kill yourself. If it were, there'd be a suicide every once in a while, and there isn't. That's right. Well, like I said, I, I, I could jump off a bridge or a tower or a building, I, you, you know. We don't have bridges or towers. I, I've seen old pictures of what they look like, but we don't have them. A tower is a waste of space, and there's nothing to build a bridge over. Nothing to build a bridge? You, you, you got rivers, culverts, hollow places? Well, everything is either filled in or covered over or the center of something. Mostly filled in. They use those old moon cutouts. All right, then. I'll jump off a building, and I'll tell you how to do it. You go into a building, you see, and you either enter an apartment and open a window and jump out, or you go up on the roof and take off your jacket and tie and leave your wallet and the note, and as soon as there's a crowd gathered down in the street, you jump. Simple as pie. Open a window? Open a window. Of course, open a window. Didn't you ever hear of opening a window? Windows don't open. It would throw off the atmospheric pressure. It's very carefully balanced when you consider the trillions of people it supplies. Jump from the roof, then. Roof? Right, roof, the top of the building. There's no roof. How can there be no roof? What's on top of the building? Floor 879. Rooms like these. Look, Eddie, I am not stupid. I know that. What I'm asking is what's on top of the floor, what you said, 879? The plastic cover. Didn't I tell you? The planet's covered with plastic. Every building goes right up to it, so no space is wasted. The only way you can get outside the plastic is through a rocket takeoff or a landing chute. And then you'd be standing on the plastic, and there's nowhere to jump because the planet is encircled with plastic. There's no below, you see. It's all out or up. Hmm. And, and all, all them other things, I, like I said, like the poison and stabbing and hanging and etc. Yeah, cetera. nothing would work. Before they thawed you, they'd prepared a backup system. Yeah, spare parts, you mean. Yes, keep them in storage. Yeah, lungs, liver, kidneys, stomach, tongue, bones, eyes, ears, nose, throat, everything. Huh? Everything. Let me ask you a question. How do you die around here? Well, you get an application for death, and you fill it out, and, and then you file it with the authorities. If it's approved, they put you to sleep in your reserve space carton. Aha! That's it, then. Why didn't you tell me I'll get an application for death? You're not old enough. Me? I'm not old enough. I'm 75 years old. What do you mean I'm not old the enough? The minimum age is 163. You're really quite a young man. I am, huh? <laughs> I would have to say that I am a miserable old nerd. That's what I'd have to say. There was nothing any of us could do. The fact that Mr. Began was willing to take his own life so Helga Seven and I could have a baby drew us close together, and we became a family unit of sorts. We went out of our living quarters and showed Mr. Began the tree. That's it? That's the only tree? We used to have billions of them. More than you got people. One Sunday, we managed to get into the automobile run where a carefully preserved 1990 Chevrolet Tudor is driven once around a track. We had freeways for them things. There were so many of them, there was traffic jams. And then, of course, there was the oil trouble, and then... Uh, imagine that. Only one car left. For a while, Mr. Began seemed to be in a trance. Events had been too much for him. He looked numb and walked aimlessly around the rooms of our living quarters. And I must admit, he, he became more than an annoyance. He was a burden. I don't want him here anymore. He reminds me all day long that I haven't got a little baby and that I'm not going to ever have a little baby. Yes, you are. How? Can you tell me that? How am I ever going to have a baby? We're going to get rid of that old man, that's how. Get rid of him? Exactly. We're going to kill Ralph Began. <laughs> Nimoy again with the fourth act of Yes, Sir, That's My Baby. There were times when I thought it was wrong even to be planning this terrible act. But then I recall cases I'd heard about where young couples in ecstatic determination had thrown discretion to the winds and stopped taking their his and her pills. 
In each case, the woman had become pregnant, and they'd been called before the authorities. The punishment was severe. The husband or wife was ordered to give up their life to make room for the child. Well, I couldn't face death, nor could I face what life would be like without Helga Seven. So I persisted. Then at last, I uncovered the information I needed. That night, when Mr. Began had gone to his room and to sleep, I told Helga. I don't want to know. The heart pump. It's been known to malfunction. When that happens, the person dies. Oh, my goodness. All I have to do is loosen one little pin right in plain view on the surface, besides the air intake valve, and that's it. It'll malfunction, and no one will ever know the difference. I'll give him a new pump. If the malfunction occurs just after he falls asleep, we won't know he's dead until morning. And by then, too much time will have gone by. Too much damage will have been done to save him. It'll be too late. The alarm bell. Didn't he say there was an alarm bell? I'll disconnect it. They've had malfunctions with the alarm bells, too. Why do you suppose they give you a lifetime guarantee if both the pump and the alarm can break? The lifetime guarantee isn't for the person. It's for the piece of equipment. You're covered for the life of the equipment. When are you going to... No, don't tell me. I waited until she was asleep and then slipped out of the bed and walked towards Mr. Began's room. I had a moment of panic when I realized he might be sleeping on his stomach where I couldn't reach the heart pump. But he lay on his back, his nightshirt open at the neck, so that the pump elements I needed were convenient to my hands. I located the tiny pin and the alarm bell connection and in two quick motions slid the pin loose and broke the alarm wire. The heart pump stopped. I couldn't look at him. I ran into the bedroom and lay down on the bed beside Helga Seven, who was still asleep. No sound came from Mr. Began's room. When I opened my eyes again, it was morning. Helga Seven was already awake, sitting up in bed, watching the sunlight begin to glow. When she saw that I was awake, she leaned over and kissed me. It's all right. It's all right. I did it. Last night, after you'd fallen asleep. I knew you had, just looking at you. Well... I'll call the authorities through the message board. They'll come and get him and take him away. Well, there's usually an informal hearing, I was told, and since we already have had the food space atmosphere ration in our name, they'll give us a pink or blue card, whichever we prefer. And we can have our baby. Yeah, our baby. Hey, you kids up yet? You decent? Uh, oh. uh, j- just a minute. <laughs> I'm not a ghost or anything, assuming you got things like that. Come on out. I uh, had to go out so the alarm bell connector could be fixed. Did you know they had an emergency station in Building 85? No, I, I didn't know that. I, I told them it busted on its own. I didn't, I didn't want to get you in trouble. Same reason I put the pin back last night, so you wouldn't get in any trouble. Put the pin back? Yeah, you got 30 seconds grace with these things. Filled in. The guy who installed mine told me. So, after Eddie left last night, I put the pin back. I heard you talking about what you were going to do, and uh, I just couldn't let you do it. You'd spend the rest of your lives, every time you looked at your kid, you'd be thinking he was there because you killed me. You know, kids should come out of love, like mine. I had three of them. Oh, I'm glad you survived. I I don't know whether I could have made it if you hadn't. You recall in our early conversations on this matter of how to get rid of me, I never once mentioned you should kill me. This whole thing is my fault because of that dumb decision I made to be frozen. So, I got myself into it. I got to get myself out of it. There has got to be a system. There always was, so there is now. And I got to figure out what it is and then how to beat it. It's just that simple. Now, tell me about life here. Fill me in. I wanted to know about the his and hers pills, the backup system that had been devised to prevent unwanted pregnancies until the couple had their permission to bear a child card. We explained what the scale in the first room was for, how men and women weighed themselves for the record each week, protection against food thievery or pregnancy, since such things were easily uncovered by the Friday weigh-in. Then, one terrible Friday, it came time for the weigh-in. I stepped off the scale to make room for Helga Seven. In a minute, she said. I was astonished. It's time for your weigh-in, I told her. In a minute. Don't rush her. Yes, don't rush me. Are you all right? Me? All right? Yes, certainly. Why? Because you've never before delayed your weigh-in. 
Well, that proves there's always a first time. Have you something to hide? Are you pregnant? What? Have you been taking your hers pill? Yes. Have you been taking your his pill? Of course. Then how could I be pregnant? Attention, your immediate attention. Mr. and Mrs. Edward 23, Glendon 55. The computer reports Mrs. Glendon 55 has not used the scale. Go ahead. I, I don't... Go, go, go on, weigh yourself. Whatever it's about, we should know right now. Oh. <laughs> Why did you do it, Edward? You're more important to me than a baby. You shouldn't have done it. What, me? I didn't do it. Mrs. Glennon, 33's weight shows two variants. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Edward, 23, Glennon, 55, will report to the family planning unit headquarters building for a hearing within the hour. We were numb. We couldn't understand what had happened. Mr. Began, however, didn't seem disturbed. Don't worry. You, you kids worry too much. You're a fine one to talk. Nothing's going to happen to you. At the headquarters building, the three of us were directed by signs to the hearing room, where four men sat in great chairs behind an enormous table. They gestured that we were to sit opposite them, and we did. A blood sample was taken at the entrance tunnel. Yes, sir. I will come right to the point. You are with child. <sighs> I don't know how It's not her fault. It's my fault. She knew nothing about it. I will accept your judgment. No, no. He didn't do anything. It was me. I did it. It's my fault. Oh, no. Sir? Yes, who are you? Ralph Began. Uh, no numbers. I'm the original. Oh, yes. The 4E. Yeah, exactly. It's neither of their faults. I accept full responsibility. Here is the key to the matter. His, his pills and her, her pills. Three months supply. Where did you get those? I've been taking my pills. No. You've been taking what we used to call placebos, fakes. I made them out of my food supplement pills. I kept this as evidence. Your Honors, I accept full responsibility. I'm sure your actions were well intended, but that doesn't change the situation. Some member of the family unit must give up his or her food space atmosphere for the newcomer, which excludes you. You're a signed family and a different status entirely. Well, let, let me tell you a story. Ralph and Emily Bagan married back at the beginning of the 20th century. They had three kids, who in turn had seven, which was the count when my heart quit and I got frozen. And these seven, who had maybe 14 or so on. Now, who programmed the machine that gives out the blue or pink cards? The machines program themselves. Are you saying that new information is passed from computer to computer? Exactly. So at a birth, the machine keeps track of that person through marriage and so on to the next child and so forth? Exactly. Who do you suppose originally programmed the computers? Why, the man, of course. Ah, now you're cooking. What man and when? I'd only be humoring you. Humor me. The computer was originally programmed in 2046. 2046. Has anybody since then asked the computer how come they assign yellow cards to certain families? No. That is to say, I'm not certain. Ask it. Uh, humor me again. This is the last time, Mr. Began. We're at the end of our patience. That information is lost to us. The computer response was secret information. Secret, huh? Okay. Let me give you a for instance, which will explain why the computer's original programmer didn't make yellow card assignments helter skelter. Suppose the machines were programmed so that a thaw E was turned over to his family, let's say. Now, if that was the case, when the machines took over and began programming themselves, they'd continue doing the same thing, huh? Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you are or not. Did I tell you that I was frozen before my daughter was married? What's that got to do with our problem? All right, just listen to this. Now, this little piece of paper here, this, this was written by my daughter. I got it from the people where I was thawed. They found it in a little slot on the side of my freezer. And my daughter says, Dear Papa, 
when you're thought out, you'll be pleased to know I'm married to a wonderful man, Nathan Glendon, and I have two boys, Robert and Edward. I thought you'd like to know when you're thawed, you've got family somewhere, etc., etc., etc. Now, don't bother counting on your fingers. I'll save you the trouble. The elapsed time in generations from my grandson, Edward Glendon, to now is 55. What's your number again, Eddie? Glendon, 55. You betcha. So, you see, Your Honors, I'm not assigned family, which can't take the place of these kids. I'm family, a member of the unit. So when I say I'll give the new little baby my food and space and atmosphere ration, why, that's it. According to your own rules, I'm allowed to do that. There is a further problem. You have heard, I presume, of the application for death certificate? It is operable as a system because disposal provisions for an individual have been made at his birth. We have no place to dispose of four E's, none at all. Even ashes occupy space. Uh Uh-huh. I thought of that. You ever hear of passing the buck? Passing the buck? When you got this kind of decision to make, you let somebody else worry about it. Pass the buck. This is the highest court on these matters. There's nowhere else to go. Where's the box I was frozen in? Still in the vault? Why, yes. And it's empty, right? Pass the buck. Free freeze me. Let somebody else worry about it in a couple of million years or whatever. Just let me wait around until the baby is born. I got the food space atmosphere card for it. Agreed? And that's what happened. He stayed with us until the baby was born. A little boy we named Ralph too. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine I got to see my 56 times great-grandson born. The authorities let him stay in the rooms for the first few weeks so he could play with the baby and hold him. Then, one day, he decided to leave. The medical staff at the refreezing station explained to him that he'd be frozen, and that would be it, until someone else, someday, somewhere, needed his services for some reason, and thought him out. We know that when that happens, he'll be with family, which is why I'm enclosing this note, to explain to you who your great-great-how-many-ever-times grandfather is, and what a really special man he is. Please, take good care of him. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Yes, Sir, That's My Baby, was written, produced, and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Herb Vigran, Noel North, and Robert Towers. Featured in the cast were Michael Rye and Marvin Miller. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. Our story concerns itself with one man's battle with the greatest monster any of us will ever face in any arena, his conscience. Armando Paz, better known to the aficion of all the countries of the world as El Encanto, was and is Batman. Before becoming El Encanto, the Enchanted One, he was usually called Armando, 
or a variety of other names usually reserved to describe a poverty-stricken stealer of oranges in southern Spain, or someone who loved the art of bullfighting so passionately that he would sneak into forbidden pastures and practice surviving the bull's deadly horns on moonless nights. Before Armando was El Encanto, he was nobody, and he never forgot it. Eje, Eje, Torito Bravo, such great, beautifully formed horns, so well armed by nature that you have only the monsters in this arena to fear. Eje, they force me to kill you. A profound symbol of freedom and strength. In order for them to experience the idea of death, you are real. They are shadows, screams, moans, creatures seeking second-hand reality. The sword sinks into the muscle of your great neck like butter, and your right horn graces my groin as you make the last charge of your life. We are joined now in a warm blur, suspended in time for a second. And I feel the sensation of your horn slashing the pattern into my guts. I live. Your horns die. The screams of the monster that forces us to live on each other's blood is the same. Always the same. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Amando Paz, El Encanto, by Odie Hawkins. Our stars, Larry Moss, Tommy Cook, and Jack Crucian. Life is not always easy. No one can dispute that. But how many of us face death each time we go to work? Armando Paz, El Encanto, carved this noble name onto the hearts of the bullfight public today. Fighting three magnificent cathedrals from the ranch of Don Julio Belmonte, he offered an incredible display of cave work. Those critics who have accused El Encanto of being stingy with his cave work in the past would not have been able to make that complaint today. He expressed himself superbly in the opening movement by executing those statuesque passes that have justly earned him the nickname El Encanto. His movement from beginning to end was illogical and a woven pattern that could only be called extravagant, but refined and above all, Turn terribly that elegant. Off. He is... Armando, what is wrong? Don't you enjoy hearing about yourself anymore? I never did. Uh, but that isn't something I've been able to make you understand. Oh, according to you, I have never been able to understand a tremendous number of things. Oh, please, Mira, let's not argue. Come, come on, sit down over here beside me. I, I'm tired of fighting. Why are you so irritable these days? I wasn't aware that I was behaving any differently but than... But you are. You used to be so... So relaxed, so at ease with life. I remember thinking when I first met you, is it possible that this man kills bulls for a living? How long has it been, Mira? Three years? Uh, three years is a long time to be El Encanto. But it is a choice you made in life. Why do you take it out on me? I'm not taking anything out on you. But you are. You bring these depressing moods into our relationship. It, it unnerves me. It makes me feel that, that I am not doing something right, that, that I'm failing you in some way. Who could know that better than you? Why do you make these sly remarks, Armando? Have I not created a beautiful lifestyle for us? Have I not made your life pleasant? Do you think that surrounding yourself, surrounding us with, with, with all, of these, all of these things, that, that, that some type of happiness will automatically occur? Sometimes I think I was happier when I had to steal oranges for a meal. Armando, what do you want? I don't understand. The more you have, the less satisfied you become. 
What the hell do you want? I want you, Mira. Amongst other things. What do you have, me, Armando? Uh, that's not what I mean. Ah, so we are back to this again. <laughs> Is that the way you think about it? See, si. Armando, I have told you a thousand times, I am yours. But I must reserve the privilege to be my own person. Why must you feel that the people around you should belong to you, body and soul? That sounds like an odd question for someone to ask who surrendered her so-called freedom for a half million pesetas. Uh, are you a great one to talk? Think of how much of yourself you surrendered this afternoon for money. Think about how it feels like even the possibility of being gored in the thigh, in the stomach, the armpit, maybe the eye. For money. No, not for money, Mira. I go to the vaults because I am cold. I am forced. I don't understand when you say things like this. You are called to fight the bulls? I don't know if it would be possible to explain what that means to, to, to someone who, who only thinks in terms of supply and demand. Armando, for once, just for once, rather than trying to talk over my head, why don't you try to explain? Perhaps I can understand. You really want me to try to explain, huh? See, si, I'm very curious. All right, I'll try. But first, we must place ourselves outside of this petty conversation. I never engage myself in petty conversations. You asked me to explain something to you. If you want that explanation, you must be patient and listen to it. Hi. Si. Go on. Good. I must explain to you what I know. What I feel in my own words. Because I, I haven't read the words of the people who write about my art. As a man, I am nothing. Nada. I am like other men, but, but as a creature who confronts death in the shape of a bull many times each season, I am el encanto. I do not quite understand. I told you you wouldn't understand. But I did not say for you to stop. Should I go on then? See, of course, go on. I, I am a sacrifice, you see, to, to a spirit in our world that is, that is older than religion. It is older than my Uncle Juan. <laughs> is there such a thing? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did not mean... I understand, Mira. I, I, I understand. Pour us some more wine. I see. There. Our best Jerez. Now, please, go on. I say that I am a sacrifice to a spirit older than religion. Now, this is true. The spirit is fear. And I am used by the aficion, by the public, to, to overcome something that they do not want to confront. Death. I am the, the, the woman who... You are the what? <laughs> I, I, I know it sounds incredible, but, but, but in a way, symbolically... I am the, the woman in the pretty clothes, flirting with a supreme symbol of manhood, using the capote and muleta as fans. And yet, every man in the arena identifies himself with me. <laughs> I wish Jose Flores could hear you now. Jose knows this already. It is what makes his afición so great. I, see, I, see. I, I can understand all of this. I can understand all of what you say, except for the part where you say... You are forced to fight the bulls. But it is true. It is my calling. If I did not do it, someone else would have to do it, and they probably would not do it half as well. I so. You think of yourself as a, some kind of a priest, eh? I spoke of myself as a sacrifice, not a priest. <laughs> Armando, you are an incredible man. Incredible. But you would not recognize reality if it gored you between the eyes. I guess it is my turn not to understand you. What are you talking about? I ask you a simple question that only concerns money, and you give me a lot of mystical nonsense about fear, about death. 
Why can't you make yourself understand that you are giving the public a thrill that they could get in no other way? I hope that isn't true. But it is true. That is why the Mexicanos are willing to pay you so much to see a fight between you and Ramon Garcia. Have you made up your mind? The money will be fantastic. Mira, you are hopeless. No matter what we talk about, we, we always come back to the same thing, money. Well, what else offers so many options? Uh. Going back and forth in time, we are quite often able to take mental pictures, emotional glances at our heroes especially those of yesterday, as these men are doing, and as they remember and wonder. Tell me, Senor Cody, what do you think of the festival this year? Oh, I've seen better. <laughs> oh, I like that in you. One who has always seen better. <laughs> it gives you a great opportunity to avoid dealing with depression, and very often with the recent past. <laughs> It offers you a great deal of safety, doesn't it? Would you say that running in front of the bulls yesterday morning was the way to safety? The annual test of bravery. Please, do not misunderstand, <laughs> Senor Cody. Please, Ernest. Ah, thank you, Ernest. Understand me. I do not doubt your courage, only your judgment. Especially when we concern ourselves with the quality of this year's festival as compared to those of past years. <laughs> Obviously, the same could be said about Matadores. Clearly. Oh, a waiter, uh, more shrimp and beer for my amigo from America. I know what you're getting at, Senor Flores. Oh, please, uh, you may call me Jose. Jose, <laughs> I know what you're getting at. Since we occupied this table three days ago, you've been trying to get me to say that Armando Paz was, and is, if he were still fighting... The best that ever used the flannel. Mm, perhaps. <laughs> Salud. Salud. Are you saying that uh, I should forget about the great bullfighters in history, uh, Manuel Rodriguez, Manolete, Jose Lito, Cagancho, Procuna, on a good day, Arusa? Well, not completely, but I have to say this honestly. <laughs> On a good day, El Encanto would have given them all the bath. Oh, he was unique. Absolutely alone on the face of the planet in his perfection. <laughs> With a plate of such excellent shrimp in front of the senor, uh, Jose. Thank you. I would find it very difficult to disagree too strongly with you. Uh, but aren't we forgetting someone? Oh, who is that? Ramon Garcia. Sobrano. Oh, him. Well, it was generally conceded by most knowledgeable bullfight fans that the matchup they fought in Mexico was a classic example of a, a lesser-known talent giving the master a taste of the medicine he used to offer. Well, that's not true. I should know. I was there. Allow me to take the liberty of giving you the truth. Uh, that is, if you were not there yourself. Well, I wasn't there. I, I was covering a war at the time. Oh. That was unfortunate, because you are not present at an event that will always be a part of bullfighting history. <laughs> I will tell you what happened. Uh, before you begin, uh, waiter, two more of the same, please. As I am sure you recall, there had been a great deal of agitation from the Garcia people for a face-to-face -face match, a, a mano a mano. There were many who felt that El Encanto was, um, how do you say in English, uh, coasting. Oh, yes, coasting, uh, taking it easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could never agree with that point of view. If you went to the Corrida and saw Armando Paz, you were present at an event that carried extraordinary emotion. True? It lacked authentic competition, except for that fancy Dan Garcia, but he never coasted. The bulls would not permit it. Why was the fight held in Mexico? Ah, oh, for the usual reason, my friend. Money. Uh -huh. The Mexican impresario Vargas made a fantastic offer, as I understand it. At any rate, at four o'clock in the afternoon, on a warm day in the Plaza Mexico. Uh -huh. 
Matador Armando, be careful with this one. He hooks like a boxer with his left horn and looks smart enough to know Latin. Run him again, Juan. Show me how he moves. But we have already. I said again. Are you the matador or am I? You are, Armando. You are. There were also a number of disloyal pipes who felt that Armando was not only coasting, but that he had lost his nerve. The urge to fight the bulls. He used to ask me, Juanito, has there ever been another one like me? If you give me the truth, old man. I guess at 40 to his 20, I did seem old. I know you've seen them all. Am I not unique in this art? I laughed at his arrogance and agreed. But I always cautioned him about making comparisons. Every great matador is a divine manifestation of grace under pressure, created to purge us ordinary people of certain emotional problems. They are priests, these men, the ones who perform honestly and with a strong sense of justice. My manager, what a shrewd uncle that one was. He had bribed every major bullfight critic in Spain to promote the fight between El Encanto and myself. He had schemed in ways that I would not like to discuss even at this point in time. He did whatever was necessary to get me into the ring with El Encanto, and it was one of the great lessons in my life. The opening pass with the capote was Armando's strong point. The pass is called a Veronica, supposedly named after a woman who wiped the sweat from the brow of our Lord on his way to be crucified. No one but Armando Paz could capture the tenderness of that emotion with his cape work. That uncle had something sacred in him. The bulls were what you would call in English uh, flag bulls. Torres banderas. Yes, torres banderas. Each one as large as this room, armed with horns as wide as your arms spread, faster than a racehorse over a short distance, and filled with a violent belief that he was the god of all that his strength and horns could encounter. Oh, senor, real bulls. Real bulls! The beauty of his movement, the way in which he wrapped himself in his cape as he took his first bull away from the picador with the chiquilinus, the cape flapping gracefully from one side to the other, almost caused me to applaud. I knew I would have to dig deeply into myself for the performance needed to match his, if I wanted to have more contracts for the following season. The first one, Churro, made a treacherous stab as Armando was making his last pass of the Kite, slashing and jabbing with his left horn as Armando went down. Most people say that the bullfight has three basic parts, and some say thousands of pieces. But all agree that death is always a prime ingredient for both the bull and the man. Juan Pelé, Armando's peón de confianza, the oldest, the most experienced member of his quadrilla, saved him from a serious goring with one bold slap on the bull's nose. Oh, I have never seen a man move toward danger with such courage. Armando calmly picked himself up and rewarded Juan with a series of chicolinas antiguas that stole the breath from us. It was like watching a butterfly avoid the rush of a two-ton truck. It was as though the bull churro, sensing that my mind was far away from the arena, far from the monstrous appetite of the crowd, dumped me onto the sun and threatened my life to, to remind me of what I was. And what our purpose for being there was, I thanked Juan and Churro with one of the most grateful passes I could think of, the Chicoalina Antigua. The complaint has always been made. See, see, that he was not one to do a three-ring circus full of passes. Yes, not many beyond the oh, basic. Oh, yes, yes, I have heard that. And he was true on this occasion also. But we must make the distinction between the matador who only knows a few passes... And the master weaves a spell with a few threads. 
my blood turned to fire when they began to scream for Armando to place his own banderillas. They knew it was something he never did. But on this occasion, he snatched the sticks from my hand, anger showing in his eyes at being asked to do so. The elegance with which he broke the sticks in half on the barrera, the fence around the ring, strolled to the center of the arena as though heaven belonged to him and earth was too dirty for him to place his feet on, is something I shall never forget. You know how critical the Mexicanos can be when they judge the placement of these sticks. I mean, after all, they have Amalito Chico, Carnizarito de Mexico, Procuna, and Arusa, among others to look back to. And this Sunday, Armando Paz, El Encanto, was added to that list. I cannot say more. Old men, sitting in the places where bullfighting is discussed. <laughs> such as this place. <laughs> see, see, in such places as this, throughout the world, we'll always speak of those three pairs of banderillas. In Mexico, they are called El Encanto Sticks, Los Palos del Encanto. He placed one pair standing on the street that circles the barrera. He placed another pair blind. Uh, that is to say, he sighted the bull for a charge, stood like a statue, and at the last second, fake to his left, and dip the short and sticks into the bull's neck while looking up at me. At you? Uh, well, it seemed that way. It, it, it is an emotion that I later discussed with others. They say that they also felt that he was looking at them. Now, I am embarrassed to admit that my eyes were closed, and I did not witness the last pair. He sighted the bull, turned his back, and... I am told by those who had the strength to watch, faked the bull to the right side of his body, and as the bull swept under his right armpit, placed the six. Oh, that's impossible. Why, no! As I said, I could not watch. I was so certain that the horn would be slammed into his back. I have to smile even now when I think back to the dedication speech I made to Mira for Chura. Uh, those who were close enough to hear my words to her uh, at the Barrera, they could not believe their ears. I could tell from the shock that their faces registered. I said to her, To you, Mira Duran, I would like to dedicate this noble animal. I would like to dedicate it to you as a true representative of the beast that forces me to fight, to kill, to bleed, and maybe someday to die. I remember the words of the dedication because I have rehearsed them for two days. Mira thanked me for my words with her, with her usual cynical smile. His domination of the bull was masterful. I have seen them all, the best. But this was like seeing it for the first time. At one point, as he dropped the bull's head with the left-handed natural and led the animal's face into the folds of the flannel, I had the illusion of seeing a man open a garden gate in slow motion. And during the course of his movement, as he slowly left the bull poised in one spot with a dazzling remate, he turned to us with a grave expression as though to say, I am doing this for you. I, an Encanto, the only one in the world able to do this. I hated him. And I loved him. I am told that a new record for fainting was set in the Plaza Mexico during the course of his faena. I found him a strange creature to watch. It all appeared to be a dream, the manner in which he led the bull past his body in a series of dream-like patterns as he casually studied the reactions of his audience. For long, slow moments, as he worked closer and closer to the horns, I felt myself being drawn into a brotherhood, one that only a few men on earth were privileged to join. Who would not believe it? The stupid women who fainted in the plaza. And it was not much better on the men's side. See, of course he was great. But couldn't they see he was simply playing on their emotions?
You know, there was this odd thing that we all understood about Armando, that he hated to make the kill, which, after all, is the final function of, of the uh, matador. matador See? Uh, killer of both. Yeah, exactly. We understood this about him. But in some a strange way, this reluctance to kill made him a better killer. Whoa, now wait a minute. You've got to ease that one past me again. I missed something. You see, his reluctance to kill made him want to do it and have done with it quickly. He was not one to hesitate when the moment arrived. The moment of truth. That becomes an hour for some. But never for Armando. Oh, he was a surgeon with the blade. The moment of truth was only for a moment. Some invisible force pressed upon my shoulders as Churro staggered to his knees. I found myself kneeling in front of his horns, crying. As his blood spilled onto the sand, I, I felt some mysterious power was draining me. Somehow I, I could see myself through the bull's dying eyes. Armando the Rascal, they called me at one point. The thief of the orange groves. The crazy one who stopped full-grown bulls in the pastures at midnight with a, with a torn shirt. I had, I had never questioned what my role in life should be. What, what I might become other than a bullfighter. And with Churro, I found myself asking that question. People around me were out of their minds. Churro was an unbelievable experience. I witnessed it, but I didn't believe my eyes. I also witnessed Armando's third-rate performance with the two bulls that followed. During the course of his first fight, he had been a god. A god, do you understand? And then, nothing, nada. With the two bulls that followed, he made stiff, half-hearted cape work. His rhythm was jerky. I cannot describe the filth that was screamed at him. The public felt that he was cheating them. During the course of his first fight, I had been put in the shade. Now I walked in the sun. I showed them which one was number one. It was unbelievable, truly. After having done so much with his first bull, one would think he was going to tear up the taurine world with the next two. It was not so. To put it bluntly, Armando blew it in Mexico. He showed all of the signs that the afición needed to know that he was washed up. I don't know what happened to him. What does it matter? I will always be accused of causing him to make a poor showing, no matter what. So, es la vida, no? Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of El Encanto, the story of Armando Paz, Matador. I could never explain it, what had happened to him. He became a man at war with himself. He dragged me around with him nightly, into and out of the lowest dives of the city. He drank too much. He... More, more wine, more wine for us, for my friend Juan, for, for me, El Encanto. Armando Come, let us go home. We've had it now. Uh, yeah, you're right, Juanito. <laughs> what sense does it make if we'll only be sorry later for it? It was even rumored that he betrayed me with a dancer, Teresa Albatin. Oh, if I had found it to be true, I would have clawed her eyes out and his. Many of us in the profession thought that he had got the coleta, as we say, you know, that he had retired. Yes, it is true. I have to admit it. I, Jose Bienvida Flores, aficionado numero uno, fell into the trap of believing that Armando was, uh, how shall I say it, uh, washed up, if one had to be blunt about it, yes. I believed with many others that he was washed up, a memory. And then... One morning, an announcement mysteriously appeared on the posts and walls of the city. The announcement was that he would fight bulls from six of the greatest ranches in España. A Mirura from Cabrera, a Paro Romero, a Domecq, one from De Los Gallardo. 
vista hermosa. En a vista billar. Soccer suddenly seemed much less important than usual. I have to admit that I went to see him prepared to see someone who had once been great make a fool of himself. It was a real puzzle in my mind as to why he needed six super bulls to show the world how bad he had become. They were all mistaken. I had no need to prove anything. After my fight with Churro, there, there could not have been anything else. He was the bull of my life. He was also, in some rare way, the, the germ of a feeling that I'd always concealed from myself. His death was my awakening, in a manner of speaking. Armando acted well, let us say, different towards me after Mexico. I cannot explain exactly what I felt in words. I could reach him no longer. To understand what I am saying, we had always had differences of opinion, even from the beginning. But this was different. He was different. He would stay out half the night and go to the church next morning, every morning. It was like living with a person in, in two different worlds. I thought perhaps it was the Gemini in him, you know, the divided personality coming out. I made a decision. The decision was to give the bulls one last chance. There were those who didn't understand. Mira didn't understand. Uh, but she never understood me very well anyway. Others called my decision arrogance or madness. I didn't feel it necessary to explain anything to them. I made my selection from the best branches because I was the best. And I wanted to fight the best one last time. <laughs> There was a slight breeze moving through the city on the day of the fight, but in the arena it was like a hurricane. The worst that could happen on the day of a fight, the wind. Armando joked about it. A little fresh air to blow the cigar smoke and cheap perfume out of the arena, eh, hey, Juan? As a member of the profession, I tried to put myself in his position. I couldn't. I didn't want to see him gored or killed, but I was impatient for the fight to begin, for the public to see that Armando was a has-been. Oh, the bulls. They were beautiful monsters. There is no other word I could use to properly describe them. Each one was fully grown, well-muscled, and armed with horns that seemed to have room for cradles in between the tips. And he fought them with the cold, elegant charm that had made him famous. You know, there was an element of something magical in what he did that afternoon. With the wind and the danger of his cape or his muleta misbehaving, there were times when it seemed that the only possible development from what he was doing had to result in tragedy. But it did not. He ignored the wind and the cynicism of the crowd, and he offered himself to the bulls. Pedricinas on his knees, Molinetes, Manoletinas, Afarolados with the left and the right hand, movements with his signature on them. <laughs> he dedicated the bull to five other persons beside myself. Oh, I treasure the experience of having witnessed his triumph. It was almost religious. He fought six of the most dangerous bulls in Spain, in the world. And he gave the money to charity. Can you imagine risking your life for nothing? It was done. I had offered the best of them a chance and survived. I could go onward to what I knew would be a more satisfying life. A life that would grant my soul peace. Each of us has to face life somehow. Some of us only do it in the mirror, at the surface. Armando Paz went much deeper. They scream for blood! 
Oh, oh, blood, blood. Oh, no, no, no. Stop. Stop it down, please. again, Father Pass? No. No, no, not, not the bulls, Father. The crowd. It's never the bulls that cause me to have nightmares. It's always the crowd, the memory of the crowd. And what a monster it was. <sighs> From time to time I have this, this horrible dream of, of, of them, them charging me all together. The, the, the crowd charging me, howling, screaming at me. I think I understand what you mean, Father Paul. I must admit, I have been an aficionado all my life, and I recognize the beast you speak of. Uh, yes. Shall, uh, shall we go to chapel to pray? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that is a very good idea. I would like to give thanks for... for having escaped from the horns of the bulls and the public. Uh, uh, Father Paz, I have wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think of this rivalry between Ramon Garcia, Sobrano, and Diego Ordonez? Uh, well, I... Uh, I, I would like to say, you know, to begin with, that uh, ne neither of them is as good, <laughs> well, Lord forgive me you know, for my modesty, as good as I was. Uh, oh, Ramon, you know, with his great ego shows me. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Armando Paz, El Encanto, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Demoy. Our stars were Larry Moss, Tommy Cook, and Jack Crucian. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Lillian Baev, and Don Diamond. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollison. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. We're in Piraeus, the port of Athens, Greece, and it's a dark and stormy night. A night for trouble if you don't watch out. Careful, lady. That gangplank is wet. Yes, so I discovered. The captain, please. What is it about? Personal. Oh, oh I should have known. Right over there, now. Thank you. Um, I was looking for Captain Clay. Evening, ma'am. I am Captain Braga, new skipper of the Golden Girl. A new skipper? Clay got sick. Pneumonia or something. Oh. oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Then could I have a word with Mr. Perez? A personal matter. Perez? 
your first name? Oh, we get all new officers on the bridge, ma'am. A new skipper likes to work with people he's used to. Oh, I see. Well, then I'm sorry I wasted your time, Captain. Good night. Good night. Well, that was quick. Everything all right? Thank you, yes. Uh, but would you send a message to John Cooper for me? John Cooper? Who's he? Your steward. Our steward's name is Abdullah. Oh, thank you. Good night. Something is very wrong. A new skipper. A new first mate. Yes, of course. It can happen easily enough. But a new steward as well? Maybe it makes sense, but this young woman seems to think it doesn't. Perhaps that's because she's engaged in a very deadly business. A business in which human life counts for very little indeed. It's just the money that matters. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, A Nearly Perfect Crime by Alan Caillou. Our stars, Lloyd Bachner and Janet Waldo. The young woman we just met is named Joni, Joni Trent. She looks, talks, and behaves just like an ordinary tourist. In fact, she's very bright, attractive, and anything but a tourist. She's not as frightened as she ought to be, because Greece is a quiet and peaceful sort of country, and very safe. Well, usually, anyway. Well, how does it look, Johnny? Worse than a brother's murder. Hmm? Rank. It smells to heaven. The whole crew has been replaced right down to the steward. And the guard on the gangplank had a gun tucked away under his arm. Good. Good. I like it. That's all we need to know. Where to now? Hungry? Hmm. Famished. And all this vast amount of money floating around, my darling, just begging to be picked up makes me think of a really expensive dinner. What's that up there? A detour, Hillary. Watch it. A detour? That barricade wasn't there when we drove up. What was on? Are you all right? No. No. Uh, yes. Yeah, don't worry about it. I didn't congratulate you, Mr. Pyrrhus, did I, on your purchase of the Golden Girl? At such a good price, too. No, you did not, Braga. That was very remiss of you. Then I do so now. The price wasn't good, either. I paid more than I wanted to. It was a mistake. You made a worse mistake than that. Oh? And what was that? Trying to kill that girl and her companion last night, even though you failed. It was a foolish move. What, 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 girl? You didn't know? Tell me what you're talking about, Captain Braga. You mean it wasn't you? Tell me! Just after two bells last night, this young woman came aboard looking, so she said, for Captain Clay. She got sought up as she left the harbor. And if it wasn't you, I'd like to know who the hell it was. <laughs> ah, that will be Mr. Souza. I'll get it myself. Ah, my dear Mr. Piros, how good to see you again. Mr. Souza, do come in. You two know each other, of course. Of course. And I am correct, no doubt, in assuming that the briefcase you are holding contains... Final payment on the Golden Girl, a hundred thousand dollars in cash. And that envelope, I am sure, contains the insurance papers I need. It does indeed. Insurance on the vessel for half a million on her cargo... For five million. Ah, Monsieur's perfect. 
You are now the full owner of the splendid golden girl and uh, custodian, for the moment at least, of her very valuable cargo, uh, which is for delivery, as you already know, to Mr. Amman of Singapore. A poor fellow. Five million dollars worth of munitions can fetch almost as much in Singapore as they can in, uh, shall I say, Beirut? I prefer not to have heard that comment, my dear Mr. Souza. Of course. And how right you are. The watchword is always a security. It is why I have lasted so long, Mr. Souza. And it's my earnest hope that we may do business again soon, dear Mr. Piros. Perhaps. Tell me where I might find you in a few days' time. Beirut, perhaps? Then I thank you and bid you good night. As we Greeks say, dear Mr. Souza, Steen Yassas. Help be on you. And as we Arabs say, Salam alaikum, peace be on you. And peace on you too, dear friend. All right, Braga, now tell me about that young woman last night. You said she had a companion. Did you find out about them? I thought you'd never ask. Well? I made a few inquiries, of course. Her name is Johnny Trent. He's his Hillary Marshall. Registered at the Grand Bretagne Hotel as just a visiting businessman. But the word's out, Mr. Piros, all over the underworld. Go on. Hilary Marshall is a gun runner. You nearly knocked off a good customer, Mr. Piros. I told you it wasn't me. Okay, okay, I believe you. When do we sail for Beirut? At once. <laughs> are not bought and sold quite like trucks. You'd never sell a loaded truck, for example, in the hope that its cargo would promptly reach its proper destination. But ocean-going vessels are commonly traded in dock or on the high seas, loaded or empty. There's nothing unusual about it at all. Sometimes, indeed, a ship will change hands several times while she's en route from one harbor to another. Under maritime law, Delivery of the cargo in such cases is mandatory. It makes it very easy for the thieves who carry briefcases rather than guns. And when there's a particularly valuable cargo aboard, all kinds of exciting things are liable to happen. Tony, over here. Oh, there you are. One of the nice things about working for you, Hillary, is that you always find such good places to eat. <sighs> Well, what have you got for me? Hmm, what have you got for me? I'm ravenous. Oh, uh, a waiter, another bottle of wine, please. Hillary. Uh, and, uh, and some more of that lobster. Mm. Well, they're coming, sir. So the golden girl has left port. Do we know where she's headed? The satellite readout says she's on a course of 152 degrees. Her port clearance papers say she's headed for Port Said, the entrance to the Suez Canal, then on to Singapore. Canal documents have been issued to her, and everything is simply marvelous. Could I have some of your wine while I'm waiting? Of course. Marvelous, except for what? Mm. Port Said and the canal are on a bearing of 170, not 152. Oh, now, isn't that interesting? And have you, my darling Johnny, discovered by any chance where a course of 152 will take her? Not by chance, but by design. I looked it up. It will take her to Beirut. Splendid. One of my favorite cities anywhere. Why don't you take a cab over to the airport and pick up some tickets for us? Hillary, I have already done that. We leave in a little under three hours. And where's my lobster? One bottle of Atsina, one flat good lobster. Mmm, it does smell good, doesn't it? Can't see a thing in this fog. It's getting worse. Good. It means we can't be seen either. Why do you think we are running with that light? I tell you, we come to very dangerous waters now, full of Israeli patrol boats. If they find out from their spies in Greece that we are carrying all those guns, I tell you, I don't want no trouble with Israelis. You're a very nervous sort of man, aren't you, brother? No, 
just careful. You know, the Christians and the Muslims in Beirut have started fighting again. Boom, 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 everywhere. Raga, if you want to make us a great deal of money quickly, then just bring this ship into port and leave the worrying to me. There are so many options open to us now. So many ways to get rich. Didn't I hear you say, Hillary, in a moment of weakness, that Beirut was one of your favorite cities? It is indeed. It has lots of character. They're all killing each other out there. Uh, put it down to a kind of Arab exuberance. Uh, now, please close that window, my love, and draw the drapes. We have to be careful, even in the hallowed enclaves of a first-class hotel. Mm. The beautiful people are all lounging around the pool down there as though it were the safest place in the world. Don't they know? All this militant nonsense, my dear Jenny, cannot be allowed to interfere with business as usual. Now, Beirut is a dead city, but it's still very much alive. Now, let me see the file again, would you? Mm-hmm. Mm. So, what have we got? Piros will be here soon with a golden girl, which he owns carrying five million dollars' worth of armaments, which he does not own, destined for a certain Mr. Aman of Singapore. Now, poor Mr. Aman, he will have paid for them in full at the time of the loading, won't he? It's customary. Oh. 30,000 Kalishnikov machine pistols, 12,000 MG-42 light machine guns, 7,088mm rocket launchers... Ah. Anti-tank rifles, heavy machine guns, landmines, hand grenades. Enough ammunition to start a major war with. Uh, every gun runner in town will be after this. We'd better see Piros the moment he gets in. Yes. Um, I hope you realize how very dangerous it will be, Hillary. Why should it be? I'm a cash-on-the-barrel customer. In any case, you'll be there to hold my hand, won't you? It's just that... I don't want anything to to happen to you. I I I I, I really am in, in love with you, Hillary. Oh, come, come, we can't have tears at a time like this. We're on the verge of pulling off yet another very satisfying job. And I I I think that perhaps I'm in love with you too, my darling. Oh. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Marshall's secretary. Who? Hold on, I'll see if he's in. Hillary, you won't believe it, but John Cooper is here to see you. Hmm. The ex-steward of the Golden Girl. Y you find that interesting? Very. Yes, send him up, please. Hillary, you really do. Find it interesting? Yes, of course. No, you really do love me? Oh, 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 that, that, um... Well, yes, it's a distinct possibility, I'd say. <gasps> Offhand and without too much reflection. Oh, Hillary. Come in, Mr. Cooper. Uh, thank you, Miss. I'm Hillary Marshall. What can I do for you, Mr. Cooper? It's, uh, what I can do for you, Mr. Marshall, sir. I've got uh, some information for sale. It might interest you quite a bit. And why should you think that? Because I know who you are. I was in Athens when you were making inquiries about the Golden Girl. I used to work on her. I was her steward. And was it you who fired on us when we left the harbor? No. No, I didn't even know about that. I'm not a gunman, sir. I'm just a steward. But I'm not a fool either. I worked it all out and put two and two together. You're an insurance investigator, aren't you? Well, that's a very amusing deduction. But do go on. And I know the insurance companies are rolling in money. A thousand dollars? Since I don't know what your information is, let's say five hundred and start talking. Well, two months ago, I was steward on another ship called the Animos. She was carrying half a million dollars worth of scrap brass for a man named Aman in Singapore. But the Animos was sold en route and a new owner diverted her to Beirut uh, for, for so-called repairs. And while she was here, the cargo got secretly offloaded and sold on the black market. She 
put out to sea again, caught fire and sank. The new owner picked up the insurance on both the ship and the cargo. Very interesting. And when the Annie Moss sank, there just happened to be a small boat standing by to take off the crew under Captain Braga. That new owner, Mr. Marshall, sir, was a Greek named Pyrrhos. He's now the new owner of the Golden Girl, and he's planning the same thing for her, too. And if that isn't worth a lot of money to you, then I don't know what is. Jerry, give Cooper his $500, will you? And I will give him some very valuable advice. Cooper, if you choose to run around Beirut, of all places, where everybody is a spy, telling these things to everyone you happen to think might be on the side of law and order, then your life just might be in very grave danger. Happen to think... Oh, Lord... You mean... Mr. Cooper, I am not an insurance investigator, heaven forfend. I am a customer for the Golden Girl's cargo. And my valuable advice is, take your money and get out of here fast. Go to your adoring Maria, perhaps. How do you know about Maria? Never mind. But go to her before I start wondering what the orthodox way might be of disposing a body in a suite of a first-class hotel. Oh, my Lord. I thought... I, I thought... No, Cooper, you didn't think, and that is your problem. Take your money, Mr. Cooper, and run. Yes. yes I, I, I won't breathe a word, not a word to, to anybody. Goodbye, Mr. Cooper. So nice to have met you. Yes. Yes, uh, goodbye. That was a very frightened man. And he has every reason to be. There's no room in this business for amateurs. We're talking about one of the most profitable rackets in the history of double dealing. You buy a ship loaded down with a good cargo. You divert it as the legitimate owner to a friendly port. You sell that cargo on the black market because physical possession is everything. It's simple, neat, tidy, profitable. It's also quite perilous. Who is it? It's me, John. Open up quickly. Oh, my darling, what is it? You're so pale. Because I'm scared, Maria. Scared out of my wits. I looked the deaf angel right in the face and I got away. Oh, John, what happened? This fellow Marshall, I told you about him. Yes, yes, the insurance investigator. No, no, I was wrong there. A mistake that could have cost him a life. That's what I thought he was. But he's not, Maria. He's one of them, a gun runner. Oh, no! There's no doubt about it at all. I told him all about Pieros and Braga and the munitions on board the Golden Girl. John, they could have killed I know it. Pour me a drink, please. A large one. Oh, yes, of course. They, they could have killed me. They should have killed me. Yes. They, they chose to buy me off instead the easy way, I think. Five hundred dollars. There, I didn't stop the counting. I just got out of there fast. And I ran all the way to your place. I didn't dare go home because they threatened me, Maria. They told me I'm not safe here now. Another, please. Yes, yes, anything you want. Oh, John. Gun runners are a very dangerous breed. Hide me till the golden girl has left port. She just got in two, three days to dispose of her the the cargo. Cellar. The cellar. I'll make it comfortable for you, John. Oh, oh thank you, my darling. <laughs> Get down. Behind the sofa. And I told you, I told you. Maria, I'm dying. Oh, I love you, Maria. i get you to a doctor now. You don't know how much I love you. Turn the damn radio on, Braga. Find me some bazookies. We don't have bazookies in Beirut. Well, where do you want me to burn the golden girl and sink her? Same place we sank the animals? 
The water is deep there. No chance for inquisitive divers. No, I, I don't think we'll do that this time. It, it seems a shame to waste such a profitable ship. We can we can use her name to present the banks with forged bills of lading for non-existent cargoes, which we can then sell. Mm, we get away with that once, twice, no more than that. Ah, you're quite wrong, Braga. The banks are only obligated to check documents, which can easily be forged. They don't ever bother to check cargoes. Maybe. That means... It's time we must change the ship's name. Precisely. And what could be easier? Once we have disposed of our munitions to the highest bidder here, you will take the golden girl out of harbor, ostensibly en route to Singapore, and supposedly with her cargo still intact. But you will put in at the muni shipyards down the coast in Sidon. The Muni brothers are friends of mine, and I have already made the necessary arrangements. There our fine ship will suffer... Minor surgery. Surgery? One must to be removed. She will be repainted and renamed. A fine ship for which we can attract good cargoes by offering very low rates. <laughs> you see where this will lead us? Genius! I do have certain talents, Braga. But that is not all. While the golden girl is being disguised, you will take a fast launch out to deep water. You will sound out a May Day on your radio, announcing yourself as the golden girl and saying that you are on fire and rapidly sinking. By the time help arrives, you will have speeded back to Beirut and there will be no trace left of the ship. Except perhaps a few sharp pieces of timber that you might get to take along uh, with you to toss overboard and mark the golden girl's passing. We'll collect insurance of the ship and her cargo. We will already have sold the cargo by then, and we will still have a fine ship with which we can start over. Very soon, my dear Braga, we will both be very rich. Oh, sheer genius. There is no other word for it. Yes, I will agree. This is an almost perfect crime. Marshal, to see you, sir, with his secretary. He says it's important. M Marshal, do I know him? Well, Mr. Ferris, you do not. My name is Hilary Marshall. This is my assistant, Miss Trent. Miss Trent? Mr. Ferris. And your business, sir? My business, Mr. Ferris, is making money. Ah, then please be seated. I'm a busy man, Mr. Ferris. I don't want to waste time on preliminaries. I want your munitions from the Golden Girl. I understand they're insured for five million... I offer you a firm two million dollars. Three. Two? I do have another buyer, you know, waiting impatiently. A two and a quarter, and that's final. Gus? A letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut. Excuse me, then. Two and a half? Uh, that depends. Ah. Ah, my dear Mr. Souza, this is your equally dear friend, Mr. Piros. I have an offer of two and a half million for my merchandise. If you would care to raise it. No, my dear friend, no haggling. We're not carpet salesmen, are we? And that is your final offer. Hold on, please. I have a firm two nine, Mr. Marshall. Then I go to three. Final. Excuse me. Three million, Mr. Sosa, will you top it? Oh, what a shame. Hey, but I have another deal that you might be interested in. I can sell you the golden girl, repainted, well disguised, and renamed. And then, when you have a suitably valuable cargo for her, I will buy her back from you at twice what you paid for her. And give you also first refusal on that cargo. That, dear Mr. Sousa, is a is an offer you cannot refuse, huh? Done. And we, too, have a deal, Mr. Pierce. We do indeed, Mr. Marshall. Hmm. Then, where may I inspect the merchandise? I will take you to its hiding place, Mr. Marshall, as soon as the letter of credit is in my hands. Of course. Accept it. I'll go to the bank at once. Good day, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Marshall. And uh, perhaps uh, we can do business again soon? I do believe perhaps we can. Miss Trent. Mr. Pierce. Well, that went off rather nicely, I thought. I think he'd have settled for two and a half. In a deal like this, speed itself is priceless. Marshall! Oh. Why are you shoot Marshall? Look out! On the roof there, she's got a gun! Oh. 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 Darling, are you all right? No, 
my leg. Uh, don't worry about it. Did you see who it was? Yes. It was John Cooper's girl, Maria. You know, Hillary, I'm beginning to believe that you're very shooting prone. I find that sad. Every time we go from point A to point B, someone starts shooting, and you finish up invariably on the receiving end. It's ridiculous. Thank you for the sympathy. Hello. Ibrahim. Ivy, this is Hillary. I want a counterfeit letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut in favor of Mr. Grigory Piros for three million dollars. I'm buying his armaments. What do you mean it's illegal? Don't be foolish. Now, a really good counterfeit, Ibi, that will stand up to very careful inspection. And I want it just as fast as you can make it. Good. Room service. Oh, yes, I ordered a bottle of Scotch, Johnny. Oh, dear. Please don't anyone make any excited moves or I will shoot. Please be sure of that. You are Miss Johnny Trent, I believe. And over there is Mr. Hillary Marshall. I am Mr. Amman from Singapore. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of A Nearly Perfect Crime. Mr. Amman from Singapore. And I am an honest and very angry businessman. Tired of being robbed by you, you, you pilot! Mr. Amman, calm yourself, please. I am not uh, what you perhaps take me to be. Oh, you can't fool me, Mr. Marshall. I know exactly what you are. Ever since Piros uploaded my cargo of scrap brass from the Animos a couple of months ago and sold it on the black market here, I have had a spy in his bureau office. And I know what you are doing. You are paying three million dollars for my munitions that I paid good money for at the time of their loading. Can you think of any intelligent reason why I should not kill you both now? Mr. Rahman, I bleed for your terrible loss. But years of experience have taught me never to try to reason with a man who holds a gun pointed at my stomach. And... So... Oh, 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 oh. Johnny, Johnny, run for your life. I certainly will. Johnny, Johnny, where are you? Over here. Oh, Hillary, you didn't get shot again, did you? Really? Come on, down to the lobby. We'll be safer in a crowd of people. Hotel manager, I cannot allow shooting pistols in my lobby. Outside on street, it's okay, but not in hotel. Remember, we are civilized people, only outside shooting pistols. Where did they go, Abiyad? Where? Oh, you, you, you mean Commissioner Marshall and his lady? Yes, where did they... Commissioner Marshall? Oh, did I say Commissioner? I meant, of course, Mr. Marshall. No, if the little money were to tell Jenny. Yes, 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 there's, there's a hundred. No, 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 tell me. Thank you, sir. And in fair exchange, I will confess that, well, like almost everybody else in Beirut these days, I am, forgive me, it's oh, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, for tell, me tell me, tell me, tell me about Marshall. But also for oh, the Americans, oh. the Syrians, the Israelis, the PLO, in short, for anyone who will help to enlarge my miserable stipend. I am not interested it in your means, miserable stipend. I have to be well informed about all my hotel guests. Mr. Marshall is registered here as businessman, but that is just his cover. We all know that he is actually a gun runner. Oh, I know that. They told me so in Greece. They told me so here ah, in Beirut. But that is a cover story, too, very expertly planted on all of us, both here and in Athens. And under those two cover stories is the real Commissioner Marshall. 
who is a very senior officer from Interpol. Oh, from Interpol? Surely. Oh, and I have been shooting at him. Oh, oh, what am I going to do? He'll have my head. I suggest, Mr. Raman, that you make your amends by whatever means you can devise at the very earliest opportunity. Fortify yourself with that. Bandage not too tight? Thank you. The bandage is fine. Mm. And you really are a sort of natural target, aren't you? You'd think they'd get lucky the third time. But they did not. And I'm a little miffed over your behavior with Mr. Amman. Hmm? Miffed? For whatever for? He was shooting at me and you chose to run. I find that an extraordinary way to behave. But, darling, you told me to. I, 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 I was obeying orders. The instruction was merely a gentlemanly courtesy. I expected you to remain and help me. The only decent thing to do. Who is it? Special delivery envelope uh, for Mr. Marshall. Thank you. You mean in the middle of all this fighting, they still have special delivery? In Beirut, it usually means seven young thugs in a jeep, all armed to the teeth. Mm. Now, let me have that. Aha, my letter of credit for three million dollars. You know, that is as good a forgery as I've ever seen. Oh. Really, quite marvelous. Now, if we could only contact the impulsive Mr. Amman with a modicum of safety... Who is it? Mr. Amman, bearing a flag of truth. What do I do, Hillary? Open the door, my dear. Oh, Mr. Marshall, sir. You see before you a most contrite man, seeking your pardon for... for a most dreadful mistake. Can you find it in your heart to forgive me? I have just discovered that you are a law enforcement officer. A very senior one, and I have no wish to be hounded to the end of the earth by Interpol. Well, so much for my cover. Now, was it you who shot at us in Athens, Miss Raman? Oh, 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 yes. I ought to clap you in irons. Oh, how can I make amends? I am a very wealthy man, Mr. Marshall. No, no, I can't accept money, I'm afraid. But I'm not a man to hold a grudge, and perhaps I could persuade myself to accept, um... But what about a case of champagne? Oh, done, sir. Done. And, and I cannot thank you enough. For myself, I have already been sorely punished for my foolishness. I've lost five million dollars worth of munitions I could have sold for twice that sum. Uh, perhaps not, Mr. Amman. Oh, it so happens that I have in my possession a letter of credit on the Arab Bank of Beirut... In favor of Mr. Piros for three million dollars. When it's presented to him, he will deliver the stolen cargo to me or to my chosen representative. Now, perhaps you'd like to find someone to accept it on your behalf. Oh? Oh? Oh, Mr. Marshall, my dear friend, what a noble gesture. And I promise you, not a case of champagne, but a whole shipload. Yes, I swear it. Oh, how nice. You know, ever since I first became nubile, I've always wanted to try a champagne bath. I mean, all those bubbles creeping up. <laughs> Lovely. Then, then we really have only one more problem on our hands, do we not? Which is? The matter of Mr. Pyrrhus. Quite so. <laughs> I'm only unhappy that Mr. Pyrrhus will go free. <laughs> Even though his financial loss will be very considerable, will it not? Oh, how so, Mr. Avan? Because your letter of credit, I am convinced, must certainly be counterfeit. Uh, yes. How very astute of you. But even those of us who enforce the law must on occasion bend it a little. 
And it's a very good forgery indeed. It'll fool Piros completely, and perhaps even the bank, too. Uh, unless, of course, someone happened to tip them off after the cargo is delivered and before the letter is actually cashed. Ah, I am sure there might be just one honest man in Beirut to do that. Moreover, neither Piros nor Braga will go free. Braga is currently disguising the Golden Girl and giving her a new name at a shipyard in Sidon. Now, Beirut lives on its sea commerce, and that is a very serious offense here. The police will raid the shipyard, find the work in progress, <laughs> and both Piros and Braga will spend the next ten years of their lives in prison where they belong. Oh, delightful, delightful. Uh, and um, just for my own satisfaction, was it you who shot John Cooper, too? Oh, oh dear, I, I, I feel so terribly guilty about that. But I thought that you and he were in partnership to steal my cargo. I'll never be able to make it up to him. He, he was not seriously hurt, I hope. My marksmanship was never very good. Uh, John Cooper is recovering nicely in St. Mary's Hospital. But why don't you just send the poor fellow a case of beer? I'm sure he'd appreciate it. And would you care for a whiskey and soda, Mr. Armand? <sighs> and you, Hillary? Uh, yeah, a, a, a quick one. We have a plane to catch. <laughs> Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, A Nearly Perfect Crime, was written by Alan Caillou and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Lloyd Bachner and Janet Waldo. Featured in the cast were Richard Peel, Marvin Miller, Larry Moss, Gladys Holland, and Alan Caillou. The music for Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears. A name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. The year is 1922, and we are in Egypt, in the valley of the tombs of the kings. In ancient times, when the pharaohs were still buried here, it was called the city of the dead. It has always been a barren and desolate place. Now, across the empty landscape, walled in by rocky cliffs, all that meets the eye is a small cluster of tents. In one of them, perspiring in the desert heat, is an American archaeologist, Dr. Malcolm Lambert. He's preparing a report to the Gralty Foundation, which finances his work here in Egypt. Now, let's see. Because the newspapers have made such an outrageous melodrama of the dreadful tragedy that has recently happened here, I wish the Foundation to have an accurate account of it and of the bizarre series of events that preceded it. This report was compiled from interviews with members of my team and from my journal. I will start the story on January 25th, 1922. I was in my tent at the site. It was early morning, and the diggers and basket boys had collected to begin the day's work. 
Suddenly, my young assistant, Gerald Boardman, burst into the tent. Oh, boy, Dr. Lambert, that's it. We're out of business. Good morning, Gerald. What is it this time? The tools have been stolen. What? Shovels, picks, everything. But how could that happen? But there ha- really is a pharaoh's tomb here. We're never going to find it. I don't know who's trying to bring our work to a halt, but this time, they've succeeded. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story... The Lover of Silence by Robert Ellis. Our stars, Howard Culver, Tommy Cook, and Shepard Mencken. For thousands of years, the golden treasures of the Egyptian pharaohs have appealed to the noblest and the basest of man's instincts. Many have gazed in awe at the exquisite beauty of the royal furnishings. Others have carefully studied them seeking to learn the history of a great and vanished civilization. But still others have looted the tombs and carried off the wealth to satisfy their own personal greed. Now, in 1922, the time of our story, little is left. The Egyptian government deals harshly with thieves and carefully regulates the number of historical treasures that may be taken out of the country. Two separate teams of archaeologists are at work at opposite ends of the Valley of the Kings. A British expedition, led by Howard Carter, will soon uncover the fabulous treasures of King Tutankhamun. But our story concerns Dr. Malcolm Lambert's team. And just now, with their tools gone and their diggers standing idle, prospects are dim indeed. Were all the tools stolen, Gerald? Every last one. I I wonder if someone really is trying to stop our work here. Well, it certainly looks that way to me. Our problems began at the very start of the season, didn't they? With that mix-up about the government permits. I really had to use a lot of pressure to get the papers out at all. Then we had the fire in the laboratory tent. Yes, that was a close call. It was just lucky I had the records in my tent that night. Otherwise, we'd have lost everything. And now the tools have been stolen. I guess the next question is, who's behind all this? And why? I can't imagine. Why should anyone want to interfere with our excavations? How about our friends, the British team at the other end of the valley? Howard Carter, preposterous. A professional rivalry, that, that sort of thing. I've known Howard for years. I'd stake my life on his integrity. Well, just a thought. In the meantime, there's no way we can get any more digging done. Well, where's Fuad? I have no idea. He can go back to his desk job in Cairo, as far as I'm concerned. No, no, no. This is his first field assignment, remember. Besides, he's as helpful as any liaison officer I've ever worked with. Ah, let's see how good he is at tracking down some new tools for us. There's only about a month left of this season. We're running out of time. Yes, and running out of money, too, I'm afraid. Oh, that foundation gives me a pain. I'm not surprised at thinking of cutting off our funds... Nearly three full seasons here, and all we have to show for it is one worthless scarab. If we had to find a scarab, why couldn't it be a really good one? Wouldn't it be great to be able to tell the Foundation and Howard Carter and everybody else that we've dug up a fabulously valuable scarab covered with gold and no, jewels No, no, no. And... Easy, easy, Gerald. Don't get carried away. <laughs> we have some pressing problems to... Shh, shh. What, what, what was that? I didn't hear anything. Shh. I think someone's outside the tent. I- is that you, Fuad? It is only me, good Dr. Lambert. Oh, Moharab, good morning. Uh, do you know where your Uncle Fuad is? Yes, 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 Doctor. I just now saw him talking to one of the guards. Were you here in camp last night, Moharab? Oh, yes, Mr. Bodman. Yes, yes. Did you see anyone near the tool enclosure? I am extremely sorry. No, Mr. Bodman. I did not look out of our tent all night. Extremely sorry. Would you please tell your uncle that we'd like to see him? Yes, 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 good Dr. Lambert. I will run all the way. A fairly fast walk would have been quite all right. (laughs) It's hard to believe that any young man can really be so servile. I'm glad Fuad doesn't let him visit the dig very often. He 
He makes my skin crawl. Meanwhile, we have some basic questions to settle. Do you think we're justified in spending still more of the Foundation's money this late in the season? Buying new tools? Of course we are. I wish I felt that certain. Look at it this way. We've still got a month. And if we don't dig, we won't find anything, will we? Yes, that's right. Good morning, Dr. Lambert. Mr. Boardman. Good morning, Ford. Uh, please come in. What can you tell us about the tools? Very little, I fear. It appears that at an unknown time, during the night, the enclosure was broken into and the tools were carried off. There are whole gangs of thieves hanging around outside the camp just waiting to grab something, anything they can sell. Oh, now, that's a little exaggerated, don't you think? Regrettably, Mr. Boardman is quite nearly correct. My country is not a wealthy one, and many poor people are forced by the circumstances of poverty to steal in order to live. However, they do not operate as a general rule in gangs. But in this particular case... They did. That appears to be probable. Several men would be required to carry away all the tools at one descent. And yet no one saw anything. That's strange. Though Ahmed is foreman and not myself, Dr. Lambert, I suggested to him that he should discharge the guard whose patrol included the tool enclosure. You suspect the guard of theft? One cannot be certain. In any event, I believe it is wise to show the men that they must all perform their duties excellently. I'll have to go to Cairo for new tools. Ah, a pity. When time is so precious. It can't be helped. It'll take me at least... If I may interject... I might save a substantial period by telegraphing to my superiors at the Department of Antiquities. Uh, I would ask them to have the tools purchased and assembled at their warehouse. You, Mr. Boardman, would need only to go there, settle a single account, and bring the tools here. That's a fine idea. Great. I should... Uh, let, let's see now. I should be able to catch the 930 train from Luxor. And I shall telegraph at once. Oh, oh, oh Dr. Lambert... May I recall to you your wish to re-examine the cliffs across the valley? Oh, yes. I, uh... Yes, this would be a good time. Could you ask Ahmed to have the donkeys ready in half an hour? Oh, certainly, Dr. Lambert. And we'll be back this evening. I will meet with you eagerly at that time. Oh, thank you, Fouad. I wonder if his Arabic is as strange as his English. In any case, with all the confusion this morning, we've forgotten about... My daughter. Oh, Carolyn, yes. When is it she's arriving? Her ship gets into Alexandria day after tomorrow. Hey, hey, I could meet her there. I'll be as close as Cairo anyway. Oh, that would be splendid. Uh, is she really as pretty as you say she is? <laughs> yes, she is. Oh, then we're going to get along fine. <laughs> you probably will. <laughs> Ahmed and I rode our donkeys over to the opposite side of the valley and tethered them in the shade of a rocky ledge. Howard Carter had told me about some rumors he'd heard of a mysterious sarcophagus hidden in one of the shallow caves that the hot desert wind had hollowed out of the cliffs here. We spent several hours walking along the rough trail at the base of the cliff, looking into every likely opening. Find nothing, Doctor. No, Ahmed, nothing at all. Let's stop here in the shade and rest a few minutes. Yes, Doctor. Ah. Oh, that's better. As a matter of fact, our entire dig hasn't turned up much more, has it? A scarab, Doctor? Well, I'm afraid that doesn't amount to anything. Important. I only wish it were. No, we really have nothing to show for all our work. And now, with one setback after another... A setback. We... Setback, Doctor. Oh, uh, uh, difficulty, a uh, problem. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Do you think there's really a... Did... Did you hear something? Maybe... Wind? Yes. Yes, I, I guess I'm imagining things. <laughs> well, do you think someone's really trying to keep us from digging here, Ahmed? Is strange, Doctor. Yes, yes it is. Can you guess at what... No, my... no, can't guess. Bad to guess. Yes, but if we all try to understand what's... Doctor! Ah! 
Mohammed. Those rocks. Why, if you hadn't pushed me... If... Doctor, is all right? Yes. Yes, I... Thanks to you. What happened? Rocks came from Clifftop. And fell here. They could have killed us both. Thanks heavens you moved so fast. Why, why, Ahmed, you're trembling. Must go home. Yes, yes, certainly. Let's get started. No, no. You go home to America. What, what do you mean? Danger. Doctor can do nothing here. But if... Can do nothing. Scan up. Curse of Pharaoh. Jerry Boardman returned to the Valley of the Kings, bringing both Carolyn Lambert and the new tools with him. Father and daughter were happily reunited after their long separation. The girl's pretty smile and easygoing charm brought a welcome change to the Spartan atmosphere that normally prevailed at the dig. At last, the men were able to go back to work in the trench. Ahmed had calmed down a bit, but he seemed nervous and apprehensive. I took Carolyn on a tour of the dig. Workmen with wicker baskets full of sand and rock filed up the steep path out of the trench on their way to the dump. Far below us, Gerald was directing the diggers at the very bottom of the trench. I just can't bear that man. <laughs> You've told me that so often since you arrived. I suspect you're trying to convince yourself of it. Your field is archaeology, Father, not psychology. I forget the silly reason you gave me for disliking him. It's not silly. I think he's trying to push you out of the directorship of the dig so he can take oh, over. That's nonsense. The next you'll be telling me he sneaked off the train, came back here, and pushed those rocks down on Ahmed and me. I wish you wouldn't treat that so lightly. Well, I can't go around forever in fear of my life, Carolyn. I'm thankful what? that... What's that? I, I didn't think I... Well, that strange sound. Don't you hear it? No, I don't hear anything. In fact, it seems unusually quiet. Oh, that's it. <laughs> the diggers have stopped work for a few minutes. It's the silence you notice. Oh, oh, I guess I'm getting jumpy. But I'm worried about you, Father. You've got to be careful. Everyone's nagging me about that. Gerald's been after oh, me ever since... Oh, that man. Do you know he spent the entire train trip telling me that you're doing everything wrong here? Carolyn, my dear girl, that doesn't mean anything. He got so technical. I didn't even know what he was talking about half the time. He said the sides of the trench were too steep, that it was liable to cave in. Oh, he and I have discussed that, but I've been digging in this kind of rock and gravel for 30 years, and you develop a feeling for what you can and can't do with it. The trench is perfectly all right. Fuad agrees with me. And you know I wouldn't endanger the men. Oh, I told Jerry he was crazy. Well, now, he's young, he's excitable, conscientious, but not really crazy. Oh, Father, you always like everybody. He's also a first-class assistant. I'm lucky to have him. <laughs> All right, don't overdo it. And he most certainly doesn't want me out of the way. Oh, but there is some sort of plot, isn't there? Oh, I, I really don't think so, Carolyn. But you're not completely sure, are you? Gerald convinced me at last that he and I should talk seriously about our succession of accidents. They simply could not be plain bad luck, he said. An unknown person was trying to bring our work to a halt. He pointed out that since Ahmed and I had nearly been killed by the rock slide, our enemy, that was his word, would stop at nothing. At Gerald's urging, I posted special guards around my tent to be sure that no one would eavesdrop, and he and I met inside to discuss our situation. When you get right down to it, Dr. Lambert, your daughter Carolyn is the only person here who can't be a suspect. Really, Gerald, if you're going to pick on Come every... on now, you agreed that we should talk. Reluctantly. Well, even so, you agreed. Now, Carolyn didn't get here till after the so-called accident, so... She can... suspects you, by the way. What? Me? Really? Oh, yes, yes, she's quite firm about it. <laughs> well, you tell her... Uh, that I wouldn't plot against you till after you've actually found a pharaoh's tomb. Once you've done all the hard work, then I'll get rid of you and take over. Why don't you speak to her yourself? Because she's avoiding me. Oh, that won't last long. What does she really think my motive is? Pretty much just what you said, that you'd like to take over the dig? Well, I suppose that does look like a possibility. Okay, I'm a suspect. Now, what about, um... Out of the question. He was with me when the rocks fell. But he wasn't hurt, was he? Well, no, but... Also, the workmen consider him the boss, not you. And don't forget, 
We allow Ahmed to distribute their pay. I don't see your point. I only mean that he's got a whole crew of willing accomplices. All right. Ahmed's second on the list. Now, let's consider Fuad. He's an even less likely suspect than Ahmed. And he'd need accomplices, too. He couldn't have carried off the tools all by himself. And the workmen don't even like him, as far as I can tell. No, he acts pretty superior most of the time. Oh, he's an extremely intelligent man and well-educated. In Egypt, that puts him in a special class. He's also comparatively well-paid, I imagine, which means that he could hire accomplices. Doubtful, I think, but, well, let's put his name down. Now, who else is there? Moharab, our own Uriah Heep. <laughs> we actually don't know much about Moharab, do we? No, not really. He's Fuad's nephew. He's uh, nearly finished school, seems to like visiting the dig, but I can't remember when he was here and when he wasn't. Neither can I. Well, in any case, on my list of suspects, Mohareb's the least likely. The kid's afraid of his own shadow. Hmm. What uh, about motive? Considering Ahmed first, he'd be out of a job if we shut down, so I can't imagine why... Come to think of it, just before the rock slide, he and I were talking about... Uh, that's not important. No, no, no. What did he say? Well, he mentioned the scarab and... You never told me that. Well, it hardly seemed necessary. What is the only thing, other than tons of gravel, that we have dug up so far? The scarab, of course. Exactly, the scarab. And I think that's the key to the whole plot. But it's nothing, Jerry. It's plaster. It's even badly made. Probably a clumsy attempt by an apprentice jeweler. You and I know that because we're looking at it as American archaeologists. Uh, you mean that... Someone who doesn't know what it really is might think it was enormously valuable? Or enormously important. Oh, now, that's interesting. Ahmed appears to think it's important. He said so. That's just my point. Some Egyptians might very well see all sorts of religious or political significance in it. Things that you and I would never dream of. All right, suppose we take the scarab over to Howard Carter's camp. He may know more about this aspect of it than we do. Okay. Where is the thing, anyway? Right here on the table, under the maps. No, no, I don't see it. Here, it's in this box with it. A... Good heavens, it's gone. Oh, it must be here somewhere. No, no, a... I looked at it just this afternoon. I'm positive I put it back in the box. Gerald, it's been stolen. The night is hot and still, and a strange air of foreboding hangs over the camp. Carolyn, unable to sleep, climbs to the top of the hill that overlooks the dig. The guards recognize her and continue on their rounds. She stands there alone, looking out across the valley, lost in thought. Suddenly, there's a noise behind her. My dear Miss Lambert. Oh, Fuad, oh, he startled me. Oh, I'm profoundly sorry, Miss Lambert. But surely you should be in your tent at this hour. Oh, but it's so peaceful up here. I felt as if I were the only living person for miles around. I too have felt that same sensation here, Miss Lambert. There is a special atmosphere, a feeling of solitude and silence. Yes, it's so terribly quiet. It was so even in ancient times. Do you see that mountain peak up above us there against the sky? The highest one? It looks like a pyramid. Ah, precisely so. That peak was believed to be the home of the goddess Myrut Saigar, who presided over the royal tombs, the city of the dead. She was called the lover of silence. I wonder. I wonder if the goddess was a lover of beauty, too. <laughs> How extraordinary that you should say so, Miss Lambert. Oh, it's so lovely by moonlight. Your pyramid mountain up there looks like solid silver. It almost has a ghostly glow. There are ghosts all about us, Miss Lambert. <laughs> oh, you aren't trying to frighten me, are you? Oh, no, 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 no. That would be ungallant. I meant only that ghosts are quite nearly all that is left here in the Valley of the Kings. Ghosts and empty tombs. Empty? But what about the mummies of the pharaohs and all the gold and jewels? Oh, gone long ago, Miss Lambert. Most of the treasure was stolen by tomb robbers in ancient times. Scientists and collectors have since carried off the remainder. Oh, but my father... There may still be a hidden tomb that no one has yet found. 
Mr. Howard Carter thinks so, and your good father also believes he's quite near to one. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful for him if he could make a really spectacular discovery? That happens but rarely. Ah, uh, but one of the most spectacular finds of all scarcely involved either gold or jewels. Really? What was it? During the 21st dynasty, in order to thwart the tomb robbers, the priests of Amon secretly moved the sacred remains of the pharaohs from their original tombs to other, more secure resting places. At last, most of the mummies were collected in two hidden depositories. Did anyone ever find them? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But before that happened, the pharaohs remained safe and undisturbed for more than 3,000 years. 3,000 years? One of those hiding places was discovered when I was a young child. But in this event, happily, the Egyptian government secured control. The Department of Antiquities sent down a German gentleman to take charge. The mummies had been placed in a vast secret crypt deep under the cliffs. The German gentleman needed to lower himself by rope. At the bottom of the shaft, he lit a torch and held it high to illuminate the huge chamber. The stone coffins of the pharaohs lay about in great numbers. In the flickering light, he gazed upon the sarcophagi of the most powerful rulers of our ancient world. The pharaoh Totmos III was there, and the great Ramses. The German gentleman discovered that he was standing amidst the earthly remains of forty pharaohs. Forty? Goodness! Oh, what a wonderful day that must have been for archaeology. For Egypt, Miss Lambert. The sarcophagi containing the mummies of the pharaohs were taken by barge down the Nile to the museum at Cairo. The Egyptian people reacted as if they were witnessing the funeral of a beloved monarch recently dead. They lined the riverbanks to watch. My father held me high up on his shoulder so I could see. My mother murmured prayers as the boat glided slowly past. Men fired their rifles in salute. Women followed along at the water's edge, tearing their hair and wailing a high, shrill cry of grief. I... I can hear it still. A lamentation for long-gone glories. An ancient cry of mourning echoing down from the days of the pharaohs themselves. The work here in the valley means a great deal to you, doesn't it, Fuad? I... I like to think, my dear Miss Lambert, that my work here is of value. But... Uh, I ramble too much. No, yes, really? Yes, 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 it is a serious failing... The moon has nearly set behind the hills, and you should get some sleep. Well, perhaps you're right. Oh, assuredly so. I hope we can talk again soon, Fuad. That would be charming. Good night, Miss Lambert. I'm not sure I fully understand you, Ahmed. You mean you actually saw Muharrab in my tent? Not in, Doctor. Maybe come out. Do you think he might have taken the scarab? Maybe, Doctor. Where were you when you saw him? With workmen, far away. And this was yesterday afternoon? Yes, Doctor. Well, Ahmed, thank you for telling us. I see Mohab's down there at the bottom of the trench. Would you ask him to come up here, please? Yes, Doctor. I can't believe it. Is Mohab the one behind all this? Yeah, I'm shocked, too. How could that little pipsqueak cause so much trouble? I wouldn't have thought he had the nerve to sneeze. But we must be sure to give him every chance to tell his story. You wanted me, good Dr. Lambert? Yes, Muharab. I might as well come right out to it. You were seen near my tent yesterday at the time the scarab disappeared. I may have been, Dr. Lambert, uh, Mr. Bortman, but I did not take it. I would not steal from friends who had been so good to me. But, but we have a witness, Moharab. Impossible, good Mr. Bortman. I have not stolen anything. And all the time you go around here as if you're eager to kiss our boots. But, but I like to be polite to show my appreciation. Moharab, for... did you take the scarab? No, 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 good Dr. Lambert. Never. It'd be pretty dumb to steal a worthless scarab anyway. I swear on the heart of my mother that... Moharab, what's the matter? Why are you staring like that? Scarab is worthless? But you you said it was 
fabulously valuable. When did I save it? Oh, so you were listening outside the tent the other day. You spoke of gold and jewels. I was talking about something else, Moharab. The scarab you stole is worth only a few dollars. You tricked me. No one tricked you, Moharab. You did. I, I humiliated myself day after day and... You are devils! Devils! So all that groveling really was just an act. Moharab, I know you're not here at the dig very often, but... Devils! Go back to America where you belong! It was you all the time. Oh, I might have known. Your Uncle Fuad will be extremely... Hey, hey, what's going on down there in the trench? Well, I I don't know. Something's happened. Now, what have you done now, you miserable... Guard! Yes, Doctor. Take charge of Muharrab, and don't let him out of your sight. Yes, Doctor. Here comes Ahmed up from the trench. He's running. Doctor! Doctor! Mr. Boardman! Ahmed, what is it? What's wrong? Steps, Doctor. Steps, Mr. Boardman. Steps? What do you mean? Stairway cut into stone. A stairway? I can hardly believe it. Gerald, do you realize what this means? Yes, sir. After all this time, we found it. We found our tomb. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Lover of Silence. February 3rd, 1922. Events moved swiftly after the discovery of the steps at the bottom of the trench. We quickly cleared away enough gravel to reveal the entire stairway cut into the rock, leading steeply downward. At its foot, we came upon a tunnel, large enough to stand up in, also cut into the rock. But it, too, was filled with debris and gravel, and still more backbreaking work was required. By late afternoon, the tunnel was cleared. We assembled in the eerie half-light at the far end of it, deep under the rock. In front of us was a sealed doorway, blocked with rubble and plastered over. A pharaoh's tomb for sure, Dr. Lambert. Yes, and the seals are unbroken. It's it's incredible. Oh, I wish we had more flashlights. It's, It's too late in the day to clear the door completely. I thought I might use this chisel to make a small hole here, at least enough to to see what's on the other side. Let me slip in beside you. All right. Yes. Scrape a little along the lower edge there. All right. Good. Now, let me... Can you get it? Is it moving? Yeah, I, I think... Ah. It's out. <coughs> Jerry, what's the matter? It's bad air. Dust, okay. perhaps. It'll be gone right away. Possibly you should not exert yourself for a moment, Mr. Borden. <coughs> Maybe not. Dr. Lambert, you should be the first <coughs> to look through anyway. Oh, yes, Father. Won't you take my light, Dr. Lambert? Thank you, Fouad. Father, can you see anything? I, I, I never... Are you all right? Oh, yes. Yes. What do you see? Such... Such beautiful things, exquisite wall paintings, furniture, statues, many statues, a great carved chest, bundles heaped on the floor. Oh, can you see any gold? Oh, yes, my dear, gold everywhere. I prepared a statement for Fua to send to the Department of Antiquities, asking them to notify the press and requesting additional police. We arranged to take turns standing watch that night at the door of the tomb. Gerald chose the first shift. I relieved him at 10 o'clock, and the hours from then until 2 a.m. passed very slowly. Thoughts raced through my mind without any rational order. In the excitement of our great discovery, Carolyn and Gerald seemed to have patched up their differences. Muharrab was still temporarily in the custody of our guards. There had been no time to deal with him, but at least he could cause no further difficulties for us. We were all safe. The tomb had been found, and in a few more hours, we would open it. Ah, Fuad, I'm glad to see you. Ah, yes, Dr. Lambert. I've got to confess, it's been a lonely four hours down here. Precisely so. There's no point in my going back up to the tent. I'm thoroughly wide awake. Would you mind if I stayed here and chatted with you? The tunnel is stifling, Dr. Lambert. You should go outside into the clean air. Oh, I will soon. But I wanted to tell you how grateful I am for all your help. There is no need for gratitude. Oh, but there is. 
We've had so many difficulties lately, and you've always been... It was not my plan to tell you in this manner, but you are entitled to a special explanation. An explanation of what? You speak euphemistically of difficulties. Is it a surprise to hear that your Mr. Boardman is responsible for those difficulties? Well, that's inconceivable. Quite naturally. Mr. Boardman does not know that he was a participant. At the department offices, he caused an outrageous disturbance when there was a small delay in issuing your permits to dig. He acted as if he had personally come to rescue Egypt from the Dark Ages. Now, Fuad, surely that's an exaggeration. I have seen many foreign archaeologists call it the department. They all have the same overbearing attitude. The manner that seems to say, you poor Egyptians should feel honored that we are willing to invest our money and talent in your miserable little country. Really, Fuad, I think... We have had too much of foreign arrogance. It has prevailed for years. I myself resolved to act. I applied for a position in the field with your team. But what's this got to do with... It was I who started the fire in the laboratory tent. I who arranged for the theft of the tools. You? But I thought Moharab was... No, 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 no. You were in error there. I am not very pleased with my nephew. He plays at being the groveler. But who knows what his mind is doing... He will never be capable of anything but petty and selfish designs. I know nothing of his stealing the scarab. The other difficulties, as you term them, were all part of my plan. It was also I who arranged the rock slide near the cliffs. You tried to kill us? Certainly not. If I wanted to kill anyone, I should not use so clumsy and imprecise a weapon... I wished only to frighten you. But the rocks very nearly hit Ahmed. Ahmed is a peasant. I... I I must ask you to go up to your tent at once. But why did you do all this, Fuad? I wish the foreign excavators to leave my country. Egypt is entitled to keep all of her treasures, not merely a part of them. But now you have found the tomb. It promises to be one of the most splendid of discoveries. And so... There is no more time. I... I have therefore formed a new plan. Fuad, that's at least four times you've taken out your watch and looked at it. What's wrong? You must leave. Go up to the surface and stay there. Tell me why. You are always the kind and considerate gentleman, Dr. Lambert. Not like the others. I could not bear it. I... I do not want you to be killed. Killed? There is an explosive here. My God, the tomb. No, 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 no. The tomb is safe. I would not harm it. But then where's the explosive? Fuad? It is hidden in the trench. I'll find it. No, 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 you cannot. No time is left. You must go. What, what about you, Fuad? I remain here. No. Ah, it is the moment for a dramatic gesture. I have sent a statement of my own to Cairo in company with yours. Our news is already going out, and the eyes of the world are turning on to this spot. This is 1922, Dr. Lambert. Egypt must be rid of foreign domination in archaeology, in everything. That is my proclamation. <laughs> proclamation is the correct word, is it not? Oh, I'm pleased. The whole world will see how desperately we need our own scientists Perhaps then authentic philanthropists will come to our aid, those that genuinely wish to help my country. I would die to achieve that. No, the Fuad. The tomb can readily be excavated again. There will be only a temporary interruption, but it is our national heritage, ours. We must keep a firm grip on our glorious past. And soon... Sometime in the future, my dear country will once again... Not this way, Fuad. There's so much you can do, so much... What was that? Someone's coming. No. No! Father, are you down there? Carolyn, stop! Don't come down here! Carolyn! Carolyn, stop! Go back! What's wrong? Don't come down here! Stay up there where you are. Don't move. Ah! Oh, 
Father, thank God you weren't hurt. I just... Just a little out of breath, that's all. What happened? It... It was Fuad. He put an explosive in the trench and... And he's buried down there. Fuad? Oh, I... I I can't believe it. Why would he do such a thing? He said it was a... A gesture. That's as good a word as any, I suppose. A sad and... And splendid gesture. Carolyn and I were still clinging to each other when Gerald came running up to us. We three stood silently, looking back on the spreading pall of dust, ghostly in the moonlight, that hung over the jumbled rocks where our trench had been. That scene will stay with me forever. Above it all, high up on the horizon rose the pyramid of living rock, shining like a silver monument. The home of the lover of silence. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Lover of Silence, was written by Robert Ellis and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Howard Culver, Tommy Cook, and Shepard Mankin. Featured in the cast were Linda K. Henning and Corey Burton. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle, John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears. A name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. Central American jungles are particularly dense, particularly dark. Within the hidden recesses of this Mayan jungle floor, the sun has not shone through the lavish foliage and the heavily vined trees for a thousand years. Yet... The perfumed scent of wild orchids permeates the steamy air. Sometimes, where there is the most darkness, there is the most light. But intruders have slashed their way into the heart of the jungle. Centuries of undisturbed seclusion ceases with the relentless strokes of chainsaws and bolo knives. Londoner Jimmy Downs is here searching for truth, or is it immortality he seeks? A former rock and roll musician of substantial means, burnt out by the electronic frenzy of the 60s, he believes truth can be found by proving the existence of Atlantis or the land of Mew. He is confident he will reach the end of his quest by financing archaeological expeditions into the remote regions of the world. His party of diggers have just stumbled upon an enormous Mayan burial site. Though archaeologists are a cautious lot, they seem excited by some evidence which could make Jimmy's dream become reality. They seem to be at the edge of a discovery which could reshape lives. And that's only the beginning 
of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Drum Maker, by Vicente Gutierrez. Our stars, Lou Horn, Carol Bilger, and Len Berman. As the days pass, hundreds of graves are exhumed. The find exceeds all expectations. Beyond the immense archaeological value, there seems to be an endless source of precious gold. Then, when all seems well, people begin to disappear without trace when far into the burial grounds. It's no use. The heat and the high humidity have ruined the computer. It can't distinguish between a permutation trend and boiling water. The trailer's air conditioning unit broke down last night, Jimmy. That's obvious. And what in Mother's name could that electronic rubbish do for us anyway, Dr. Wigan? Why, I thought you wanted the... Truth? Yeah. <laughs> Blast the truth. Blast what I wanted. There's a great fortune in gold here. Can you comprehend what that means? Power. Power, Dr. Wigan. Have you ever thought of power? I have wealth, but power. Now, that's exciting. Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy. It's an eel. Sorry. So sorry, Susan. This incessant heat is driving us all a bit mad, I tell you. Jimmy, have you looked around? Around? Oh, you mean the camp? We're practically alone. Even the government man has vanished. Captain Sanchez gone? Well, you see, it's the gold. Everyone's after the gold. Our workers are calling it the curse of death. Yes. Invoked by angry Mayan gods for having desecrated their sacred shrine. A superstitious people, of course. Of course. I say let's break camp, take all the gold the lorries can carry. I can have me yacht meet us off the coast. That's just it, Jimmy. None of the gold is missing. Susan is right. If gold was the problem, then how is it that none of it has left with them? A ruse. Only a deception. They're probably regrouping back there somewhere, and when least expected, they'll swoop down on us and take the gold. Maybe that Dr. Swenson, who was sweet on Susan and a born leader, maybe he's behind all of this. Well, how dare you accuse a man of Dr. Swenson's reputation? It was only a speculation. I needed to see how you would react. Backshooter. Hey, hon, I've got to set priorities. Sure, I'd like to get it on with you, but... Half a dozen things or more have to come down first. Who wants you? There's no need for cruelty, Jimmy. Sorry. Sorry again. Susan, I apologize. Wait a minute. I just flashed on something heavy. Could be... Cold, fool. Cold. Shut up, woman. Let me think it out. I knew this man in London. If it's sorcery, he'll be the one to know. And if it isn't, the better to prepare for whatever comes... Why, I could bring an army in here if I have to. The man? Rumor has it he's gone home. Home? He's an Indian. You know, Native American Sioux. Yes, the Black Hills of Dakota, I think they called it. He knows about magic. Real magic. <laughs> real magic? Really? He helped me out of a jam using magic. Back in the 60s? I know what you're thinking, but I wasn't high on acid, not even a beer. Sure. i just left the recording studio when a street gang came on strong. There must have been ten or more of them. They were going to beat my pretty brains in because they hated my music. Mm, do tell. Oh, really? Then Drummaker, that's right, Drummaker was his name. He seemed to appear out of nowhere. He muttered something, something like a uh, chant it was. And then the bloody beggars froze in their tracks like statues they was. Oh, you expect us to believe your drug fantasies? No, I wouldn't expect a blue-blooded technocrat like you to understand anything less than electronic overkill. Oh, sure. You're always going on and on about the evils of electronics. But they've made you rich, and, and I... And heartless. Go on, you were going to add on heartless, weren't you? Heartless is a mild word for what I'm really thinking about you. Good. Woman's got spirit, Dr. Wagon, don't you agree? Maybe she has more spirit than you can handle. 
Searching by those passive bodies you generally have hanging around? No, no, Dr. Wagan. Nevertheless, you're welcome to come along, but you must leave everything behind. Everything? Uh, not even an artifact or two? If there's anything to this cursed thing, well, one must keep the odds in one's favor, don't you see? I'm staying. Regardless of what you feel, Susan, I'm no ogre. No, thanks. I'll stay with Susan. Besides, there's much work to be done. I will make sure nothing runs. You'll have to walk if you want out. And should you get out, I'll make sure a reception committee meets you. Get it? Got it. Dirty. And cold-blooded, too, eh? You wouldn't have your men any other way, would you, love? The man's gone mad. He knows full well there's only one way out of here. You're locked into a three-walled canyon whose overhanging cliffs are quite impossible. We're leaving together. Right now. No way. The birds, the animals, the workers. Birds. They've everything. Why, they've stopped singing and calling. There's not a soul left in the camp. A deathly silence. It's silly, isn't it, Dr. Wagan? Silly or not, how fast will one of those trucks move, Jamie? malevolent force at work at the Mayan dig, or is it a clever plan designed by persons known or unknown for the purpose of obtaining all of the gold that's been uncovered? No incidents of note occurred as our trio made their way safely out of the jungle. Now, Susan and Dr. Wayand have accompanied Jimmy to the Black Hills of South Dakota, Pahasapa, as the Sioux called their holy mountain country. They've come to see Jimmy's friend, the man he calls a sorcerer. The man at the trading post said it'd be a hard climb, but this is bloody ridiculous. I think I'm getting onto the knack of these snowshoes. There, there, right, right there. I believe I see the entrance. You can see through this blizzard. You must have X-ray eyes. No, just an unnatural indentation in the snowbank. That, yeah, yes, dig some of the snow away. Voila! There's the door. Solid oak. It must be 20 feet tall and half as wide. Here, let me turn my flashlight on. Before you close the door, Jim. Fantastic. Eh, quiet. It's quite beautiful. Stalactites and stalagmites? Sparkling crystal formations. Drum maker doesn't live in a cave. He lives in a full-blown cavern. Look, there's a bit of a glow. Come along. <clears throat> are, are you sure he's your friend? I mean, this is kind of weird. I guess I forgot to tell you that drum maker was not only my friend, but a hell of a rock and roll musician himself. Everybody wanted him on their albums. Nobody could play drums like that. Primitive. Now, ancient it was. Listen. Around this bend. An unbelievable look. Crisscrossing neon tubes... In multifluorescent colors. And drums. Drums of all shapes and sizes. Must get a door chime. No, a strong lock would do a better job. Look at him. Long braided hair, war paint, feathers, buckskin. He's an astonishing looking fellow. Drummaker, it's Jimmy. Jimmy Downs here, remember me? 
lead guitar, Jimmy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Jimmy, I sell my drums once every six months. There's distributors all over the world. You can even special order. You didn't have to climb all the way up here to buy my drums. No, we didn't come to buy drums. Though I understand the best groups around have at least one drum maker drum. Susan Collins and Dr. Vigal at your service. My uh, associates. Associates? <laughs> Sounds like real important stuff. I have some pine needle tea made with wild mountain honey. It'll warm the flesh and bones. <laughs> So, you see, I have good reason to fear for my life. Aren't you being overly dramatic, Jimmy? After all, we did get out of there alive. But whatever is there knows full well we won't go around blabbing about the gold. It knows we'll be back. That could be so, but the solution remains simple. Stay out. You don't understand. Past the gold and the power, there's proof of the land of Mew. Proof, I tell you. Calm down, Jimmy. Did you know that one of the largest gold mines in the entire world is less than 50 miles from here? No, but what does that have to do with anything? On the treaty, we were allowed to keep our hills. They were sacrosanct. Then some prospectors found gold, and so it went. But knowledge is worth more than gold, more than worldly powers. But not so, drum maker. A strong point. But can't you see, Dr. Wagon, I'm an ascetic. I'm communing with the universe in diminutive terms. Contradiction, contradiction. You live in this fabulous cavern. Hell, magnificent it is. You've strung neon lights all over the place. Glitter, litter city. You tell me that's an inward search? Grandiose, I'd call it. <laughs> Touché, mine hair. Caught with my blanket down around my knees, as us Native Americans would say. Well? Another look out there might be just what I need to convince me... Never to leave here again. He sits there under that papaya tree, motionless. I've tried to catch him moving, a tweak of muscle. But he's been utterly motionless for three days and nights. Amazing. Amazing. Waste of time, I say. He must cleanse himself before he enters the burial ground. Ah. Oh. He must be pure of heart and soul. The spirits, if there is such a thing, must be satisfied. Don't make her mean no harm. Oh, so the bloody rascal's charmed your full head, love. He's a nice man. Nice man? You'd be the last woman I'd know would ever be into nice. You're an impossible creep, Jimmy. Now, that's the caustic lady I've grown to love. Now, fetch me another gin and tonic and forget the stinking lime, wench. No. You've been drinking much too much. You could jeopardize everything if you don't control yourself. I am always in control. Don't ever forget it. To gin and be quick. If you want to rot away, get your own booze. Feisty, feisty. Never mind, I have a little extra in the flask. Ah, good, good. The local government wants to move in. They'll blast and bulldoze the graveyard into oblivion. Time's running out, and that prized Indian sits there waiting. Waiting for bloody what? You don't give the government any credit, Jimmy. They wouldn't destroy a national monument. Aside from that, they aren't aware of the magnitude of the find. Gold, Doctor. Gold. Wait. I, I thought I saw some movement. Yes. Hmm? He's coming out of it. He's standing up, beginning to dance. No, it's more like... like very odd contortions. And he's waving the eagle feathers in his hands over his entire body. He stopped moving. He's staring out at burial grounds. It will be at sunrise. Sunrise? Wait another day? That's it. I can't stand any more of this worthless hocus pocus. Leave him be. Drummaker's doing the best he can. <sighs> Woman, I'll do as I damn well please, thank you. Drummaker, let's get a move on. Time's running out, understand? I cannot imagine, dear friend, what gets you so darn riled up. Ah, I see. Good old fire water, isn't that's it? That's it, that's it. It's a blooming conspiracy. You and Susan are tearing me to pieces so that you both can get your grubby mitts on the loot. <laughs> Bella, you really ought to lay off that hoot. Probably take my damn boat, too, won't you? Probably, flower child, Jimmy. What's happened to you? I enjoyed our friendship, making music, doing peace and love. It was truly a joy knowing you during those splendid 60s good old days. I can see it all now. You and Susan on Maui. 
then Madagascar, and on to Quintana Roo. But knowing you two, you'll probably like Yonkers the most. The best hotels, exquisite cuisine, a fairy tale, and I'm not the prince this time around. Jimmy, you're a horrendously bad drunk. You and that heathen savage will have it all. All, I say. Tokyo it was. We'd finished a wonderful concert, and the city was ours for the taking. You had long hair then, braided like some Anglo-Saxon warrior. At break of dawn, I made you my Indian brother. Lots of Indians in those days thought hippies were a kind of reincarnated Indian coming back as white folks, but underneath skins just the same. Enough of this sentimental drivel. I've got to chase down a bottle. This blinking flask's gone dry. If at all possible to America, I would consider it an honor if you'd allow me to go into the gravesite with you. Me too. The company would be a comfort, but whatever strength I possess, I must keep for myself. That is, until I find out more. You mean to say you already know something? Could be. But at the moment, I can't distinguish between what I want to see and what is. Oh, oh, oh Pony Rider, you uh, lost me at the pass. Good thing for you, ma'am. Ain't been to a good massacre since Little Bighorn. Drummaker! 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 Well, Susan, what is it? Dr. Wagan, he's gone, vanished. Well, maybe he's taken a walk. No, he's taken his digging tools and a... And? and? His shotgun. Oh, I see. A little keep till morning. Night. You're not going to do anything? In my own time, in my own way. Yeah, but he was... Trust me, okay? I'll, uh, I'll give it a try. Good. Now let me rest. <laughs> Fascination of the unknown can latch onto anyone. Even a mystic like Drummaker is not immune to its gnawing persuasion. I'm not at all pleased with the situation, Drummaker. If it wasn't for your lackadaisical ways, you might have saved Dr. Wagen's life. <laughs> oh, bloody head's killing me. One question before I go into the burial ground. Yes, yes, but the sunrise is fading. Who gets the gold? All artifacts are the property of the government. But we get credit for the discovery. What they don't know won't hurt them. Meaning you're going to steal all you can carry. We found it. It's ours. Will I participate? Is that all that's bothering you? You've got a full share coming. That is, if you rid us of this death curse, or whatever it is. My share remains here. What? You can't be serious. It's millions you're throwing away. Deal? I don't understand. No need to. Deal? Deal. Break a leg. I didn't know you were showbiz. No, just an old movie freak. They were always saying something like that just before they hit the big time. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're all going to need some luck before this is over. I must have owed deed on too much rock and roll. Why else would I find myself breaking the rules of the ancients by violating their sacred ground? Well, not for that crazed cockney. Or would I? Ten years in that cave, and the first time some idiot shows up wanting something from me, I yield without any real resistance. Rock and roll has changed the very fiber of my mind. Ten years hardly made a dent in my journey out of this rock and roll world. I should have known fear by now. I'm nearly at the far end of the graves. But all I can feel is the exhilaration of the hunt. What's that? Behind me. Eyes. Eyes watching me. No, not merely watching, but following my every move. Here. Quickly now. Behind this pile of rubble, I'll set a trap. I'll myself be trapped. Gotcha. <laughs> Scared? Yeah. Good. Jimmy started drinking again. He was driving me crazy. And you think you'll be better off with me? Well, we all got to go sometime. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence. Ready? 
You're not mad at me? Waste of energy. And besides, I've always been partial to lunatics. Who are you calling a lunatic? You're the one who lives like a hermit in that cave. And now I'm beginning to understand why I am a hermit. You don't like me much, do you? I like you. I like you. Oh, that's much better, isn't it? Damn, these birds are driving... You were saying? Yeah, I got a case of the chills again. Eerie. Got to keep moving. Let's go. Nice flute. Is that all you can say? Nice flute? We'll follow the sound. Hey, it's kind of like that fairy tale. Pied Piper. I don't know whether that's good or bad. Up over this little knoll. A pyramidal structure. Oh. It's well kept, almost looks new. That's impossible. The hieroglyphic writing, bold, but impossibly different from anything I've ever seen or studied about. The motif. Serpents, I think. Yes. Feathered serpents. But of a style I've never seen before. Double doors are opening the front side of the pyramid. There's a woman. A beautiful woman dressed in gold and jade. Tassel feathers and jaguar skins. I am Wolf, keeper of the graves. Strange, one with here, one without. Buffalo people, a brother from the north. A musician and a man of some power. Here is Arthur. No, try not to stay in my mind. You'll only fail, drum maker. How did she know? The workers, Uo. Where are the workers? Enter the tomb of the serpent and see for yourself. Susan! You said I was a maniac. Lunatic. Lunatic, maniac, but I'm not stupid. Have you any choices left? The least you could do is hold my hand. Come. Do not fear this blackness, Susan. It will soon melt away. Oh, I'm walking on huge sponges. So I'm holding light. Finally light. I'm suspended in a diaphanous labyrinth. Propelled forward toward that floating tube. We're going to collide. No. It, it's turning around. And, and its mouth is a tunnel. Rolling into a tunnel. A void. An abyss. Gyrating, plunging, reeling. Descending. Beams of light, flashing colors of the rainbow. Twisted and distorted. My body folds and unfolds. Riding a kaleidoscopic vortex. A powerful burst of white light. And I'm losing it. Look at us. Look at this room. We're all in black and white. Outside there, through that opening. What is it? A, a minimal world? A geometric world? Simple line and form. Gleaming blue ground, floor. An incandescently pink sky with twin black suns. And cubes of all sizes, shapes, and colors. Oh, no, they don't. Not that again. If you want to stay in black and white... Hand. Hand. Oh, they keep shutting the damn doors behind us. The size of the pyramid we've just come out of is awesome. We can't really see the very top of it. You know what? I think it's made of solid gold. <laughs> Jimmy'd be in convulsions by now. What took you so long, friend? The doctor! Indeed, the doctor, and in the pink, I can say for myself. No sad, long face, I, Dr. Wigan. I do think you've grown attached to the place. A more than easy task, I assure you. Doctor, <gasps> why don't you show our uh, itinerant pair the sights? I wish you'd stop making entrances out of nowhere. 
so sorry, Susan. A bad habit I must work on. Help. Help. A half dozen choice dirty words I'm too low down mad to remember. Here's the fourth act of Drum Maker. I like the way you dance. <laughs> I would have never imagined that you'd care much for rock and roll. I'd have thought you'd be Mahler and Tchaikovsky. Yeah, maybe in the long run I'd prefer classical. But if my parents had been less strict and me more adventurous, I could have been a voracious groupie. Mm, everybody wants to shine. And it was a way to get in touch with a glow. My favorites were the stones and the scorpions. I played with them. Stones? No, the scorpions. Really? <laughs> I must be dreaming this. In my book, you were way up there. And 15 years later, you're running into these old rock and rollers, Jimmy and Drummaker. Jimmy would have been at the bottom of my list. List? Oh, yeah, me and my girlfriend made bliss. Oh, you know, who you'd like to date if you got the chance, etc. The bottom of the list? Okay, okay. Jimmy was near the top of the list, but he's riding the bottom now, okay? Glad to see you enjoying the facilities. <sighs> Hi. Well, once you become used to the landscape, it's very peaceful and soothing. The gods are kind to those who forsake gold, jade, and the outer worlds. An admirably pleasant place here. I congratulate the gods for their love of humankind. A paradise with a new twist, no? That jungle scene everyone talks about is such an utter bore. I'm a Virgo. I guess I'm turned on by such an economical and function-oriented use of space. Thank you. Dr. Wagen took us to see the workers from the dig. They seem quite content and have no desire to return home. No one ever leaves. We're prisoners, then? Residents. No one has ever gone back. Not because we forced them to remain here. There's free will at work here. For me, I find this place lacking something. Something I seem to need. <laughs> Dear drum maker, after all of these years, and you still don't know what your delusion is. Danger? The fine edge of danger is what you've always required. Didn't the scent of the hunt have more meaning than any of your futile and reclusive meditations? The love of danger brought you here. Can't you see it, drum maker? I've arranged a wonderful hunt for you, drum maker. It'll get the adrenaline flowing. And our warriors must keep themselves in tip-top shape, don't you know? Oh, they've got to be kidding. Jump cut back into black and white? Right into, uh, uh, what's that artist's name? Yeah, an Escher graphic. Oh, Look at the size of that critter chomping down on that unfortunate saber-toothed tiger. Barely an appetizer for the brute. Hmm. Not vegetarian, so it must be at least a Tyrannosaurus. And I've lost a dimension or two. Everything's kind of flat and one-sided, sort of like cutouts. All except for me and that creature. He sees me, and me armed only with his wooden spear. Oh, here he comes. I've got to run. Oh, no! Watch out for that foot! Damn! It feels like an earthquake every time he moves. I've got to get behind him. Yes! Then crawl up his tail. There! Up on his back! Oh, he knows I'm here. And he's trying to shake me off. I've got to, I've got to hold on! Oh, his eyes! Not much of a chance either way. But I'll jam my spear into one of his eyes. And here it goes! Oh, I can't hold on any longer! No! Oh, I'm lost! Now, wasn't that fun, drum maker? <sighs> A great sport if, if you're into being eaten alive. A pitiful story. And I thought you were tough. Tough enough. See you around. Bye. <sighs> I'm not staying, Susan. But it's perfection itself. I couldn't live any other way now that I've experienced this. No, oh, thanks. I like my chaos less organized. But I was thinking, and it, we're getting along, and... Please stay. 
despite yourself, you have these strange qualities I'm attracted to. Though I'd wish not to have admitted it. Ever elusive, aren't we? Stay with me. Best offer of the decade. But I can't. Out there, I've missed out on something important. I can't rest until I found it. Luo may try to stop you. Maybe, maybe not. Men are so stupid. Always going off to war, fighting, annihilating. And that's what you want, isn't it? If it's danger I do desire, then I must find real danger. This place is real? As real as any place. We'll probably never meet again. Here's one long-distance friend who will never forget you. Friend? Friend. All right, come to order. The council is now in session. How I abhor these emergency meetings. What is it this time around? It all began with one of these bison persons. A warrior from the north. The buffalo people of the Great Plains. And with pure intentions. Which caused an unprecedented incident. Mr. Chairman, who allowed the fellow free exit? She was obligated to have stopped him. As it is our custom... He had free will. He has knowledge of the ancients. He'll do us no harm. He could return with an army. He knows the secret of the passageway. He probably won't. But if I've misjudged the circumstances, a little action might liven up the area. Whoa, oh, keeper of the graves. Your responsibility is with us and with our system, which is paramount to all. Yes, sir. Understood. Good. Should he ever return with malice in his heart, you will destroy him. Agreed. Very good. And now, back to the game. Mr. Chairman, are we ahead? It seesaws, my child. It seesaws. <laughs> Drummaker? Oh, it's about bloody time you showed. Been here all alone. I'm about bonkers, you know. I can see by the empty gym bottles you finally ran out. Cold sober, mate. No worse for the wear and tear. You seem to have fared well. I'm ready to split the gold two ways. Right? Despicable. Susan and Dr. Wagen? Why didn't you ask after them at first sight? Dog eat dog and all that. That's where I stand. If you want the gold, you'll have to go into the burial ground and get it by yourself. Alone? But I thought we had a deal. You won't be able to take 1% of what's in there. There's that much gold. I'd be one of the richest men in the world. Maybe the richest. Sure. Just walk on in there. Fill the truck up to the brim, and you've got it all, Jimmy. Oh, come along, mate. We'll make this tiny planet our personal possession. <laughs> <laughs> when you go in, give my regards to Susan and Dr. Wagan. They're waiting for you. We'll have an empire. <laughs> yes, Jimmy. An empire is yours. There's a well-laid path through the heart of the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Follow the little knoll, and there it is. Tons of gold for the taking, Jimmy. Yes, sir. The world will know Jimmy Dan's been here. I'll be a bloody legend, won't I, Drummaker? Oh, they'll write poems and songs about you, Jimmy. Well, here's the first step into eternity. <laughs> A melodramatic line with a familiar ring to it. I never was an original drum maker. <laughs> Only the best innovator in the whole damn music business. So long, good buddy. Drum maker, you're a fool's fool. Crazy Cockney. You're going to find out them 60s trips weren't nothing like this. <laughs> Have a nice flight, space cadet. <laughs> <laughs> Super concert. Them drums of yours sure got hot. <laughs> Great way for us to end our tour. Thanks. And I'd say you horn players were symphonically nuclear. Or thereabouts. <laughs> Three-month vacation, and I'm ready for a good time. Going to take Mama and the kids fishing and hiking and all that good stuff. Mm, going to try and break 700. And that Utah Salt Flats rocket car of yours? 
All drummers are such barbarians. Yeah, and then I'm going to do Mount Everest. Swim shark-infested waters, and if I've got time, I'm going to crew on the fastest toboggan race in the world. And then what? Then what? Then I'll come back and play some more rock and roll. Mm, sounds dim-witted and perverted to me. Well, could be that death and danger are close buddies of mine. Well, maybe we play a finely tuned, intricate little game. One little mistake and poof. Poof. <laughs> The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Drum Maker, was written by Vicente Gutierrez and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Lou Horn, Carol Bilger, and Len Berman. Featured in the cast were Harold Ironforth, Louise Fitch, and William Lally. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle, John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Speed Queen, the automatic washer with a stroke of genius. It pushes more clothes through the water, pulls more water through the clothes than ever before. Get your clothes super clean. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. The Barbary Coast, that mysterious region so much talked of, yet so seldom visited, of which so much is heard, but so little seen. That sink of moral pollution whose reefs are strewn with human wrecks. The Barbary Coast, the stamping ground of murderers and cutthroats, the home of vice, the harbor of destruction, the coast on which no soft winds blow, but where rages a wild Sirocco of sin. <laughs> That's how a San Francisco newspaper described the city's most notorious district in 1869. The 1860s had seen a period of extraordinary growth take place in the city, in population, in commerce, and in importance as a seaport. But the same tide of prosperity that washed against those shores also brought with it the human flotsam of the seven seas. And as the city grew famous, so did its underworld become infamous. Murder Point, Bull Run, Motown, Dead Man's Alley. Every jack tar that ever went looking for pleasure knows the streets of the Barbary Coast. Aye, it was rough. It was a place for murder and worse. Mind you, a man had to keep a weather eye out if he went down there. As we got a saying... Many's the man that went to the coast. Many's the man that sent back his ghost. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Where No Soft Winds Blow, by Steve Sharon. Our stars, Corey Burton, John Larch, and Jack Crucian.
From the 1860s on, San Francisco's Barbary Coast District offered every variety of vice and crime imaginable. For that reason, it was the outrage of society's more respectable members, a condemnation that also made it a magnet for the curious. No, sir. The coast warrant for the weak heart, nor the gentry. But that didn't stop them lubbers from coming... All fitted out in their silk finery and such, nosing in the ports they'd be better off sailing past. Some folks never learn until it's too late. Take what happened to my young shipmate, Johnny B. Bannister! John Bannister! Hold up there! Well, now, what's this? Fuller and Hammond, <laughs> what are you two doing here in San Francisco? We might ask you the same question. Why, I, I've just been visiting the board of brokers on an errand for my father. Ah, taking advantage of all the speculation and mining stocks, eh? No, no, I, I leave that to my father. We have an agreement. He makes the money and I help him spend it. <laughs> <laughs> but surely you two didn't rush all the way from Virginia City to be duped by these disreputable stockbrokers. Oh, good Lord, no. Oh, we're on a holiday. Yes, we thought we'd have a bit of fun. I wish you'd told me. We could have made the trip together. No harm done. Now that we've found you, we can all at least have a drink together. Ah, excellent idea. I'll get us a cab. Uh, you there, Hacky? Ham and I thought we might take in a prize fight this evening. Why don't you join us, John? Watching two ruffians strike each other with bare fists is hardly my idea of excitement. Well, there's bound to be a bit of wagering. I hear both men are Irish, probably quite proficient at fisticuffs. I should imagine. No, you sure you won't change your mind? Quite sure. If I want that sort of thing, uh, I'm sure I can find it in any alley back in Virginia City. Eh, Bannister's right. There's no sense in doing something here we can just as easily do back home. We should take advantage of some of the delights that San Francisco has to offer. What about this uh, Ada Menken woman? Hmm. She's appearing at the Opera House in a play called Mazeppa. Is she the one who gallops across the stage on horseback wearing only a pair of flesh-colored tights? She is. <laughs> I hear her performance is quite... Uh, Stirring. <laughs> Scandalous is more like it. Sounds perfect. All those in favor of... Uh, I say, take a look at this. What is it, Ham? This newspaper. Someone left it on the seat. Read what it says here. Mm, see it. The Barbary Coast is the haunt of the low and vile of every kind. <laughs> the gambling houses and dance halls are thronged with riot-loving rowdies in all stages of intoxication. Here, faded women <laughs> drink vile liquor, smoke offensive tobacco, and engage in the most vulgar conduct. We warn our readers so they may keep away. Give it a wide berth as you value your life. <laughs> Disgusting. <laughs> yes, quite. Still, it does make one wonder, it's just why these pitiful creatures behave in such a degrading fashion. Hmm. An interesting question, to be sure. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Much more interesting than Mazeppa. Surely you aren't suggesting that we visit this, uh, the cesspool of sin? Oh, no, no, no. Of course not. I think what Ham meant was that it would have been interesting to see for ourselves what it's really like, but, uh, we all know that's impossible. Oh, quite impossible. Uh, we are, after all, gentlemen. Yes, we are gentlemen. Right this way, Tess. Right this way. <laughs> there, I got just what you're looking for. The pretty waiter girl. Is this off the boat from France? Uh, 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 no, thank you. Some other time, perhaps. Mm. What about you, lad? Mm. Have a drink with me, girls, eh? Give me a chance to be with a real gentleman? Uh, unhand me, sir. I, I have business elsewhere. Well, suit yourself, mate. You'll be back. My girls are the most reasonable on the coast. Dirty <laughs> little man. He soiled my coat with his foul hands. Yeah, the prize fight you were looking for. Yes, I'm not entirely sure coming down here was such a good idea. Yes, I, uh, I get the feeling every ruffian on the street is staring at us. Oh, I shouldn't worry. They wouldn't dare attack three gentlemen. No, I suppose not. I say, I could use a drink. Uh, what about... Spare two bits for a gentleman outsider. What? 
No. Oh, come on, Marty. Don't be selfish. You've got plenty of swag. Share it with someone that ain't got none. I said no. Now, go go away and leave me alone. Two bits, it's all. Just two bits. Oh, give it to him, Ham. Then he'll leave us alone. Um, he'll only spend it on cheap whiskey. And by his smell, I'd say he's had more than enough. Now, you better listen to your mighty. Are you threatening me, my good man? Why? Look out, he's got a knife. All right, get me money or I'll cut your throats. What it be? The money, of course. Here, here, take it all. There's more lots. Hey, uh, what's going on here? Jack. Jack, no, no, will you? Look, no. You baby little scut. I don't mean no harm, I swear, Jack. Trip out for a stove in that monkey scut of yours. All right, Jack, whatever you say. Now look alive, let him be quick about it. Ha, your uh, your appearance was most propitious, sir. <laughs> uh, what's that? You have my gratitude, Mr. Mr. Oh, uh, Jack the Ox, my name. Don't mind the claw. It's a wicky-looking thing, but it comes in right handy. Yes, so it would seem. You young gentlemen are a bit off course, ain't you? If you don't mind me saying so, you're like three treasure ships in these waters. Yes, I'm beginning to get that feeling myself. If you want to muck about the Barbary Coast, you'd best keep a weather eye out for bills like that or they'll have you scuttle in no time. I think we'd better return to our own uh, waters, as you put it. Yes. Yeah. yes. Let's go back to the hotel and have a drink. Oh, what I need is a nice, quiet brandy. Oh, well, if all you're looking for is a bit of peace and quiet and a drink or two, <laughs> I know just the place. <laughs> I, uh, thought you were bringing us to a nice, quiet establishment, Mr. Hook. Yeah, and so I have. It's me very own saloon. You own this place? Aye. Now down the hatch. Drink up, mates. It's all on me. Yeah. <coughs> Ooh. Ooh. That was some drink. Ooh. It's, it's going right to my head. I feel a bit dizzy. So do I. <laughs> what, uh, what did you give us? <laughs> Just a little something to take the wind out of the sails. Whiskey, brandy, gin, and laudanum. <gasps> laudanum? Don't worry, mates. You can sleep it off on the mattress in the cellar. Mattress cellar? <laughs> Aye. Didn't I tell you? You're standing on a trap door. <laughs> John Bannister and two of his friends decided to see for themselves if the Barbary Coast deserved its wild reputation. During their explorations, the three young gentlemen are lured into a waterfront saloon by the notorious Jack the Hook. Once inside, they're quickly drugged, then dropped through a trap door in the floor of the saloon. There's an unwritten law on the Barbary Coast. Any man is fair game. Man like Jack the Hook lives by them words. Many's the lad who fell into his greedy clutches and ain't come home to tell of it. Oh. Oh, my head. Where the devil? Bannister? Oh, Bannister, wake up. What? Hammond, where are we? The saloon. There was something in the drinks. Yes, and a trap door. But this isn't a basement. It looks like the hold of a ship. We must be aboard one of the vessels anchored in the harbor. My money's gone. Those dirty swine. I've been robbed. If they think they can get away with this. Oh, who's that chap next to Fuller? I didn't even notice him in this dim light. Obviously, we aren't the only ones Jack the Hook entertained this evening. You there. Are you all right? Do you hear me? I said... Why, he's nothing but a suit of clothes stuffed with straw. A dummy? Now, why would anyone... My word! What's the matter? His arm. It moved. They stuffed a couple of rats into the coat sleeves. <clears throat> Nasty little vermin. Uh... You better wake up friend Fuller and give him the bad news. Yes. Let's get off this stinking ship and get to the authorities. Fuller, wake up. Come on, come on, old boy. Look at his face. 
He seems awfully pale. Oh, come on. Help me get him up. Wait, roll him over. Uh, oh, blood. Uh, it's his head. Oh, he must have cracked it open when he fell through the trap door. He needs a doctor. You stay here. I'm going to get help. We're... We're at sea. But this is impossible. You could have fooled me, mate. What is this ship? Where is she bound? She's the Medusa, bound for China. China? But I don't want to go to China. Oh, then you shouldn't have signed on. Signed on? What are you talking about? I didn't sign anything. Oh, well, one of them, eh? I should have guessed. You ain't exactly dressed like a sailor, are you? Then you agree that there's been a mistake. Well, if there is, you made it. But you don't understand. My, my friends and I, we don't belong here. You've got to take us back to San Francisco. Oh, you hear that, lads? He wants to go back. <laughs> I demand that you put us ashore immediately. My, my friend is very ill. He must see a doctor. Oh, he ain't got no doctor. But I could have a look at your friend. I've picked up a thing or two over the years. Might be useful. Well, I'd appreciate that, uh... Pitt. Mr. Pitt. John Bannister. Are you coming? No, I want to speak to the captain. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I was you, mate. Please, sir, you just look after my friend. <laughs> ah, so you want to go back to Frisco, eh? <laughs> Put me and my friends ashore, and I'll gladly pay whatever you ask. As I told you, all my money was stolen, but you will be paid. You have my word. Your word ain't good enough. Sir, I am a gentleman. I can... And a right stupid one at that. What? You just don't get it, do you? <laughs> You've been shanghai shanghai The Medusa's bound for China, and there ain't no way off except the shark bait. But I, I told you I will pay. Money won't reap a sail or man the helm. I've got to have men to sail my ship. And you're one of them now. I'm no sailor. You're what I say you are. Jack the Hook sold me a sailor, and a sailor you'll be. You can't get away with this. <laughs> My father is a very powerful man. When he finds out what's happened, he'll have you thrown in prison with all the other scum. Hey! You and your frock coat and your fancy airs, they can't save you now, can they? Take a pardon, Captain. What is it, Mr. Pitt? I thought you'd better see this. Looks like Jack the Hook sold us a bill of goods. A dummy! You mean I paid a hundred dollars for a bundle of straw? Aye, sir. Jack outdid himself on this one. He sewed rats in the sleeves to make the dummy twitch like a real man. That thieving one-armed son of Neptune, I'll have his head for this. It serves you right. Shut up, you! <laughs> Still think your precious father can save you? Mr. Pitt, take this man up on deck and give him a taste of the last. Aye, aye, Captain. Floggy. But you can't. <laughs> take him along, Mr. Pitt. Please, Mr. Pitt. You've got to listen to me. Come on, lad. Step lively. <laughs> your captain is insane. Can't you see that? Now, turn and put your arms around the mast. My God. Stop your sniveling and listen to me. Your friend's dead. Fuller? I couldn't do nothing for him. And if you don't want to end up the same as he, you'll do exactly as I say. You understand? <laughs> yes. Now, the whole crew's going to be watching when I start cracking this cat. And I ain't going to be able to help marking this soft white back of yours. You're not? No, because the whip is soaked in gull's blood. So you make it look good, mate. When you hear that whip crack around the mast in front of you, you jump and you scream your bloody lungs out. But why are you... Hush now. Just make it look good. When I'm finished, slump to the deck and don't move until I say so. Ready? Yes. <laughs> louder, mate, louder. <laughs> Body shall be cast into the sea. Heave it over, Mr. Pitt! Aye, aye, sir. Goodbye, Fuller, old friend. All right! Hark to work, you lovers! Look alive! Stand by the helm! You there! Go off! Prepare to slack off the main sheet! The time may come when we'll envy Fuller. 
At least he's off this godforsaken ship. Not even a headstone to mark his grave. Come on, lad. You can't do him no good now. No, not now. But someday, someday I'll have my revenge. Sailing ship Medusa makes its way along the coast of California on the return voyage from China. On board is John Bannister, formerly a gentleman of leisure, now just another common sailor. At first, his heart wasn't in the sea. But once Johnny B, uh, that's what we called him, once Johnny B stopped putting on airs, he turned out to be a right fair mate. Ah. <sighs> Tis a fine night, Johnny. Aye, Mr. Pitt. A fine night indeed. Uh, just look at the sky. Not a cloud in sight. It's nothing but stars as far as the eye can see. If I climb the mast, I'll bet I could reach out and touch them. <laughs> I bet you could at that. Johnny, I'll take the helm if you like, lad. You look a bit sleepy. Well, not sleepy. Just dreamy. Ah, uh, the sea's casting her spell on you, Johnny. Once she does that, you'll never be able to leave her. Believe me, I know. Many's the time I thought about giving up the life and going ashore for good. But in the end, I always sign up for another voyage. Too much salt in your blood, eh? Partly. But then, I couldn't take the chance in them days. What do you mean? Well, you've been a good shipmate these last three years, Johnny. As good as any I ever sailed was. I reckon I can trust you. You know you can. Well, it's like this, Johnny, my lad. Some men choose to see, and some men have it chosen for them. Like when I was Shanghai. Well, I wasn't Shanghai, but I didn't have no choice either. I had to go before the mast. It was that. I'll go to prison. Hmm? I killed a man, a very rich, very powerful man. And a sea was my only escape. But surely they've forgotten by now. Oh, maybe, maybe not. But now I'm too old to start another life. Too old to leave the sea. (sighs) Your secret is safe with me, Mr. Pitt. I owe you that much, at least. You've shown me nothing but kindness since I first came aboard. (laughs) You were a worthless lubber in those early days. I felt sorry for you. Because you had hands like a woman. I did not. Oh, yeah, soft white hands and never done an honest day's work. Now look at him. You got two good fists there, hard and strong, ready to grab hold of life and ride out any storm that hits. A man needs fists like that if he's going to make his way in the world, especially if he's got revenge in his heart. Do you blame me? If I'd only lost three years of my life, I might have given up the idea. But I've lost two good friends as well. First Fuller died, and then Hammond was swept overboard during that storm off Kamchatka. Aye, that was a deadly wind, that was. It's not the storm that killed Ham. It was Jack the Hook. Or did you think I'd forgotten who put me on this hell ship? The thought of getting even with him is the only thing that's kept me alive on this voyage. Make no mistake, Mr. Pitt. I will have my revenge. Yeah, it's bad enough being on short rations without having to eat this swill. And I get my hands on that scurvy cook. And cookies to him. He serves what the captain tells him to. What's he trying to do, starve us to death? I don't know how the skipper expects us to do all that extra work he's been giving us if we don't eat proper. Oh, wait a minute, no. Most of them chores don't even need doing. They're just a waste of time and a lot of hard work. That miserable son of a sea witch. If the captain ain't careful, the Medusa's going to be a ship without a crew. Well, that's exactly what he wants. What? What do you mean? You all heard the scuttlebutt. The skipper's fixing to lay over in Frisco Bay for at least a month so the ship can be refitted. Aye, and that means we'll have a whole month to spend on the Barbary Coast before shipping out again. Don't <laughs> be a chucklehead. 
You think the captain's going to pay a month's wages just so you can drink and whore? As long as I'm signed on to this ship, I get paid. Same as if we're at sea or in dry dock. But you don't get paid if you desert. And just why would I desert? Because the food's going to get worse, and the work's going to get harder. You mean the captain's been doing these things deliberately? Aye. I've seen it before on other ships. Captain's trying to run the crew out. So he won't have to pay wages. Ah, so that's his game, eh? Well, a little bad food and extra work ain't enough to make me jump ship. Oh, you'll jump all right. If he takes away your shore liberty. What? No liberty? Oh, now, wait a minute. He can do it. He can do it if he's a mind to. You think he can stand to spend a month aboard a ship? With the lights of the Barbary Coast shining across the bay? Ah, that's a toy. Ah, Tell you if you can. Well, then you ain't human. There she is, Johnny Lad. Just look at her. San Francisco. Never did I see a more welcome sight. Ahoy, my doja! Well, here they are. What's the matter? It's only some men in small boats. What harm can they do? All the harm in the world, lad. Them's runners. The boarding house owners pay them five dollars for every man they can persuade to desert. They go with them. Gather round, blokes. Gather round. Here's all the whiskey and rum you can drink. <laughs> Give me some of that rum, mate. <laughs> Fools. What fools they are, Johnny. Can you blame them, Mr. Pitt? They're trying to drink away three years of misery. They're drinking away more than that, Johnny. As sure as I'm standing here, that liquor's been doped. By the time our mates realize what's been done to them, they'll be signed to an outboard ship. They'll be lucky if they spend 24 hours ashore, much less a month. And the captain does nothing to stop the runner? Hell, he's in cahoots with them. Ain't nothing we can do but look out for ourselves. Unless you want to spend the rest of your days at sea. No, thanks. I've taken my first and last voyage as a sailor. Them runners won't leave the ship until they get every man aboard in tow. Well, what'll we do? Well, play along with them. Pretend to get drunk and wait for my signal. <laughs> So what do you say, lads? Why don't you jump this stinking oak and come with me? Ah, I got almost $600 coming to me. If I jump ship, I'll lose all my pay. Now, don't kid yourself, mate. Your skipper's as tight-fisted as they come. You've got about as much chance of getting paid as a whale has a flying. <laughs> now, you don't want to stay here. Why, that captain's a mean one. You tell me so yourself. Ah, I hate his, his, his guts. Now, you come with me, and I'll see that you sign with a ship headed for the South Seas. A real pleasure cruise, eh? And with a kind-hearted old skipper who treats his crew proper, ah, like. that's right. A lot of good it does to jump ship if we don't have any money. I know, don't you blokes worry. I know just the place. It's a little boarding house run by a mate of mine. He has got the best whiskey and the prettiest, the most skillful women on the Barbary Coast. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, here, just take a look at these pictures. <laughs> oh, now that's the gal for me. Ah, it's all, it's all for your amusement, lads. Even if you please, just waiting for you to come and get them. Now, who's going to come with me? Into the boats, then, lads, into the boats. Now, yeah, I changed my mind. I'm going to stay aboard and get me money. Oh, yeah. Take him, boys. All right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm staying here. I tell you. Thank God. Oh, you yeah. stinking wolf, man. Use the blackjack. Oh. Now, Johnny, over the side and swim for it. All right, shut those two. Don't let him get a watch. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of Where No Soft Winds Blow. 
<laughs> Sorry, Johnny. I, 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 I ain't much of a swimmer. Oh, you should have let me drown. You should have got away while you had the chance. A man looks out for his shipmates. You taught me that. And look where it got you. Once that runner turns us over to his mate at the boarding house, you ain't got a prayer of escaping. You'll be on an outbound ship. Stop you... old man. I've heard enough of your tongue all for one day. Where are you taking us? You'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Come on, move it! That's the last boatload. Ah, oh, that's a scary-looking lot. What death ship did you pull these corpses off of? The Medusa. Ah, I'll be lucky if I can ship them. They look like they ain't that nothing in weeks. Oh, now, come on, Jack. Just count heads and give me my share. All right, y'all, line up there. One, two, three. Do you believe in fate, Mr. Pitt? What? Fate. Predestination. Everything happens for a reason. Even our being here right now. What the hell are you talking about? That man there. The one with the hook. Do you recognize him? Aye, that's... Jack the hook. Fate, Mr. Pitt. I'm going to have my revenge after all. You'll have a hell of a time getting it in this place. Try anything here. And we all get our throats cut. Oh, no. All right, just swabs. Listen here, Tommy. You'll be bunking here until I find you a berth on an outbound ship. Until then, the whiskey and women are on me. Oh. Now, before you goes into the saloon, I want you to stow any money or valuables you got in this here bag. What the devil for? So you won't get robbed. I'll lock your swag up where it'll be nice and safe. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. You're saying I don't look out for me gaff? Jack the Hook looks out for himself. How? You're the biggest thief on the coast. Huh? No. Anyone else think I'm dishonest? No. <laughs> Aye, that's it, mate. Drop it in and you can go into the cellar. <laughs> All right, now take your mate with you. Oi, that earring go? Well, you better put it where it'll be safe. Oh, uh, and your knife. Don't want to cut yourself accidental like, do you? <laughs> All right, now what are you two waiting for? But you want an invitation? Oh, well, we ain't got no money. Nothing but the shirts on our backs. Oh, is that so? All right, search him. Aye, aye, Jack. It's for your own protection, mates. You understand? Oh, aye. You, Jack the Hook? I might be. I got three whaling ships anchored off the heads, and I want to sign 90 men to sail on the morning tide. Ninety men. They're clean, Jack. What? Oh, oh, all right. You can let them in the saloon. <sighs> Do I get the crew I need or not? Well, I can't ship ninety men in one night. I got to have more notice. I'm paying one hundred dollars for each man that signs the ship's articles, and there'll be a bonus in it for you. Ah, well, uh, I can give you seventy now, and the rest in two days. Ah, won't do. I sail on the morning tide. If you can't handle it, I'll take my business someplace else. Uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, don't, don't go. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'll I, get you the men you need. You just said you couldn't ship that many men. Might. For a hundred dollars a head. And a bonus. I can do anything. Hmm. All right. Have them aboard my ships before dawn. One other thing. I. Uh, What's that? If you fail, if I miss that tide because you couldn't deliver, you're a dead man. <laughs> and just where in blazes are you going to get 19 men? I got 17 already, I tell you. Uh, all I need is another 73. Oh, what have I done? 
73. And you got to get them signed and delivered before dawn. I think my shipmate and I can be of some help. Uh, hey, uh, what's he talking about? Here, get him out of here. All right, you have it, Jack said. Suit yourself. But I know where I can lay my hands on 90 men easy. Uh, you're a liar. If I am, then you can say goodbye to $9,000 and the bonus. But if I'm telling the truth, then all it's going to cost you is our freedom. Better listen to him, mate. That's a lot of swag to pass up. Uh, but what I want to know is how come you wants to help old Jack out of a fix? What's in it for you? You were going to ship us out on those whalers as part of the crew, right? Aye. So if we want to stay ashore, we've got to find someone to take our place, right? Aye. But 90 men? You just leave that to Johnny B. and Mr. Pitt. Is it a deal? Uh, aye, it's a deal. Come on, Mr. Pitt. We've got work to do. Do you think you can trust those two lubbers? You forget. There ain't a man on the coast that's got the guts to double-cross Jack the Hook. Uh, now, what does he want us to meet him on Talbot's war for? Well, he didn't say, Jack. He didn't say. That bloke, you know, Pitt, just told me to be at the steamship Anna Marie an hour before dawn. Anna Marie? Why, that old Hulk ain't even seaworthy. How does he expect it? <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Come aboard! Come aboard! All right now, matey, what's going on here? How many is that, Mr. Pitt? That's 90, Johnny Lad. You're supposed to be hustling up sailors. Not having a wing ding aboard some broken down old steamship. Cast off, Mr. Pitt. Aye, aye. Now, tell me, what the hell's going on here? It's almost done. Where are the 90 men I'm supposed to ship? Jack, we're moving. Aye, we're going to a picnic. A picnic? By the yard arm, I'm going to rip you apart with me hook. And feed your guts to the shark. Well, what for? You've got your 90 men, haven't you? What? You can't mean these lovers. Aye. But they're all getting drunk, having a good time. Well, how do you think I got them on board? And how did you? Once the word got out that Jack the Hook had chartered the Hannah Marie for a birthday and that there would be free whiskey and rum, well, let me tell you, we had our hands full keeping the limit down to 90. You mean these are the 90 men I'm shipping? By the time we reach the whalers, they'll be sleeping like lambs. We uh, added some laudanum to the whiskey, uh, a touch I knew you'd appreciate. I. Wait a minute. I know some of these lads. There's Butcher Knife Bill and Boston Charlie. Why, these are all mates of mine. That's right. Runners, crimps, murderers, the scum of the Barbary Coast. Oh, uh, what's going on here? I ain't shipping me friends, you double cussing little... Oh. You're very handy with that blackjack, Mr. Pitt. Aye. It's amazing what you can learn on the Barbary Coast, if you've a mind to pick things up. And lying there right in front of you is numbers 89 and 90, waiting to be shipped out on the whalers. So Johnny B. got his revenge, after all. The Barbary Coast weren't so wild after that. What was 90 of the worst cutthroats runners and Shanghai artists off on whaling ships? Johnny B., he went back to Virginia City. He asked me to come with him, but like I told him, I got the sea in the blood. As for Jack the Hook, well... 
He got what was coming to him. <laughs> oh, me head. And where am I? You're aboard the Iron Castle, bound uh, for Japan on a whaling what, adventure. What? What's that? Oh, you, you're a liar. <laughs> liar, eh? See for yourself. No. Oh. oh, that scurvy rat. I'll get even with him if it's the last thing I ever do. I doubt it. Huh? You failed me, Jack. You only shipped 89 men. That's one less than I contracted for. I don't know what you're talking about. That rotten Johnny B said there was 90 men on board that steamship. Aye, but that included you. And a one-armed man is of no use to me. Hook or no hook. So you see, you forfeit everything. Huh? The $9,000. The bonus. Oh. And I'm afraid your life. Me, me life? All right. Heave away, oh. lads. No! No! I... Put me Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Where No Soft Winds Blow, was written by Steve Sharon and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Deboy. Our stars were Corey Burton, John Larch, and Jack Crucian. Featured in the cast were Robert Towers, Lou Horn, and Dawes Butler. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliot Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBR. This is Lauren Green. Tune in again next Monday for another original dramatization of America's past. How a nation began and how it grew. This is Leonard Nimoy. There was a timelessness to the country. The rolling green land and the towering trees were without age. It seemed that they had been forever and would be forever. This was a place ruled by seasons, not calendars or clocks. And the seasons were eternal. The boy was carefully keeping to the back roads and away from the more heavily traveled highways. He wore pants tucked into boots and a white cotton shirt. He had a knapsack strapped to his back and a cap pulled low on his forehead. His long, dark blonde hair reached his shoulders. His name was Davy Skinner. As he cautiously crossed the countryside, he often glanced behind him as if he knew that he was being followed. To the pastoral serenity, his lone and weary figure brought a sense of apprehension of escape and pursuit. Davy Skinner was escaping, bound for a strange and foreign place. But before he arrived there, he would have to travel the landscape of his soul. If he felt he was being pursued, the truth was that he was only chasing after himself. He stopped for a moment 
and leaned against the split rail fence. He was tired, bone weary. He'd been on the road since early morning, and by the lengthening shadows and the lowering sun, Davy knew the day to be nearly done. He was wondering where he could sleep tonight, feeling that he could easily lie down on this very spot when the sound of approaching footsteps jolted him. With his heart pounding, Davy watched the man come toward him. And as he neared, Davy could begin to make out his face, a hard and weathered face. His huge hands hung gnarled from the sleeves of his red flannel shirt. Clearly, the man had spent all his days in the wind and the sun, laboring in the fields. Davy recognized him as a farmer and a stranger. His heartbeat began to return to normal. Hello there. Evening. Uh, that fork in the road just ahead, I turn left to go north, don't I? North, you say? Yes, sir, north. Left. Yeah, thank you, sir. And a good evening to you. The farmer passed on without another word. He hadn't even slowed his steps. He had barely looked at Davy. The man's lack of friendly interest or curiosity was strangely soothing to the boy. He leaned back in relief against the fence and watched him move down the shadow-patched road. He was thinking that this was the usual roadside encounter and that he would never see the grim-faced farmer again. But Davy Skinner was wrong. Their paths were destined to cross once more. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Davy Skinner's War by Pamela Russell. Our stars, Tommy Cook and Joan McCall. It was dusk, and the night was coming on fast when Davy Skinner sneaked into the large red barn. He looked around the dark interior, making sure it was deserted, and then he quickly climbed up into the loft and collapsed in the hay. He was tired and hungry. His stomach rumbled, but his eyes were heavy and closing. Fatigue won out over hunger. He dropped off to sleep, but was awakened after only a few minutes by shouts and running footsteps. A man and a girl had entered the barn. Davy couldn't see the man's face, but he knew the voice. It was the farmer he had met on the road. Davy had unknowingly found his way to his farm. He listened to the angry exchange going on below him. Don't you never try to run from me, Faith Hobart. You're a worthless, lazy girl. Pa, I'm sorry about supper. Clara was burning on the stove. You with your face stuck in a book. Well, I guess I just forgot the time. I'm sorry. I ought to wail the blazes out of you. But that just don't do no good with you. Nothing does. Just a lazy, worthless girl. That's all you are. Well, you see this here book of yours? I'm going to burn it. Just like you burned my supper. Please, Pa, please don't. Burn it, I will. In every other book in the house except the Bible... The holy book's the only one there need be in a God-fearing house. I promise, Pa, I'll never burn supper again. Only please, please, let me have my book back. No! No more books for you. They put wrong ideas in your head. I'm going to burn them all. Do you hear me? No! Don't you ever do that again, girl. I say what's what around here. You do what I say or you'll be mighty sorry. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you? Yes, Pa. Tomorrow, girl, you better do right. You have the cows milked, the eggs gathered, the chickens fed, my breakfast fixed by son of. And if you're lolling around past dawn, you'll regret it. Do you hear me? Yes, Pa. Don't cry. Who's that up there? Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. My name's Davy Skinner. Oh, don't don't be scared. I mean you no harm. I had no place to go. 
I was going to sleep in your barn tonight. Is that all right, Faith? Oh, Faith is your name, isn't it? Yes, that's my name. Paul wouldn't like you staying here. Are you going to tell him about me? No, I guess not. How is it you have no place to go? What? Just don't, that's all. What are you running from? Oh, nothing. Looks to me like you're running. Oh, I'm not. Uh, I'm standing still right here in front of you, Faith. <laughs> I guess you are at that. Right now you are. Is your father always that way to you? What way? So mean. Yes, he's a mean man. But he's my pa. What can I do? I don't know. Run off like you, maybe? Yeah, I, I told you, I, I'm not running. And I say you are. How many days have you been on the run, Davy? Or is it weeks? You're not talking. Are you hungry? No. Well, your stomach's talking, even if you're not. It says you're hungry. All right. I haven't eaten since yesterday morning. What if I brought you something? Aren't you afraid your father might see you doing it? No. The sun's gone down. That means it's time to go to sleep. I don't believe Pa's ever seen the stars in the sky. I'll bet that man doesn't even know what the moon is. Will he really burn your books? Probably already has, the ones he could find. I hide them. He'll never find all of them. You love books, don't you? I do. They're my way of running off. I know I'm not really going anywhere, but for a little while I can feel like I'm gone. Gone to all kinds of wonderful, faraway places. Maybe someday I really will run, like you are. I told you, I, I'm I not... I know, you're not running. You sure won't be if you don't get something to eat soon. I'll see what I can find in the kitchen. There's not much. I guess you might have heard I burned supper. Faith. Yes? I don't know how anybody could be mean to you. Well, Paul finds it very easy. Of course, he likes to drown kittens and shoot deer. The more helpless the creature, the better he likes it. I'll be right back, Davy. Be careful, Faith. Don't wake him. I wander in the night all the time. I don't have to be careful not to wake him. What I have to be careful of is not becoming like him and then killing him in his sleep. I'll be back. The sky was barely blue. To the east, there was a rosy glow that hinted of sunrise. But Davy Skinner looked from the high barn window to the north. North was his destination. There was his refuge. He hurriedly strapped on his knapsack and came stealthily down from the loft. He was almost out the door when he heard her speak. You weren't even going to say goodbye? Faith? Over here, by the stalls. Oh, I wanted to say goodbye and to thank you for the food, too, but I, I didn't know where to find you. Well, here I am. Oh, thank you, Faith. And goodbye. That rooster runs fast, you know. It's not as late as he says. It's late enough. I should have been gone by now. Don't go just yet. Stay a few minutes longer. Have you ever seen a girl milk a cow? I've never seen anyone milk a cow. I'm a city boy. What city? May I ask you that? New York. You live in New York? I did. I've been there only once. Awfully fast and furious, but I liked it. So did I. Then why did you leave? I had to. You shouldn't be afraid to talk to me. You can tell me anything, Davy. I won't repeat it. I have no one to talk to. N no one at all? No. Well, where's your mother? She died when I was a little girl. Oh, sorry. I don't remember her. I wish I did. Andrew remembers her. He used to tell me wonderful stories about her. I think he made them up sometimes, just so I'd have a mother. Something of a mother, anyway. Well, who, who's Andrew? <laughs> I forget that we're strangers, Davy. You don't seem a stranger to me. Andrew is my big brother. Big. Oh, he's a beanpole, tall and skinny. He's just skin and bones, that boy. Six feet two and 140 pounds. But maybe he's put on weight in the army. I don't know. It seems like I never hear from him. A letter once in a while. Not enough. You miss him. So much. He's the only reason I stay here. 
I'm just waiting for him to come home. Then we can leave together. Oh, Faith, I have to go. I know you do. This is going to sound kind of crazy. I don't even really know you. Yes, you do, Davy. I hate to leave you here. I'll be all right. I'll manage until Andrew comes. I hope he comes soon. So do I. But you never know about wars, how long they'll go on. And why they begin in the first place. I guess people just can't get along with one another. So they blow each other to bits. Davy, I have you... to go. Tell me at least which way you're headed. At least tell me that, if nothing else. I'd like to be able to tell you everything, but I can't. All right, but which way are you going? North. The old mill road would be best. It's not used much anymore, and you don't want to be seen, do you? You know I don't. Cut across the pasture. You'll come right to it. Faith, I, I don't know what to say. Tonight I'll wish on the North Star for you. What will you wish? That you arrive safely where you're going. That you find what you want there. Maybe someday I'll be able to come home again. If that happens, you'll be the first one that I... Me. Hey. Go, Davy, quickly through the window. Remember, across the pasture to the mill road. Goodbye, Faith. Goodbye. Faith! Faith! He's coming. Run, Davy, run! high overhead. Davy was resting under a dusty-leaved tree by the roadside, eating the last of the bread and jam that Faith had given him. He couldn't stop thinking of Faith, couldn't stop seeing her face as she said goodbye to him. Davy squinted and made out the figure of a man far down the road. As the man came closer, Davy saw that he wore a uniform, and closer still, that he had only one arm. When he was almost even with him, Davy spoke. Hello. Oh. Hot one today. Sure is. I have some water here if you'd like some. I would, thanks. I didn't expect to see anybody on this old road. Nobody uses it much anymore. So I was told. You're not from around these parts, are you? No, I'm not. I didn't think so. I've lived here all my life, and I know most of the faces. Of course, I've been away for a while. You thinking of settling here? No. Well, you might think twice about that. This is a real pretty place. I know I'm awful glad to be home. Been home long? No, about two days now. Out getting reacquainted. Yeah, huh? you might say that. Then I get restless, too. Folks always trying to do for me, fussing around me. Not that I'm complaining, but sometimes I feel like I'm going to jump right out of my skin. It used to be all that I could think about, getting home again. But it's hard coming back. I guess it would be. You see, they're all the same, just the same. And I'm different now. I can't seem to light anywhere, you know. I'm always expecting to hear shelling or a gunfire start up. I can't explain it to them the way I feel. Uh, maybe I should have waited a little longer, but I, I was so anxious to get home. I came direct from the hospital. It's all right, you know. Uh, what's that? You, you were looking at my arm just now, where my arm used to be. It's all right. Don't feel bad about it. Everybody does it. It's just human nature. I guess you'd like to know how it happened. Most everybody's dying to know, but they won't ask. I can see the questions in their eyes, and they, they look away pretending like nothing's happened. But something has. I wish they'd just see me as I am and speak up. Uh, how did it happen? Well, there was hard fighting, close in. It was night. The sky was all black and red, lit up like hell. It was it was fiery and smoky. All of a sudden, there was an explosion right in front of me. I saw my friend beside me fly up into the air, and I felt this awful pain in my chest and arm. But I was lucky. They got me to the hospital right away. My friend was dead. I could have died, should have died, but they saved me. That hospital. <laughs> I'll never forget it. There's doctors running around crazy like all covered in blood. Put me in mind of hog butchering on the farm. 
And that's where they took it from me. My arm. I had it still when I got there. I, I know that it could, I did because it, it hurt so bad. It was there in the hospital that they cut it off. But I was lucky. I guess you were. Thanks for asking. Thank you for listening. My folks, they won't ask. And even if they did, I'm not sure I could tell them. I don't know why I could tell you, except maybe because I, I know I'll never see you again. Well, I should be getting on home. Uh, are you sorry that you went to fight? No, I'm not sorry. I miss my arm something awful. I, I don't feel right anymore, kind of off balance all the time. There's so many things I can't do, little things like, like pulling on my boots and cutting up my food. I find everything takes two hands now that I only have one. But it was my duty to go. It had to be done. Nothing else to do. Would you ever tell someone else that they should go? You mean, would I tell you that you should? Yes. I don't think I could do that. It's every man's decision to make on his own. But, but... What if it's taken out of your hands, the decision made for you? What then? You've been drafted? Yes. And you don't want to go? I don't think so. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. Why don't you ask me for a couple of dollars or directions to curry, though? That'd be easy enough, but don't ask me whether you should go to war or not. I can't tell you. I went. I'm glad I went, but I'm not you. Well, thanks for the water. You're welcome. Bye now. Goodbye. Oh, and good luck to you. I'm a lucky man. I've come home again. And I may never see home again. Goodbye. <laughs> Faith, what are you doing here? I followed you. I started about three hours after you left. But, but how? I told you that I wandered in the night. I've come almost this far before. I know the land and I prayed. Prayed that I would find you. What happened? Why have you done this? A letter came early this morning after you'd gone. A letter? Yes. Oh, from Andrew. No, about Andrew. He's dead, Davy. Andrew's dead. Faith, don't cry. Please, don't cry. I, I, I don't know what to do when you cry. Maybe you should cry. Does it make it any better? It can sometimes. This time I don't think anything will make it better. Davy, don't you ever cry. Oh, men don't cry. Why, Davy? Why did it happen? Why did he have to die? Why, Andrew? I don't know. It's one of the rules. Rules? Men don't cry. Men go off to war, kill or be killed. Women wait for them to come home, and when they don't, women cry. You're thinking that I shouldn't have come after you, aren't you? You're, you're, you're not thinking too clearly right now. I know that much. Why do you say that? You're all torn up over your brother. You've, you've just gone off wild. I know how it is to blindly run, run as hard as you can. But look at you. You didn't bring a thing with you. There wasn't anything from that place that I wanted to take with me. I am thinking clearly. I was right to go. I know you truly believe that, but I don't know how you can. You don't know anything about me, Faith. Where I'm going or, or why. I don't care. All I know is that there's nothing for me on that farm anymore. I had to leave. And when I thought of where I could go, the only direction that came to me was north. North to find you. Davy, tell me something. What? This morning, didn't you want to take me with you? Didn't you nearly ask me? I, I thought you wanted to. Was I wrong? No, you weren't wrong. I came so close to asking. Why didn't you? I had no right to ask you. You knew how it was with me. You guessed from the very first. I, I'm running. Now I am, too. Faith, if I could take you somewhere, I'd ask. But I, I, I'm just running away. I have no idea what I'm running toward. It's, 
It's only a vague destination, a place I've never been before. But I think it's the only place I can go now. What are you running away from, Davy? Do you really want to know? Yes. I, I don't think you do. You're frightening me. Is it very bad? I'm running away from the war that your brother just died fighting. Is that bad enough? I don't know. I'm so confused. I don't know if it's bad or not. I wish Andrew had run and not died. But he wanted to go. Is it wrong that you don't? I, I don't know. Neither do I. North. That's why you're going north. You're leaving the country. You're going to Canada. Yes. Do you still want to come with me? Don't, don't you hate me now? Don't you think that I'm a... A yellow sneaking coward? I don't know if I can go with you. But I know that I don't hate you. I love you, Davy. How can you love me? I do, that's all. And I love you. I want you to know, Faith, that I'm not afraid to fight. I don't think that I'm even afraid to die. What really scares me is that it it wouldn't mean anything if I did. It wouldn't change anything, my fighting or dying. You think that Andrew died for nothing then? Well, what do you think he died for? Something that he believed in. He died for his country. But what does it mean to die for your country? I want to know. Well, what does that mean? It means that... It means that my brother is dead. He was 20 years old. His birthday was the seventh of this month, and you'll never have another. His favorite color was blue, the color of his eyes. And when he got excited, he'd stammer. And he could whistle like a bird. I've seen wild squirrels and raccoons eat from his hand. And he died for his country. I met a soldier on the road today. He'd lost his arm. You know what he told me? What? That he'd done his duty, and that he was a lucky man. As long as we can think that it's our duty to be dismembered and that we're lucky to be allowed to live, I don't see the war ending. Is that the payment for citizenship? Your arm? Your life? Maybe. I can't think about it anymore. It's all spinning around in my head and none of it makes any sense. I ache for wanting Andrew alive and here with me, but he never will be again. Davy... I wanted to ask you this last night, but I couldn't. Tonight I can't. What is it? Hold me. Hold me until it's light, Davy. Don't let me go. Here's the fourth act of Davy Skinner's War. It was light, well past dawn, but Davy and Faith slept on, exhausted, side by side in the open field. The beauty and innocence of their shared slumber was lost on the man who stood over them with a shotgun. Davy opened his eyes to its long, dark barrel. This is my property. Well, we weren't hurting anything. We were just trying to get some sleep. Don't tell me. I know what you've been doing. Faith, wake up. Don't you be coming at me. Yeah, No, I'm not. Please don't point that gun at me. It's my gun, and I'll point it wherever and at whoever I want to. What is it? What's wrong? Shame on you, girl. Shame. What's happened? You've been caught. That's what. Caught? Caught sleeping. That's not all there was to it. Girl, you look familiar. He don't, but you do. You live around here? No. I think you do. Your folks might like to know what you two have been doing. We haven't been doing anything but sleeping. Whatever else that's been going on has been going on in your evil mind. Hold on there. You better watch yourself, boy. Davy, please. We just fell asleep, sir. That's all. We're awfully sorry if we disturbed you in any way. Are you a local girl? No, I'm not. You sure look familiar We're to just me. traveling through. Just traveling through. I don't know what's got into you young'uns these days, traveling through. Always on the go. You're moving too fast. You ain't satisfied with nothing. Nothing's good enough for you, is it? Wait, is it a crime to want to change things? Maybe nothing is good enough. If you'd let us, maybe we could make it better. Davy, 
Well, I know I should shut my mouth. He's not hearing me anyway. I hear you, boy, and you make me sick. Roaming around from place to place, sleeping on other people's property, not a cent in your pocket, dragging this little girl along with you, and you're going to change the world? Maybe. You better get a haircut and settle down, boy. You're not going to change nothing. Only you'll change. Get smart, maybe, and stop trying to make things any different than what they always been. Now, I want you off my land, and I want you off fast. Next thing I know, you'll be begging for food or stealing it. I don't beg, and I'm not a thief. I say you're a liar and a beggar and a thief. Baby, don't. You better listen to her, boy. I got this gun aimed right at your chest, and I'd dearly love to use it. Now, I'm sure you would. Get going. And you, girl, I don't know where your home is, but you better hightail it back there. You're headed for trouble with this one. He's real trouble, I'm warning you. Now, get off my land. Huh. Friendly people around here. You knew you were making him mad, but you just kept on. You have to learn how to handle people like that. You don't want to rile them. I do. They need riling. His gun, his land, his world. Did you hear him? Self-righteous and narrow He might have shot you. I guess if I'd let you do it your way, he might have fed his breakfast. He might have. Well, I'd have choked on his breakfast. You were ready to fight him. Well, you sound surprised. You do think I'm a coward. As much as you may think you hate war, as much as you're mourning your brother and, and you say you wished he'd run rather than fought, there's some part of you, Faith, that thinks I'm a coward for running. There's something inside of you that believes I should go back and fight. You're talking more to yourself than to me, Davy. There's something inside you that believes that. That's the war you're fighting right now, Davy Skinner's war. But how do I win? What should I do? I don't know. But as much as I love you, and I do so much, I can't go to Canada with you. I know. Where will you go now? I can't go back to Pa. I have no place to go. I can't just leave you like this. We're close to a town called Curryville. Do you know anyone there? No, no one. Wait, did you say Curryville? Yes. Curryville. Why do I know that name? Curryville. Andrew used to tell me how Mother would take us to visit her father's farm outside Curryville. Grandpa Willie. I, I can almost remember. He lived in a funny old tumble-down house, and there were fields of flowers, yellow, blue, and white. Do you think he's still there? I don't know. It may have all been one of Andrew's stories or a dream. Even if it was true, that was nearly 20 years ago. What was your mother's maiden name? Vandermeer. Well, we'll go to Curryville and we'll ask if there's a William Vandermeer who has a farm nearby. You don't have to go with me, Davy. Yes, I do. But what if... We're going. Come on. Now, let's see. The woman said we were to cross the bridge and veer to the right. <laughs> so strange, Davy. I feel as if I remember, but I'm not sure if I only remember what Andrew told me or if I remember being here. There's something, I, I, I don't know, something different about this place. It's out of a fairy tale. It's enchanted. Do you feel that? Yes. <laughs> and I thought that the woman looked at us strangely when we asked her about Grandpa Willie. She seemed to know of him. Her directions were clear enough. It was just the way she looked. Davy, this is it. There's the house and the flowers. This is it. Just the way Andrew said. Look, on the porch is Grandpa Willie. I remember him. Not what Andrew told me about him, but him. You go with him, Faith. I'll wait here. No, no, I want you with me. A good day to you. Hello. If you have a thirst, the well is right there. The dipper's on the... Rachel? Rachel, is that you? It's Faith, Grandpa Willie. Rachel's little girl. Faith, you are the image of your mother, of Rachel. I thought for a moment that my dear darling had come for me, that my Rachel had come to take me with her. An old man's dreams. Oh, Faith, come closer, child. I, I haven't seen you since you were a babe in your mother's arms. Grandpa Willie, I do remember you. Come and sit beside me. Who's the lad? Who is your friend? This is Davy Skinner. Davy, sit down a minute with us. 
Davy brought me here. If it hadn't been for him, I don't think I would have come. I thank you for bringing faith to me, Davy. Come and sit. I can't. I, I really have to be going. The road is a long and a hot one. Can't I tempt you with the shade of the porch here and some cool well water? Please, Davy, stay for just a little. But not long, Faith. You know I have to go. I know. Where are you so eager to get to, Davy? I have to be on the road, that's all. Not getting anywhere but just going. Yes. Grandpa Willie, why has it been so long since I've seen you? <laughs> it was your father, Faith. We never got on well together. I think that Rachel saw something in him that no one else could. I couldn't see it. And with Rachel gone, he got worse and worse. Oh, I wanted so much to see you and Andrew. But he wouldn't allow it. How is Andrew? He's dead, Grandpa. Oh, no. He was killed in the war. It only happened a few days ago. In a way, that's why I'm here. The war. No matter how far you think you are from it, it reaches out and touches you. It's always there waiting. Everyone has his war. I had mine. One's the same as another. War's war. You may be right, Davy. All war is the same in devastation and horror. That's true, but there's the good bite and the bad, I think. To fight a war is a terrible thing, but sometimes it's more terrible not to fight. What do you mean? When I was a soldier, I was fighting to defend my country from things that I thought were evil. I thought we'd worked so hard to make this country what it was, and it was being threatened. By going and fighting, and a lot of others doing the same, I am here now, an old man with his flowers and his animals, living the life I wanted. If I hadn't gone, I, I don't know that I'd have this now. It might be a different world where people like me weren't allowed, or people like you, Davy. You think to have peace, there must be war? Sometimes. There have been wars that I wouldn't have fought, Davy. I was spared because I was too old. But I don't think I would have fought the war that broke out years after my war. That one was a bully's war, one of greed and conquest. In good conscience, I don't think I could have gone to that one. You would have run away then and risked being called a coward and a traitor. Is that what you're doing? Yes. I don't believe in war. Wars don't end war. No, they don't. But they do stop some things. Sometimes you have to fight for the right not to. Are you saying that I shouldn't run away? I'm saying there are times to run and times to stand and fight, and only you, Davy, can decide which you will do. Grandpa, may I stay here with you? Oh, nothing could make me any happier, Faith. I, uh, <clears throat> I have a little mare about to fall. She's young. This is her first, and I'm a little worried. I'm, I'm going to go and see to her. He knew we wanted to be alone. He seems to know everything without being told anything. Do I have to say goodbye to you now, Davy? I'm not going to Canada. You were right about me fighting with myself. I've been trying to get someone else to make the decision for me, tell me the right thing to do. I still don't believe in war. But I cannot run away from your brother or that one-armed soldier, or what Grandpa Willie said. Sometimes, I guess you do have to fight for the right not to. I'm going back. I want you to, Davy, and I don't. There's something I want to do before I go. What's that? Will you marry me, Faith? Yes, I'll marry you. And when the war is over, we're going to have the life we want together. Davy Skinner went off to war, he and Faith were married. Faith remained with her grandpa, Willie. The war dragged on and on. But one early spring, hopes were raised that it soon would end. Faith wrote to Davy of these hopes and others. My dearest Davy, 
Everything is much the same here, except that our baby boy grows bigger every day. And Grandpa Willie's flowers have begun to bloom. It's a beautiful spring, made even more beautiful by the prospect of peace. We hear from everyone that the war is nearly over. I cannot quite believe that I may be able soon to count the days until I see you. I have found a name for our son. I call him Andrew. Do you like it? I hope so. Davy, I know that you did the right thing by going. I feel sure that this war will truly be the last. The cost of it has been so enormous, I cannot imagine that it could ever, ever happen again. You have helped to win this war, overcoming great doubts and grave misgivings to earn your peace. I am so proud of you. I long for you, cannot wait for your return. Grandpa sends his love. Andrew is eager to see his father. Come home to us soon. Ever yours, Faith. Three days before the surrender at Appomattox, Corporal Davy Skinner was killed in one of the last battles of a civil war at Sailor's Creek in Virginia. His son, Andrew Skinner, fought in the Philippines in the Spanish-American War. His son, Lieutenant David William Skinner, was blinded at San Miel in France in World War I. His son, Sergeant Bill Skinner, was decorated for bravery on Guadalcanal in the Solomons in World War II and served again in Korea. His son, Corporal Davy Skinner, was killed near Saigon, one of the last American casualties of the Vietnam War. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Davy Skinner's War, was written by Pamela Russell and produced and directed by Livia Granito. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Tommy Cook and Joan McCall. Featured in the cast were Tyler McVeigh, Robert Towers, Howard Culver, and Parley Bear. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by the King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. Its unique bonded construction assures comfort and durability year after year. The King Coil Posture Bond Mattress. This is Lorne Green, inviting you to join us again next Monday when I'll bring you another original drama about the American West. This is Leonard Nimoy. Most of us, I dare say, have a reasonably healthy love of adventure. We like to do new things and visit unfamiliar places. We don't even mind taking a little bit of a risk now and then. All within reason, of course. To truly wager life and limb in pursuit of adventure is only for the very few. Rarer still is that breed of person who cannot resist setting forth even though he knows the outcome is almost certain to be death. But there are circumstances so enticing that even we ordinary people might be willing to risk everything. I'm telling you, it's out there, Chester. I'm sorry, Ernie. But there's the proof right there in front of you. What more do you want? I'm not going to help you. We'll be millionaires. We'll be set for life. Yeah, that's just what I'm thinking of, pal. 
My life. What's happened to you anyway? In the old days, you were never afraid of a little risk. Look, just, just chalk it up to failure of nerve and let it go at that, okay, okay? But it's out there, Chet. We know it's out there and we know exactly where to go to look for it. All we have to do is dig it up. Legends of buried treasure have always exercised a strong pull on our imaginations. We know there are still hordes of untold wealth. The historical record tells us they exist, if only we knew where to look. Our tale is about three people who think they know exactly where to look for one of the greatest treasures of all time, Captain Kidd's. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Treasure of Grand Caicos by Percy Granger. Our stars, Tom Brown, Vic Perrin, and Jim Mapp. There is an elite breed of person, the professional adventurer the soldier of fortune who will routinely risk their lives in hope of gain. The rest of us are all content to sit back and read about their exploits in the papers. But we are all susceptible to the fever of the hunt. And when that fever strikes, it can become an obsession that will give us no rest. Listen now to one of the strangest tales of modern times. My name is Chester Dawson. I guess you're going to have to call me a drifter now, but once I was half-owner of a charter fishing boat in the Florida Keys. The story I'm about to tell concerns my former partner, Ernie Chowders. It happened five years ago, but even now I still can't believe it. it began a little street cafe in a small town on an island in the Caribbean. And like now, I was drifting. I hadn't seen Ernie in several years. Chester... Chester, is that you? <laughs> Ernie. <laughs> Ernie, what are you doing way out here? <laughs> I could ask you the same question. Uh, are you still hiring out the lazy sailor? Oh, oh, yeah, we still got the boat. And Tom's still in you, huh? Uh, still the first mate and <laughs> yeah. chief bottle washer. Lazy Sally wouldn't be the same without Tom. A couple of years ago, we had a good season. I was going to buy a new boat, uh-huh. and Tom wouldn't hear of it. He said it'd be bad luck if we ever sailed another boat. <laughs> Still as superstitious as ever, huh? <laughs> no, that always bothered you, didn't it? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so, what are you doing here? There can't be many wealthy fishermen in a small port like this. Well, it's uh, part of the Caribbean I hadn't seen before. You know me, turning a buck never did matter that much. I <laughs> know, that's why we dissolved the partnership. So, how's it work for you? You a millionaire yet? Well, I kept myself from starving. But uh, you could be doing better. <laughs> Who couldn't? <laughs> Look, Chet, why don't you come down to the harbor? Say hi to old Tom. See the boat. Maybe we'll have something to talk about, okay? Ernie, you, uh, you ain't in any kind of trouble, are you? Why do you say that? Huh? No, I, I just seem a little jumpy. Look, look, there she is. <laughs> yeah. Come on aboard. Tom, come up topside and look who I got with me. Want to be ready in a minute, Mr. Chowders? Well, set another place. Come on up here. Look who I got with me. <laughs> Mr. Dawson. Yeah, how are you, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'm all right. Maybe a little more water long than before. <laughs> and how's the old boat running? Uh, she stays afloat. Mr. Charters wanted to scuttle her a few years back. I told him to just be asking for trouble. <laughs> uh, you want to go out for a spin after lunch, Chet, for old time's sake? Oh, I'd like that, Ernie. Yeah, I think I'd like that a lot. Good. Why don't you walk around a bit? Get your sea legs back. Did you tell him, Mr. Charters? No, no, I uh, haven't had a chance yet. Oh, don't you think you ought to? 
Maybe you won't want to come if he knows what we'll do. There is no risk. You know that. We don't have to worry as long as we don't find anything. It's a fact I'll feel easier with another person along. You think he still carries that pistol? Shh, shh, shh. Here he comes. Get below and make lunch. Okay, but you tell him, Mr. Charles. The whole truth is your friend. So, what do you think? Still the same old lazy Sally, huh? Yeah, could give us a few repairs, don't you think? Well, maybe here and there. Uh, a new coat of paint? How do you expect to drum up business if she's not looking her best? Chet, Tom and I, we aren't in the charter business anymore. Oh? You're not into something illegal, are you? No, no, no. It's nothing like that. Uh, well, what is it? You ever hear of Cacus Island? Uh, it's on the tail end of the Bahamas, isn't it? That's right. It's across less than a hundred miles of open water from this port. Entirely uninhabited. Huh? So? You ever hear of the Quida merchant? Oh. How about Captain Kidd? Ca- Captain Kidd? Chet, the Quida merchant was a ship he captured nearly three centuries ago. On board, he found what was reputed to be the single richest prize ever taken by a pirate on the Spanish main. Gold coins, ingots of silver, jewels. It's an unbelievable treasure. Oh. Which he supposedly buried on Caicos Island? Not supposedly. He did. He buried it there before he returned to New York to stand trial. He thought he could clear himself and return for it, but he never did because he was sent to England and executed. Oh, Ernie, Ernie. They claim this treasure buried on half the islands in the Caribbean. But it's known for a fact. Kid buried this treasure on Caicos. He left a map carved in one of the rocks around the island. No one's ever been able to find it, but if we could, we'd be rich. Huh? Uh, this is why the lazy Sally needs a new coat of paint. Huh? We've been making a methodical search, one section of the shoreline at a time. This could be the day, Chester. There's only a small strip of beach on the leeward side we still haven't explored. What do you say? <laughs> well, I think I've had it with wild cards and long shots. Oh, this is no long shot. I've it's heard really that there. Story before, and it's a legend like all the others. There's no proof he actually buried his treasure there. What if I had proof, Chet? What if I could show you proof that it is there? What would you say then? The lure of fabulous wealth, as ancient a dream as history itself. El Dorado, King Solomon's Mines, the treasure of Montezuma and the lost booty of the pirates of the Spanish main. Imagine that such a fortune were within your reach. I tell you, Chet, I've got proof. Here, here, look at this. What is it? A Spanish doubloon, pure silver. I found it on Cacus the first time I went there. All right, all right, but how do you know this is part of Kid's treasure? Ah, look here. You see the imprint? You see these numbers down at the bottom? Yeah. It's like a serial number. I wrote to the National Archives in Madrid and got a copy of the Quida Merchant's Manifest, and there it was. The numbers on this coin match the manifest. This coin came from the ship that Kid plundered. National Archives Manifest? <laughs> You've really gotten into this, haven't you? Because it's really there. So what do you say? You want us to cut you in? What's the catch? Well, there is no catch. They say, Captain Kidd, vault from the gallows that he'd come back and keep watch over that treasure. Will you shut up with your damn superstition? Oh, come on, come on, Larry. Come on, take it easy. Easy now. All right. Well, Chet, you ain't got nothing else going for you, have you? No. All right, I'll come. Just for the ride, Ernie. Just for the lazy Sally. We always come at low tide uh, so we can examine the whole beach. Uh, Ernie, Ernie, this is hopeless. Uh, the thousands of rocks. No wonder the treasure is safe, even if the map does exist. Uh, I've only got a few more yards to uh, cover. Now, well, how come Tom stays on the boat? Wouldn't it go faster if he helped? Well, he's a kind of lookout. Lookout? Why? Mr. Tyler! <laughs> It's here! Oh, damnation, not again! What's here? Mr. Chowder! Oh, we gotta get back to the boat. Quick! Over there, to the left, Mr. Chowders. Focus the glass on the horizon. 
I don't understand it. Every time. How do they know? How does who know? Hey, hey, hey Tom, Tom, what, what's going on? Mr. Charters didn't tell you? No, but someone better. Are we in danger? Ah, uh, they must have spies everywhere. Who must? Here's the binoculars. Look for yourself. Huh. Looks like the mast of a boat. It's a yacht. She's high speed and heavily armed. Yeah? Who owns it? It belongs to a syndicate. Big people. They're headquartered down the coast from Monte Cristi, the port we put out of. Well, who are these people? Well, nobody's ever seen them. But they know the legend of Cacus, too. They tail every boat that comes out here, and they sit out there just over the horizon and wait. Oh, I see. And if the treasure is ever found, they sweep down, take it, and most likely kill whoever had the misfortune to discover it. <laughs> so that's why you were so anxious to cut me in. Oh, I thought maybe with you along, I wouldn't lose my nerve. Chad. Tom, you start up the engine and get us out of here. I left the port of Monte Cristi that same night, and I didn't see Ernie or Tom again for a long time. And when I had to pass through Monte Cristi again on my way back to the States, I, I was still angry. I decided not to see them. Assuming they were even still there. But something made me linger. Mr. Dawson? Oh, hello, Tom. I thought that was you. Yeah, well, I'm just passing through. I guess I couldn't blame you much for not coming down to the Lazy Sally. It wasn't right of Mr. Charters not to tell you the whole story. And have you found the treasure yet? No. That trip we made with you, uh, it was the last one. Then why are you still here? Mr. Dawson, I, I wouldn't blame you if you said no. But I think you ought to go see Mr. Chowders. Why? Something terrible has happened. He hasn't left the boat for three months. He's in a bad way. Why? What happened? It was that day we went out to Caicos. The day you came with us. I went with Tom down to the harbor. When I saw the lazy Sally, I was startled by her appearance. She'd assumed the aspect of a ghost ship. If I'd been superstitious or even smart, I'd have taken that as a warning, but I didn't. But the change in the boat surprised me. There was nothing compared to the change in Ernie. He's down below, Mr. Dawson, in the cabin. He doesn't even come up on deck. Just stays in there with the portholes closed and the blinds pulled shut tight. Uh, who's there? Tom, is that you? No, it's me, Ernie. Chester? Yeah. Oh, Ernie, it's stifling in here. Why don't you open some portholes? No, no. No, they might see in. Who might? The syndicate people, Mr. Dawson. They've been after him? Because of what I've got, Chet. You won't believe it. Tom, were you followed? No, sir. Ernie, what have you got the syndicate would want? The treasure? Yes, yes. How? You, Tom said you hadn't been back out. But I know where it is. I know where it is. You remember, when we went out that day, as we were leaving, I took some pictures. Yeah. To try and convince the syndicate we were just harmless tourists. Yeah. I don't think they were fools. Ah, but I had them develop, Chet. And look. Look at this one. Hmm? Some of the rocks on the beach and the sunset. So? Well, look at the rock in the foreground. You see how the sun is striking it? Hmm? Hmm. Are those markings? Yes, it's the map. It's the map, I tell you. We walked right past it and couldn't see anything because the sun wasn't hitting it at the correct angle. But this photograph caught the angle and there's the map made by Captain Kidd. All we have to do is decipher the markings, and the treasure is ours. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> Only what about the syndicate, huh? That's the problem, Mr. Dawson. There's no way we can get the treasure, and Mr. Charter's been tearing himself apart from the inside out. Don't you see how close we are? It's all here. It's all here in the photograph. And all we have to do is get it.
Which is more powerful, the mind or the universe? The philosopher would say the mind, because it can encompass the universe plus one inch. But the human mind is also the only organism that will torture itself with its own remorseless workings. Like the mind of Ernie Chowders as he sits in his darkened cabin and stares at a photograph day after day. Ah, but you can't go back out there, Ernie. The lazy Sally can't outrun a high-powered yacht. Chet, I know that, damn it. Don't you think I know that? But we've got to do it. It's been this way for months, Mr. Dawson. <laughs> can't you do something? Now that you're here, Chet, we can go. No, 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 absolutely you know, no. With you along, I'd be brave it's enough. It's not but... a question of bravery, Ernie. It's <laughs> common sense. Oh, we were just waiting for you to come back. Now, you listen to me. You listen to me. <laughs> There's no way I'm ever going back to Caicos. And neither are you. So just put it out of your mind. You understand me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right, Chet. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. Good. So, take care of yourself. Mr. Dawson, you going? Yeah, I gotta catch the evening bus to Puerto Plata. Gonna make tomorrow's flight to Miami. Well, what's in Miami? I got a job lined up. Uh, Big company with a whole fleet of charter boats. Oh, they hire you as a skipper. Uh, no, no, actually, I'll be working on shore in the marina, scraping holes. Well, I guess it's not what I was hoping for when I left the lazy Sally, but it is a steady job, and it's the first one I've had in a long time. I hell, it job's a job. I know that. But what about Mr. Chowders? Oh, he'll be okay, Tom. Now that he's decided to face up to reality, that's what I've done. That's what we all have to do. Yeah, well, so you take care, huh? Chester? Is that you, Chester? Oh, when, when did you get here? I, I didn't see you right off. I've been looking at this, this photograph. Chet, you're not going to believe what I've got here. Oh, Tom. This is how it's been, the... That's what I was trying to tell you. Sometimes I, I don't think he's in his right mind. Uh, okay, you're right. I, I can't leave him this way. Oh, now, now, now that Chet's here, we can go, Tom. Or any of the only place you're going is up on deck for some fresh air. Oh, no, no. I can't leave this photograph hey, unguarded. I Tom, uh, Tom, you ventilate this place. It's like a tomb. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Dalton. And then wrestle us up something to eat. And this evening, we'll have a little talk. Ah, you haven't lost your touch with a meal, Tom. Thanks, Mr. Dawson. Coffee? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, Chet? Yeah? You still carry that gun? Yeah, boy. Well, that lessens the odds a bit. Ernie, are you ever, ever going to stop thinking about this treasure? I've been figuring it out. Oh, boy, I guess that answers my question, doesn't it? The syndicate boat won't actually make a move on us until they see we've really got the treasure, right? Okay, okay, and if we assume that? So let's just go there. Just go, follow this map, dig a hole, and see. Maybe there's no treasure, okay? Possibility? But let's just find if we're sitting on a fortune or not. If we're not... We can all crawl back into our insignificant little holes. And if we are? <laughs> well, then that's a whole different kettle of fish, isn't it? That sounds reasonable enough to me, Mr. Dawson. Well, I'd agree to that. <sighs> but what I want to know, Ernie, is just supposing we did find the treasure. What ideas are you going to have about getting us out of there with that syndicate watching us? Um, maybe we could fly it out. One of us come in with a helicopter and the others load it on and climb aboard and whoosh, we're off. I don't know about that. That yacht's supposed to be equipped to deal with any contingency, including our craft. They could shoot us down. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could make a run for it in the lazy no, Sally. No, no, but, no. no. Well, then, what's your idea? Well, I don't have one. I'm sure getting curious about the syndicate. Does anyone know who's the head of it? It's supposed to be this patron named Galiban. Oh, who lives down the coast from here? Yes, in a mansion built in the ruins of an old fortress on the cliffs overlooking the ocean between here and Puerto Plata. Well, what evidence links him to the syndicate? He owns a 52-foot yacht with a mast just like this one that we see on the horizon. He keeps it hidden in a cove. But I gotta look at it once from a distance. 
It had deck armor. Oh. Well, okay, we'll... Let's not worry about them for right now. Now, look, it's been three months since the last time you went out to Caicos. Maybe they ain't watching you anymore. But just to be safe, we'll get on the way after nightfall, huh? That's right, Chet. Yeah. Give them the slip. We should reach Caicos while it's still dark, and by daybreak we should be digging. And if we find the treasure, like you said, Ernie, we'll take it from there. We left the port shortly after it was dark. And even if the syndicate discovered we were gone in the morning, if all went smoothly on Caicos, we'd have a good head start on them. Of course, if we found what we were looking for, returning to Monte Cristo would be out of the question. So we took extra fuel. Enough to get us to Rum Key in the Bahamas, where we could refuel and press on to Florida in safety. But the first step was to see if the treasure really existed. It was still dark when we reached Caicos. Okay, Tom. We're near the shoals. Kill the engine. Hear anything, Mr. Dawson? No. No. Are we in the right spot? Oh, I've got these rocks memorized. Give me the flashlight. Mm. There. There it is. That's the rock. See? See the markings? Forty-two. Forty-three, forty-four... Hey, hey, you're veering to the left. Six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. How am I by the compass? Well, should be the spot. And right on schedule. The sun's just coming up. Tom, Tom, give us those shovels. And take up a position on a riser ground with the binoculars. Tell us if the coast is clear. Yes, sir, Mr. Dawson. Let's get started. Now, wait, wait, wait a minute. I want to know if they follow this. Look, he's signaling all clear. We did it, Chet. Let's dig. (sighs) Come on, Ernie. Hold up, will you? It's got to be here, right? Oh, now, look, we're down over six feet. There's no sign of anything. So don't give up now. Hey, hey, Tom. How's that horizon? (sighs) What time is it? Uh, It's almost noon. Almost noon and no sign of them. You know what that means? They weren't watching us in the harbor anymore. Let's keep going. Oh, no. Ernie, I just can't dig, dig anymore. The sun is killing me. What? Well, we're going to find it. Uh, look, you've had your luck, pal. It ain't here now. now. Come on, let's go. No. Nothing's ever going to satisfy you, is it? You dig the whole island down till it's underwater, and you still keep eating your heart out. Stop me wasting your breath. Well, I hate to tell you. Dig. I hate to tell you, pal, that I don't spend the rest of my life on this island. We ain't leaving till I've found what I've come for. Ernie, if I have to, I'll take you out of here at gunpoint. No! Chet, did you hear that? Whoa. We found it! Look! Look! Chests! Mr. Chowders! Mr. Dawson! What is it, Tom? I just saw it. The mast. The yacht. It just came came into view on the horizon. Oh, no, no, no. They can't have it. Are you sure? Positive. Oh, that's not fair. Ernie, Ernie, calm down. Tom, Tom, look. We think we found it. You have? We have. (laughs) Go back and keep watching. Stay low. Don't let them see you now. And let us know if they make the slightest move towards the island. What are you going to do? We're going to break open these chests and see if we have anything worth fighting for. There. I got the padlock off this one. Open it up. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Will you look at that? Oh, bags of gold dust. Coins, silver bars, rubies, emeralds, sapphires. We're rich. Chet, Tom, 
We are rich. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Treasure of Grand Caicos. It's one thing to find a treasure, and quite another to keep it. Three of the world's currently richest men are in a unique situation. They are on a desert island in the middle of an ocean, in the immediate proximity of their entire fortune, and they can't move an inch. Well, now what? We can't sit around the rest of our lives staring at the million dollars worth of jewels. It's unfair. It's just unfair if they'd even show up an hour ago. But getting here just as we found it, it's unfair. I think there's only one solution. What's that, Mr. Dawson? We're just going to have to rebury. No, 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 no. What else can we do? The shoals. The Baracoa Bank. Where's our map? Where is it? Yeah. That's it right there. You see? That's our escape. We go over the Baracoa Bank. It's a reef system that stretches north of here for ten miles. That's ten miles of shallow water. So? Not too shallow for the draft of the Lazy Sally, but it is too shallow for the boat their size. They couldn't follow us without cracking up. They'd have to detour. We could get a head start. To where? Going across the Baracoa Banks would take us in the wrong direction. Straight out into the open water. We'd run out of gas, and we'd be sitting ducks. He's right, Mr. Chowders. Until we can figure out some way to beat that yacht, we've got no choice but to rebury all this beautiful treasure. We made the trip back to Monte Cristi in silence. We all felt the same way, and looking back on it now, that was the last shared feeling we were ever to have. I can't understand it. How does a syndicate know every time we move? All right, all right. So let's try to figure out something out, all right? You're mighty interested all of a sudden, ain't you? Yesterday you couldn't wait to get to Miami and that landlubber's job. Well, there's a few million dollars in the roar out there, old buddy. Of course I'm interested. Now let's not start yelling at each other. Let's have some coffee. Miami? What? Yeah. And let, and let's assume now, Ernie's right, that the syndicate has people watching every harbor along the Dominican coast here, huh? But what if we approached it from the other direction? The open sea? From Miami. Yeah, I'll go on first by myself, as I planned. You two follow later in a few days to avoid arousing suspicion. Meanwhile, I'll be looking for something large enough to get us to Caicos. And fast. Tom. What do you say? I don't like any plan that means leaving behind the Lazy Sally. Oh, the Lazy Sally's no good to us now. I'd be happy if I never saw her again. Uh, Tom, you in or out? Uh, it's the uh, same as signing my own death warrant. Okay. Good. I'll go back to my hotel and catch the morning bus. Here. Here. Now, there's the address where I'll be staying in Miami. Oh, uh, one other thing, this Mr. Gallivan. Where did you say his place was? Just this side of Isabelica on the road to Puerto Plata. Ah, oh, thanks. Why? See you in three days. Well, Tom, what do you think? I don't like the idea of abandoning the Lizzie Sally. No, I mean about Chet. Mr. Dawson? Something about him is beginning to bother me. He's taking over, acting like this whole thing was his idea. Oh, I don't think that's what he means to do. He came up with that plan fast enough, didn't he? Suddenly we're doing everything just the way he wants it. You think he's got something in mind? I can't imagine any circumstance in the world where Mr. Dawson betray us. He cut out on us four years ago, didn't he? He's always looked out for number one. I want you to follow him. Until he gets on that bus tomorrow morning... I want to know every place he goes. I left the Lazy Sally for what turned out to be the last time. But I had a strange feeling about something else. Everything I was hearing about the syndicate was funny. 
and a suspicion was beginning to dawn on me. I needed to check out one thing if I could. I didn't know it at the time, but what I did that evening saved my life. I met Ernie and Tom in Miami as planned, and they seemed cool to me. I didn't pay much attention at the time. I just chalked it up to nerves. Our plan went well, at least until we arrived at Caicos. We planned to accomplish the entire operation at night. It's pitch dark. You said the skies were supposed to be clear. All right, I don't know, Ernie. I double-checked with the weather bureau in Miami. And we came tonight because they said there'd be absolutely no chance of cloud cover. It's being off the lazy salad that's responsible. Oh, shut up, you idiot. You were supposed to dig up the treasure by moonlight and be safely out of here before daybreak. Now it's almost dawn and the whole night's lost. Can't imagine where those clouds came from. Not a breeze. Captain Kidd himself might as well be protecting that treasure. I said shut up! We had to wait for daybreak to begin our work. But within the hour, with Tom on lookout, Ernie and I had dug down to the treasure. It was still there. <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. That's it. We've got it. Oh, my back. Yeah. Hey, hey, Tom. Any sign of the yacht? Ice waving all clear. Yeah. I just don't believe oh, it. Oh, oh. All right, let's uh, let's get these chests out of the rowboat and get out of here. That's the last chest. Yeah. Let's go back for Tom. And then take off for Miami and Easy Street. Uh-huh. Uh-oh. What? Well, look, he's coming. He's running like a son of a gun. Mr. Dawson! Miss, Mr. Tavis! What? Now, don't tell me you saw anything. I think it's there. Oh. The gap! No, no, no. I don't accept that. I do not All accept right, that. All right, calm down, calm down. Check, give me your gun. Why? I'm going after them. Oh, come on, don't be crazy. Give me the gun or so help me. I'll swim out there by uh, my... Hey, uh, here, come, come. Hold my gun while I go after him. Okay, Mr. Chowders. I got the gun. Hey, where is this? Ernie, are you okay? Nice going, Tom. Huh? Keep him covered. What's going on? Now... This was our little plan, in case something went wrong with yours, Chet. All right, Tom, I'll take the gun. Get the rope out of the rowboat. Rope? Stay back. You double-crossing beach bum, I ought to blow your head off. You thought you'd hedge your bets, didn't you? What are you talking about? Here's the rope. Get up on the beach, Chet. What do you mean, I hedged my bets? Yeah, you figured no matter what precautions we took, they might still get wind of it. So you decided to switch sides. You're crazy, Ernie. Yeah. I'm up good, Tom. Where did you get that idea? I followed you, Mr. Dawson. The last night on the boat followed you to Galliban's estate. Oh. oh, that's it, huh? That's it, pal. Ernie, I just went to try and get a look at his yacht. I'm sure you did. Is that what swung you? Nothing swung me. You know, I, I don't think Galvin's mixed up in this at all. His yacht isn't armed. It's a normal pleasure boat. You forgot I saw it once, too, Mr. Dawson. Huh? Only I saw it in broad daylight. Yeah. Yeah, and how far away were you, huh? 300 yards? 500? And how old are you, Tom? And just how good is your eyesight? I tell you, I saw guns. Yeah, harpoon guns. And your anti-aircraft installations are just fishing rigs. Oh, you may be selling, Chet, but we're not buying. Look, I don't even think there is a syndicate. The whole thing sounds like a lot of mythology made up to explain things that that, that had no other explanation. Like that boat out there? <gasps> He's tight, nice and tight. Oh, you can't leave me here. Oh, your friends out there can pick you up. I tell you, I don't know who they are. I, I'll die here. Get in the boat, Tom. With the treasure? Of course. I'm not leaving it behind again. But we agreed if the yacht showed up, we wouldn't try to take it. We'll do what we should have done before. Head out across the Baracoa Bank. 
That boat's not the lazy Sally. A draft's too deep. Tom, don't force me to shoot you. Now, come on. I'm sorry, Mr. Dawson. It doesn't look like any of us has much of a chance. Tom was right. They never had a chance. The boat hit the first reef, and within seconds she was gone. In the crevices between those reefs lie some of the deepest waters in the Atlantic. Tom, Ernie, and the treasure were gone forever. Chester Dawson watched helplessly from the beach as his two former comrades went to their deaths. But what became of him and what of the mysterious yacht on the horizon? Tom knew how to tie a good knot. It was some time before I was able to work myself free. While I struggled, I expected the yacht to sail into view, and when it didn't, my curiosity increased. I found the binoculars that Tom had left behind and climbed to the top of the nearest hill. It was then... I saw the sight that kept me from telling this story until now. The ship's mast had not moved. It was still on the horizon. As I stared at it, a flag ran up its length and unfurled in the breeze. First I couldn't make it out. And then I saw it was black with a skull and crossbones. And then the mast and its flag vanished. The ghost of Captain Kidd had guarded his treasure well. Chester didn't have long to wait for rescuers. Within the week, another party of would-be treasure hunters came to the island and found him. As he sat alone on the deck of their boat during the voyage home, a thought occurred to him that has haunted him to this day. Old Tom had been right all along. Since the syndicate yacht was an illusion, they'd all be alive and rich men today. If only they had stayed with the lazy Sally. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Treasure of Grand Caicos, was written by Percy Granger and produced and directed by Livia Granito. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Tom Brown, Vic Perrin, and Jim Mapp. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tolufson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations. For the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Lorne Green. Join us again next Monday at this time for another new and original radio play about America's past. This is Leonard Nimoy. One of the delights of radio is the element of surprise. You can't see what's coming. You hear things. My voice, that approaching train, music. And added together, they create a picture in your mind. Your picture, painted by you. Filled with the people and the objects you created out of the bits and pieces we've given you.
You've stood at that crossing and watched that train pass. Or you've seen it in motion pictures or television. But what happened just then happened only to you. Each one of you listening pictured a different train at a different crossing. Our story brings you more of those pictures. Listen to this. Okay, Suzanne, this is it. Your big chance to become a star reporter. Now, this is the way it is. We got this crazed bunch of people who call themselves the Committee for the Preservation of Rodino's Masterpieces on one hand. And on the other hand, we got this equally crazed bunch, in my opinion, from the Office of Public Safety, which means Commissioner Tugmore, who says that Rodino's works are just mounded junk, public hazard, and have to be torn down before they fall over on somebody. Now, the committee, in a supreme effort, has arranged for something they're calling a stress test. If the so-called masterpieces... Oh, you ever seen these masterpieces, Lou? I've driven past a couple of times. Could I continue, please? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. Now, the deal is this. If the so-called masterpieces... Well, why do they call them the so-called masterpieces? Suzanne, are you going to let me give you this assignment or not? Oh, I am. I am. I just want to... <laughs> now then, the stress test is this. They're going to use this crane to try to tilt the structures over. If the crane topples the things over, the committee has no choice but to cease and desist from its efforts to save the webs. The webs? Well, they've always been called that because that's what they resemble, cobwebs. Can I go on? By all means. Thank you. Now... If the crane tilts these structures over onto their respective backsides, the committee well, is going to have to stop proclaiming these things are some sort of big stuff that has to be preserved. Well, what happens if the crane doesn't knock these things over? Well, first of all, Commissioner Tugmore is going to have to back off. Or any particular slant of this loop? What do you mean? Well, does the Sentinel take a position? Do you want to say that the committee is right and that the commissioner is wrong? <laughs> Suzanne. I'm giving you this assignment because I want the most objective, well-balanced look the Sentinel can offer. Is that a fun, Lou? Go on, get out of here. Come back with something that'll tug at our throbbing heartstrings. I'll do my best. If you want an increase in salary, you better. And that's just the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Legend of Angelo Rodino by Odie Hawkins. Our star, Hans Conried. Your imagination is waiting... The players are ready. Act One. I hope this test will put an end to this matter once and for all. If we permitted everybody the privilege of putting up whatever they felt like, the landscape would be cluttered with dangerous junk like this. These structures are not junk, Commissioner. These webs are a magnificent expression of folk art. They are some of the greatest possibilities that the human spirit can seek. Poppycock! They're unsafe, and this test will prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now what makes these structures unsafe, Commissioner? This needless, useless test is This no... test will determine that these structures are basically unsafe. And if permitted to remain standing, will eventually wind up causing somebody a permanent headache. My job oh, is Oh, come to... off of it, Commissioner. The webs are as sturdy as oak trees. Look at that. I've stru- already looked. Well, what makes these structures unsafe, Commissioner? I'm glad you asked that question, young lady. Yeah, keep those people back over there, Smithers. We don't want any accidents around here. Uh, what makes these structures unsafe? Is that your question? Yes, sir. Well, just look at them. What the hell does that mean? A Commissioner. Like I said, just look at them. Now, here you've got these three structures going up in the air. Oh, I'd say about three stories high. My deputy has the exact figure. So you're saying that they're structurally unsafe because of their height? Uh, well, not, not exactly. What I'm saying is that they are poorly constructed. I, I mean, even a nincompoop could see from the general look at these structures that they were not designed to last. Now, that strikes me as kind of weird in view of the fact that they've stood for 30-some-odd years before the commissioner came into office. Now, now, what does that mean? 
Just what we're talking about, your lack of sensitivity toward artistic treasures. To suggest that these structures, this art, is about to fall is complete nonsense. I'm happy to say that I won't have to argue with you about this. The test will prove my point. Mr. Enbridge, why does the artistic community seem to think that these structures are so unique and important? Well, as you can see, these three structures are unique. They represent an incredible amount of artistic energy. A sample of what the human spirit is capable of. Boulder there. Aside from simply being beautiful, they show what one man... With can... no architectural training. With no architectural training or formal education of any type that we know about. This one man took it upon himself to create a work of love, brilliance, and artistic integrity. Young lady, if you have no other questions, I think we can get to the business at hand. Well, one more question, please. Now, what exactly is the test to be made, and what will it prove? I'm glad you asked that. Smithers, keep those people back! Now, the test has been devised by the firm of Green, Turner, and Sanders. It's a stress test, using his crane over here. Green, Turner, and Sanders has determined that these structures will not be able to withstand 5,000 pounds of pressure. They'll tilt over. As you can see in the way that they're interlocked, when one goes, they'll all go. If they go, you mean. We'll find out in a few minutes. Okay, Smithers, Jackson, let's clear that area there. Rev up the engine. Oh, this is strictly off the record, Mr. Enbridge. In that case, why don't you call me John? Oh, John. Well, what makes you feel so confident that these webs will hold? I mean, they are beautiful, no doubt about that. But they also look very fragile. Okay, Bob. Tilt. They're fragile, but... I said tilt it, Bob. I'm trying, Commissioner. What's the pressure reading? They're up to 3,000. Well, let's take her up to 3,005. That ought to do it. Our organization is... Oh, the Committee for the Preservation of Angela Rodina's Masterpieces? Right. We made an independent study. I'm up to 3,005, Commissioner. Are you sure? I've been handling this monster for 25 years. I kind of think I ought to know how to read the gauges, Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I didn't mean You it. want me to take up to 4,000? Yeah, four ought to do it. You, you feel any give yet? Well, it feels like I'm hitched up to the Rock of Gibraltar. Our study showed that the webs well, are... Well, take her up to 4,005. That ought to do it. Oh, my. Hey, hey, watch out! You idiots are knocking cement loose! And that isn't all that's coming loose. Is she going, Bob? Doesn't seem to be, Commissioner. You want me to take up to the full five? If you're really determined to knock them over, Commissioner, why don't you call for an airstrike? Take her up to five, Bob. You were saying that your organization has made a study? Look, look at these fools. They're knocking the design patterns from their casings. I got her up to the full five, Commissioner. I don't feel no gift, nothing at all. Well, go on to six. Sure you don't want to call for that airstrike, Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Enbridge. John. John, you were starting to tell me about the independent study your organization has made? And when the stress pressure mark had reached the 10,000-pound point and the crane tilted instead of the webs, it became obvious that the little guy had battled City Hall and won. The Committee for the Preservation of Angelo Regino's Masterpieces deserves a vote of gratitude from each and every one of this city citizens. Good! <laughs> it's good, Suzanne. You keep up the good work. You know, uh, this... Peace whets my appetite. I know. Who was this Rodino guy anyway, right? Right. Now, you read me loud and clear. You get pictures if you can. I'm on my way. It's been said that life is like a maze filled with blind turns and sudden open paths. Which is it now? The blind turn or the open path? If some people thought that Angelo was a little crazy, you know what I mean? Maybe even I thought he was a little crack. Who knows? 
Here you see this middle-aged guy was about 40 when he started building the webs, climbing three stories up, plastering, bending, pushing, pulling, all these after a full day's work on his regular job. Oh, we used to drink a little vino together, you know what I mean? After work, right here at this table, as a matter of fact. Sometimes I would ask him, after we had a couple of glasses, Angelo, what are you doing? Sometimes he would just shrug his shoulders. Usually, <laughs> he would just smile. Just smile, you know. After a few years, I started asking him questions. You know how it is. If a man is decided he's going to do a certain thing, you've got to give him space to work in. Well, if you could give me some idea of the impression he made on you. Uh-huh. Well... My wife, she might say something else. Maybe some other people in this area might say something else. You know what I mean? For me, I'll say this. Angelo Rodino gave me the feeling of being near someone who had discovered a tremendous secret and he wanted to share it with the world. I think he loved the human race more than any man I ever know. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. We drank a lot of vino together right here at this table. There was really something magical about the webs. You could feel it. All the girls used to say that. Oh, what girls, Mr. White? Now, I was the only one you ever took for walks around the webs. <laughs> it was the custom. I don't know how it started. What it was, honey, was a kind of courtship thing. If a guy began to really think seriously about a girl, he'd take her for walks around the webs. I don't have to tell you what it was like to be young, in love. And have the full moon shine down on you through the webs? You ever meet anybody as romantic talking in your life? <laughs> you used to be pretty good at it yourself, Mr. White. <laughs> what do you mean, used to be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mrs. White, uh, Mr. White, during the course of these walks around the webs, did you ever see Mr. Rodino? Oh, yes. Most times he'd be working up on the webs. I don't know when that man slept. He'd work a regular eight-hour day and then come home, get his tools, and climb up in the web. Well, what kind of tools did he use? Well, he had this window washer's belt that he wore, a bucket with tools and stuff like that. Well, I can hardly believe this, Mr. White. I mean, not that I'm doubting your word, but are you saying that Mr. Rodino only had simple tools of the sort you mentioned, and he constructed three three-story towers that couldn't be pushed over by a crane applying 10,000 pounds of pressure? Sounds unbelievable, don't it? Well, I was there when the test was made. And we were too, honey. And we knew that the webs was going to remain standing. Well, how did you know? Well, first of all, we had seen him build those webs from the bottom up. From below the bottom, even. I, I don't quite understand. Well, I don't guess it would harm anything now for me to say this. Oh, to say what? Well, Angelo was a pretty slick dude in a lot of ways. Could you be more explicit? I mean, give me an example of what you mean. Well, like Martha was talking about him coming from the bottom of... From below the bottom. From below the bottom of the... From below the bottom? Well, that's exactly right. Angelo did almost as much work under those webs as he did from the top. Some days, for a week or two at a time, we wouldn't see him because he'd be underground. He'd be down there hooking up steel up to steel. Mr. White and Mrs. White... I don't want to try to play games with you, but what you're saying to me sounds so mysterious, I don't know whether to doubt you or not. What do you mean he was hooking steel to steel? You tell her, honey. I never have been able to explain what that man was doing. Well, okay. It was like this. Angelo, we all called him Angelo, had figured out a way to tunnel underneath the street. And what he did, number one, was to tap the city's electrical supply. He tapped the city's electrical system? Uh-huh. He did that for about 30-some-odd years. He tapped the city's electrical system for 30 years? Well, give or take a few years. <laughs> oh, please, go on. Well, with his tunnel system underneath the street, he needed light, right? Well, yes, of course. So now then, with this light, he started hooking the webs onto pipes, water mains, and stuff that ran underneath the street. Angelo even buried his old Model T Ford underneath the webs in concrete and hooked the webs onto that. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. That man had those webs stuck to so many pipes and stuff on the ground. They would have had to almost till half the city over to make those things fall. Well, one last question. 
Why do you think Mr. Rodino built these webs? Well... I'll always believe that Angela Rodino put those webs up because of love. There was some woman in his life that none of us ever got to meet. Well, it's true, you know, that men have been known to do weird things when they're in love. So I've heard, Mr. White. So I've heard. <laughs> comes a time when it might be best to wish that everything that's happening is a dream, something that will disappear once you've awakened. But often it's not a dream. It's happening. Happening to you. Hey, Angelo! Angelo! You want to come down to eat? Maria made some enchilada. No, 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 Tanio, no, no, tonight, I'm a busy, Tanio, so. You want some vino? Oh, vino, I got some up here, in my bucket. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'll see you later. Ah, uh, okay, uh, such a good friend, they see me walk up here, they want me to come down, I'm going to eat. <laughs> How am I going to explain to them that nothing else matters but this, these webs, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing matters more than these webs. Nothing has meant very much since I started doing this work. Perhaps I'm crazy. No, I'm not crazy. If I was crazy, I couldn't say that maybe I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Seashells. Seashells blasted onto the outer ring. Toss in a seashell because because I, I love the sea. I gotta make a trip down to the harbor soon for more seashell. Eh? How many shell I, I plaster into these frames? Fifty toes? Sixty toes? Ah, who cares? A little taste of vino. Eh? Oh, the, it fires my blood. Yeah. The, the city lights. How beautiful they look from here. I wonder if, if they can see me from downtown. Eh? Oh, of course not, you old fool. How could they gonna see that so far away? Maybe if I put the lights around. Eh? Oh, my back hurts. I'm getting old. No matter that, because this work keeps me young. I say to the world, look at me here, a poor Italian immigrant who feels so rich inside that he has created a monument for you from the things that you throw away. Yeah. A little more wine. Yeah. Good. Yes, it's a good. All of it, all of it is a good. This wine, this uh, web, is, is this uh, life. I ask myself, Angelo Rodino, if you was not doing what you were doing, what were you going to be doing? <laughs> I must be a little drunk. You know, so much done, uh, so much more to do. Uh, they ask me, they ask me, Angelo, I you know what is right, or, or is that right? And what will happen if this happens or that happens? What can I say to them? I don't really know, know anything, for sure. I study, I study the spider, the spider, in order to know how, how to do certain things. The spider anchors his web as well as possible. It is strong, yet it is flexible. I do that. I, I, I study the, the master architect, the spider. Uh, uh, tomorrow I, tomorrow I gotta bend the more steel for the belts around the small web. Uh, they ask me, hey Angelo, why don't you use a bolts? Uh, you use a rivets? Why don't you use a scaffolding? Uh, how can I say to them, these are big equipments, uh, stuff that's gonna require lots of men to use. I'm only one. And they say, Angelo, why don't you let us help you? What can I say? Oh, sure, I need help. I, I want help, but what can I ask him to help me to do? 
I don't know myself. <laughs> the spider has a great advantage over me. And he knows what he wants to do from the moment he starts till the second he finishes. Yeah. Yeah, a little more wine. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Some kind of little wind tonight, huh? You know, that's going to help harden the shells in the plaster. Oh. Damn it, I forgot my pipe. Oh, well, what's a pipe? Are you artist, Angelo Rodino? No, no, no artist. Me, I'm, I'm a mad little spider with a dream. <laughs> a mad little spider with a dream. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, hey, Mr. Rodino. Yeah, what do you want? How you doing tonight? Oh, okay, okay, Tanya. You, you, you want to watch out on there. You're going to get a piece of plaster on your head. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. Rodino. We'll be careful. Uh, good. Uh, nice kids. Nice kids. Look at them. They, they walk around holding their hands. <laughs> yeah, it looks so serious. Uh, I think they must be in love. Uh, I wonder if my web will make them feel... More in love with each other, eh? <laughs> uh, uh. Oh, so beautiful. So beautiful. The, the wind. The wind talks to me. The wind, she, she sings in my face. I, I feel like maybe the, there's a hand touching each side of my face with the wind. Maybe it's the hand of God. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's only the vino. <laughs> all these years, all these years I've spent doing this. And I wonder, I wonder what, what they really mean. Huh? <laughs> During the Second World War, they thought I was uh, making secret antennas, something to reach out to the enemy with. <laughs> Fool, how could they think that I would do anything against a country that has given me so much? Oh, America. America. Imagine. Oh, uh, tomorrow I gotta crush more bottles for designs. Uh, and the plates. I, I need more plates, too. I, I gotta be careful. I don't make the neighborhood ladies uh, gonna be angry with me. You know, if, if their kids uh, uh, keep on bringing me the plates, they're gonna be angry. Maybe I could go to the factory and get the uh, crack, the broken plates that they break there. Eh? No, no, they wouldn't be no good. If nobody has eaten from the plates, <laughs> there is no life in them. Yeah. So little time. And I, I'm 30 years older than when I started. Oh, you got to get a move on, Rodino. Roma wasn't a built in one day. <laughs> but first, another small swallow of the vino, huh? Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of our story. I forgot to ask, exactly how did you discover the webs? We were doing locations for a movie project. A movie project? Yeah, we'd scraped up enough money to shoot what we felt would be a masterpiece. Kind of surrealistic, Bunuel-type thriller. The strange thing about the whole business is that neither one of us natives of this city had ever heard of the webs. Can you imagine? Yes. I suffered from the same ignorance until the day of the stress test. Can you give us some idea of what it took to bring that about, the stress test? Well, to begin with, we became friendly with Mr. Rodino. He was an incredible guy. The man worked like a demon. I mean, it would be hard to describe this little guy. Little guy? I had the idea somehow that he was a lumberjack type. No, he was about 5'3", five, 5'5", five, five at the most, and probably weighed 120, dripping wet. Incredible guy. When I said earlier that we became friendly, I, I don't want to give the impression that we became slap-on-the-back pals or anything. He wasn't the type. After we'd watched him working for a few days, we asked him if it would be all right to film him at work on the webs, and he agreed, and if we kept out of his way. We kept out of the way... And film. You have film? We have film. 
That film weighed in our favor when we began to make an effort to save the webs. Seems that some people only believe what they see. We've come full circle. How did the Committee for the Preservation of Angelo Rodina's Masterpieces come about? Well, I guess you could say it was a gut response to a gruesome newspaper article. They were going to destroy the webs. Mike got in touch with me the same day I saw the article. We had to do something. So, we organized. I'm sure Mr. Rodino appreciated your aid. Mr. Rodino was not on the scene. He had finished his work and disappeared. No one knew where he was. Oh, what came next? We enlisted John Enbridge's help. Told him it was time to come out of his studio and into the streets. Talk about uphill battles. The big block was the Commissioner of Public Safety, Tugmore. Come in, gentlemen. Please be seated. Now, I'm busy, and I'm certain you gentlemen also have other business to take care of, so let's get to the point of your visit. The webs are being torn down at the end of the month. Commissioner, can't you see that you would be destroying a monumental example of folk art? No, quite frankly, I can't see anything like that. What I can see is a threat to public safety. And it's my duty to prevent the public from being harmed by these structures. Commissioner, let's be reasonable about this. I mean, can't we achieve some sort of compromise? What exactly did you have in mind? Uh, well, isn't there some way we can guarantee the safety of the public and leave the webs as they are? I would be quite happy to do exactly that, if that were possible. Of primary importance is the safety of the public. We've collected 25,000 signatures, sir. Signatures from people in all stations of life. The problem doesn't simply begin and end with my office. There is also the problem of an unauthorized structure on unincorporated land. In addition, the structures have violated every known building code. In effect, those webs should not be there at all. Sir, we agree that everything you say is true. But we're asking you to make a consideration for factors that go way beyond unauthorized structures on unincorporated land and all the rest. I couldn't possibly imagine what consideration would go beyond those points. We're asking you to consider the idea that the webs are a once-in-a-lifetime creation of an authentic genius. Aren't we becoming a bit over-emotional about this? Okay, so an old man decided to spend the last years of his life building up a pile of junk. Does that automatically mean that we grant him the title of genius? It is anything but a pile of junk, Commissioner. That's why we're here. I think further discussion of this matter would be completely fruitless. Oh, come on, Commissioner. This subject is much too important to just put aside. I don't think that I'm being impertinent or anything, but we're, we're dealing with a work of art that will be world famous someday. I don't get the impression that you're the kind of guy who'd like to be known to history as the person who condemned a priceless work of art. You know something? You fellas have a bunch of nerve. The kind of nerve I admire. I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take another stab at this. You're telling me that that pile of uh, those webs are some kind of precious treasure? Without question. They're probably one of the most unique combinations of sculpture and architecture to be found in the world. It occurs to me that the man who built these things should be here arguing his own case. Where is he? Mr. Rodina has disappeared. No one seems to know what happened to him. Uh, this situation is rapidly reaching the incredible stage. Are you fellas going to try to convince me that the builder of these masterpieces has just simply disappeared and left the three of you to speak for him? Well, sir, he didn't really ask us. We're here as representatives of all the people who believe that the webs should be preserved. You said something about having a petition, some signatures? Twenty-five thousand of them. Oh, that many people believe that those things should remain upright, huh? Absolutely. Well, now, let me see. The building permits and the unincorporated land thing, we might be able to get around, but we still have one outstanding problem. Oh, what's that, sir? The problem is that those webs are going to fall. No, they're not, Commissioner, and we've made an independent study that will prove it. We also have film that shows what kind of skeleton is underneath all the cement and decoration. Film, you say? Yes, sir. Film. Of this guy's work? This I've got to see. 
I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. Now, you have to understand, Commissioner, that hour of film only covered a few weeks of Angelo Rodino at work. I know, I know. If he worked like that for a little longer, there's no telling what he would have come up with. Another Empire State Building. So you agree that the structures are worth saving? Oh, despite the fact that I have to admit that I'm impressed... The webs still have to come down. But why? Because they're a hazard. They're apt to keel over on somebody any day. Commissioner, what would you say if we offered you a demonstration that the webs are stable and will probably not fall over until the year 4000 or later? I'd say, great, let me see the demonstration. possessed you to agree to a mad test like this. You really want to know? I do. Faith. Faith, Ed? Yes, faith. I just happen to believe, after watching that little guy work, that no power on earth could possibly push those webs over. So this is how the stress test came about. More or less. We could see that the commissioner was trying his best to go with us, but... He needed a peg, something that would cover him. The stress test was it. But we weren't taking any chances. We decided that Ed and I would trip off to the Capitol to dragoon some of our more artistically inclined politicians into some kind of support for our cause while the test was going on. My job was to stay on the scene and harass the commissioner a bit. Well, now that we're looking at uh, this matter in retrospect, let me ask, were any of you guys in doubt about the web standing up under pressure? The truth? The utter and absolute truth. I was scared to death. All I could think was, these idiots are going to destroy one of the greatest works what man has ever built. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I felt a little... Well, let's just call it terror. <laughs> well, I knew they were going to be okay. I just knew it. funny feeling I got, uh, reading about the different things that were happening because of the webs. Uh, it was like I was uh, reading about something I, I never had nothing to do with. A lot of people over here, they say, hey, we got to keep these things standing up. A lot of people over here, they say, hey, we got to knock these things over. <laughs> yeah, I got a smile reading about these things. It was like uh, I was a ghost. Uh, people, uh, how funny they are, eh? Nobody seemed to care very much when I was building the webs. And when all the work is done, they care. We still had problems, even after the test, after the decision had been made to allow them to continue to exist. Number one, we had to track someone down who'd sign some kind of proclamation stating that the webs were under the protection of the state. Well, we couldn't get it. You couldn't get it? Not even after the test? Nope. Simple as that. From being a block, the good commissioner, bless his stubborn soul, became one of our supporters. He ran a lot of interference for us, but in the end, we wound up becoming the administrators and caretakers until last year. turkey who threw us out of his office six months ago? The same turkey. We are not often privileged to be able to say we were there in the beginning. Thank you. That's one of the things I love about politicians. They can always make you feel that they're leading, even when they've been following all the while. Oh, that's great, Suzanne. You may get that raise yet. You keep up the good work. 
Uh, it's only one thing, Miss. I know, the elusive Mr. Rodino. Yeah. I'm hot on his trail. But first, I have a date to take a walk around the web. You got a date to do what? I've got a date to take a walk around the web. I'll explain it to you one day. Yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, let, let's see if we can't get a personal interview with Rodino for the Sunday supplement, huh? I'll do my best. Mrs. White was right. There is a kind of magic about the webs, with the moonlight shining through. Suzanne, there's something very important I'd like to tell you. Yes, John. I know where Angelo Rodino is. You do? Where? Let's go see him. I thought we could pay him a visit on our honeymoon. He's in Italy. Honeymoon? Italy? I realize all of this is rather sudden, but... Uh, no, 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 but when do we leave? The week after the ceremony. <laughs> There was a days and a nights when I felt the weight so heavy of what I was doing that I was a crying, crying the tears of joy. There was those people who said I was crazy. Hey, they said, what are you doing? And because uh, I couldn't answer them, these people are going to say, he's crazy. What a shame that people always got to have answers. Don't they realize there are no answers for certain things? Well, look who's back. Come on, did you get the scam on Rodino, Mrs. Embridge? I did, in a sense. Come on, Suzanne, what happened? You've been gone three weeks, Gil. Well, we were directed to this village called Quaint in the travel folder. Uh-huh. Uh, we were directed to an old-fashioned stone house five miles beyond the village, and yeah, there... Yeah, yeah, There we met Mr. Angelo Rodino. Great! Now, what did he say? What motivated him to build the webs? We never found out. What? We rented a room in the local hotel and paid him a visit every day for two weeks. But he never had time to give me an interview. He was very busy building something. Looks like a pyramid of some kind. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Legend of Angelo Rodino, was written by Odie Hawkins and produced and directed by Livia Granito. Your host was Leonard Niebuhr. Our star was Hans Conry. Featured in the cast were Robin Braxton, Robert Doki, Jack Crucian, Marvin Miller, Helen Barton, David Downing, and Byron Kane. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tolufson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis Production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations. With a top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Lorne Green. Join us again next Monday at this time for another new and original radio play about America's past.
This is Leonard Nimoy. You're on the largest oil tanker ever built. Right now, it's fully loaded and traveling the waters of the Southern Ocean through the night on its way to the United States. In the dark night, the captain hears and then sees a helicopter with its landing lights on, flying over the ship, hovering over the landing pad. This is an alert. Helicopter landing. Form an armed party and find out who they are. The small crew of seven men scramble for their rifles and run across the immense deck, running to where the helicopter hovers. Unseen by the captain or any of the crew, a second helicopter hovers, lights off, directly above the bridge, and five armed men are lowered to the roof of the bridge. Distracted by the first helicopter, no one has seen the landing of the second one. Captain, please raise your hands very slowly. On a dark night in the Southern Ocean, the world's largest oil tanker has just been hijacked. And that's only in the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Ship, by Andre Stoika. Our stars, Brock Peters and John Daner. The hijack crew takes over the oil tanker, the regular crew is locked in the ship's brig, and the new captain takes charge and adjusts his course. Several hundred miles away, there's a small, sparsely populated island, and on the island is a lonely man who knows nothing of what has happened. Yet his life is about to be changed by these events. Here's his story. Twenty years is a long time to be in a place, but I've been here that long. When I came to this island, it was with other men from my home. We had heard that the fish ran strong in these waters, and the women believed anything you told them. It was true. But twenty years is twenty years, and now the fish have run out, and the women are wiser. And how do I account for my time? It is true that I have grown. I started as a fisherman, and now I own a store, a provisioner. Well, that's not too bad. In fact, that is how I met Conklin. Maybe a year ago. Hey, Sanduro. <laughs> how many poles have you got stuck in the sand there? I have ten. Ten poles? What do you do with all those fish? With my luck, I'll only catch one. The rest of the poles keep the odds in my favor. <laughs> I did that once. I put out 50 poles and lines, all baited, and can you guess? They all caught something, fed a whole village, and I, I, I was just looking for supper. Lucky man. I am a lucky man, and you are lucky, too. Why am I lucky? I have brought you my business. In such a way, I met Conklin. An expansive man. He bought much fishing gear from me, but somehow I don't believe he fished, for I never saw his catch. Some men expand on the truth in their stories, but we don't call them liars. It's just their nature. On the other hand, we don't believe them a lot either. Would you like some coffee? Of course. Hey, did I tell you I was in Sydney? That's a long sail. By myself. You handled the boat alone? By myself, through a thousand miles of sea. Once the waves rose over a hundred feet, and I played them like a game. Dangerous. A game. I played and won. I got there, and I got back. 
What is Sydney like? You never been there? No. Yeah. It's marvelous. The, the, the women are very nice. Proper, but I know my way around them. One has to be... <laughs> one has to be skillful. You are skillful? Very skillful. Uh, tell me, Provisioner, could you outfit a fishing fleet? Of course. I've done it many times. How big a fleet? Maybe six boats. Full crew? Where'd you get your provisions? From a boat. It comes every three weeks. Hmm. That's too bad there's no airfield. Who wants to fly here? Ah, who indeed? <laughs> That's a good question. I am staring at you. And I am seeing a very rich man. I should be so lucky. No, I'm not talking about luck. I'm talking about fate. We're fated to be together, Sanduro, and this will bring us both a great deal of wealth. I believe in fate. I've often wondered why I was fated to live on this island. With no wife. There are plenty of women. Ah, but they're smarter now. <laughs> For their own protection. But the, the women in Sydney... Oh, they're more beautiful. You've just been to Sydney? And brought back fate for you, my friend, and for me. Let's hope fate brings us supper. I had a strike just then and pulled her in. No fight to speak of, but enough size for dinner for two. I invited Conklin to join me, and he agreed. After dinner, we sat on the porch and watched the lights of a small boat at anchor. What is the largest ship you've ever seen? The largest? Not many around here. A big freighter lost her course once. What is the largest ship you have seen? You wouldn't believe me. I might. Well, I'll test you. The largest ship I ever saw was nearly 1,400 feet long. Where did you see it? Two years ago in Japan, they were just building her. For what? Oil. An oil tanker, a huge one. It's the largest ship in the whole world. And you swear this is true? It is true. You will see her. Me see her? What would she do here? She's coming here at this very moment, my friend. She will be here in two days, and then you will see her. But she cannot stop here. There is no depth to the bay. Oh, not in the bay. Out at sea. Two miles out, it is deep. But why? Because, my friend, I have already hijacked her. Hijacked? You? Yes. And now you will join with me. Well, what do you need from me? You're a provisioner. We need provisions. You will provide. My friend, what you are doing is against the law. What law are you referring to? Have I stolen in anything from anyone on this island? Have I an enemy on this island? Do I harm this island? International laws? Probably, boy. probably. But what is more important, law or oil? I think we'll find out, and you will be with us. I have never violated a law in my life. For me to do this would make me a criminal. My dear friend, you have been here on this island for 20 years, and what have you got? Small life, a very small life. What I'm offering you is a chance for change, a change to a very big life. The owners of that ship want it back. I want to give it back. They will make a nice exchange, and we will all be rich. How rich would that be? Ha-ha! <laughs> the businessman in you shows your share will not be less than 50,000 Swiss francs. That much money would surely make a change for me. Well, what must I do for it? You will supply food, clothing, water to the crew of the ship. You will get it through your normal supplier, and you will secretly bring it to the ship when she arrives here. That is all. You are paying a high price for food. I am paying a high price for your trust, your loyalty, your discretion. These things are more priceless than food. And if I refuse? You will not refuse. But if I do? I... 
must kill you. But I swear that I do not wish to do that. I would rather make you a rich man. It would make me very rich. You might wish to leave this island, return home, or perhaps Sydney. I could introduce you to uh, women there. <laughs> oh, oh, what women. They are much smarter than the women here. Oh, yes, yes, they are. But by then, you would be uh, uh, a very rich man. <laughs> 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 Life is full of choices, as Sanduro, a lonely man on a lonely island, has made his choice. He has chosen to side with Conklin and assist in hijacking the world's largest oil tanker. And Conklin has given him money, cash to be used in increasing his inventory of supplies. His timing was perfect, for the next day the supply boat to all these islands came into the bay, and I purchased extra provisions. Mr. Chow, the owner, seemed a little surprised at my order, but he filled it. Very large order, Sandoro. Very large. Like the old days. Perhaps the old days have returned. The fish are running well again? They are running better. I will spread the word. No. What? They are running better than before, and already there are more fishermen. Don't spread the word. Let these men make a living. It has been some time since fishermen could make a living around here. Let them make it. Don't bring more boats here. What do you care? You sell to whoever buys. New fisherman, old fisherman, what do you care? I care. Please. I see. Your order is very expensive. Of course, you have my credit, but... Do you have some money for me in advance? A little down, just in case your judgment has failed you? My judgment has not failed. But yes, I, I have money for you. You do? Oh, very well. I shall not spread the word. Chow was a very suspicious man. He suspected everything. And he was a talkative man. News around the islands travels by radio and by boat. And so when Chow delivers supplies, he delivers news. I tried to keep his suspicions away. After all... What could he suspect? That a great ship full of oil was approaching? So I made my excuses, and he seemed to believe me. He seemed to believe me more when I gave him the money. Sandoro, here is my bill for your supplies. You are charging me double the price. It would seem so. Double the price. You do not wish to pay it? You wish to argue? It is not fair. What is fair? Fair is what I can get. You will pay, won't you? Or do you wish to argue? I'll pay. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You? You say there are fish. Others say there are none. You say you wish to have fishermen. There are no fishermen. Look at this bay. Where are the boats? They are, they are out at sea. And I didn't see them? No. You have something else in mind. What is it? Why do you need these supplies? Tell me. I will keep your secret. I have no secret. You have no secret. But you will pay double price, won't you? I will pay. Give me the money. Good. You will not talk. I will not talk. Money in hand, he ordered his men to untie his boat. I stood on the dock watching him back up and swing the nose of his boat out toward the ocean. My eyes and mind played tricks on me, for I thought I saw a shadow of something at the mouth of the bay. But it was an illusion. I worried. He knew I was up to something. But could he know about the ship? 
Would he be truthful to his word, or might a word slip out to someone on one of the other islands? Would others be curious? My mind worried as his boat slipped away. Perhaps I should have told him the truth. Perhaps I should have made him a partner with me and demanded his silence. Perhaps I am too slow sometimes. And this time I was angry at myself for not having thought of something smart. His boat reached the edge of land and moved out of the bay to the sea. It picked up speed, and I imagined that he was hurrying, hurrying to tell someone that I had a secret. I wanted to wave him back, but he could not see me, for his boat now was very small. The speck of the boat turned bright orange and disappeared in an instant. A few puffs of smoke rose from the water where the boat had been. It happened so fast that I wondered whether it happened at all. But I knew it had. The boat had blown up, and Mr. Chow and his crew were all dead. The money I had paid him was at the bottom of the sea, and it had happened in an instant. I knew Chow, and I knew the explosion couldn't be an accident. And if the explosion wasn't an accident, it must have been on purpose. I was very much afraid. The next day, Conklin arrived, and I told him of the explosion and my fear. He expressed great sympathy for the crew, but he knew nothing else about it. Together, we loaded the supplies onto my boat, and midday, we set out to sea to meet the great ship. Keep a steady course, my friend. Hold at 240 degrees. We're low in the water from the cargo. Well, we'll lighten her soon. Fog ahead. Don't worry. I've got a true bearing. And, of course, I've got this. What is it? Kind of radar. I can sight that ship in the fog even if my bearing is wrong. In the fog? You must show me. I will. Straighten her up, my friend. It is lucky that this is a calm sea. I told you. You're a lucky man. The fog surrounded us close and thick. At times I could not even see Conklin, who stood with his radar only seven feet away. I grew tired. It is not difficult to run my boat under most conditions. But fully loaded, it lay close to the water, and each change in course I made with difficulty. I could not see where we were heading, but Conklin didn't mind. He worked with his box, and after a few minutes... A sound came from it. What is it, Conklin? The radar is working. It's working perfectly. Change course to 242 degrees. My boat would not fail me. We had been through a great deal, and I have shown her respect. And now she showed me respect. She worked harder than she was used to. But she did it. We moved through the fog, and my eyes watched the compass constantly. For there was not more to be seen. And then Conklin shouted to me. Stop! Here! We have reached the ship. I can't see it. We have not reached the ship. We've reached a point on the chart. A very small point, but an important one. You see, my friend, the ship will reach us. Fogs at sea can lie thick and dense, swirling walls of white, blinding the traveler. In such a fog, two men wait for a monster ship. Conklin hunched over his radar box, and his face froze in concentration. Several times I wanted to talk with him, but his concentration was so deep that I was afraid to disturb him. The fog was so thick I could not watch the waves, and it seemed wrong to want to fish, so I sat with my thoughts and waited silently. I thought of Sydney and how I would be there soon, rich and respected. I thought of the beautiful women of Sydney and how they would swoon over me. And I thought, I will be nice to them, not like some rich men I have heard of. I will be very nice, and they will be very nice. 
And then Conklin spoke for the first time in two hours. It is here. What? The ship is here. I don't see anything. Look on the screen. Yes. See how this sweeps? I see it. Now, watch. Now, over here. See the blip of green? That is the ship? That's it. About five miles from us. It'll be here in less than an hour. We sat waiting. Conklin looking at his radar and me looking at the fog. I could see nothing. And the silence of the fog began to wear on me. You hear? Yes, Conklin. It's coming. Conklin, are we safe? Safe? Of course. But a ship as big as you say, if it were to hit us, it would break our boat apart and suck us beneath the bow. It could, but it won't. We're very safe here. Because while I'm watching them on this radar, they're watching us on their radar. We're very safe. That is, we're safe if they're hungry for this food. My eyes searched the fog for a sign. In my mind, I thought the ship would run over us, but Conklin seemed so certain that it wouldn't. I was not sure. One moment, I was certain it would run over us, and I began to tremble. And then the fog began to thin, and the thinning slowly became a lifting. And with the lifting, I could see the ship. In my wildest imagination, I could not have imagined a thing like that ship. I could see the bow, but the stern was so far away. Conklin was right. It towered above us so that unless I looked straight up, my vision was all black with the hull. And Conklin was also right in that we were in no danger, for it was not angled toward us. It had come to a complete stop in the water. It was a monster. I raised the sea anchors and started the engine and headed for the monster ship. Its shadow fell nearly a quarter of a mile port side, and we moved into it so that while it was still day, we were moving into darkness. Conklin directed me, and he motioned upward to the deck. They gave him a signal, and he told me to stop the engines. From above on the deck, a crane swung out over us, carrying a large wooden platform. When we could reach it, Conklin and I guided it to our deck, and the two of us loaded it with the supplies. Three times we loaded the platform, and three times it was carried up to the deck, unloaded and lowered again to us. The fourth time completed the delivery of the supplies. Conklin packed his radar box and put his things on top of the boxes of supplies. Full and complete delivery, my friend. You've done a fine job of it. If I start back to the shore now, I'll have light most of the way. Start back? Aren't you curious to see the ship? I'm curious, but I think it is safer for me to leave now. Remember, I must find another source of supply. My friend, you have delivered his promise. Now please step onto the platform. We'll both take a ride up to the deck. Then I must fix the anchor or she will float away. Oh, don't concern yourself with that. You'll have no more need for your boat. No more need? Onto the platform. From somewhere he had pulled out a gun and he pointed it at me. I had no time to think and so I did as he told me and stepped onto the platform. He stepped on the other side and still holding his gun at me, made a signal. The crane pulled us up. And I looked down at my boat as it got smaller and smaller, as we rose higher and higher until finally the crane swung us away from the water and lowered us onto the deck of the ship. As I stepped off the platform onto the deck, Conklin motioned to another man, and he also had a gun in his hand. Here's our provisioner. Take him below with the crew. Right. You will walk ahead of me. Conklin. What is happening? My friend Sanduro, your life on the island has kept you far from, uh, what, the greed of man? <laughs> you are an innocent. I admire that quality. 
You have served your purpose, and I'm afraid we're finished with you. Finished with me? Mm. You you promised me 50,000 Swiss francs. I lied. You lied to me? Ah, what can I say? You know I'm a born liar, and <laughs> lying, lying to you wasn't difficult. Now, I'm afraid there are no 50,000 Swiss francs for you, and I'm sorry to say your life itself is in some question, but you may be certain I'll do what I can for you. My boat? Your boat will be destroyed. It is the final link between the food supply and the ship. And when your boat is destroyed, there will be no way of finding us out here at sea. Conklin, you are a very bad man. Me? Bad? Ah, I suppose you're right. I was led from the deck of the ship to the control building... And the man behind me pushed on an elevator button, and we waited. We stood on a deck just below the bridge of the ship, and I could see out, down to the water, and my boat which had floated away from the great tanker. Then, just as the elevator door opened, my boat turned bright orange, just as Mr. Chow's boat had done. My boat was gone without a trace. My boat, which had served me so well. I wanted to cry with anger, but the armed man pushed me into the elevator and the door closed, shutting me off from the world. I could not guess what was ahead of me, but in my mind I kept thinking, my life is over, my life is over. And I truly thought it was. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Ship. Tricked you. Serves you right. <laughs> How does it feel to be behind these bars? I was too greedy, Captain. I think I should have suspected something. Well, greed gets to all of us at one time or another. Think of the greed of those guys on the bridge who took over my ship. I wonder what they're planning to do with us. I think... I think they will kill us. I think so, too. This, uh... This island you come from, how far would you make it? Two miles. Maybe a little bit more. You hear that? Two miles on a calm sea? It's a possible swim. But we would have to to be out of here to be able to swim. Oh, we can get out all right. We just didn't know there was an <laughs> island out there to get to. And now you know. And now I think it's time for us to leave this ship. Yeah. Me too? Why? After all, you were on their side. I paid for it. My boat is lost. It, it was a big loss for me. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I have a home on the island. There is food... Water and a radio. Uh, Captain, <coughs> we could radio our position. We could. Or he could be setting us up for something. Tell me, Sandero, are you setting a trap for us? Still working for them? Oh, if he is, he'll be with us. It's the same trap. The captain took some tools from somewhere. And with the help of the crew broke the lock on the prison door. Beyond this was a large metal door, and the captain broke through this, its lock, too. It was so easy, I could see that they could have escaped at any time they wanted to. They simply had no place to escape to. We slipped through the empty corridors of the great ship unnoticed until we found a stairway. We moved up the stair past landings and doors... The captain knew his ship, and finally on one landing at one door, he stopped us. Okay, we're on the starboard side. Fifty feet from this door is a ladder to water level. That's a long climb down. Take it slow, you'll be okay. Now remember, the real workout is the swim after we get down. You got it? Well, it's going to be dark out there, so we'll hold on to one another until we get there. 
What if they uh, spot us? If they spot us, just hurry. I figure they're mostly on the bridge. It'll take them ten minutes at least to get to the side. By that time, we'll be part way down. Once we're in the water, we'll be hard to find. Yeah. While we're on that ladder, we'll be like sitting ducks. The captain opened the door, and we stepped onto the deck. It was good to be in the fresh air of the sea, and I breathed deeply as we crept along the side of the ship. Then a strange thing happened. The black sky was suddenly bright with flares. Are they crazy? Using flares near an oil chamber? The flares lit up the sky and the ship, and I thought for sure we would be seen. Prepare to be boarded. We have you covered. Come within 50 yards of us. We'll blow you out of the water. What's happening, Captain? Sounds like someone's trying to hijack the hijackers. What do we do? Keep moving. If they start shooting, this whole ship could blow up. I don't want to think about that. We got to the ladder. One by one, we slipped over the side of the great tanker. The attention of the bridge was on the other ship to port, and they never saw us. It was such a long way down, rung by rung. We climbed down very slowly and more and more painfully. And the farther down we were, the less and less we could hear of what was going on between the ships. We climbed down, and as I moved, I thought of the oil that was just beyond the metal plating of the ship, inches from my face, and that it was getting ready to explode. Okay, men. I you bet your direction... The only thing they can tell you is to swim. And let's hope we get out of here before they find us. The worse that the whole thing goes. Two miles. Only two miles. Let's put on some distance. We all swam, each at his own pace. I am not a fast swimmer, and in the darkness, I felt that everyone had swum ahead of me. But even though I am not fast, I am constant. And in a while... I turned back to see how far I had swum. The dark shape of the ship could be seen under the light of the flares. I had swum a good distance. I looked for the captain, and I looked for the crew but could not see them, and I thought it would not be smart to call out to them. So I turned back toward the island and began swimming again. My arms were heavy, but I thought, it is my wind. I will be better. And I swam on until something made me stop again. And I turned back to see the ship. What the captain had said might happen had really happened. What I saw was a great ball of fire rise from the middle of the ship into the air. And then a second ball of fire rose from the bow of the ship. And then another and another explosion until instead of a ship... I was looking only at fire, and within the fire I thought I could see the ship rise into the air. I could feel the heat, and I knew I must continue to swim, for such explosion would cause a wave of water, and if I'm caught, I will drown. I swam as hard as I could, and my mind was a blank with only one thought in it, to reach my island before the wave. But I was not strong enough. And in the darkness, I could hear the wave coming for me, rushing for me. And then I felt caught up in it, twisted by it, enveloped in it. I was spinning in the dark water, and after I gasped for air, the black night and the black water closed onto me. I gasped for my life. My lungs filled, and I tried to cry out, but my mind went blank, and I slipped into another world. what happened after my body reached the shore of my island. I know only from stories of the villagers. I heard that there was a wall of fire around the island from the oil, and it was a mile high and lasted a week, but I do not believe it. I heard that the men of the island pulled their boats ashore to keep them from burning because the whole ocean was on fire, but my boat was already destroyed. And so I can only tell what has been told to me. 
I heard that the tides and wind shifted so that the ocean of oil floated away from our island. But I saw none of these things, for I lay unconscious for nearly two weeks, tended by the islanders. And there was talk among them that I was failing, and that soon I would die. One morning, after two weeks of unconsciousness, my eyes opened and I slowly began to see my home on the island. Casey, one of the fishermen, came in to look after me, and he told me of what happened. You should have seen it. He tried to tell me of everything that had happened, but my mind was on the captain, and I stopped his talk to learn about the crew. They are gone. Dead? No. A helicopter came for them. I've never seen such a huge helicopter. And they were all alive. Well, almost. One died in the wave. Let me tell you about the wave. Only one dead. A miracle. It's all a miracle. Will you let me tell you about it? And he told me about it. But I was too weak to listen. And when I was well, he told me again. By the time I was out of bed, the island was normal again. A month later, some money came for me from the company that owned the tanker. It was a reward for saving the captain and most of his crew. It wasn't a large sum, but it was enough to buy another boat. Since Mr. Chow died, I took over his route. Now I am supplier to all the islands here. It is not a big life for me, but it is better than before. I have stopped dreaming of Sydney and the beautiful women. They were only dreams. I have my own life, and it is here. Sometimes, I think back to Conklin. Poor Conklin. And what he told me. Perhaps I am a lucky man. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Ship, was written by Andre Stoika and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Deboy. Our stars were Brock Peters and John Damon. Featured in the cast were Tyler McVeigh, Marvin Miller, and Andre Stoika. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears. A name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. Fifty-nine years ago, a rebel chieftain arose in the Rift Mountains of Morocco. His name was Abdul Krim. 
and for five years he fought against the combined French and Spanish armies with remarkable success. He was a colorful and, some said, a romantic sort of figure, a desert warrior. In fact, his exploits inspired a light opera of the time, The Desert Song. But while guerrilla warfare may be colorful, the color of flowing blood, it's not in the least romantic. For example, in 1921, the Spanish army in Morocco numbered 19,000 troops. Abdul Krim's furious tribesmen massacred 16,000 of them. Abdul Krim was a cruel and violent man, and he had an uncontrollable lust for blood. Well, Abdul Krim's been dead for 17 years now, but the legend lives on, and so does his family. One of his grandsons, more ruthless and even more violent, is trying to take over where Abdul Krim left off. He's in the Rift Mountains, gathering an army together, and he too has an uncontrollable lust for blood. John, this is Helen. I'm off to Morocco for a week or two. I want to interview Hamid Krim before he either gets too big to answer questions or gets killed off. I'll be out of touch for a while, but when I come back, it'll be with an exclusive. Good. Thank you, John. Helen West, one of the best foreign correspondents in the business. She's no fool. But she's rushing in where angels, if they had any sense at all, would very definitely fear to tread. It's liable to cost her her life. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, North from Marrakesh, by Alan Caillou. Our stars, Hans Conried, Antoinette Bauer, and Len Berman. In spite of all reports to the contrary, there are still some young people around today who want to get married. I like that. Of course, there are sometimes obstacles to be overcome, even before you start out. Well, hi there, Virgil. Hi, Norma. Oh, what beautiful flowers. What are they, roses or something? Uh, yes. Is Helen home? No. Oh. Well, maybe I can come in and wait for her. Sure, Virgil. Anything you say, come on in. Hey, that's a great fire she's got going there. It's cold tonight. Oh, is it? I didn't know. I'm always warm. You want a drink? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Is she going to be long? Who? Helen, Norma. Oh, Helen. Yeah, I guess so. Well, how long, Norma? Um, she figured a couple of weeks. I'm house-sitting for her. A couple of weeks? Yeah, she left yesterday. I have to feed the budgie and water all those house plants. Oh, my. Where'd she go this time? Oh, a place called Morocco. Uh... That's in um, Marrakesh. Norma, I know where Marrakesh is. But oh. What's she doing there? I mean, I came to propose to her. You know what a proposal is, Norma? It's kind of old-fashioned these days. Oh, sure I know. I'm not dumb. I get them all the time. <laughs> Cheers. Marrakesh. Oh, I need this drink. Uh, she went there to interview a man named Abdul Krim. He's going to take over all of North Africa and give the Western world a really bad time. Norma, Abdul Krim has been dead for nearly 20 years. Yes, that's what she said. Where does Abdul Krim come into all this? Oh, oh, I remember. Well, this guy she went to interview is his grandfather's 
grandson. That could apply to a lot of people, Norma. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a rebel chieftain in the Rift Mountains. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, we're talking about Hamid Krim? That's what I said, Virgil. Hamid Krim. And Helen thinks he's taking over... Hey, she's on to a very good thing. Now, why didn't I think of that? Can I use the phone, Norma? I have to call my office. Oh, sure, Virgil. You can use anything you like. You know that. Yeah. Charlie, Virgil. Listen, Helen West... You know Helen West from the opposition? Charlie, I suggest there are some things you don't know. Okay, make a note. Helen West is on her way to Marrakesh to interview Hamid Krim, grandson of the legendary Abdel Krim, and I'm going out there, too, to get that exclusive out from right under her nose. When's the next flight to Morocco, Charlie? Okay, that gives me lots of time. Have a ticket for me there at Kennedy and send a cable for me to Magda. Do you know Magda? Oh, shut up, Charlie. Tell her I'm on flight, whatever it is, and have her meet me. Great. See you. Who's Magda, Virgil? Well, now, Magda runs a thing called Unified Press in Morocco. It takes care of all us foreign correspondents. She's really very cute, and she thinks I'm fantastic. Virgil, you don't really care who you marry, do you? Well, uh, let's examine that comment. I really do have my mind set on Helen right now. Why don't you marry me instead? We'd go great together, and I'm right here, not in Morocco. Norma, I have to say it. You're a wonderful woman. I still... don't want to be a wonderful woman. I want to be a wife. Norma. Let me tell you about Helen. She's got a great face, but, well, it's the kind of face that if the body's great, too, okay, then she's terrific. You know what I mean? I got both of them going for me, Virgil. <laughs> yes, well, Norma, sometimes I think you're not as dumb as I most times think you are. But two hours from now, I have to hightail it to the airport to fly to Marrakesh. Two hours? <laughs> you want another drink? <laughs> mountains of Morocco are a long, long way from home. They're harsh, rugged, forbidding. Nothing can live here except goats and bandits. And Helen West is blithely on her way to a rendezvous with disaster. She's not even aware of the great danger she's in. Mustafa, do you really think this decrepit old jeep is going to get us there? Oh, yes, Missy. It's very good jeep. Little time now we find in camp of Hamid Krim. Very dangerous man. He's killing everybody. Maybe he cut our throats, too. Well, frankly, I doubt that. Everybody says he's some kind of barbarous maniac, and yet if he were really so terrible, you wouldn't have agreed so readily to find him for me. Don't you think that makes sense? Uh, when we see what people like me will do for money, it is best to be sad and not think at all. This... A very dangerous business, Missy, for both of us. I won't believe it, Mustafa. The great Abdel Krim fought against colonial oppression. All his sons were educated in Europe, even his brother. And his grandsons. Hamid Krim was educated at Sandhurst Military Academy in England. He's practically a British army officer. He cannot be the ruthless maniac he's made out to be. And that's what I want to find out about. Hamid Krim is still Berber, Missy. A Berberi of the Barbary states as I am. And the Berbers are the most dangerous people in the world today. Never forget that. Magda! Oh, my, it's great to see you again. You look fantastic. Uh, a new hairstyle, you like? Fantastic, how are you? Great. It's so good to see you, Virgil. Come over here. 
Unified Press Office on Sharia Bulam. Would you care for some Arak? It's all I have here. Great. So, what are you doing in Morocco, Virgil? The cable said absolutely nothing. I'm looking for Helen West. You know her? Sure, I know her. But she's not in Morocco. She'd have checked with me. Cheers. Cheers. She's after an exclusive. Ah, then she would not have checked with me. With whom? Hamid Krim. What? With Hamid Karim? Yeah. She's crazy. We all know that. But she's not on her way up into the Reef Mountain to talk with him, I hope. I can only assume that she is. Oh, my Lord. Well, I guess we have to write Helen West off. A pity. She had a great future ahead of her. Stripped of all the adverse publicity he's been getting lately, how bad is he, Magda? Truly. His grandfather, Abdel Karim, was one of the most violent men in history. Hamid is far, far worse. Let me tell you just what kind of man he is. There were two French journalists here recently. They went up there to interview him, too. Now, Hamid Karim has maybe 2,000 men with him, 10 or 20,000 rifles, a lot of rocket launchers. Heavens only knows how many bazookas, and he's got seven tanks and one aircraft, and a little balanca he hijacked. Well, he took those two French journalists up in his plane, and he dropped them on Marrakesh, Virgil, from 5,000 feet, without benefit of parachutes. Mm. This is the man your Helen has gone to interview. But Helen is a woman, and a very attractive woman at that. So, maybe she'll last a little longer. Hamid is quite a man for the ladies. But don't expect to see her again, Virgil. Ever. Just write her off. Then somehow i got to get her out of there. Impossible. There's got to be a way. Can I get help from the military? Not a chance. He's got an absolute fortress up there. And everyone knows where it is, but it's, it's really quite impregnable. And the bizarre gossip is that the Moroccan Air Force is about to mount an aerial attack on his camp and blow him sky high. When? We can't be sure. But it could be any moment now. Then I have to get up there fast, don't I? How do I do that? Well, if you've got your heart set on suicide, there is a mad American pilot in town. His name is Bindix. Aloysius Bindix. If you can find him, and if he's drunk enough, he'll fly you up to the Reef Mountains. But you need a bodyguard, too. Can I give you a name? Magda, I need all the help I can get. A man named Suleiman. He was a police inspector, but he just got fired. He's tough and knowledgeable, and he'll do anything for money. You'll need him, Virgil, if you're ever going to get out of there alive. Can I trust him? But as far as you can throw him, and he's a very heavy man. But if you give him some money up front and promise him a great deal more when you get back, if you get back, maybe it will work out. I don't know. It's a pretty small chance, Virgil. I have to take it. So tell me where to find this Solomon. Number 32, Sharia Fulani. Okay. Thanks for the help, Magda. Virgil, hmm? if I never see you again. You bet. So long, Magda. This is Majda. Get a message up to Hamid Karim at once. Tell him there's another one on his way up there. A man named Virgil Fraser. You know, it 
it's sometimes very easy to walk all unsuspecting into dangers that you can't walk out of quite so easily. And Helen West, a young, attractive, and very sure of herself foreign correspondent, is walking into just that kind of trouble. It's all part of the necessary business of keeping the public informed about what's going on throughout the world. Sometimes, it's easy to forget that a number of good reporters have lost their lives doing just that. Mustafa, there's a man up there on, on the bluff, a man with a rifle. Oh, yes, Missy. Another one over there, you see? And over there, and over there. For half an hour now, they're everywhere around us. And listen, listen. There's horses, I think. Oh, yes, many horses. Now, now I think we have very bad trouble. They tell us to get down, Missy. Better we do that, I think. Okay, but I want my equipment. My camera. I my, have my it. tape recorder. I have it, I have it. Mustafa. Mustafa, what yes. are they trying to do? They throw the jeep over the cliff, Missy. We're lucky they don't throw us over, too. Oh, it was a good jeep. Come, Missy. We go with them to Hamid Krim's camp. Yes. Well, that is what we came all this way for, isn't it? But I have to admit I'm frightened now. No, no, no. Do, do not be frightened, Missy. You must not be frightened. You must have courage. Because mine is all gone. <laughs> You were recommended to me, Mr. Suleiman, by Magda Esborn over at Unified Press. She said you were tough and knowledgeable and would do anything for money. Oh, how kind of her. Really a very perspicacious lady, if I may say so. She also said you'd recently been fired from the police department. I'm sure it's none of my damn business, so I won't ask why. Oh, but I insist you know, Mr. Fraser. I was treated most abominably. I was fired for corruption. For corruption, Mr. Fraser. And I must postulate, sir, that it is not customary anywhere in the civilized world to dismiss a respected police officer for such a trifle. <laughs> corruption, indeed. It is merely that I was getting bribes my commanding officer thought should be his. And what shall I do now? I have twelve children. I must eat three times a day, and I have no money. Eat three times a day? Oh, you mean feed. Precisely, Mr. Fraser. I have to feed on them three times a day like a good father. And the little beasts are always hungry. Money, Mr. Fraser, it is always a question of money. An honest man simply cannot live without the bribes he has become accustomed to. Uh, yes. Well, Magda suggested I might hire your services as sort of, uh, I don't know, guide and bodyguard, I suppose, for a trip into the Rift Mountains. Ah. Ah. Uh, there is nothing in the Rift Mountains to interest a foreign journalist, Mr. Fraser, except... Except Hamid Krim, yes. I want to go to his camp. Did Magda tell you also that Hamid Krim's men murdered my father? No. No, she didn't. And if that means... They, at they attacked my village, Mr. Fraser. And my father, my four brothers, two uncles, and seven women of my family. They were all killed in the massacre. A village called Sarit. Remember the name. Sarit. I'm sorry, Solomon, I didn't know. Well, thanks for the drink, anyway. Oh, wait, wait, Mr. Fraser. Uh, your business with uh, Hamid Krim is to his advantage? Probably not. Ah, uh, then, given sufficient uh, impetus, I will take you there. Impetus? Money, Mr. Fraser, is not, as you Westerners say, the root of all evil. It is merely one of its most beautiful flowers. Oh. Well, I thought 50 bucks a day for two or three days would be about right. If I were to parade my 12 starving children before you, Mr. Fraser, I am convinced you would reflect on the insufficiency of that offer. 
Come look at their bloated bellies. Suleiman, I already saw some of your damn kids. They don't have bloated bellies. They're just fat. A hundred a day, then, plus a sizable bonus when we return. Done. Okay. Tell me where I can find a man named Aloysius Bendix, a pilot. Captain Bendix? Ah, at this time of day, Mr. Fraser, uh, Captain Bendix will be in the bazaar getting drunk. Well, let's go find him, shall we? I'd like you to know, Hamid Krim, I'm very upset just now. Oh, really? And why should that be? Because your men threw my jeep over a cliff. I'll never get back to Marrakesh without it. How true. But you won't need it now, Miss West. You came looking for me, you found me, and now you will stay a while. Long enough for an interview, yes. Oh, yes, the interview. It will be well publicized. Very well, yes. In that case, I agree. The more people learn of my plans, Miss West, the more they will stand in fear of me. And fear is a very powerful weapon that I know how to use. But I must leave you now. I'm expecting a visit from the Moroccan Air Force, and I must look to my defenses. We will talk again tonight. Meanwhile, you are free to make yourself at home in the village. We Berbers are known for our hospitality. And there's an execution you may want to watch, to photograph for your gutter press. But remember that, like this miserable Mustafa here, you are my prisoner. Don't try to escape. We are also known for our marksmanship, too. Hasane! Hadar, ya sheikh! Why should I want to escape, Hamid Grimm? I came here to get your philosophies down on tape. When I've done that, I'll worry about getting home. Not before. Oh, you are a very aggressive young woman, aren't you? And it isn't my only virtue, I assure you. We shall consider your virtue tonight. All right, Mustafa. Let's take a look at the village. I want to get some shots before we lose the light. I don't like it, Missy. This is a very dangerous man. I don't think we get out of here alive. Nonsense. It's all just bluster. Ah! What was that? Hamid Krim said an execution, Missy. Oh, my God. Listen. Isn't that a plane? This is a plane. I think they shoot it down now. Better you have camera ready, Missy. Captain Bendix, they hit us. Yeah, yeah. We took a couple of shots there. Everybody all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Well, at least we found the camp. A lot of very angry men there, Mr. Fraser. With guns. Well, don't worry about it. We're coming into the valley now. A little valley called Wadi Minfa. Okay. That's where I'm going to drop you off. You have maybe two hours climbing to Hamid Krim's camp. Hey, Captain Bendix, your fuel tanks. Well, what about them? The gauges say empty. Hell, those gauges, they haven't been working for five years. we got plenty of gas. Okay, fasten your seat belts. We're going down. <laughs> what am I saying? We don't have any seat belts. Okay, everybody out here. I'll be here tomorrow at first light. I don't really believe you'll be, but the deal's a deal. You got any idea just how you're going to get your girlfriend out of there? I wish I had. Play it off the cuff, I guess. Well, I'd volunteer to help you, except for one thing. Oh, and what's that, Bendix? <laughs> I got more sense. I'll see ya. It looks like a long, hard climb, doesn't it? Never mind, Mr. Fraser. Think of the great reward that is waiting for us at the end of it. All those angry men with their guns. And here they come now, Mr. Fraser. 
But they're not firing. That is absolutely correct. It means they want us alive. And shall I tell you what they might do to us? No. I'm trying very hard not to think about that. West, did you photograph that execution? No, I did not. Oh, well, I can easily arrange another one for you if you wish. Do you really want the whole world to see that sort of thing? Yes, I told you, and you don't listen, do you? I told you, the more people who fear me, the better I like it. They must learn that I am not a man to be trifled with, that this is the fate of anyone who stands in my way. Oh, come, we sit here on the sand, and you may interview me. Photographs? Tape recorder? Of course. I want my ambitions to be known to the whole of your damned western world. Okay, we're recording. First, Hamid Krim, will you repeat that last comment, please? I want the western world to know that anyone who stands in the way of my ambitions will be removed. And what are your ambitions, Hamid Krim? First... The conquest of my own country, Morocco. Then the subjugation of Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. By force of arms. You are a very foolish young woman if you believe there is any other way. Then you're talking about all-out war. In the desert, yes. We Berbers are very good in the desert. In the cities, by more devious methods. By selective assassination. By selective assassination? What do you mean exactly? I mean the present rulers and their minions who are all pawns of Western imperialism. From Marrakesh all the way to Cairo, I have more than a hundred names all marked down for assassination. For the record, Hamid Krim, can we call that murder? Call it what you will, dear lady. Death has as many names as it has forms. As my army grows, my power grows. And so will my list of victims till there is not one man left who would dare stand against me. There is one war in the lexicon of all great rulers that must never be forgotten. And that war is kill. Hamid Krim, will you tell me how many men you have under your command? No comment. I will say only that when my illustrious grandfather, Abdel Krim, died in exile, mark you, he still had 400,000 adherents to his cause. Soon I will have far, far more. And then... Uh... Well, Mr. Virgil Fraser, I do believe. Virgil! Helen, thank God I found you. I made trip. You know my name. Well, I was expecting you, Mr. Fraser. I'm kept well informed about the machinations of my enemies. Enemies? I'm not your enemy, Hami Krim. I just came here to... Uh, well, to help Helen out with her interview. Virgil, I don't need help. Then sit down, Mr. Fraser. Where were we, Miss West? You were saying you'd kill anyone who stood in your way. Oh, yes, of course. And about that, what about those two French reporters? What French reporters? Shut up, darling. Why did you murder them, Hamid Krim? Why? Because I thought they might perhaps be spies. As both of you might well be, too. Wait, wait. I have to flip the tape. Hold the thought. Okay, off the top. Virgil? Why did you murder those two French journalists, Hamid Krim? All they wanted was an interview from you. I executed them, Mr. Fraser, because I thought they might be spies, as you might well be, too. And at the moment, for the record, I'm wondering what I should do with you. I might have you buried in the sand up to your necks for the children to throw stones at. You're forgetting one thing, Hamid Krim. Oh? And what is that? You said it yourself. You want the whole world to hear your philosophies, as it will. You can't afford to kill us. And is that what you are counting on? Yes. I thought as much. Your manner has been arrogant and offensive ever since you first came here. Yes, I want to see that tape made public. But I can easily send it down to my friends at Unified Press. It does not need your physical presence. He's got a point there, Virgil. 
In the morning, I will decide what is to be done with you both. Tonight, Mr. Fraser, you will sleep here under guard. Miss West will sleep with me. I can't permit that, Ahmed Krim. You can't permit it? You have no say in the matter at all. She is my prisoner. And I do with my prisoners as I wish. And in her case... It... That's the Moroccan Air Force, Hamid Krim. Come to bomb you the hell and gone out of here. I know. There is a cave a hundred yards behind you. Take this west there. I send a guard with you. Ali, Romagum! Suleiman, Mustafa, come with us! Okay, we should be safe here. This cave's a natural, natural air raid shelter. Suleiman, our guard. You think he speaks English? No, Mr. Fraser. A mountain man, which is to say, an ignoramus. Okay, when I belt him in the gut, you grab that machine pistol. And then we'll all get the hell out of here. Please, Mr. Fraser, allow me to handle this delicate matter for you. You see, Mr. Fraser, there is nothing in the world more formidable than the anger of a righteous man. And if you would like me to cut his throat, I will be most happy to oblige. Really, very happy indeed. No, no he's out cold. Suleiman, can you and Mustafa guide us down the mountainside in the dark? Virgil, where to? We can't just walk out of here. It's 200 miles to Marrakesh. There's a plane coming for us at dawn. A place called Wadi Minfa. Wadi Minfa? It means... The Valley of Dried Out Bones. Watch out, rock slide. Dear Lord, I nearly fell. It's an awfully long way to fall. Where's Mustafa? He's not with us anymore. Do not worry about Mustafa, Miss West. He knows where Wadi Minfa is. He will catch up. Oh. Will they come looking for us, Solomon? Oh, yes, if they survive that bombing. But this is a very large mountain, Miss West, and they will not know where to look. It will be for them like looking for a haystack with a needle. And we are there. What do you mean for? Better you sleep now till the plane arrives. I will keep watch. Mr. Fraser! Mr. Fraser, wake up! We have trouble. We have adversity crawling towards us on its hands and knees. Uh, a man out there. And where there is one, there may be many others. Oh, my God. Oh, what a lovely Shh, morning. Shh, we've been discovered. Oh, no. Wait. He, he, it's Mustafa. And he's been hurt. I will go to help him. Virgil, I'm scared. Yes, me too. Are you sure this plane is coming for us? I'm hoping. He's been shot, Mr. Fraser. He is dying. Miss, Missy West, is she here? I'm here, Mustafa. What happened? I, I, be, I betrayed you. I told, told Hamid Krim that plane come for you this morning to Wadi Minfa. I, I'm hoping, hoping for a reward. But Hamid Krim become very angry, and he, he shot me dead and leave me there. All night long, I crawled down mountain to tell you my revenge. Mustafa, tell us what? Wait, my dying breath. Hamid Krim. I think he may be come here soon, looking for you. Very angry man. Uh, uh, he... Oh, God. He is dead, Miss West. We will leave him here for the jackals to feed on. They too will die, and the vultures will feed on them. And when the vultures die and fall to earth as they must, it will be a turn of the ants to feed on them. It is what is called in your language ecology. And I brought him here. Hey, that's Pendix. 
Virgil! Virgil, they're on the mountains. Horses! Yes, it is Hamid Krim and some of his men. Bandits! Come on in, damn you! Hamid Krim and four men. Do not worry, Miss West. I have a good machine pistol. Get up there, fast. Come on, honey, move your Solomon, hands. come on. No, I wait for them to get within range, Mr. Fraser. Are you crazy? Get aboard. Yes, something. It is better you take off now, Mr. Fraser, without me. There is something I must do now. Solomon, get on board. Hamid Krim, remember Sarit? Sarit, my village. Remember the name to wonder what a submachine gun can do in the hands of a capable man. You okay, Suleiman? No, he's been shot. Okay, Suleiman, grab my arm. Uh, you think, Mr. Freeman, this is the first time my poor body has been the recipient of barbarians' bullets? No, I have had in my time a nemiety of them. Nemiety? Suleiman, why don't you just speak English like the half-civilized savage you are? Okay, boys and girls, let's go. Yeah. Uh. Hey, well, some kind soul, you want, want to pass me the bourbon bottle that's under the seat there? Me first, Captain Bendix. Two things, Helen, in order of their relative importance. Do we still have the tape? And will you marry me? Yes, Virgil. And yes. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, North from Marrakesh, was written by Alan Caillou and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Hans Conry, Antoinette Bauer, and Len Berman. Featured in the cast were Peggy Weber, Shepard Bacon, Richard Peel, and Alan Caillou. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lauren Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. The spotter helicopter flits across the rose and blue summer sky of the polar regions in search of leviathan prey. The most tremendous creatures the world has ever known are not extinct. Not yet. The peaceful whales, twice the size of the largest dinosaur ever unearthed, were not always so wantonly slaughtered by man. Whales once ruled the oceans fearing nothing, neither great white shark nor man. They once breathed freely, 
mated, and suckled their young with milk. They once grew. Their persecution began less than 200 years ago. Not even a tiny tear in the eye of carbon-dated time. But enough time for man to push their species to the brink of extinction. Spotter 1 to ship. Sector 7 is empty. I'm now commencing sweep of Sector 6. The helicopter will radio for a capture boat when he makes whale contact. And the capture boat will respond bearing death at the end of an explosive-tipped harpoon. The whales have learned to sound, dive deep at the approach of a catcher boat's engines. They must surface shortly for air. Violent death is inevitable, for the whales have small chance of evading the spotter helicopter. This is the story of one blue whale's revenge. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Whale Savers by Bruce Martin. Our stars, Tommy Cook, Joan McCall, and True Boardman. Eagles circled the sky, high above the international queue of ships docked in England's thriving Liverpool Harbor. One ship, the Requiem, completes its preparations for a voyage different from that of any other ship in the harbor. The Requiem's voyage has but one purpose, to save whales. And that young man with the duffel bag slung over his shoulder, walking up the Requiem's gangplank, intends to join the crusade, one way or another. Hold on, mate. You're boarding the wrong ship. This is the Requiem, isn't it? It is. Well, then I've got the right ship. Captain Sutherland didn't mention that a Yank or anybody else would be signing aboard today. Well, maybe Captain Sutherland told the first mate to expect me and the first mate forgot to mention it to you. I am the first mate. Oh. I think you've got a delivery down there. Yes, it's our last load of fresh vegetables. Oh, button up, love. I know you're there. Look, the captain is expecting me. <sighs> All right. I can watch you the whole way up the bridge from here. Keep one eye on my stuff, will you? Everything I own is in that duffel bag. Come in. Captain Sutherland, I'm Mark Grogan. Who? Oh, you. How did you get aboard my ship? Well, your first mate sent me up. I wrote you in my letters that I'd be dropping by for an interview. Yes, I stopped answering your letters after the first two. I have no need for a photojournalist. Well, I wrote you I'd be willing to sign on in any capacity. Deckhand, coal stoker, cook, you name it, just for the experience. Whatever educational training you've had, obviously failed to explain the concept of the word no. Captain, you can't say no. The Requiem is setting out on an adventure I just have to document. There's so little true adventure left in the world today. Mr. Grogan, you are not welcome aboard the Requiem. Please leave. Immediately. As I went down the stairs from the bridge to the deck, I remember how much I hated Captain Sutherland for standing between me and the story that would make my professional reputation. Later, a great blue whale would radically change my selfish attitude. But that was later. While I was walking down those stairs, I had almost given up the story until I overheard the conversation of two crew members walking ahead of me. In an instant, I realized they were my ticket aboard the Requiem. But, Sushi, you must take my turn. Always there are grumbles when I cook. I'm not grumbling. (laughs) You haven't tasted my cooking yet. I grumble while I cook, and everybody else grumbles when they taste my cooking. Nigel, I don't enjoy cooking either. But since our galley cook decided marriage was more fun than spending three months at sea saving whales, we all have to take our turns. Excuse me. I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. You see, I just applied for the cook's position. Oh, this is wonderful news. Yes. My name's Mark Grogan. And I am Nigel Olson, a resident marine biologist aboard the Requiem. And this beautiful young lady standing here beside me is... Soshi Nakamura. 
Anyone who reads a newspaper would recognize your face, Miss Nakamura. You have a good memory, Mr. Grogan. I haven't been in the public eye for two years. But you were saying Captain Sutherland has signed you on as the Requiem's cook? Actually, he turned me down. Why? Do you have no experience? Well, I worked as a short order cook my last three years at college. And I can cook from a cookbook, which is no small talent. Why, compared to the rest of us, this young man is practically a chef. Did the captain say why he didn't hire you? I think it's because I'm not a committed conservationist like the rest of you. Then why do you want to sail with us? For the adventure. I don't want to put my foot in my mouth, but... I do have ambitions of writing someday. What kind of writing do you do? Story writing. I hope to be a novelist. But the pay is small aboard this ship. I'd work for room and board. I want this experience that bad. So she... I think Mr. Grogan would be a welcome asset. I agree. Let's go talk to the captain. (laughs) You must be some charmer to bring this impressive delegation with you, Mr. Grogan. I'm just persistent, Captain. Yeah, that you are. Well, Soshi, Nigel, you're certain you both feel Mr. Grogan would fit in aboard the Requiem? Of course. A galley cook would allow your crew to concentrate on their duties instead of worrying about who cooks next. Yeah. And the fact that he plans to write about our voyage doesn't bother either one of you. And Mark told us about his writing. Very well, then. Now, uh... Uh, before you assign ship's papers, Mr. Grogan, you should understand that any dereliction of duty is grounds for immediate dismissal. I'll drop you off at the nearest port. I understand. Of course, when we reach the Antarctic, there will be no nearest port. <laughs> there will be no ports at all. We're sailing to the South Pole? Yes. We've had a first-hand report, a ship, that the Demus and a refrigeration ship are headed into Antarctic waters to hunt blue whales. What? Blue whales are protected by the International Whaling Commission. Nigel, why are you upset? You know pirate whalers don't recognize any of the International Whaling Commission's laws or quotas. When I am no longer outraged by illegal whaling, then the time is near when all whales may become extinct. I sign here, Captain. That's right. Soshi, please radio the harbor authorities that Mr. Mark Grogan has been officially added to the crew. Certainly, Captain. <laughs> I have the latest weather forecast, Captain. Good. And I brought the Harbor Authority's confirmation on Mark Rogan's listing. Yeah. How's the weather look? Cold and clear. Yeah, that's what I like to hear. You know, you know, you really surprised me walking in here with that Grogan. I didn't sign him on because I thought the last person you'd want to sail with would be a journalist. Then you suddenly... Mark didn't tell us he was a journalist. You said you knew all about his writing. He sees a big story in our confrontation with the Demas. I see. I can't believe how he misrepresented himself to Nigel and me. Uh, too late to do anything about it now. Grogan signed his papers. I think he sees this voyage as his big chance to make a name for himself. Well, I won't help him. You can tell him that the first chance you get. Why don't you tell him yourself? It'll have more bite coming from you. Don't worry. I will. <laughs> conservationist ship, Requiem, maintains its southerly heading through the cold Atlantic. She's bound for even colder waters in the Antarctic and a high seas confrontation with the pirate whaler, Demos. But the Requiem's quest is not exactly a harmonious adventure for the entire crew. So she, he surprised me. I'm looking for an egg beater. If you're here for a preview of tonight's dinner, it's breaded filet of sole. I can't believe your nerve, Mr. Grogan. Whoa, whoa, what's got into you? Quit playing so innocent. You lied to Nigel and me so we would help you get the cook's job aboard the Requiem. I didn't lie about anything. You lied when you neglected to tell us you were a reporter. Oh, okay, maybe I wasn't totally candid when you asked me what kind of writing I do. But I'm not here working on an assignment for anybody. I'm... I'm an aspiring journalist and photographer. Just be sure to leave my name out of your stories. I told you I'm not in the public eye anymore, and I want to keep it that way. Soshi, two years ago, you were the most photographed, the most talked about model in New York. 
You still have a large public out there interested in you. You could be the story of the year. The story of the year is being killed by explosive harpoons in the oceans. As for me, I just want to be an ordinary person again. Understand? Okay. Okay, you call the shots. I meant what I said. Stay away from me. I bet most whalers are just ordinary men earning a living, supporting families. Ordinary men don't hunt blue whales. I wasn't talking about pirate whalers, Smithy. The sad part, Mark, is that what we whale preservationists are advocating, such things as population dynamics and stock assessments, are in the whalers' best interests. The only trouble is the whalers don't believe us. What do you think, Soshi? Uh, come and join us. Smithy and Nigel have been educating me in our big fish of the sea. You use the word a fish, Mr. Grogan, the way the whalers do. Whales are mammals, like you and me. Pardon my semantics. Oh, we're a bit touchy this evening, Soshi. Must be those bad whale dreams you get. <laughs> the whales always die in Soshi's dreams. They've recurred ever since she was a young girl. What would make a young girl dream about dead whales? I suppose if I don't tell you, Nigel will. Well, now, if you prefer, my dear, we can change the subject. No, no, it's all right. When I uh, first moved to New York with my father, a large envelope was left outside our apartment door. Inside the envelope were horrible pictures of dead whales. Whales killed by catcher boats my father owned. It was conservationists who left the pictures for her father. Did you show the pictures to your father? Yes, he tore them up. Fashi's father is still a major stockholder in the Japanese whaling industry. Now I understand why you're aboard the Requiem. Oh, do you? Yes, I think I do. Tell me, why do the pirate whalers go to so much trouble to hunt the blue whales? Greed. That's why. Greed. Blue whales yield twice as much oil and meat as their closest cousin, the fin whale. Yes, there's great prestige, too, when a whaler kills a blue. Blue whales are clever and difficult to catch. What are you writing there in the dark? I'm just jotting down a few notes. I wish I would have been warned I'd be quoted. They're only reference notes and facts. I'm not quoting anybody. I like not having to worry what I say with my friends in private. Good night, everyone. Uh, good night. Nah. Everything I do upsets that lady. Easy, mate. You're letting her get under your skin. That's trouble. No, not me, Smithy. I'm not interested in trouble. Of course I was lying. I knew I needed Soshi's interview to sell my story. The more she ignored me, the more interested in her I became. I didn't like the situation but I accepted it as a hazard of the job. When the Requiem reached the coast of Argentina, I was on the bridge calmly discussing food spoilage with the captain. Well, someone obviously forgot to double-check the seal on the flour container. Otherwise, a week's worth of flour wouldn't have spoiled. Okay, I'll see that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, good. You do realize a food shortage could delay our pursuit of the Demas. I hope you're a better journalist than you are a galley cook. That's photojournalist. And I am. C Captain Sutherland? Yes, Saucy, what is it? I just received this telex message out of Buenos Aires. It's from the Demas. Well, now we know that the Demas knows we're coming. Yeah, please read the telex, Saucy. Buenos Aires, October 2nd. Attention, Captain Requiem and crew. The Demas sails under the international laws of the sea. We will defend our right to fish sea lanes with force. The Demas possesses a peculiar view of international law. What are they expecting us to do when we find them? Start a war? It would appear that the Demas is prepared to fight one. The Requiem's pursuit of the pirate whaler Demos has taken her past Cape Horn, the tip of South America. Cape Horn's weather is recognized as the most violent in the world. One thousand miles of gale force winds lie ahead of the Requiem before she reaches the South Georgia Islands, where the great blue whales feed on the abundant accumulations of floating mollusks amid towering icebergs. Here in these primordial Antarctic summer seas, the pirate whalers make their kills. Mark, your galley is the only warm place on the ship in this end. 
Come on in and share the warmth, Nigel. Oh, thank you. Uh, the Requiem is a small ship, Mark. I, since the last week, you're not happy. It shows, huh? Yes. Whenever so she enters the room? Yeah. So she's been crossing my wires all right. I'd hoped she'd changed her mind and grant me an interview by now, but she hasn't spoken to me since the night the four of us sat out on the deck talking about whales. I think so she forms a new opinion of you. Well, she should know I wouldn't write anything about her. She wouldn't want people to read. Well, maybe a little item. She needs time. She's had almost three weeks to change her mind about me. Three weeks. Other twelve. We've not yet even sighted the demos. You're right. I won't press, Soshi. Oh! Ah! Nigel, are you all right? I, I hit my shoulder. And you? Yeah, I'm fine. But lunch will have to be scraped up off the floor. Listen. Listen. No onions. We stopped dead in the water. What happened? Possibly we struck an iceberg. I'll grab my camera. Let's go have a look. Blast! That hurts! Watch, watch Smithy's leg. Careful tearing him below. Soshi, what happened to Smithy? Smithy broke his ankle in a collision. Oh, poor guy. He won't like being laid up. What did we hit? It An iceberg? Have, it might have been a, a submerged iceberg. No one's confirmed anything yet. Captain, look to pour it off the bow. Sweet saints alive. Will you get a load of the size of that whale? Incredible. I, I've never seen a blue whale to equal it. These tail flukes are like the wingspan of a small airplane. <laughs> He's sounded now. I hope he wasn't hurt in the collision. Are you saying we struck that blue whale? That's right. We must have caught him napping. That whale stopped this 600-ton ship dead in the water? Whales sleep very close to the surface. Their power and strength are immense. Look! The, the blue surface. There, off the port bow. Uh, get your camera ready, Mark. Look! The blue's blowing right off our bow. His blow shot 20 feet into the air. I snapped a few shots for posterity. How big is that leviathan? The largest recorded blue whale was... 36 meters. Well, this blue is certainly in that class. How does that translate into feet, Nigel? More than 100 feet long and over 150 pounds in weight. Wow! The blue whale is swimming around the ship. I doubt the collision hurt him. Hey, is it normal for a whale to circle a ship? Uh, blue whales do possess a natural curiosity, but circling ships is a bit unusual. A bit? He's changed course. He's headed straight for our bow. He's going to ram us. <laughs> We stood transfixed with the wind in our ears and our hearts pounding wildly as the great blue whale closed on the ship. 200 yards, 100 yards, 60 yards. It was over in a matter of seconds. The great blue hurled his body out of the water. I swear the wind and my pounding heart both stopped at the sight of the great blue whale suspended in midair. It was as if we were the only witnesses to a mystical event. The greatest photograph of my career... And I didn't even know my camera was in my hands. He's 40 meters at least, like Or more. That's almost 150 feet, Mark. My God. He sounded again. What an incredible sight that was. The blue threw himself right out of the water. And I forgot to take his picture. During the next two days, when the Requiem passed the South Georgia Islands, I found my thoughts continually returning to the great blue whale. On the third day after we collided with the great blue, we found the floating slaughterhouse. A gutted whale was strapped on either side of the ship, and the smell of death hung heavy in the cold Antarctic air. So that's the Demus. That ship there isn't the Demus. That's a refrigeration ship. Whale meat rots within 48 hours. Without the refrigeration ship, the Demos would be out of business. At least the pirate whalers can't afford factory ships. That would be a real nightmare. The whole whale, bone and all, can be processed on a factory ship in half an hour. Bridge, 
Captain Sutherland, the captain of the Demas wishes to speak to you. The Demas is returning to the refrigeration ship now. I'll be in the radio room in a moment, Sochi. Mind if I tag along? Ooh, all right. Smithy, you're in charge of the bridge. Ah, Captain. <laughs> Captain of the Demos. Captain Sutherland here. Captain Sutherland, did you receive my telex message? Oh, yes. The message wishing my crew and me bon voyage. You will discover I am not a man who jokes. Do not misjudge me as one either, Captain Papadoulos. Tomorrow, when you play your child's game with your rubber rafts, Make certain your crew can evade my harpoons. I may miss the whale I'm hunting and seal your toy boat. The Demas has broken transmission, Captain. He sounds serious. Papa Dulles is insane. Anyone sent overboard in polar waters wouldn't survive 20 minutes. Who's going out in the raft tomorrow? Ben Smithy was before he broke his ankle with a two-man crew. But uh, under the circumstances, I go alone. But, Captain, how can you go alone? You can't keep your eyes on the whales and the Demas at the same time. I've had some experience with pirate whalers. I'm quite capable of doing my own harpoon dodging. Captain, I didn't sign on as your galley cook just to end up shooting my whale pictures from the Requiem's poop deck. Are you volunteering to go out on the water with me tomorrow? Yes. I can operate the radio for you. That's ridiculous. Whales aren't his cause. Hey, I'm over 21. Don't tell me what my causes are. What's going to happen out there tomorrow is no joke. Captain, you could find a better man from the crew than Mr. Grogan to ride with you. Nobody in your crew wants to be out on that water more than I do tomorrow. I need those close-ups of the Demas if I'm going to sell the story someday. Just what I thought. Your cause is good old number one. Yeah? Well, this will be one time when looking out for number one might save a couple of whales. I'm your man. All right, Mr. Grogan, it's settled then. Tomorrow, you and I will find out just how serious Captain Papadoulos is about harpooning two men in a rubber raft. Leonard Nimoy again, and here's the fourth act of The Whale Savers. Captain Sutherland had Smithy post a 24-hour watch in case the Demas attempted a clandestine departure during the night. For all the sleep I got that night, I could have stood the watch myself. So she found me smoking a cigarette in the corridor outside my cabin. Can't sleep, Mark? Do I look tired? No, I guess you don't. Wait a minute. Let's run up the truce flag one more time. You just called me Mark. What happened to that Mr. Grogan jazz? I decided Mr. Grogan was too formal to call any man willing to risk his life to save whales, regardless of personal motives. I told you all along that I'd been after a good feature story. You did. And I kept my distance from you because I wanted you to discover the real story of the year was the whales, not me. I'm still hoping you give me an interview. We could talk now, in your cabin. You see, Mark... My work aboard the Requiem put new purpose in my life. But I wouldn't be honest if I said I didn't occasionally miss the excitement of the social life I led in New York. The fishbowl attention from the media I don't miss. Does this reporter still bother you? I like this reporter. Well, put a point up on the board for me. Soshi, we've been doing a lot of talking. Of course, you're tired. Maybe I'd better leave. No, 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 I... I was just thinking. About what? About how nice it would be to kiss you. Oh. Then I will leave. Oh, I wish this cabin had a carpet. I need something to crawl under. Why? It was a nice thought. Yeah, sure. I just got carried away. I I don't know what made me think you liked me. I, I mean, how does it look? I use an interview to make a pass at you. You weren't being unprofessional. Because you picked up on my feelings for you. Now I'm really confused. You don't want me to kiss you, but you're glad I made a pass at you. Is that it? No. What I'm saying is that under different circumstances, 
I'm not so sure I would refuse. Mark, tonight's the first time since we met that I see something in you I like. You've changed somehow. Well, before I was only interested in making a name for myself. Now I'm concerned about saving whales. I think that's great. What we need is time to get to know one another. Like maybe on a date when we get back to England, huh? Yes, I'd like that. And in the meantime, we're just a couple of amiable shipmates aboard the Requiem. That's the way I'd like our relationship to be for now. Okay? Okay. Okay. Good night, Soshi. If Soshi had hoped our conversation would help take my mind off the Demas, she succeeded. I spent the rest of the night thinking about her. Captain, this bounce back on the sonar screen shows what looks like a small group of whales. Two or three at most. Uh, could be whales or flows from a stray iceberg. Well, we have entered iceberg waters. Uh, whatever it is, the Demas must be picking it up too. You see how the bounce back pattern varies a bit? I think we found whales. Mm. Oh, Mark, you're just in time. So she thinks she has a bounce back on the sonar indicating whales nearby. Smithy has our raft ready. It is a whale bounce back. The Demas is headed for the bounce back reading. We better shove off, Mark. We have to beat the Demas to those whales. Well, you cannot run the Demas in your motorized draft. My camera's all packed, Captain. You lead. Mark, be careful. Oh, you, you take care too, Captain Sutherland. Under Smithy's expert direction, it took the crew only five minutes to get our raft into the water and the captain and me over the side. This outboard's a bit of a puzzle to get started, but once she catches, there's no quit in it until she runs out of gas. Captain Sutherland, do you read me? Soshi, this is Mark. We read you just fine. Nigel and I will keep in contact over the portable radio from the bridge. Ah, ah, that's the ticket. Soshi, we're off. Good luck to both of you. My camera's viewfinder was welded to my eye as Captain Sutherland steered straight for the Demas. I felt ridiculously small as we sailed alongside the 780-ton catcher boat at 15 knots, like a gnat buzzing the head of a lion. Your steering is too close to the Demas. I'm flaunting our courage. Well, you better ease up, Captain. I'd like to save a little courage for another day. We're fighting a war of wills. Psychology and speed are our only weapons. A harpoon can put a big hole in your psychology. Let's play down the intimidation stuff. Not on your life. I was just about to remind Captain Sutherland that I was already risking my life when we passed the catcher boat's bow. Twelve feet above us, with one hand on the harpoon launcher, stood Captain Papadoulos. The hate etched across his face made a wonderful close-up through my zoom lens. On our right there, it's the whale so she spotted on the sonar screen. I see them! Look, a mother and her calf. The calf swimming alongside his mother. Under the IWC's laws, that makes the mother an illegal cat. Ah. IWC laws make no difference to the Demas. Well, what about the calf? Uh, the Demas will spare the calf only because there's no profit in the kill. For over an hour, Captain Sutherland jockeyed our rubber raft into position behind the fleeing whales. But the chase proved too much for the tiring calf, and the Demas closed to 50 yards, killing distance. Why don't the whales sound again? The calf's too tired. It's like asking a four-year-old child to keep pace in an Olympic marathon. Captain, I can see Papa Doulas lining up his harpoon on the mother whale. Huh? Papa Doulas is too close to miss at this range. If the mother doesn't abandon her calf, she'll die. She'll never abandon her calf. Now, hold on for sweet life. I'm moving us in as close as possible to the mother. Requiem to Lifeline. Lifeline, he's back. So she who's back? Over. The Great Blue. Nigel spotted the Great Blue Whale 3,000 yards off your port bow on a 10 o'clock heading. Yes, I can see him blow now. Uh, the Demas has abandoned him, the mother and her calf for the Great Blue. Mark, Nigel's following the blue through his binoculars. He says the Great Blue just sounded. That was the first of 12 soundings. For five hours, the freezing salt water stung our faces as we blocked the Demas's path to the Great Blue. 
Captain Papadoulas pursued the great blue whale with fanatical determination. It proved to be the mistake of his life. The great blue can't shake the demons. He's tried every trick he knows. Uh, Papadoulas is too experienced a whaler for the blue to evade him. Now prepare yourself, Mark. The blue's blowing again. I'm already drenched from the last half dozen blows. Captain, the Demas is turning. Which way? To starboard. We have to beat Papadoulas into position. I'll give it my best. The Demas is gaining on us. It's a good job of sailing, Mr. Wim. Papadoulas has shaved ten yards off us on that last turn. Well, the Blues picked a hell of a time to slow his pace. What's wrong with him? He's been swimming full tilt for five hours. Even a creature his size gets tired. How close will Papadoulas bring the Demas before he fires? Fifty yards. Papadoulas will launch a percentage shot. And the Demas is about 80 yards in closing. Yeah. We've got to help the blue hold Papadoulas off until dark. He could slip away in the night. Yeah, the night won't stop the Demas. Harpoon! Get your head down! Dear God! The blue whale's thrashing. You said Papadoulas wouldn't fire over 50 yards. Uh, that Papadoulas is a damned lucky shot. The water's turned crimson around the blue. <sighs> All we can do now is return to the Requiem. We were ten feet behind the blue when Papadoulas fired. It was a perfect shot. No, not perfect. See where the harpoon entered the blue? Behind the flipper. A bad spot for any whaler. This won't be a fast or an easy kill for the demons. When we returned to the Requiem, so she met the captain and me with warm blankets and tears in her eyes. The great blue will die now, won't he, Captain? Ah, uh, so she, you know, whalers seldom lose a harpoon whale. Here, wrap yourself in these blankets. You two are chilled to the bone. Uh, thank you, Smithy. We, we did everything we could. We really did. Uh, Papa Doulas landed a very lucky shot. I know. Captain, Nigel would like to speak with you in the radio room. There's hot coffee waiting there, too. Uh. See here on the sonar screen, Captain. Only five kilometers due south. Yeah, that's a frightfully large iceberg. Yeah, I'd prefer to avoid it. So and the Demas. I'll bet the sweetest draft of ale in Liverpool on that one. Due south is the very direction the Great Blue drags the Demas. The Great Blue is dragging the Demas now? Yes, at eight knots, even with the Demas engines in full reverse. How is it possible for a harpoon whale to drag three times its own weight? Well, whales display phenomenal strength when they're harpooned. And this blur is a phenomenal whale. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll be entering the iceberg area ourselves shortly. I'll have one of the crew establish an iceberg watch on the bow. Look at that sonar screen. The great blue just dragged the Demas into the iceberg area. Another iceberg dead ahead, Captain. Uh, the course change I just made should take us around this one. The Demas has managed to evade every iceberg in its path the way we have. So far, that is. I imagine the sonar operator aboard the Demus is an extremely disturbed man than all. Did you hear that? I heard it. Could be two icebergs colliding nearby. No, no, I watched it on the sonar screen. The Demus has struck an iceberg. The Great Blue did it! <laughs> <laughs> it's as if the Great Blue had planned to drag the Demus into the iceberg area. No, 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 I rather doubt that, Marsh. But, Nigel, the Great Blue maintained a due south course throughout the entire hunt until he reached the iceberg area. Then, and only then, did the great blue constantly change direction. Uh, yeah, 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 Th this is true, but then who would This believe... is Whaling Ship Timos. Mayday! Repeat, Mayday! It's Papa Dulles. When the great blue won his battle, I forgot about the lives of the men aboard the Demas. We are attacking on water. Come in, Requiem. Smithy, get to the bridge. Put us on the Demas heading. Ah, oh, Captain. Mayday! Mayday! Come in, Requiem! I'll man the radio, Saucy. Captain Papadoulas, this is Captain Sutherland. We are maneuvering to answer your mayday now. Repeat, the Requiem has begun immediate rescue operation. Thank you, Captain Sutherland. For a moment I feared your ship saved only whales, not whalers. My crew is not above saving human lives, Captain. Even the lives of pirate whalers. With bitterness... I thank you.
Captain. What are the odds that the great blue's still alive? I shouldn't imagine his chances are very good. Not with a harpoon in his side. But it is possible he'll survive. What do you think, Nigel? Whales suffer from pneumonia and tumors, skin and teeth infections, even kidney stones. They suffer, adjust, and survive, Mark. I would not be surprised to hear someday of the sighting of a great blue whale with a harpoon in its side. No corroboration of the Requiem sighting of the great blue whale was ever made. Marine biologists who studied Mark Grogan's detailed photographs drew one conclusion. The harpooning of the great blue whale resulted in its death from loss of blood and from shock. They lamented the lost opportunity to study the largest animal that ever lived. And for a time, the story of the great blue whale's revenge captured the world's imagination. The International Whaling Commission once again opened serious debate on a 10-year whaling moratorium to rebuild the populations of all species, not just those in danger of extinction. But even at the height of this media attention, there remained those uninterested observers with a single question foremost in their minds. Why should I care whether the whales live or die? Possibly the best answer to this question was offered 100 years ago by an American named Henry David Thoreau when he said, I wish to know an entire heaven and an entire earth. This inherent right of mankind is the legacy which the whale savers work to pass on to future generations. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Whale Savers, was written by Bruce Martin and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Tommy Cook, Joan McCall, and Drew Boardman. Featured in the cast were Parley Bear, Richard Peel, and Larry Moss. The music for radio theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. This is Lauren Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. We're in the garden of an elegant hotel in Casablanca. It is August, the hottest month of the year in North Africa, and there are very few tourists now. In fact, the hotel is almost empty. But here is a tall, pretty blonde, obviously not a native of Morocco. She could be English or American or Swedish, perhaps. And she is alone. She looks as if she's been sightseeing all day long. She sinks gratefully into a chair and fans herself with her straw sun hat. Garçon, may I have some mint tea, please? And some biscuits? Oui, madame. And perhaps some stale bread to feed the pigeons? Oui, madame. Oh, kittens. Oh, 
Oh, uh, bonjour, madame. Uh, bonjour, madame. But you're American, aren't you? Yes, I am. You too? <laughs> yes, of course. You're the first American I've seen on this trip. And I think we're the only guests in this hotel. Oh, what darling kitten. Oh, they're so tiny. Where did you find them? Right here in this basket. They keep oh. trying to climb through the hedge. Now, now look at him. Oh, look at this little one. Every time I put him back in the basket, he oh. climbs out again and makes straight for the hedge. He's like a wind-up doll. Oh. Oh, I suppose the kittens belong to the hotel. Mm, a lot of hotels in Morocco keep cats. But you never see a dog around a hotel. No, that's true. I've even seen people chasing them away. I wonder why. Well, I've been told that Muslims believe cats are clean, but dogs are dirty. I think it may be even in their Bible, in the Koran. Really? Oh, here comes their mother. <laughs> She'll keep her kittens in line. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're not traveling alone, are you? I, I didn't see any tour bus arrive. Yep. I am alone. Are you with the group? No, I'm alone, too. Now, that is unusual. Do you realize we may even be the only American women on our own in all Morocco at the moment? I guess that's entirely possible. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Livingston, I presume. <laughs> and that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, a trip to Casablanca by Anitra Earl. Our star, Joan McCall. Two American ladies have met by chance in the garden of a select hotel in Casablanca. Each of them surprised to see another American, another woman traveling alone, even another tourist. It is off-season, and they have the elegant little hotel almost to themselves. Did everyone at home tell you how brave you were to come to Morocco alone? Yes, I guess they must have. How long will you be staying here in Casablanca? Well, I'm supposed to fly south tomorrow to Marrakesh, but I may just go home instead. Go home without seeing Marrakesh? Yes. Oh, but you mustn't do that. It's a fairy tale city, my favorite place. Oh, have you just come from there? No, but this is my second trip to Morocco. I liked it so much two years ago that I came back to see it all over again. Oh, I'm sure you're right. Marrakesh is worth seeing. It's just that I'm... Well, I'm very tired. I want to go home. I've been traveling for a year. A year? And all I have is a three weeks vacation. My husband died a little over a year ago. Oh, oh I see. I'm so sorry. Are you. I wanted to go away and stay away as long as I could. Then maybe when I get back and start over, maybe it won't be so difficult. Mm, I understand. You know, if I were you and I had a lot of time, I'd spend at least a week in the south, in Marrakesh. If you're tired, you could just lie around the pool and look at the sky. Ah, here are my tea and biscuits. Will you join me? Oh, thank you. But I want to go to my room and have a shower and a nap. This heat wears me out. <laughs> but perhaps we could have dinner together tonight if you're free. Oh, yes. Uh, this hotel has lovely food. I stayed here on my last visit. Shall we meet at 8 o'clock in the lounge? That'd be fine. Uh, but I warn you, I promise to try and persuade you to stay in Morocco a little longer. <laughs> Tell me, don't you find it awfully hard to get from place to place in this country? I do. People here seem to operate on some time schedule that I haven't discovered yet. No. Well, actually, yes, now that I think about it. In fact, two years ago, in the middle of the night, I took a taxi from Casablanca down to Marrakesh. What? A taxi? <laughs> well, that's like taking a taxi from New York to Boston. Almost. Why did you do that? I was tired of Casablanca. And there was no other transportation. And in the middle of the night, uh, yeah. you are adventurous. <gasps> well, we'll have to compare notes on our travel this evening. <laughs> yes, 8 o'clock then. Oh, my name is Claire. How do you do? I'm Jean. <laughs> See you at 8. It is twilight now in the small but luxurious lounge of the hotel in Casablanca. Jean sits among the overstuffed cushions waiting for Claire, her new acquaintance, 
and the only other American she's seen on this trip. A waiter lights the colored glass lamp that swings from the ceiling. It casts multicolored patterns of light around the room. He opens the latticed Mushrabie windows to catch the evening breeze. Now we can hear the sound of the Muezzin from the tower of a mosque nearby. He's calling the faithful Muslims of Casablanca to the last prayers of the day. Madam, will I have to drink? Uh, I'm waiting for another lady. Oh, here she is. <laughs> a gin and tonic for me, please. I'll have the same. Thank you. Oui. Well, Jean, uh, you'd be glad to know that I've decided to go to Marrakesh tomorrow after all. Oh, good. But didn't you say you were flying? <laughs> I do have a reservation. But you'll see so much more if you take the train. Or even a bus. I took a bus yesterday from Tangier. Of course, it wasn't air conditioned. <laughs> but even with a second-class ticket, you can sit right behind the driver for more leg room. Ice, madam? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. No, uh, Jean, you know, I, I don't think that's correct. A second-class ticket. No, that that doesn't entitle you to sit in the front of the bus. Hmm? You must have bought a first-class ticket instead. Uh, but I'm sure I paid for second class. It was so cheap, much cheaper than the train. Wait a minute. I have my passport case with me. Here. Here's my bus ticket. You see? <gasps> oh, no. Oh, I don't believe it. Is that what happened? <laughs> Now I understand everything. Oh, but I'll never be able to make it up to him. Him? Whom? Hassan. His name was Hassan. Oh, I feel terrible. Tell me. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I'll have to start at the beginning. It all began yesterday morning as I was paying my bill at my hotel in Tangier. And one hundred. There is your change, madame. Uh, would you have a train schedule? Uh, please inquire of the concierge. He is the, the heavy man over there wearing a red fez. Mm, yes, of course. Thank you. Good day, monsieur. Uh, I need a train schedule. Ah, yes, the train. Madame wishes perhaps the three o'clock train to Casablanca? But how... How do you know where I'm going? Madame's hotel reservation has the forwarding address next stop, Casablanca. Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> In order to take the 3 p.m. train, it is necessary to buy a ticket at 1 p.m. at the train depot. Let's see, it's almost noon. All right, I'll go buy my ticket now, and when I return, I'll send for my luggage to be brought downstairs. No, madame. The ticket window is not open yet. What time does it open? It is scheduled to open at noon, madame. Ah, oh, then I'll go at noon. No, madame. It does not, in truth, open at noon. Not in many years. In truth? When does it open? In truth, it opens at 1 p.m. Uh, can't I buy my ticket closer to the 3 o'clock departure time so I won't have to take two trips to the station? No, madame. If you arrive any time after 1 p.m. at the depot, all the tickets will already be sold. Ah, only in Morocco. Well, thank you. I'll just walk to the train depot now and wait. There is, however, another possibility. Oh? And what's that? There is an army gentleman, an officer in the Moroccan army, who will be glad to take Madame to Casablanca in his car. There is? I don't see anyone. Besides, I don't know any army gentlemen. I prefer to take the train. As you wish, madame. The train depot is about six blocks to the left, isn't it? Down the Avenue de Spagna? That is correct. Madame wishes a taxi? Uh, no, thank you. I'd like to walk alone next to the ocean. Bonjour, madame. Oh, uh, bonjour. Excuse me. Ah, madame. I have the honor to present... Oh. Oh, the army gentleman you spoke of. I am at your service, madame. I regret that until now I have been unable to deliver my compliments to madame in person. But perhaps the concierge has informed madame that I wish to place my car at her disposal for her journey to Casablanca today. Yes, uh, yes he has. But I'm taking the train. My car is preferable, madame. Oh? Uh, to be sure, it is a very fine car, the best. A Mercedes-Benz, red, 
Most comfortable. Yeah, I'm sure it's very nice, but you see... Also, air-conditioned. On the other hand, the train will be hot and dirty. And so public. Public. Mm -hmm. well, yes, that's just what I have in mind. Public. The train is also very slow. I don't care. It makes many stops. In my car, Madame's journey need not be interrupted by such things. No interruptions? No interruptions. Uh, I have a chauffeur. Aha. Uh -huh. Somehow I'm not surprised. And uh, what if I were to tell you that someone may be meeting my train at the other end in Casablanca? We can leave now, immediately. We will arrive much sooner by car, and Madame will have more free time. I think I see what you mean. And now, if you will excuse me, sir... I am Colonel Rocco. Yes, I'm sure you are. And no doubt you're very kind. But I'm taking the train. Madame. Claire are dining together this evening in Casablanca. Jean continues telling Claire the circumstances of her journey yesterday from Tangier. Yesterday morning, Jean left a very persistent army officer, one Colonel Rocco, behind in the hotel lobby and headed downtown to buy her train ticket. I walked to the train depot along the sandy sidewalk next to the Bay of Tangier. My mind was elsewhere. Actually, I was trying to sort out the current rate of exchange and figure out whether I had just been overcharged on the hotel bill. I was startled when a young man walked up behind me and asked me the time of day in French. Quelle heure est-il, madame? I looked at my watch. It was 12.41. I couldn't remember how to say 12.41 in French, so I held out my wrist toward him so he could look at the time. Here, see for yourself. Ah, you speak English. You are, perhaps, English? Perhaps. American. Perhaps. Ah, you are American. I can hear from your accent. What is it you are looking for, madame? Nothing. I'm just having a last look around at the bay. It's such a beautiful color. Uh, or rather, so many colors. From cobalt blue at the horizon to the palest icy green here at the shore. Mm. I hate to say goodbye to it. You take the train to Casablanca, madame? How did you know that? Ahead of us, there is only the train depot and the bus terminal. Most of the tourists take the train. And the only train today is the train to Casablanca. Oh. <laughs> but you should take the bus instead. Should I? Why? It runs more often, it gets there faster, as it makes fewer stops, and it is cheaper. Really? Oh, yes. In fact, if you will lend me the price of a ticket, I will accompany you to Casablanca. Why would you want to do that? I have relatives there. Huh. What a coincidence. Yes, madame. Um, what does it mean, uh, the word... Coincidence. Hmm. Uh, something like good fortune. Ah, yes, madame. You speak very good English for such a young man. Thank you. I am proud. Did you learn it in school? No, madame. My father uh, lived some time in America many years past, in New York, New Jersey. Do you mean Newark, New Jersey? Yes, madame. <laughs> so why do you want me to lend you the price of a bus ticket? I, I don't understand. I have no money in my captain, but... Before the bus comes, I will run home to get my money and my suitcase. Here we are now, in front of the bus terminal. Uh, what do you say, madame? Well... But there is no risk. You will hold the tickets while I am gone. I don't know. <laughs> oh, look! What's happening inside the bus terminal? A minute ago, all those people were standing in one orderly line, and, and now they're climbing all over each other. <laughs> the ticket window is just open. They are all trying to be waited on at the same time. <laughs> but there's only one clerk. He can't possibly wait on everyone at the same time. Oh, and I can't possibly get waited on either. Not in that crush of humanity. No, madame. You had better let me buy your ticket for you. Oh, all right. You win. Get one for yourself, too. How much uh, for two second-class tickets? Fourteen. That's all? Well, here you are. Thank you. I will return in moments. He dived into the crowd as if he were diving into the ocean and completely disappeared. I felt rather silly paying this young man's way for him. But as he said, I would be holding the tickets. What did I have to lose? 
I couldn't imagine why he should want to go all the way to Casablanca on the spur of the moment to visit his relatives. But that was his business, after all, and if worse came to worse, and he didn't show up at the time the bus was ready to leave, well, I could always get a refund on his unused ticket. He reappeared in no time at all. Here you are, madame. Two second-class tickets. He grinned and bowed and thanked me in the name of Allah. Then he took off at a run. There is an enormous flight of stone steps that divide the city of Tangier into two parts, an upper half and a lower half. He was running up these steps when I called after him. What is your name? Hassan! I watched him run to the top of the ancient stone stairs. Then I turned and made my way around the edge of the marketplace. It was very crowded at midday. There were many women wearing jellabas with veils over their faces, shopping two by two with baskets over their arms. Camel drivers cursing their bad-tempered camels that growled back at them. Boys in caftans weaving through the crowd on bicycles and ringing their warning bells. And several of those old men you see wearing the white turbans that mean they've made the holy pilgrimage to Mecca, riding on their tiny burrows. I bought some fruit to eat on the bus trip, and then I broke away from the crowded marketplace. I walked back toward my hotel the way I'd come, along the edge of the Bay of Tangier. When I was about halfway there, I noticed a car following at a discreet distance behind me, a shiny red Mercedes-Benz. If I stopped, the car would stop. If I ran to catch a green light, the car would catch up, too. It was following me very, very slowly. I looked around me. As far as I could see in any direction, I was the only foreigner. And the only woman who wasn't wearing a veil. During dinner with Claire, Jean continues relating the story of her journey to Casablanca. It was perfectly clear to Jean that the red Mercedes following her belonged to Colonel Rocco and that the colonel apparently was not accustomed to taking no for an answer. When I reached my hotel, just before going through the revolving door, I glanced behind me. Happily, the colonel's red car was nowhere to be seen. I walked to the front desk. They have an odd habit in Tangier hotels of shutting off the water in the afternoons which would be most inconvenient. I learned from the concierge that I would have just enough time for a swim in the hotel pool and a shower before the water would be turned off for the rest of the day. I decided to take advantage of it. The bus ride to Casablanca would be long and hot. I climbed out of the swimming pool. As I walked from the blazing sunshine into the dark back hallway to go upstairs to my room, I was startled to see a figure suddenly loom up in front of me out of the shadows, blocking my way. Madame, I am at your service. Oh, good day, Colonel. If you will look just there, through that window at the far end of the lobby, you will see my car parked. Yes, Colonel. I believe I have already noticed your car earlier today. I await your instructions, Madame. I'm afraid I have no instructions for you at all, Colonel. Will you excuse me? But he didn't step aside. He was still blocking my way. He was a very forbidding-looking man, tall and stern. He may never have smiled in his whole life. His hair was cropped as close to the skull as possible. It made his head look like a bullet. And every feature of his face was hard and sharp. He looked as if he were entirely made of painted steel. Even his gray army officer's uniform was so flat and hard that it seemed to be painted onto his body. I think if I had been one of his poor young recruits who had to serve under any command of his, I would have found a way to desert the army. He was certainly not what anybody would have called an easy-going man. And I did wish he wouldn't click his heels like that. This morning he had probably bribed the concierge to tell him where I was going. I wondered when he would finally give up. The conversation seemed to go on and on. I stood there, dripping water on the marble floor, holding my wet towel close around me and slapping at the vicious flies that were biting me. I didn't think this was a fair arrangement, 
Since I noticed that none of the flies were attempting to bite him, <laughs> they wouldn't dare. I tried to figure out how to get away from him as gracefully as possible. He seemed to think I didn't understand. He wanted to take me to Casablanca, or at least that's where he said he wanted to take me. And as far as he was concerned, that was that. It never seemed to occur to him that I didn't want to go with him. Madame will not wish to take the train. Madame will be far more comfortable in my car. I'm sorry, but I simply cannot change my plans. I've already made other arrangements. I assure you, madame, that we will depart at the hour you prefer. May I thank you once more for your gracious offer? But it is not possible for me to go with you. Good day, colonel. Madame. When I arrived at the bus terminal, I looked around for young Hassan, but I didn't see him anywhere. I stood behind the bus at the baggage compartment until I saw that the baggage handler had padlocked my luggage inside of it. Then I walked around to the front and climbed up the steps to have one last look around for Hassan. Finally, I boarded the bus and glanced at the faces of the other passengers, but Hassan was not there. I was the only foreigner as usual. I sat down on the seat just behind the driver next to an open window. There were two veiled women sitting across the aisle from me. Just as the driver was about to close the doors, an enormously fat man got on the bus and sat down on the seat right next to me. He looked like a southerner from Marrakesh. He wore a long striped caftan and a yellow crocheted skull cap on his curly hair. He had very soft features, wide nostrils and grayish brown eyes with long eyelashes. He was so large that he completely blocked my view of the door. I couldn't even see the aisle. Of course, I wondered why Hassan hadn't shown up, but there was nothing I could do about it. I put his ticket, together with my own punch ticket, in my passport case. My seatmate from Marrakesh immediately fell asleep and snored a little from time to time. The bus moved quickly out of the city and through the suburbs of Tangier and then out onto the open road. The countryside wasn't very interesting to look at and I must have fallen asleep myself after a while. I woke up to the sound of a loud car horn. All the passengers in the bus turned around in their seats to see what was happening and stared out the windows. I stared, too. It was a big, white taxi cab roaring up the highway behind us, honking like mad for the bus to pull over. The bus stopped, the door flew open, and the bus driver jumped out and walked quickly back to the big, white taxi cab. The door of the taxi opened just then, and out stepped Hassan, suitcase in hand. He had come all the way in, the, in a cab to catch the bus to Casablanca. Hassan and the bus driver exchanged some words in front of the taxi for a moment, and apparently the bus driver gave him permission to board the bus and look for me since I had his ticket. The taxi made a U-turn and headed back to Tangier. Just as Hassan was getting on the bus, the fat man next to me leaned forward in his seat to see what was going on. So Hassan couldn't see me at all. I was completely blocked from his view. Hassan walked up the aisle to look for me, followed by the bus driver. I suddenly began to feel very embarrassed that I had bought Hassan's ticket for him. I wondered what the veiled ladies across the aisle from me would think. Here I was, a tourist, and the only foreigner on the bus, and paying the fare of a Moroccan man at least ten years younger than I am. I could feel my cheeks burning. I opened my passport case to get his ticket out. Hassan came striding back down the aisle again with a bus driver hot on his heels. I reached up. The fat man was still leaning forward. I slipped my arm between the fat man and the back of the seat and slipped Hassan his ticket so that nobody else saw me do it. Hassan snatched the ticket up with a cry of triumph and waved it at the bus driver. And Hassan was promptly thrown off the bus. I was completely bewildered. I turned to the fat man next to me and asked him why Hassan had been put off the bus. 
The fat man shrugged and looked thoughtful. Finally, he said, I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, I don't understand. All things are from Allah, madame. Oh, I see. The fat man went back to sleep. I turned in my seat to look out the window at the road behind us. The big white taxi had long since departed. The highway was deserted. Except for Hassan, who stood completely alone in the blazing sun in the middle of the highway, suitcase in hand, gazing forlornly after the bus. Just then, we passed a road sign saying that the nearest village was 12 miles back. I felt very sorry for Hassan. I was just about to turn around and face the front again when something red in the distance caught my eye. I craned my neck to see. It was a red car coming up the road behind us, a shiny red Mercedes Benz. I saw Hassan raise his arm as the car approached him. He was hoping for a lift in our direction. But the red car never slowed down. Hassan had to jump aside to get out of its way. As the hours passed, I looked back from time to time to see the red car continuing to follow us at a discreet distance. I had not seen the last of Colonel Rocco. Here's the fourth act of A Trip to Casablanca. Night had fallen by the time we pulled into downtown Casablanca. I climbed down from the bus right behind the fat man from Marrakesh. It was like walking behind a, a large tent. As I was standing at the rear of the bus and waiting for my bags... I suddenly saw the red Mercedes Benz nearby with its engine running. Colonel Rocco was standing at attention next to the open door of his car and conferring with the bus driver. I imagine the colonel must have been saying, How could you not have seen a tall, blonde woman on your bus? The bus driver was shrugging, and the colonel looked as if he meant business. Naturally, the colonel had parked his car so that none of the passengers could go from the bus into the terminal without walking right past him. I knew I couldn't possibly go along with the other passengers without his spotting me. I looked in the other direction, to the left. Nothing but six lanes of fast-moving cars. But I had no choice. I bribed the baggage handler to bring my bags out first. Then I ran a few feet into the street and saw a taxi cruising with its lights on, three lanes away. Taxi! I ran back to the baggage handler. I grabbed all five pieces of my baggage at one time and darted out into the traffic. I raced through the three lanes of traffic and leaped into the cab. And the cab sped away to my hotel. Whew. I had escaped Colonel Rocco at last. And so, here I am. (laughs) Mmm, isn't this delicious pigeon pie? Yeah, wonderful. You don't suppose it's made out of real pigeons, do you? Well, I would imagine so. Mm. (laughs) But Claire, what's the matter? Nothing. It just tasted better a minute ago. Mm Mmm. I think I'll wait for dessert. But is that the end of the story? Didn't you ever find out what happened to poor Hassan? Well, um, it wasn't until this evening, <laughs> when I pulled that ticket out of my passport case to show you, that I realized what I'd done to him. In my embarrassment to slip him his bus ticket without anyone else seeing me do it, I grabbed the wrong ticket. I slipped him my ticket, the one that had already been punched. I gave him a used ticket. <laughs> no. Naturally, the bus driver thought he was trying to pull a fast one, so he put him off the bus. Oh. (laughs) Hassan may still be walking back to Tangier for all I know, and it's all my fault. He must think I'm the cruelest woman he ever met. And I I have no way to apologize for what happened uh, or to explain it to him. 
<sighs> I'm not planning to go back to Tangier, and I can't write him. I don't know where he lives or even his last name. <laughs> Can you imagine how many thousands of men in Tangier are named Hassan? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry, Jean. Perhaps he'll realize that it was only a mistake. Mm, yeah. And anyway, look on the bright side. You can still get a refund on his unused ticket. Yeah, I suppose I can. I I'll write to the bus company before I go to bed tonight. As for Hassan, I guess all I can do to make up for his long walk home is to try and do a good turn for the very next Moroccan I meet. Oh, that's a nice idea. But don't forget, you did buy Hassan's bus ticket for him in the first place. Yeah. Not many people would have done that. I wouldn't worry too much about him. You never know what he might have had in mind. Oh, I, th I think he was a rather harmless young man. Very wholesome looking. Unlike Colonel Rocco, who was really quite a sinister character. <laughs> I'm glad to see the last of him. Yeah, I don't blame you. Well, will you have some dessert? I think just coffee. And you? I haven't decided. Do they have pastries here? I can't remember. Here's the waiter. Waiter, uh, what are you doing? We didn't order any champagne. There must be some mistake. Uh, no, madame. It is from an army officer, a uh, colonel. He wishes to... Good evening, ladies. Oh, no. I am Colonel Rocco. At your service, ladies. I hope that you will allow me to have the privilege to provide you with some champagne. Uh, uh thank you, but I, uh, we have... How very generous of you, Colonel. Won't you sit down? If madam will permit me. Oh, um, yes, uh, please do. Waiter, uh, is this the best champagne in the hotel? Mais oui, colonel, the very finest. Good. I am satisfied... Ladies, to your help. Oh, to yours, Colonel. Jean, your help? Yes. Cheers. Colonel, my friend here was just telling me a most interesting story about a young man yesterday in Tangier who asked her to lend him the price of a bus ticket. He said he wanted to come with her here to Casablanca to visit his relatives. Now, what do you suppose he was up to? Hmm. Perhaps he was impressed by her beauty. Thank you. And her blonde hair is very rare to see in this country. But, of course, brunette ladies like yourself, uh, Madam... Uh... Oh, Claire. My name is Claire. Claire. A lovely name. Most suitable. As I said, brunette ladies like yourself are also most Charming, to be sure. Oh. oh, but now you're talking almost about another generation, Colonel. I have grandchildren at home in the United States. No. Madame is mistaken. Surely you are joking. That cannot be. Yes, I'm sure she is joking, Colonel Rocco. She looks uh, much too young and attractive. Don't you agree? I agree entirely. You are both too kind. And now... Oh, you must excuse me. I'm really very tired. I've had a long day. Oh, no, no, Colonel. Please don't get up. Jean, you're not leaving. Yes, uh, but you must stay. There's still a lot of champagne there for the two of you to drink. Colonel, thank you. And, um, Claire, you must give me a call in the morning on your way to Marrakesh. Good night. Uh, good night, madame. Good night, Jean. Claire, are you traveling to Marrakesh? I have a car. Good night, Colonel Rocco and Claire. May you live happily ever after. Oh, a letter to the bus company. I'll never remember unless I do it now. Mm, paper. Envelope. Pen? Ah, pen. <laughs> Hello? The front desk, please. Yes, good evening. This is room, um, 865. 
Can you give me the address here in Casablanca of the... Uh, let's see. Um, the Cap Compagnie Auxiliaire de Transports au Maroc. Yes, the bus company. Thank you. Yes? Uh, yes? Yes. <laughs> Thank you again. Mm, good night. Hmm. Gentlemen, enclosed is an unused second-class ticket, Tangier, to Casablanca. Please refund the purchase price to me in care of my hotel in Marrakesh, where I shall be staying in two weeks' time. A copy of my itinerary is enclosed. Thank you. Very good. Jean managed to solve the problem of Colonel Rocco, but she never did get an answer from the Moroccan bus company. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, A Trip to Casablanca, was written by Anitra Earle and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our star was Joan McCall. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Shepard Menken, Corey Burton, Marvin Miller, and Larry Moss. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CVI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. In the months before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the rebellious American colonies are outmanned and outgunned on land and sea. They lack everything needed to conduct the war. They are especially short of gunpowder and are forced to import it. Captain John Barry of the Infant American Navy is sent the following orders from the Marine Committee of the Continental Congress. Philadelphia, April 7th, 1776. To Captain John Barry, Esquire, as we are informed that the brig L'Esperance with a cargo of gunpowder from France has been disabled in the recent gale, you are hereby directed to take temporary command of the merchant ship Sarah Jane. You are to proceed to the waters off Cavendish, New Jersey, where you will fall in with the L'Esperance, transfer her precious cargo to your ship, and bring the powder safely into the Delaware River and up to the port of Philadelphia. However, as British warships are known to be cruising near the mouth of the Delaware, and indeed off New Jersey, we urge you to take particular care to avoid them, as your ship, the Sarah Jane, is not armed. And that's only the beginning of our story.
Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Powder Ship, by Robert Ellis. Our stars, Arthur Hill, Len Berman, and Peggy Hazard. There is always a way to get things done, Mr. Graham. John Barry was born in Ireland to a family of sturdy farmers. But life there was full of privation, and at the age of ten, he was forced to go to sea. He rapidly gained seniority in merchant ships. Eventually, he adopted Philadelphia as his home. And in 1775, as the difficulties between Great Britain and her American colonies turned into open revolt, he sought and won a commission as captain in the new American Navy. I expect this cruise will provide a young naval officer with many opportunities for advancement, Captain Barry. Lieutenant Donald Graham's history was almost the exact opposite. He came from the landed gentry of Virginia and grew up with every luxury. It was probably inevitable that there would be friction between the two men from the beginning. We are fortunate to have Lieutenant Graham's private journal, in which he kept an informal record of the events of his first cruise. Our passage down the Delaware River from Philadelphia was slow and awkward. The crew had begun to discover the peculiarities of our ship, the Sarah Jane, and no one was pleased with her. It was not until we had rounded Cape May and were heading generally northeastward along the New Jersey coast that Captain Barry had a chance to speak to me other than about ship's business. A good following breeze was pushing us toward the area where the powder ship should be found, and the captain and I were together on the quarterdeck. You have come with high recommendations from certain members of the Marine Committee, Mr. Graham. But I'm bound to tell you that your family's friends in Congress will not help you on board my ship. I intend to prove myself to you, Captain Barry. Time will tell on that point. I believe that you've done some sailing in Chesapeake Bay, small sloops, luggers, that sort of thing. Yes, sir. Better than nothing, I suppose, but I'd frankly prefer my lieutenant to have seagoing experience. <laughs> Our present cruise will barely take us out of sight of land, sir. I was also told that you are independent and inclined to speak your mind. Those qualities may prove to be of doubtful value in a junior officer. Yes, sir. As you say, time will tell. I will warn you right now. Sail sir. ho! Where away? Starboard beam, Captain. There's to be a frigate. Bearing away from us. Very well. If she alters course, I want to know at once. Aye, aye, Captain. Lieutenant... I call your attention to the lookout Sewell, a man who knows his duties thoroughly and his position. Yes, sir. You will find me a man of action, Mr. Graham. I dislike officers who spend all their time in planning what to do and have no time left to get it done. Yes, sir. However, some planning is always necessary, of course. Now, you're acquainted with our orders. We are to bring the powder safely back to Philadelphia and in all haste. Once we have found the L'Esperance and she is alongside us, what would your course of action be? Turn all hands to bring in her cargo on board as fast as possible. Lash some of the powder kegs on deck to save time. Head for Philadelphia. Oh, no, Mr. Graham, you've fallen into a trap. Speed is important, but so is safety. Yes, Captain. However... This is not lumber or dried fish. This is gunpowder. And you want it out here on deck for every British ship to see... We have no guns on board larger than the musket, and the Sarah Jane is slow and cranky. We cannot defend ourselves, and we'd be hard put to outsail a sea turtle. I see my error, sir. I'm glad you do. I'm also beginning to see the problems that lie ahead. Only a few of them, I fear, Mr. Graham. Captain Barry went over to consult with the helmsman, and I strolled to the larboard rail. I found myself unintentionally over here in a conversation between two crewmen below me on the main deck. Captain Barry and the lieutenant don't get along so good, do they, Josh? Old Graham will come around sooner or later, Benny. He's new and he wants to advance. And he's lucky to serve his first cruise under Captain Barry. You've been with the captain a long time, ain't you? Yep, since 72, when we made trading voyages to the West Indies. Mm. Then, when he got his commission in the Navy, I joined up, too. We was in the Lexington together. And now, here we are back in a merchant ship again. I'd feel a lot better if... Hey, look off there, on the shore. 
I don't see nothing but marshes. There. That sandy point sticking out in the inlet right past it. Oh. Is that Cavendish? No. We're getting close. I remember that inlet. Fished there many a time. Is Cavendish a big town? No, you could blow it away with a sneeze. Oh, there's a wharf and a brick warehouse and a church up the street. A few houses and farms all around. Sounds real nice. Well, it ain't. I hated it. it smells like mud flats. It's just ain't nothing there. As soon as I could run off to sea, I lit out. Well, how about your family? All gone years ago. Didn't you ever go back? Only once. Still hated it. Of course, I recollect a girl or two. Uh, uh. Wager they're married now, with little ones climbing all over. They wouldn't even remember me. Oh, sure they would. Well, it was this one girl. Abby. Abby? Yeah. She was different from the others. Pretty? Hi, Benny. Real pretty. Ah, uh, but I expect she's moved away by now. Nobody with any gumption would stay in Cavendish. Ah, uh, that was a long time ago. We ain't likely to set foot ashore this cruise anyhow. We got a Hello, lot... Ho! Where away? Down her bow, Captain. He's only showing her four topsail. Pick her up with a spyglass, Mr. Griff. Yes, sir, I've got her. She's flying the French flag. Her main and mizzen masts are gone, and she appears to be dead in the water. We're in the area where the powder ship should be. May I uh, have the glass? Yes, sir. Hmm. Yes. Yes, she could well be the L'Esperance. Yes, sir. But in view of her condition, I would say she was more hopeless than hopeful. I don't understand. L'Esperance means hope in French, sir. Does it? Well... I would say we can hope to make certain only by closing and hailing her. Would you be good enough to order the helmsman to alter course and head for her? Aye, aye, sir. We drew closer to the disabled ship. When we were within hailing distance, Captain Barry took up the speaking trumpet. What ship is that? Ship L'Esperance. Forty-one days out of dance for Philadelphia. What ship are you? Brig Sarah Jane. Two days out of Philadelphia. Are you the captain? Captain James Putnam from Connecticut. Proud to be a cousin of General Putnam. Captain John Barry of Philadelphia. May I come alongside, Captain Putnam? Uh, we'd welcome it, Captain Barry. I don't trust him, sir. Why not, Mr. Graham? I believe a ship's captain would normally say I'd welcome it, not we. We are not playing word games, Mr. Graham. Keep your pistol handy and out of sight. Bosun, take us alongside. Aye, aye, Captain. There were no weapons in sight on the L'Espérance, and everything looked as it should. Captain Barry reminded me how urgently Congress needed the powder and added that it did not seem like a time for us to be distracted by small subtleties of language. We eased gently against the powder ship. Our hooks went over her rail and the lines were pulled taut. My compliments, Captain Barry. Well done. Thank you, Captain Putnam. No, man, all hands topside. Stop exactly where you are, you rebels. Don't reach for your pistol, Mr. Barry, or I'll blast your head off. My men outnumber yours three to one. Who in blazes are you? Lieutenant Philip Nichols of His Majesty's armed schooner Marlborough, now tied up at Cavendish. Have I succeeded in surprising you, Mr. Barry? This is Captain Barry, Lieutenant. Oh, I know quite well who he is. Who are you? Lieutenant Donald Graham of the American Navy. The American Navy, indeed. In my book, any colonist fighting against His Majesty's forces is a traitor. I do not address traitors by rank. It strains my sense of decency even to call him Mr. Barry. To answer your question, Lieutenant, you've succeeded in surprising us greatly. Yes, I dare say I have. You see, we came upon L'Esperance quite by chance. Her captain informed me he had already sent word of her flight to Philadelphia, and it was obviously only a matter of time before some rebel ship would arrive to secure the powder. 
I sent the crew ashore in the Marlborough, armed my men, kept them in hiding below decks, and, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Captain Putnam, who is now smiling broadly at you, is actually one of my gunner's mates. He's a native of Nova Scotia. You appear to have foiled us. Yes, I think that describes the situation. You might also care to know that your precious powder has been stored on shore under guard. In brief, Mr. Barry, I have captured your ship. And you, Mr. Graham, and your rebel crew are my prisoners. During the American Revolution, the British Navy operated freely along the Atlantic coast. When one of His Majesty's vessels needed supplies or repairs, the commanding officer simply sailed into a town, threatened to bombard it, and proceeded to do whatever he wished. Communications were slow, and before the Americans could collect a force to oppose the invaders, the British had finished their business and sailed away. Lieutenant Graham's journal continues. Lieutenant Nichols took all of us prisoners into Cavendish in the Sarah Jane, where we tied up at the wharf near his schooner. Captain Barry and I stood on the quarterdeck with Nichols while armed British sailors herded our crew down the gangplank below us and into town. A small crowd of local citizens gathered to watch. Move along there, you rebels! Hurry it up! What do you think they're going to do with us, Josh? I wish I knew, Benny. You think they'll put us in jail? Most likely. For all of me, the whole town's a jail. <laughs> Lively there! Oh, shut up. Josh! Josh Watkins! Who? Abby! I can hardly believe it! There she is, Benny! She's the one I told you about! Abby! Oh, Josh, please let me by. Josh, are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Takes more than King George's Navy to hurt a good Jerseyman. Move along! Move along! Oh, it's so good to see you. I thought I was never... Out of the way, miss. Get your hand off her arm. Shut up, you bloody rebel! Keep those prisoners moving, Harrison. All right, Lieutenant. Go along now. Move! Lieutenant Nichols, his voice full of sarcasm, welcomed Captain Barry and me to Cavendish. Then he announced that he owed us an apology. Yes, Mr. Barry. Uh, you see, I've commandeered the local jail. It will serve until I decide what to do with you. Uh, but I fear you'll find its facilities rather limited. In fact, you and Mr. Graham will be locked up in the same cell with your men. I'm so sorry. Aren't you taking chances, Lieutenant? All your prisoners in one place. Oh, I hardly think so. <laughs> the jail may indeed be small, but it's strong as a fortress. There isn't a chance in hell that you can break out. That night, although we didn't learn the details until later, our jailer had a visitor. Hmm? I... Oh, blimey, who can that be? Who's there? What do you want? Let me in. It's important. You know, woman, it's time of night. Go away. You ain't supposed to be here. But I got Mr. Bodley's medicine. Oh, who in told me he's Mr. He ain't here. Let me in. He may be dying. He, oh, dying? Hurry. Open up. Maybe I'm too late. Oh, that'll be all I need. One of them dying on me. Now, now hold up a minute. I, I don't know which key. Is... Oh, hurry, can't you? I am out of here. Whoa. Oh, you're a pretty one, aren't you? What are you doing outdoors this time of night? Where is he? Where? Where's who? Mr. Bodley. I got to give him his medicine. Well, he wouldn't be out front here with me, would he? All them rebel prisoners is in the other room, locked up in the cell. Mr. Bodley ain't a prisoner. He's the jailer. He's a what? Oh, maybe he was the jailer. Those are Mr. Bodley's keys on your belt. Yeah, I expect they are. Lieutenant Nichols put me in charge here tonight. There wasn't hardly anyone else left. He put men on the Sarah Jane and the Les... Uh, uh, the uh, Lesmer... So you're uh, from the Marlborough? No, eh? Oh, I suppose you're a blooming rebel like all the rest here. I'll have you know I'm a loyal subject of His Majesty King George. Huh? Pretty and a loyalist to boot. Blimey, ain't that lovely? What's your name? Abby. 
What's yours? Timothy. Uh, but why are you fetching medicine to Mr. Uh, um, Mr. Uh, what's his name in the middle of the night? Mr. Bodley. I do every night. He's sick and there's nobody to tend him since his wife died. I expect you're his sister? No. No, I ain't his sister. Well, no. Not his wife. Not his sister. It, it's a secret. <laughs> it would be. Well, there's lots of loose tongues in Cavendish, but Mr. Bodley's got to have his medicine. And when I bring it to him, we, uh, we usually... Usually what? Oh, we usually share a little drink. A drink? Of medicine? Oh, no, land sakes. I got something else besides medicine here in my bag. There. What do you think of that? Rum? Yep. A bottle of good Medford rum. Lots better in your old Jamaica spirits. Yeah, but I don't know what he... Mr. Bodley always says it's Medford rum that gets him through the night. You know, you even look a little like Mr. Bodley. Do I now? Oh, he's a mite heavier, of course. But he's about your age and... Oh, my age, is he? Are you fiber men of my age? Oh, it's nice to have a drink now and again with an older man. <laughs> the young ones is always grabbing at me and... <laughs> grabbing, eh? <laughs> Uh, suppose, suppose you and me could uh, have a little tot of rum together. Well, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to well enough, but uh... you ain't saying no. Now don't get all worked up. It's just that our lieutenant I'm... Nichols will never find out. Oh, it ain't the lieutenant. What then? It's, it's me blooming stomach. What's the matter with your stomach? Oh, I don't know. I uh, every time I drink any kind of liquor, I get these dreadful gnawing pains. My stars! You mean you can't drink liquor at all? No. The doctor says if I... I vow I never met a sailor before that don't touch spirits. I, uh, I thought you were starting to like me. Oh, I bloody well don't need rum to like you. Do you really think I'm pretty? Didn't I say so? Want to put your arm around me? Oh, Lord love me, I wouldn't say no. Well, now, how's that? Oh, give it a little kiss, eh? Love, Timothy, you Britishers are terrible forward. But I guess one would be all right. Here, on my cheek. Now that's enough. No, it ain't. How about the... Oh, <laughs> Timothy, let me be. <laughs> oh. ah. Great blazes. What would Mr. Bodley say? No, forget Mr. Bodley. Oh, my lands, I did forget about his medicine. Well, fetch it to him later. Oh, I can't do that. Now, let me go. Oh, that, that's better. Uh -huh. Goodness, I'll have to go to his house. You ain't leaving now. Well, he's got to have his medicine, ain't he? But I'll come back here afterwards. Abby, I'll I... be back inside of an hour. You just stay right here. Of course I'll stay here. But Abby... Abby came round to the back of the jail where there was a high barred window in our cell. She threw the jailer's keys into us, all the while trying to whisper the complex story of her efforts to slip them off his belt when he had his arm around her. We were all profuse in our thanks, Watkins in particular. Good girl, Abby. Wait for us at the granary. I'll be there. Be careful, Josh. Watkins, aye, Captain. Once we're out of here, you should marry that girl. I might just do that, Captain. <laughs> All the Americans have escaped safely from the Cavendish jail and have met with Abby at the granary. Lieutenant Graham's journal continues. The moon had set. From the window in the granary, we could just make out the wharf where Nichols's armed schooner Marlborough was still tied up on one side and our poor old Sarah Jane on the other. There was no sign of the disabled L'Espérance. Captain Barry questioned Abby about Lieutenant Nichols and his men. She told us that the British forces were divided among all three ships. Oh, and he's got a couple of men at the warehouse with the powder, too. Which ship is Nichols himself on, Abby? None of them, Captain Barry. He took some men and went out to get provisions. Out? You mean out of town? Yes. What? <laughs> By all the saints, he's a confident devil. He's got his crew spread all over the Jersey coast, and he's away hunting turnips. Beef, Captain. Our work is laid out for us, sir. But it is, Mr. Graham. Now, Nichols will have the largest group of his men still on the Marlborough, I expect. We'll have to deal with them before we can do anything else. 
In order to avoid his mistake, Captain, perhaps we should keep all our men together, capture the Marlborough first, and then retake the Sarah Jane. There's also the powder, Mr. Graham, which we were sent here to get. If we attempt two ships and the warehouse one at a time, it'll take too long. Hmm? We've less than six more hours of darkness, I should say, and we don't know when Nichols may come back. Hmm. Watkins? Aye, Captain. Can we see the warehouse from here? Aye, Captain. It's that brick building that faces the stern of the Marlborough. It's got a lantern at the door. Mm, I see. Mr. Graham. Yes, sir. Choose four men and overpower the guards at the warehouse. And don't make a sound. Stay there until I send word to you. Aye, aye, sir. Turn out the lantern to let me know when you've succeeded. I'm heading for the Marlborough. My detachment took care of the guards at the warehouse in short order. Captain Barry's work was considerably more complicated, as he told me afterwards. He carefully reconnoitred the wharf and the ships and returned to the men in the granary with a plan of action fully prepared. There's one man with a musket on the wharf at the foot of the gangplank to the Marlborough and two men on deck at the head of the gangplank. There's no one in sight anywhere else. Bosun? Aye, Captain. I want you and Sewell here to climb up over the stern of the Marlborough and make your way forward till you're hidden just behind those two men at the gangplank. Aye, aye, Captain. When I give the signal, we'll move together. Watkins and I will take care of the man on the wharf. You and Sewell will overpower the men on deck. Pick up the laying pins for weapons. There must not be a sound. Aye, aye, Captain. The rest of you men will stay here in the granary till I send for you. If anything goes wrong, it's every man for himself. Are the two of you ready, Bosun? Aye, Captain. Go ahead. Good luck. And to you, Captain. Very quietly, Watkins and Captain Barry made their way to the wharf. They found a great many casks and bales stacked about and were able to keep hidden behind them nearly the entire distance out to the gangplank. The captain made a sign to Bosun and Sewell, who were in position on the Marlborough, and the four Americans poised themselves to jump on the unsuspecting British sailors. Any sign of life on the Sarah Jane Watkins? Uh, no, Captain. All right. Our man is looking back toward town... Now he's looking down. You think you can keep him quiet, Watkins? I'm sure I can, Captain. I'll grab his musket. So the next time he looks out to sea... Now! Go, Bosun. Go, Watkins. (laughs) Everything taken care of, Bosun? Aye, Captain. Good. Here, Watkins. Let's hide this fellow under the gangplank. Aye, Captain. Yeah. Now, take the musket and pretend that you're on duty here. I'm going on board. Aye, aye, Captain. Good work, Bosun. Thank you, Captain. One of them had a pistol. Yes, sir. Excellent. That'll come in handy. Everything all right there over on the Marlborough? Uh, uh, aye, perfectly all right. Um, how's the Sarah Jane? Very quiet. Uh, trust it'll stay that way. Amen after that. <laughs> I was thinking, Captain. Uh, along with some good Irish luck. Lieutenant Graham's taking the warehouse, all right, Captain. Look, the lantern's out. Splendid. Now, Bosun, wait till that man on the Sarah Jane is out of sight again and go back to the granary for the others. Aye, aye, Captain. Bring them on board here. Quietly. There is certain to be more arms in Nicholas' cabin. We'll round up the men below decks here and take care of those on the Sarah Jane. And then we can start loading the powder. Oh, it'll be a pity, Captain, to leave the Marlborough behind when we go. But we're not going to, Bosun. We're going to bring the powder on board here. We're taking the Marlboro to Philadelphia. The Marlboro wasn't built to carry cargo, and we were soon stacking powder kegs in the passageways, in the forecastle, and even in Nichols's cabin. When less than 10% of the powder still remained in the warehouse, I reported to Captain Barry that we would have trouble finding space on board even for that little. We'll make room for it. Even if we have to rip out the bulkheads and heave the ship's stores over the side. Bosun. Aye, Captain. Bring all hands back on board. On the double. Aye, aye, Captain. There's always a way to get things done, Mr. Graham. Well, the sun's up, and still there's no sign of Lieutenant Nichols. No, sir. Hmm. Watkins. Aye, Captain. Load our stern guns. I want a gunner with a lighted slow match at each one. Aye, aye, Captain. I wonder how many men Nichols has with him. Three or four at the most, I should think. The uh, rest of his crew is securely locked up? Yes, sir. In the hold of the Sarah Jane. Whose idea was that? Mine, sir. Hmm. Ingenious. 
Your work in capturing the warehouse was also well done. Thank you, sir. But it was only a small part of our whole operation. Patience, patience, Mr. Graham. You have plenty of time for still greater glory. I meant only... What the... Hold it! Right there, Barry! Look! In front of the warehouse. It's Nichols. I have sharpshooters aiming at you from both sides, Barry. That first shot was only a warning. The next shots will be the death of you. Here's the fourth act of The Powder Ship. One move, Barry, from either you or Graham and your dead men. Both my hands are here on the taffrail where you can see them, Lieutenant Nichols. But you can never get all of us off your ship. I have many more men here with me than you think. So, it's bluff he wants. Can we oblige him, Captain? I believe we can, Mr. Graham. How many men can you see with Nichols? Uh, one man on each side, Captain, and one right next to Nichols. Three altogether. We're leaving you the Sarah Jane, Nichols, and we're taking the Marlborough. One word from me, Graham, and you'll both be blasted off my ship. We are the ones will do the blasting, Nichols. With what? With the 50 tons of powder inside the warehouse behind you. The Marlborough stern guns are aimed directly at it, loaded and ready. Don't be an idiot. You wouldn't dare. Each of my gunners has a lighted match, Nichols. If you so much as take a step... That much powder would blow up the whole town and all you rebels with it. You've got him, Captain. He thinks the powder's still there. How close would you say you are to the warehouse, Nichols? Ten feet? Fifteen? We're at least thirty yards away, Nichols. You wouldn't. Dare you bloody rebel cowards! Bosun, we're getting underway. The first musket ball is yours, Barry. You heard my order, Bosun. Aye, Captain. Prepare to get underway. I warned you. Cannon ready, Watkins. Aim for the roof. Aye, Captain. Cast off lines, fore and aft. Harrison, fire! Oh. Watkins, fire! You're insane, you, you kill us all! Set main and four courses! That was just the upper corner of the warehouse, Nichols. The next shot will smash through the center door right behind you. Damn you, Benny! You've lost your ship, Nichols! You, you'll never get away with this! You'll hang, Barry! They'll, they'll track you down and hang you! We've done it, Mr. Graham. Yes, Captain, we have. Nichols really looked... Good Lord, what happened to your arm? It's bleeding. Oh, it doesn't amount to anything. Did that musket ball hit you? It hit the top rail, but the ricochet... Yeah, let me look at it. Oh, no, really, Mr. Graham, it's not. Don't you realize we have our powder, most <laughs> of it, and we've captured His Majesty's arm schooner, Marlborough. Our return passage to Philadelphia began smoothly, but as we were doubling Cape May, we encountered a large and formidable British frigate. Lieutenant Nichols' signal book showed us what flags to run up to identify ourselves properly as the Marlborough and told us that the powerful vessel only a hundred yards distant from us was the Penelope, 32 guns, Captain Richard Hitspeth commanding. She ordered us to heave to. 32 guns. One shot and we'd go up with an explosion. But as far as she knows, we're British too, sir. Yes, We'll just have to continue the masquerade, won't we? Ahoy, Marlborough! Captain Edgeworth wishes to speak with his nephew, Lieutenant Nichols. His nephew? Um, uh, Lieutenant Nichols is ill, confined to his cabin. Stand by, Marlborough! Another hour, Captain, and we'd been safe in the Delaware River. Oh, this won't amount to much, Mr. Graham. He'll send his good wishes. I'll tell him we're cruising for rebel shipping, and we'll all be on our way. Probably so, sir. Besides, there's a squall off there to the west beyond the frigate. I seriously doubt Captain, that... Captain, look. The Penelope's putting out a boat. Ahoy, Marlborough! 
We're rolling Captain Ed Bent over to visit Lieutenant Nichols. Oh, meddling old fool. Um, delighted to have him come on board. Damn. We can't very well run, Captain. No. Hmm. I'll have to stay below out of sight, Mr. Graham. This bandage on my arm would beg too many questions. It'll be up to you to deal with Captain Hester. Yes, sir. Perhaps I could pose as Nichols' bosun. Yes. <laughs> yes, Mr. Graham. Capital scheme. Have Sewell hunt up a uniform for you. Oh, what about the men? A ship this small, British sailors dress pretty much the same as ours. They look all right. Delay Captain Hedspeth until that squall is close. You'll probably want to get back to this frigate before the storm hits. Now get below and change clothing. Aye, aye, sir. While I went below, Captain Barry ordered Bosun not to alter sail because of the squall or for any other reason whatever without specific instructions from him. Would you look at this, Captain Nichols? Man must have been a small fellow. This uniform doesn't fit me very well. Mm. We'll just have to hope that Captain Headspeth's eyesight This is... boat's almost alongside, sir. Oh, so it is. Under no conditions is he to be allowed below until I come back on deck. I understand, Captain. I'll be at the foot of the main companionway. Good luck, Mr. Graham. Thank you, sir. Hey! Who's in command here while my nephew is laid up? I am, Captain Hetzbeth. Please let me give you a hand up. Well, it's about time. Yes, damn it. <sighs> Welcome on board the Marlborough, Captain <sighs> Hetzbeth. I fear we didn't have time to prepare a proper... Your bosun? Bosun Graves, sir. The top button of your waistcoat is unpassable, most of Yes, Captain. Now, this visit is quite informal, but... I think your uniform ought to, um, well, uh, I shall take the matter up with my nephew. Uh, what ailed him? We don't know, Captain. He's in his cabin? Yes, Captain. He asked me to convey his apologies and to entertain you here on deck for a few minutes while he uh, prepares himself. Prepares himself? What's he got to do? Shave, Captain. Uh, well, we can't object to that, I suppose. Perhaps you'd like to make a tour of the ship, Captain. Of this ship? Certainly not. I can see all I want to from here. I, uh, I can't place your accent, Bosun. Uh, Nova Scotia, sir. Indeed? I'd have put it further south. P uh, perhaps the captain would care to consider returning to his ship. Yes. I, uh, I didn't, didn't hear you, Bosun. I said the squall is coming on remarkably fast, Captain. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Do you think the colonists will try for independence, Captain? Well, damn near got it already, haven't they? All the fault of those blockheads in Parliament. The, the, the king should be so easy to these things. Are you sure, Lieutenant Nichols? There are certainly a great many malcontents in Virginia, Captain. Oh, and in Massachusetts, too, of course. Malcontents? What is this gibberish, Bosun? Why are you attempting to protract the conversation? Beg pardon, Captain. I was just trying to carry out the Lieutenant's orders to entertain you. Well, your performance has been extraordinary, Bosun. However... I'm ordering you to take down all sail now until this squall is passed. And I'm going below to see Lieutenant Nichols shaved or not. Getting heavier, Mr. Graham. Can you still make out the frigate? Just barely, Captain Barry. Where's Captain Hedspeth? Well, as soon as I saw you come on deck, sir, I had Watkins taken below. I expect he's shouting about our carelessness in storing powder in the passageway. The captain will be a fine prize for us to take into Philadelphia. You handled him well, Lieutenant. Thank you, sir. I must confess I'm still trembling. Perfectly natural. He's a man of some... There. The Penelope's completely hidden by rain. We're getting out of here. Helmsman? Aye, Captain. Hard to starboard. 
Bosun, Bainsel Hall. Bainsel Hall, Captain. Step lively, man. Captain Barry told me that we would be running blind for a time with the storm. Once we had put a few miles between us and the frigate, he said we could heave to again and wait for the squall to pass. Then, at last, we would make for Philadelphia. You can count on a good report, Lieutenant. You have most certainly proved yourself to me. Thank you, sir. Now, break out our proper colors, Mr. Graham. We don't want our friends to think we're British. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, here comes Captain Hetspeth, sir. He, uh, he does not look pleased. Good luck with him, Captain Barry. We can trust my Irish luck will hold, Mr. Graham. The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Powder Ship, was written by Robert Ellis and produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Arthur Hill, Len Berman, and Peggy Hazard. Featured in the cast were Vic Perrin, Tommy Cook, Ivor Barry, Ben Wright, Jack Manning, and Richard Peel. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is Production Supervisor. Recording Engineer, Hal McDonald. Music Editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears a name that means quality and value, a name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. To all the men out there, remember how you felt when you introduced a new girl to your best friends? You wanted them to like her as much as you did. Well, that's the situation going on now. There they are. They've just finished dinner. Carol is helping Monica clear the table. That was the best lasagna I've ever eaten. Oh, well, thank you. It's one of my specialties. You cook the dinner? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. believe it. Believe it. He's a great cook. That's just one of the many reasons I married him. Bud, are you listening to this? Is any of it rubbing off on you? I refuse to answer on the grounds it might tend to incriminate me. <laughs> Sounds like they're getting along. That's good. That's what Bud was hoping for. Now he can ask Carol to join them on a camping trip. Carol, what are you doing this weekend? As a matter of fact, uh, nothing. How would you like to go camping with us? Camping? You mean outdoor camping? Isn't she cute? <laughs> Bud, there are a lot of things you don't know about me yet. One of them is I'm not the outdoor type. Oh, uh... Carol, you don't know what you're missing. Have you ever tried it? No, not really. A conversation turns to a debate with three against one. Carol weakens and reluctantly agrees to go. Unfortunately, they can't see into the future. If they could, I don't think any of them would want to go. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater. A new adventure in radio listening. 
Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Turnabout, by Joyce and Stanley Director. Our stars, Joan McCall and Vic Perrin. David is driving the group along the peaceful early morning countryside. They're all looking forward to an unforgettable weekend. All but Carol, that is. Right now, Carol is just interested in going back to sleep. Isn't this beautiful? Look at all those trees and flowers. And smell that air. Ah, clean. You know, I almost forgot what it smelled like. Well, Monica and I make it a point to try and get out here at least once a month. Hey, listen, any time you want to come along, we'd love to have you. Remember that. Ah, it's a standing invitation. Thanks. You know, I'm really excited about this. I haven't been camping in such a long time since I was a Boy Scout. And that is a long time. <laughs> uh, it's not that long. Oh, don't worry, bud. It's like riding a bicycle. It all comes back to you. I just hope Carol has a good time. Oh, so does Carol. Ah, Sleeping Beauty has arisen. Oh, Sleeping Beauty never fell asleep. The back of this car is not very comfortable. There's not much room. Now that you're up, look outside. Yeah? So? So? So! That's nature out there. Nature untouched by human hands. Oh, you'll never see anything that comes near to it. I'm sorry, but I just can't get as excited about it as you guys obviously do. What do you get excited about? Now, let's not get personal, David. <laughs> <laughs> not bad, not bad. You got me. <laughs> hey, how did you two meet? Carol shops at the market that I manage. One day she brought back some oranges that she said were terrible. They were terrible. There was absolutely no juice in them. Anyway, she complained to some poor cashier that didn't know how to handle her. Handle me? Carol, you're really upset that poor guy. It was his first day on the job. So, anyway, I see this cashier walking toward me with this screaming woman behind him. I wasn't screaming. Shouting, maybe, but not screaming. <laughs> so what happened? Well, I gave her her money back, and I asked her out to dinner. <laughs> yeah, he told me it was part of the supermarket's policy for dissatisfied customers. <laughs> oh, not bad. But one thing, speaking as your accountant, I hope you didn't forget to get a receipt for dinner. Maybe tax deductible. Oh, always working. That mind of yours never stops. Yeah, I made good time today. Not much traffic. But this is just a parking lot. I imagine there's a nice little walk ahead of us, huh? You imagine right. Mm. Monica! How much further? Oh, about another hour or so. An hour? Oh, I don't think I'm going to make it. Leave me here. You you guys go on ahead. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, well. Can't blame a girl for trying. My feet are killing me. I'm positive I've got blisters all over them. Oh, no wonder. Look at your shoes. Oh, don't you have anything more comfortable? Some sneakers or jogging shoes? I don't own any comfortable shoes. Everything I have looks great and feels terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have told you what to wear. It's my fault. I, I just assumed you'd know. But why should you? you? You've never been in camping before. Oh, I feel terrible. Oh, don't. It's not your fault. It's mine. I didn't think. When we get to camp, I'll heat up some water so you can soak your feet. Thanks. Hey, look, the guys are getting way ahead of us. Oh, that's not good. David should know better. David! Wait for us! Come on, you slowpokes. Listen, Simon Legree, it's time to rest. We're tired. Well, not too long. Just for a couple of minutes. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> we women have to stick together. <laughs> right over here. That's a good spot. I can take a couple of pictures. My husband, the camera. Come on, girls, look pretty. Is he kidding? No. Oh, that's better. And now you have a natural look. <laughs> uh, Carol, take your hand away from your face. But... Come on, get in the middle. Uh, you're going to waste all that film. Don't worry, I brought plenty. Oh, do you see what I think I see? Hey, look at those bushes overflowing with berries. You know they're a dollar and a half a box at the market. Let's pick some. Uh, what can we put them in? Oh, here. Uh, we'll put them in these baggies. Come on, everybody. we got work to do. Stop, stop. Nobody move. You scared me. What's wrong? Look here. Right by your foot, Carol. That metal stem sticking out of the grass. That? Oh, that little thing wouldn't hurt me. Oh, really? Would you like to see how much it wouldn't hurt you? 
Why don't I just put this piece of wood on it, like so? Ah! Lou, that could have been my foot. That's right. You think it would have hurt? What is it? That's what you call a bear trap. Ugh. Hey, aren't those things illegal? They're supposed to be. There's no hunting allowed around here. I'll bet that was put there by a poacher. No, they don't put out just one. There are probably a lot more in this area. The berries draw the animals and the traps catch them. Now, look. Look, there's another one. I better be careful. Form a single line in back of me and step exactly where I do. Hey, this is dangerous. Traps, animals... Bud, why didn't you tell me about the animals? Would you have come? No. That's why. Don't worry about it. They don't bother people unless they're bothered. Well, how do you know what bothers them? Maybe just our being here bothers them. It doesn't. How do you know? Because I asked them. They told me it was okay for us to be here. I'm not going to forget this. I'll protect you. Nothing will happen. Monica, do you know what's the matter with Carol? She hardly ate her dinner. Hasn't said two words to me all night. Now she's in the tent. What am I doing wrong? No, oh, it's not what you're doing or not doing. She's just not having a good time. We shouldn't have talked her into coming. There are just some people who aren't the outdoor type. Well, if you ask me, she's a spoiled brat who's used to being pampered and getting her own way. Well, first of all, he didn't ask you. He asked me. And second of all, you're too hard on her. What is your compassion? It, it takes time to get used to this type of life. It, it doesn't happen one, two, three. I remember how I felt the first few times. What are you talking about? You loved it. No, I didn't. Not at the beginning. I never told you the truth because I didn't want to hurt you. You expected me to love it the way you did, so I made believe I did. What I'm trying to say is, I had to acquire a taste for it. Oh, boy, you think you know a woman. Shh. Carol's coming. Come sit by me, honey. The fire's nice and warm. Uh, you want a toast to marshmallow? Okay. Oh, boy, it gets chilly out here at night, doesn't it? Want me to rub your back? Oh, my weakness. Ooh, that feels good. What's that stuff on your legs? Uh, calamine lotion. It's supposed to relieve the bug bites. I just counted them. Guess how many bites I have. I don't know. Eight? Thirty-four. Thirty-four? Oh, my poor baby. Why is everybody biting my little baby? <laughs> After a good night's sleep, you'll feel better. Promise? <laughs> no. Smart. <laughs> I would have held you to it. I'm not looking forward to sleeping on the ground. You won't be on the ground. You'll be in a sleeping bag. Same thing. Uh, why don't I put my radio on and we can listen to some music? Uh, let me try and explain this to you, Carol. And don't think I'm a snob. But I'm not happy that you brought a radio. We come out here to get away from all that. From the radio, the television, the telephone. All noises and distractions. All we want is peace and quiet. Seems you missed the biggest point of this trip. Uh, we all marched to a different drummer. Remember when we were kids and used to scare each other by telling ghost stories? What a great idea. Yeah, terrific. Since you thought of it, you go first. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. There was an old house around the corner from where I lived. And legend said that if you dared to enter, you would never be heard from again. People laughed. But one day a friend of mine, Louie, went into that house and he never came out. Ooh. Well, I missed Louie and I thought about him a lot. And then one day, I found myself in front of that big scary house. I had a hammer for my parents' tool chest so I felt a little safe. I saw a board that was big enough for me to pull down and squeeze through. I did. Then I slowly put in my hand, then a leg. <laughs> From nowhere, a big gust of wind came and pushed me the rest of the way through the opening. <laughs> when I got up, I noticed the board I had removed was back on. Oh, no. I was scared. I felt something, a sort of hot breath on my neck. It stopped. I turned slowly and saw the door at the end of the hallway close. <gasps> what was that? Did you hear that? No. You're just reacting to Bud's story. Shh. Something's out there. I'm sure of it. I heard something. Hey, you're right. Who's out there? Oh, I'm scared. What if it's not human? 
It sounds human to me. The stranger gives his name as Frank Nolan. He appears badly shaken up. There are patches of dried blood on his torn clothes. Monica is busy tending to his many bruises. I hope this doesn't hurt. That must have been a terrible car accident. Oh, I'm lucky to be alive. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I stepped on my brakes and they didn't work. Oh. My car started picking up speed. I, I couldn't stop it. I took my eyes off the road for a second. And when I looked back up, this tree was straight ahead of me. That's the last thing I remember. When I woke up, I was wandering in the woods. How I got here, I don't know. I, I must have gotten out of the car while I was unconscious. If it wasn't for you folks here, I'd still be wandering around. I feel okay. I'm just a little sore in spots, but no broken bones. Well, how can you be so sure? Well, I've broken enough bones to know what they feel like. Uh, I don't want to be a bother to you folks, but... Could I sleep by your fire tonight? Oh, what a question. You don't have to ask. We've got plenty of extra blankets, plenty of food. You, you just take all the time you want till you feel better. Well, that's very nice of you, but I'll be going in the morning. You uh, live around here? No, no, just driving through on business. You work on a weekend? Uh, checking out some property. I'm in real estate. No kidding. Well, any uh, secret tips you can lay on us? <laughs> Not anymore. Everybody's in real estate these days. I don't like the looks of this gash on your hand. David, look at it. Yeah, it's a bad one. Just clean it and bandage it. That's all we can do. Oh, that's plenty. I really appreciate this. I'll go to a doctor when I get back. Oh, oh. I I'm sorry. Did I hurt you? Oh, not you, lady. This here gun of mine just stuck me in the ribs. Mind if I take it out? I'll just set it right here next to me. What's a guy in real estate doing with a gun? Well, protecting myself. I don't care what kind of business you're in, you need a gun. What kind of weapon you got? I don't have one. Well, you got to be kidding me. You all out here in no man's land without protection? That's right. Well, you're putting me on. I'm not an idiot. You have a gun, you just don't want me to know, right? Wrong. We're peace-loving people. We just come out here to camp and fish. Oh, you people are crazy if you ain't got protection. A gun is a man's best friend. Well, how can you say that? What about all the innocent people who've been killed or maimed? Oh, look, it's late. I don't think this is the time to get into a heavy discussion. It's been a big day for all of us. I think we can use some sleep. You know, bud, hmm? I'm kind of glad that guy's got a gun. I was a little worried being out here. With the animals and everything. Now I think I'm going to sleep a little better. Oh, that was a delicious breakfast. Thanks again. Now, I have one more favor to ask, and then I'll be on my way. What can we do for you? A map. If you could just draw me a map, something easy that'll help me get out of here, back onto the road. Sure. Uh, but not right now. Uh, we're going fishing. Hey, why don't you come with us? Take life a little easier. You know, you've got to learn to relax and enjoy yourself. Wherever you're rushing to, it'll still be there when you get to it. Oh, I'm not rushing, but i got things to do. I'll relax later. Well, yeah, that's the trap. Later never comes. If you're going to do it, do it now. He's right. Look, it's so early, nobody's up except us and the fish. Come with us. When was the last time you went fishing? Oh, I used to be pretty good at it. No, no, I can't. Oh, leave him alone. Maybe he's got family that'll be worried about him. I have no family. See? Bud, we look like we're the same size. Tell you what, I'll stay if you let me put on something of yours. I'd really like to get out of these clothes. No problem. Come on, I'll find something for you. You can change in the tent. Right. It's a good thing I made extra sandwiches. Did anybody see my wallet? Thought I had it in my jacket. I can't find it. Well, maybe you put it in your pants. No, took it out of my pants and put it in my jacket. Well, it's got to be around. It didn't get up and walk away by itself. You probably mislaid it. It'll show up. Yeah. I'll look for it later. Right now, it's fishing time. Frank will be ready in a minute. Carol, you'd better get your hat. The sun is going to be strong today. 
I've uh, been thinking about it, and I'd rather not go. Why not? I'm I'm not into fishing. <laughs> I just put a damper on everybody's good time, and uh, I don't want to do that. I've got a book I can read, and I've got the radio. Uh, I'll be okay. You just you all go and catch yourselves a lot of fish. Within an hour after the others have left, Carol regrets that she didn't go fishing with them. She's bored by the book she's brought along on the trip, bored with her surroundings, and bored with being alone. Then she remembers her portable radio. She gets it out and turns it on. Oh, don't conk out on me now. I need you. And the high in the lower deserts is expected to remain near 80 degrees, while in the mountains it's a beautiful 72. Not a night, it's not. The weather pattern will continue with us all weekend. Now, there's an update on that plane crash we reported earlier. Short time ago, the twin-engine plane, which was reported missing yesterday, was located a few miles east of Wiley Ridge. That's near here. The plane was headed for San Quentin. The pilot and deputy sheriff were found dead, apparently from the crash. The convicted murderer they were transporting was missing. His name is Fred Crystal. There is a search party being formed. Fred Crystal is described as a male Caucasian, 42 years of age, 5 feet 10 inches tall... 160 pounds. Hair black, eyes brown. He's armed and considered extremely dangerous. Stay tuned to this station for further... Wow. Could it be just a coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> a little too close for comfort. Armed and considered extremely dangerous. It could be our visitor, Frank. He's got a gun. What was that name? Fred. Fred Crystal. Oh, boy, we could all be in deep trouble. They're coming back. What should I do? That was rather unnerving news Carol just heard over the radio. She puts up a good front as she awaits the right time to tell her friends about their mysterious guest. We're back, Carol. Did you miss us? As a matter of fact, yes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Maybe next time you'll come. I don't know. Pew! You all smell terrible. It's not us. It's the fish. Well, don't put the blame on some poor dead animal. Oh, who caught that big one? Frank. Really? Okay, everybody. Picture time. Frank, get a hold of Jaws over there, and I'll take a shot of you and your prize-winning cash. Uh, no pictures. What? Oh, a fisherman who doesn't want a picture? Come on. Now, I won't take no for an answer. You won't take no for an answer? That's right. Well, then take all the pictures you want, but after, I get to take some of you. Oh, that's fair enough. Now, hold up your partner, the fish, and let's get this show on the road. That's good. Now, uh, do something. Uh, like make believe you're biting it. <laughs> hey, good shot. Okay, everybody, join in, grab a piece, and open wide. Uh, hurry up, David. I'm getting locked jaw. Uh, well, you see this. It's a funny picture. Got it. Ah, uh, you can all relax now. Ah, uh, my turn. My turn. How does this camera work? Ah, uh, here. All you have to do is look through this and press down here. Uh-huh. Now let's see. We're on twenty-two. Uh, you've got 14 shots left. Oh, that's plenty. Everybody ready? Mm-hmm. Yes. Now smile. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, Frank. Hey, you're some director. Watch out, Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, that's Coppola. Uh, Coppola. Oh, is that the way he says it? Oh, stop teasing him. Oh, oh I'm sorry. What did, what did I do? Mm. The film came out of the camera. I, I'm really sorry. Oh, boy, I had some great shots on that roll. Sorry. You shouldn't have pulled this bar down. Well, there's nothing we can do now. It's ruined. I'm glad I brought plenty of film. Oh, sure. We can take some pictures later. I, I think I'll go wash up. But I forgot which way is the outhouse. To the right. Ah, now I remember. Thanks. Shh. Everybody, come here. Huh? This is important. I got to tell you something. I don't know where to start. While you were gone, I was listening to the radio, and they said on the news that a plane crashed right around here. Oh, how terrible. Was anybody hurt? Too dead, but they said that a convicted murderer escaped from the crash. And by the description, he fits this guy, Frank, to a T. What should we do? Nothing. Nothing? He's got a gun. That's right, but I don't think we should jump to conclusions. 
I agree. Carol, you got to admit it's pretty far-fetched. And no, it's not. I mean, we know nothing about this man except what he's told us, which I don't believe a word of. You know, young lady, I don't know much about you either, except that you're a complainer. Oh, so that's it. You just don't like me. Well, I don't care, but don't disregard what I'm saying. Another thing, the escaped murderer's name is Fred. Huh? Fred? Frank? Close, isn't it? Oh, you're really reaching for straws. Look, Carol, I'm the same physical size as Frank. I've got the same coloring, and we're both about the same age. Does that mean I could also be the killer? Well, don't you see the similarities? He said he was in a car crash, and there was a plane crash. Before he put on your clothes, bud, remember the ones he was wearing? They didn't appear to fit him. They were much too big. And don't tell me he could have lost weight. Well, not everybody's a clothes horse like you. You're making too much out of this, Carol. Have you thought about the possibility that it's just a coincidence? I hope your husband doesn't say anything to Fred. His name is Frank. Oh, yes. And my husband doesn't tell tales out of school. David's not going to say anything. Oh, really? Then why are they out there together, hmm? Tell me why David asked Frank, of all people, to help him gather wood. I mean, why didn't you go with him? What difference does it make? It makes a lot of difference. Hey, why are you all against me? We're not against you. Well, you're either against me or with me, and you're definitely not with me. You can't paint everything black and white, Carol. What about the grays? Well, all I know is there's a good chance that this stranger, and he is a stranger, could be a killer. And you're not even scared or worried. He could kill us all, and and we wouldn't even put up a fight. Frank has done nothing to make us feel threatened by him. Not yet he hasn't. Oh, I don't know what to say anymore. (laughs) Maybe if if you listen to the radio yourself. That's it. Maybe, Maybe it's the way I'm saying it. Maybe my voice doesn't have any authority in it. I'm putting the radio on. Stay tuned for more news from the station where the news never stops. Tomorrow's weather picture. What is wrong with this thing? I think it's your battery. Oh, great. Now you're really not going to believe what I told you. I, I swear it's true. But, Monica, I'm pleading with you. Just let this man Fred, Frank, whatever his name is, let him leave. That's all I ask. Please. He said he wanted to go. Let him go. We're not going to stop him. Thank you. That's all I wanted. Monica, since you're his wife, could you tell David what we decided? As soon as he gets back. It won't be long now. I hear him coming. You think we got enough wood? Oh, more than enough. Uh, uh, David, can I talk to you privately? Uh, In a minute. First, I've got some good news for everybody. Well, almost everybody. I talked Frank here into staying tonight and heading back with us tomorrow. I promised we'd give him a ride to wherever he wants to go. Oh, your husband's a good talker. Yes, I know. Hey, a radio. I didn't know you had a radio. Anything interesting going on in the outside world? Uh, it doesn't play. Uh, the batteries are dead. Oh, that's too bad. But like they say, what we don't know won't hurt us. <laughs> that's a funny thing to say. Don't you think so, everybody? Well, it's a saying. Haven't you heard of it? We've all heard of it. You know, I could go for a cup of coffee. Is the stuff fresh? I made it an hour ago. Good enough. Who wants? I'll have a cup. Um, tell me, uh, Frank, uh, what company do you work for? No company. I work for myself. Oh. Uh, well, uh, if I were interested in buying a house, uh, how would I contact you? I don't sell houses, only land. Uh, what if I wanted to buy some land? But you don't, do you? Well, not right now. But you never know. Don't you work for commissions? Carol, that's enough. Enough? Enough what? I'm only carrying on a conversation. Why do I have the feeling something's going on that I don't know about? Frank, I have something to tell you. Carol doesn't like you. David, (gasps) don't. Why don't you like me, Carol? I haven't done anything to you. Well, it's hard to explain. Whatever it was, how about starting on a new foot, okay? Hello, Carol. Nice to meet you. Hello, Fred. It's nice to meet you, too. What did you call me? Leonard Nimoy again. And here's the fourth act of Turnabout. It's too bad you found out I was getting to like you people. Well, uh, we like you, too. Uh, 
Things don't have to change. Shut up and sit still. I got to think. What am I going to do with you? Oh, I hate making these decisions. Now, why are you doing this to me? Everything was going fine before. Why did you have to be so nice to me? People talk, you see. It's not good for people to talk too much. It gets them in trouble. I should kill you. That's the right thing for me to do. No, wait. Wait, maybe I won't have to. I could tie you up and let nature take its course. You gave me a chance, I'll give you a chance. I saw some rope in the tent. You, Monica, go get it. Oh, well, uh, okay. Everybody knows the human body can last a few days without food or water. You may survive. Maybe in that time somebody might even rescue you. Hurry up with that rope. And then again, there's animals around here. I hope they don't find you first. Oh, thank you, Monica. You, Bud, take the rope and tie Monica's hands and feet. Oh. And tie them real good. I'm watching. Oh, no. Maybe I'll take a little insurance with me. Big Mouth, get over here. Wait a minute. Don't take her. Take me instead. Oh, a hero. Cemeteries are filled with her. Look, I'm only trying... She can't help get you out of here. I can. I'll take my chances. She's easier to handle. You, Carol, get David's car keys and... Here, you can give him back his wallet. Why did you tie my hands behind my back? So you won't try anything. Well, if I promise not to, will you untie them? No. They hurt. Can't you at least tie them in front of me? Shut up. You talk too much. Just walk. What's that? Shh. Get down here, quick. Don't you move and don't make a sound or I'll blow your head off. Uh, that was close. Well, uh, well, was, it, was that the search party? It could have been. Or it could have been hikers or campers. I don't know. No matter who it was. If they'd have found us, there'd be a lot of dead bodies around here. Come on. Let's walk. You don't. You don't have to kill anybody. I mean, they don't have to know what's going on. We could just be a, a plain couple. All you'd have to do is untie me. Listen, lady, you think I like to kill? Well, I don't. But I gotta protect myself. I'm the only one that's looking out for me. You think I'm a cold-blooded killer? You don't know the whole story. What did the radio say? Oh, not much. Uh, they described you and uh, said you were a convicted murderer on your way to. Some prison. Yeah. You know who convicted me? A jury. Twelve lousy people. Twelve. Think of it. Millions vote in elections, but twelve vote for my life. Well, they were wrong. I'm innocent. You can appeal. Won't do no good. It was the person I killed. I killed the wrong person. He was a cop. The thing that makes me mad is I didn't know he was a cop. That's not my fault, is it? He wasn't in uniform. He didn't say, hey, I'm a cop. Two more minutes, I'd have been out of that bank. It was perfect. Everything went perfect. Nobody knew I was robbing the place till I was finished. Except there was this cop there doing business in the bank as a customer. They shouldn't be allowed to be out of uniform on their off hours. And... Come on, let's move. People had a right to know who's a cop and who ain't. I never would have robbed that bank if I saw a cop. I would have left and come back the next day. And everything would have been fine. The cop would be alive. I'd have my money. And the taxpayers would have saved on the trial. I never thought of it that way. Could we rest for a little bit? Didn't you hear what I said? Yeah, uh, I told you. I, I never thought of it that way. You believe that I'm innocent, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, now that you've uh, told me the whole story. Can we rest now? Yeah, just for a few minutes. <sighs> Here, lean against this tree. You want one of these sandwiches? Will you untie my hand? No. I'll feed it to you. Oh, you're all heart. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Next to you. What are you getting oh, so excited a, about? A snake right there next to your leg. Oh, boy. <laughs> I got it. Thank you, lady. You didn't have to warn me. You could have let him bite me. 
Now that I think about it, he could have bitten you, too, isn't that right? Oh. Hurry up. It's getting dark. Maybe we should wait till morning. It'll be easier to see where we're going. You keep walking as long as this flashlight holds out. This is the really best time. Nobody will see us. No more search parties. They all went home. Hey. Hey, this looks familiar. We were here half hour ago. What are you doing? You taking me in circles? No. Everything uh, looks familiar in a forest because there's there's nothing but trees and bushes. Where are we? I'm not sure. Look, uh, you knew up front. I'm not the outdoor type. You got a memory, don't you? And use it. Get us out of here the same way you came in. Why are you looking down on the ground all the time? Because I'm, uh, I'm tired. Okay, it's uh, it's hard for me to hold my head up. Look, berries. Are you hungry again? No, no, it's the berries. I remember them. See, oh, I got us on the right track. I know exactly where we are. I, I was here before, Frank. <laughs> It'll soon be over. It's about time. All we have to do is walk right past these bushes here. Yeah. Ah, good, good. <laughs> hey, you're walking too close to me. Walk a little to to the left. That's better. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> what? Hey, something got my foot. I, oh, I dropped my gun. What is this? I, uh, I think that's what they call a bear trap. Uh. Well, get me out of it. Well, how? I don't know anything about bear traps. Give me my gun. Give it to me. It's near you. I'll blast this thing off my ankle. I can't pick up your gun with my hands tied behind my back. <sighs> oh, I know. I'll kick it over to you. <sighs> oh, my. Mm. <laughs> I kicked it in the wrong direction. Now, how did I do that? Come on, lady. This thing hurts. I'm sure it does. In fact, it must hurt almost as much as... Let's see, having your hands tied behind your back? Oh, I'll kill you if you don't get me out of here. You'll probably kill me if I do. I can't win, can I? Look, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. We all say things we don't mean. I just got mad for a second. Hey, we're, we're friends. I like you. That wouldn't hurt you. <laughs> what is it? You want something? That's it, huh? Isn't it? (laughs) Well, you name it, you got it. Money or or jewels, a a, a car. What? You tell me. Oh, I'd really like to help you, Frank, but uh, my hands are tied Uh, in more ways than one. So, I'll untie them. See, I'll help you. You help me. You'll have to come closer so I can reach you. No, I've got to think about this. Well, what's to think about... It's a funny thing. I think I've gotten used to having my hands in this position. In fact, it's uh, starting to feel good. Mm. I don't know if I want you to untie them. What are you doing to me? Nothing. I'm not doing anything to you. Mm. That's the way it's going to stay. You want help? Well, I'll get you help. You stay right where you are, and I'll I'll be back as soon as I can. Don't leave me. Don't. Let's talk about it. Oh, I'll get you for this. But uh, I'll get you untied first, and then you can help me with Monica and David. Sure, fine, but tell us what happened. Is everybody all right? Oh, now we are, thanks to you. Yeah, we couldn't be happier to see you, Carol, safe and sound. But how did you manage to get away from him? Well, I'd have been back here sooner if I hadn't run into a search party on the way. It was a pretty scary bunch, believe me. Bristling with guns and led by a real live sheriff. And I had to take them to where Frank was. Fred or Frank or Fred, whatever his name is. Before I could get back here to help you guys. Oh, these knots are so tight. But hang on, darling bud. I'm nearly done. There. Oh, wow, what a relief. 
My wrists have been numb for hours. Well, I'll go to work on poor Monica here. Uh, and as soon as you get your circulation back, Bud, you can untie David. Yeah. I must say, Carol, we do owe you an apology. I'll say we do. Accepted with pleasure. I'm just glad we've all survived this little outing. Carol, are you going to keep us in suspense all night, or are you going to tell us what happened? What happened? Oh, I don't want to go through all that again. There was a reporter with a search party, and I had to tell him every little detail. You can hear all about it on the car radio. On our way home! The Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Turnabout, was written by Joyce and Stanley Director and produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Joan McCall and Vic Perrin. Featured in the cast were Len Berman, Janet Waldo, and Byron Kane. The Mutual Radio Theater theme was composed by Nelson Riddle. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tollefson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. This is Lorne Green. Listen in on Monday for another story about the West, as it was then, as it is now. This is Leonard Nimoy. The first great crusade ended in the triumphant capture of Jerusalem from the Seljuk Turks and the establishment of a Christian kingdom that was to last for two centuries. The knights who had answered the call of Pope Urban II to participate in the crusade must have felt themselves blessed men indeed. For had not the Pope himself promised that their journey should count as full penance for their sins? Had they not triumphed over the Antichrist? Were they not truly invincible? One of these brave and noble men was Sir Guy of Harcourt. He chose not to remain in the Holy Land once it was conquered for Christ, but to return home to Europe. It seems as if the Pope's promise has been well kept, Sir Guy. Our lands have been protected and have flourished in our absence. Those folks, as God wills it. Look, the peasants have seen our approach. They're coming down from their fields to cheer our return. Raise high our banners, so they shall know once again we have been victorious. Indeed. When have you ever not been victorious? As Sir Guy rode in triumph through the village and up the winding road to his castle... It did indeed seem as if absolute peace and safety had been achieved. His borders were secure, his people happy and flourishing. All that remained was for him to enjoy the fruits of his labors. And that's only the beginning of our story. Mutual Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, The Master of Harcourt, by Percy Granger. Our stars, Fletcher Marco, Ben Wright, and Peggy Hazard. In 
the days following his return from the Holy Land, Sir Guy of Harcourt experienced for the first time in his life the sensation of peace. He did not have to be on his guard, nor had he to worry about whence the next attack might come. There had, however, been a curious incident, and at a feast held in the castle, it was discussed in whispered tones. They say it happened last night, as a cloud passed over the moon. The captain of Sir Guy's horsemen was sitting astride his mount, when for no apparent reason the beast reared up and threw him. He struck his head as he fell, killed instantly. And this same valiant captain saved Sir Guy's life in the Holy Land. A fearless soldier. And an excellent rider. How could such a thing happen? Oh, hush. Here comes a guy now, with his wife and his old counselor, Baldwin. Will you dance, my lord? No, no, I've no leg for dancing tonight. But perhaps Lord Amelie will escort you. Oh, with pleasure, Sir Guy. They move gracefully, do they not? I suppose so. Music is indeed the harmony of the spheres, and the very opposite of the discord of war. How much longer, think you, will these inactive days of peace continue? Let us hope forever, my lord. I do not think that possible. What enemy is there within a hundred miles to challenge us? Years ago you defeated the barbarians to the west and north, then the Saracens in the south, and the Huns from the east. And now you have returned from Jerusalem with the infidel himself has been vanquished, and the Holy Sepulchre is safe under the protection of Godfrey of Bouillon. And the Pope has pardoned you all your sins. Truly are you blessed among men. My skill is for war. Mine attraction is to mine enemy. Then permit your old counselor to make a suggestion. Let us organize a tourney. We'll invite everyone from far and wide. <laughs> Mock battle? Well, in honor of your triumphant return. Jousting is a sport for idle men. It's a useless risk of life. I want a holy cause and a worthy opponent. Well, unfortunately, there seem to be none at the moment. Now, listen to me. Tomorrow, let us venture down to the village. It is market day, and you have not yet seen how the people have fared in your absence. Your subjects love you and long to see you, and the distraction will do you good. Ah, this is the kind of day we live through fire and thunder for. A lovely spring day to clear the mind of noxious thoughts. Yes, I suppose it is. What occupies your mind, my lord? My captain. And why he should have been thrown from his horse. Ah, it was an accident, sir. It has no meaning. Ah, smell the blossoms and look. They have come to the village. Fish, fresh fish and oranges. Old woman? Yes, Oh, your lordship. Give me an orange. Why, certainly. Let me find the base. It doesn't matter which. That one will do. And here's for your trouble. Silver scola. That's too much. I have no change. Keep it. Thank you. God bless you, sir, guy. The oranges have grown larger in our absence. What's that hammering? Ah, a newcomer to our village, I'm told, my lord. A carpenter. He occupies the stall once owned by Gerhard the Saddler. None of the local people would take it because they thought it was bewitched. Pagan superstition. Let us meet this fellow. Good day, Sarah. Oh, did we startle you? Uh, it's, it's nothing, my lord. Forgive me. What is your name? <laughs> Only God knows that for certain, but... I am called Cedric. Your face is new. No, it is very old. I mean in our village. My counselor tells me you are a carpenter. Yes. Our savior was a carpenter. It is a noble profession. What are you making? A coffin. Has someone died? No, but someone will. Who? I mean, someone always does. Why did you look frightened when I first spoke to you? It, it was nothing. A, a mighty Christian warrior such as yourself would only laugh, but, but... Well, there is an ancient superstition in our trade that if anyone speaks as the last nail is being driven into a coffin, it means the coffin is meant for him. 
Hmm. But, but it is only a superstition, my lord. It is good you assure me thus. Good day, Carpenter, and I hope you find a buyer soon for your coffin. <laughs> what are you laughing at, you old goat? <laughs> the look on your face when the carpenter told his story. <laughs> Pagan superstition. <laughs> that coffin did look a pretty decent fit. <laughs> now, shall we walk through the rest of the village? No, I've had enough of this dalliance. Let us return to the castle. Baldwin? Uh, yes, my lady. Have you spoken yet with my husband today? I'm on my way to see him now. We must discuss the disbanding of the army and the lowering of our levies now that we are at peace. What is the matter? Well, he has been so restless ever since his return. And just now I asked him if he would ride with me this afternoon, and he flew into a rage. At what provocation? I do not know. He acted as one afraid. <laughs> I have never known Sir Guy to show fear. But something troubles him more than just the restlessness of the recent days. See if you can discover what it is. My lord. My lord. Hmm? What do you want? I have uh, drawn up your orders for the army to be disbanded. What? Talk you of disarming? Why, yes, as we agreed. Come over here to the window. Look you there. What do you see? Nothing. Only the battlements. Above the battlements. Ha! Ah, I see a bird in flight. A raven. A lone raven. It is a sign, Baldwin, a messenger from mine enemy. He has been chivalrous enough to give me warning. Your enemy, my lord? Death. The angel of oblivion. <laughs> Harcourt, triumphant in battle, standing at a casement window high in his castle, master of all he surveys, has just turned calmly to his old and trusted counselor and made a most startling announcement. Death cannot be an enemy, my lord. No. Yet look at the signs. Was not my captain killed, the very man who saved my life? What should be the meaning of this? It is not given to us to know these things. And the no. carpenter with his coffin, what of that? I send to the village then and have the coffin destroyed. I already have. Then there is no need to carry this foolishness further, my lord. But what good will it do when the cock did not crow this morning? I, I do not know how to answer you. <laughs> do not worry, Baldwin. I have not gone mad. We shall treat this enemy as we would any foe. We will respect him as a worthy opponent and take appropriate measures. Come over here to my table. I have been drawing up plans to strengthen the castle's fortifications. My lord. My lord. My lord. Your soldiers have gone mad. They are tearing up the gardens. It's all right, Matilda. I gave them orders to do so. You did? They are digging wells. The castle must have its own water supply. We must no longer be dependent on the public wells, which may be exposed to contamination and which lie outside the protection of our walls. But must it be my beautiful garden that pays the price? Baldwin! Well, I, I must say I have long argued that we should have an independent source of water. What if we were attacked and laid siege to? You see, my dear, Baldwin understands these things. And now... As to the disbanding of the army, that, of course, is out of the question. And the taxes and other levies on grain and so forth must be kept at the same levels as before. The peasants will not like that, my lord. Of course not. They never do. Their security comes from me, from my might. But whence comes my security? That you must get from God. Of course. But the army stays at its present level. I have also this day dispatched couriers to the four corners of the earth to fetch to me the finest doctors of medicine. I shall establish here the finest and most modern of laboratories where they may work without impediment to discover the cures that will check death at every turn. Excuse me, I must see to the procuring of the equipment they shall need. Why talks he of death? 
What has put this fear into him? I do not think he is afraid. The guy is a soldier. His habit is to fight and to be prepared to fight. That he now chooses to call his enemy death is but an allegory, a symbol. It cannot lead to any harm. It does seem better for having something with which to occupy his mind. Well, that is true. Uh, perhaps it is best to let it be. And who knows what good may come of it. Did he not say that he would gather together here the great scholars of medical science? Perhaps Harcourt will become a famous center of learning. My lord, I... I... You what? Are you not yet ready to tell me what you have discovered? The discoveries you're seeking, the, the antidotes to the scourges and plagues that ravage mankind, well, these are diseases that have been with us for centuries. It, it, it will take time and knowledge. Are you asking for still more money? Is that it? Dr. Sutorius, you and your colleagues have been at Harcourt these six months past. You have wanted for nothing... I have ransomed my kingdom to provide you with everything you have requested. Is it too much to expect something to show for all this? It, it is... It is not in the nature of experimentation such as we're doing to... to expect results? To predict when such results as you want, as we all want, uh, might be achieved. How many ways may a man die from disease? One hundred? Two hundred? A thousand? Have you not, in all this time, been able to find the cure for even one? No, but you must give us time. I give you no more time. You are dismissed, all of you, back to from whence you came. I will not live with false hope. Sir Guy, the doctors have all taken their leave. Charlatans. I think that in time they would have made wondrous discoveries. Time is precisely what we do not have. You defeat an enemy by moving faster than he does. I know this is true. I taught you these things myself. I want the garrison doubled and redoubts built up beyond the moat. I want us so securely armed and protected that we shall never again have to be afraid. Sir Guy, your orders have been carried out. There is an extra line of fortifications around the entire castle, and your armorers are forging new weapons for your fresh recruits. Every rational step that can be taken to ensure the castle's security has been taken? Yes. And my soul is saved? The Pope has promised me salvation? Yes. Good. I will take my leave, my lord. Uh, wait. What more can your lordship want? I want a fortune teller. What? A sorcerer. A wizard. One who can see into the future. I want to know what fate is in store for me. minister to a mind diseased and raise out the written troubles of the brain? Sir Guy of Harcourt, a fearless warrior, stares into the eye of dread. It is not given us to know why a man can face the enemy host without flinching and then tremble before the specters of his own mind. Nor do we know how far he might go in his madness. A fortune teller, my lord. But they are outlawed by the Holy Church. Yes. And do you know why? Because it has given them to know the future. They but claim to know it. No man has such knowledge, for that is the sole province of God. Do not quote scriptures to me. My need is no less than Saul's when he went to the Witch of Endor. I must know what awaits me. My enemy is death, is it not? To see a wizard is no sin... It is as if I were to send a spy into the enemy's camp to ascertain his plan that I might counter it. And would this content you? Of course it will content me. Why should it not? Well, there is a famous so-called seer in the mountains to the east. Her name is Gudrun. Ah, bring her to me. No, I will go to her in disguise. That way I may test whether she be a true sorceress or not. Yes? Are you 
Gudrun? I am. It is said you can see into the future. Come closer. Who are you? A peasant. I do not think so. I am dressed in peasant's clothing. But uh, there is a aura about you, and the cross of Christ shines upon your chest. I do not see this. You are one of noble birth who has been to the crusade. Ah, this is true. You are indeed a seer. But that is the past. I am here to know the future. Come closer. This is strange. What is? I sense that you are a man of great power, uh, yet you are afraid. Fear in the powerful is dangerous. Tell me my fate. Bend forward, that I may see your reflection in the cauldron. Well... What do you see? A double image. Yours and uh, behind you, the coat of arms of a noble house. A scarlet dress across a field of blue. With the fleur-de-lis and the rising sun? Yes. Those are my armorial bearings. But something is amiss. The shield is backwards. The sun rises in the west. What does that mean? That you shall live invincible until the day the sun rises in the west. But that's not possible. Therefore, I am safe, for the sun can never rise in the west. Old woman, give me thy mitten. I'll have it filled with gold crowns and return to thee. <laughs> My lord, you're back. Yes. And are you satisfied? Indeed. I have nothing to fear until the sun rises in the west. (laughs) You shall be an old man ere that happen. Yet this was the prophecy. She saw a double image in her cauldron, mine and that of my coat of arms reversed. Well, as long as it has finally set your mind at rest. Still... I do not rightly understand the meaning of it. Did she interpret correctly, do you think? I'm sure she did. What do you think it means? I think, my lord, it is a sign from God chiding you for your foolishness. I want more grain requisitioned from the peasants. What? We are not well enough provisioned here. We've never lacked for food. And more men must be conscripted. But you have already doubled the size of the garrison. Then double it again. It is planting time, my lord. The men need it on their farm. I want to see soldiers on every rampart, at every gate, and in every tower. Why do you stand there gaping? I ask you for advice, and all I get is the wrong advice. Carry out my orders at once. It has all been done as you commanded. The castle granaries are full. To the bursting point, and your hunters are killing and dressing twice the usual supplies of meat. And my men? Every able-bodied man has been pressed into service. Are we safe? Are you asking my opinion as your counselor? What do you mean? As the man who was your teacher as a child, who has guided you ever since, whose word you have always trusted? Yes, of course. Then in my judgment, Sir Guy, yes, the... Measures you have taken are sufficient. Good. Good. Is that all? Yes. Yes, you may go. Baldwin. Yes, my lord. Build more granaries. Oh. Now, lady, what's the matter? I was riding through the village, and the people spat upon me. They shook their fists. And when the captain offered to draw his sword, they threatened him with staves and pitchforks. Are you all right? Oh, yes. But the people are starving. Their sons have all been taken from them. You must do something to convince my husband of his madness. I think I have news that will bring him to his senses. A 
outlaws in my domain? Where are they from? They are your own people, sire. Nonsense. They have no cause. They are in revolt over the high taxes. They haven't enough to eat, and winter is coming. Give them back some of the grain in our storehouses. We shall never eat it all. It is already beginning to rot. I did not realize things had come to such a pass. Yeah, they have, and you must address the situation at once. You are right. <clears throat> Send out my captains to hunt down every villainous rebel and kill him. That was not my meaning, my lord. Burn the forests if necessary. Deny them shelter. Deny them food and fuel. Deny them everything. I am standing face to face with death, and these ungrateful slaves peck at my heels like mongrel curs. <laughs> Your captains have ambushed a party of the outlaws, sire. And? They are all dead. All but one who was taken prisoner to be made to say where the rest of the rebels are. Has he talked? He refuses to. Put him to the torture. He has been, but even under pain of death he refuses to speak. That's not possible. I tell you, he is not afraid. He bluffs. He must be afraid. I think not. Not afraid of death? This is a man I must meet. He's down here, your lordship. They, uh, they just brought him back from the rack. He uh, may not be conscious. Is he chained to the wall? That he is. We take no chances here. Give me his key. Yes, your lordship. Is that him yonder? Yes. Leave me with him. Alone? Is that wise? Leave me. Yes, sire. Who's that? Sir Guy. Come to kill me yourself, tyrant? Tyrant? Is that what I am called now? It's what you are. You would have me believe it's true, then, what they say, that you are not afraid of death. Well, I don't believe it. You're as frightened as the next man. Look. Look here. I have the key to your chains. What will you do for me to unlock them? Not what you would have me do. Not tell me the whereabouts of the rest of your band? Not if a thousand lives were mine to give. Very well. I'll make it easy for you. Tell me your father's name. Why? Tell me his name and you shall go free. My father is dead. So much the better. I've no care of him one way or the other. It is a painless way to buy your freedom. What's the trick? No trick, but to satisfy me that you fear death and will escape it if you can. I am holding the key to your chains. Speak and you go free. There is no freedom whilst you live. Do not mince words. I will tell you nothing. Don't be a fool. My sword is at your throat. Tell me thy father's name. Tell me thine. Tell me the color of thy beard. Speak! I will not content you, tyrant! Then die! <laughs> die and take your secret with you. Leonard Nimoy again. And here's the fourth act of The Master of Harcourt. I am sorry, but I cannot stay here a day longer, my lady. Baldwin, you must not leave. Sir Guy has gone completely mad. He has this very minute come up from the dungeons where he killed a bound prisoner in cold blood for no reason. I can no longer place my own soul in jeopardy by following him. But you are the only person he will listen to. He listens to no one anymore. Only the demons that possess his mind. He will not be satisfied. Oh! I must go. No, wait. There is a legate from the Pope himself, a bishop, arriving in the courtyard at this very minute. They have heard of my husband's distraction. Baldwin! 
Persuade him to speak to this bishop, to seek the comfort of God. You are the only person who can do this. Most Reverend Father, are you there? Yes. I cannot remember when I made my last confession. I see at times my sins as clearly and with such revulsion as I do at other times with zeal commit them. I cannot sleep. I have just this day killed a man for no reason except that he was brave. I am told that you have not acted as yourself these several months past. How else should I act if not as myself? What I do, I do. Tis me. I am it. My deeds are no one else's. I am responsible for them. What is it that troubles you? I feel myself to be in combat with the angel of death. Why? I don't know. And nothing I can do gives me rest from my fear. Do you trust in God? With all my heart, yes. And still the specter of death haunts me. There is life after death, this I know. Yet still I am afraid. In light or darkness I tremble. I look into the eyes of my wife when this mood is upon me and think I would kill even her for a moment's rest. The man you killed, do you now repent his death? Yes, but that will not bring him back or the others whose deaths I ordered. I, who was once blessed by the Pope himself, am now a common murderer. Listen to me. It is for God to forgive. But this he does to the truly penitent heart. Think what you may do. I... I will throw open the granaries. Ah. I will release all those I have conscripted into my army that they may go back and tend to their families for the winter. I will undo as much as is in my power to do. This is well, my son. The darkness of Saul has been upon you. But even Saul found relief in the music of David. Perhaps you can too. The world is in order, Sir Guy. You have no cause to fear. How do I fare, Matilda? You are relaxed, my lord. Mm, the music soothes me. And to lie thus with my head in your lap, is it possible there could be no more to it than this? To what? To happiness. I think this is the reward for which you have labored so long. <laughs> to lie inert in my lady's lap, plucking blossoms and listening to music? To feel at peace with yourself. The world and God. <laughs> How silly to fear death. When that old hag told me I should not die until the sun rose in the west. We should see that here from our chamber window. Aye, if we are awakened some morning by the sun striking us full in the face, only then will I tremble. Boy, enough of your music. The incessant plucking of strings is a most pleasing irritant. Would my lord like to eat now? It's time to eat again? It is nearly so. But we just finished eating an hour ago. As it seems but an hour, because you fell asleep. Ah. Well, then, by all means, let us eat. I am not hungry, but we live by the clock now. Is that not what peace means? Let us eat. <laughs> Good morning, my lady. And how is our new man today? Gone to the village again to oversee affairs. He moves among the people without fear. They are glad to see him recovered. He has directed that the building of a new cathedral be started. As thanks for his salvation. He has sent for master craftsmen from far and wide. I am glad he shall have a project to keep him busy, for he has begun to chafe again at the bit. This will occupy the rest of his days. Indeed, so big does he plan it to be, it shall barely be started at his death if he lived to be a hundred. Now, Baldwin, give orders for the gatekeeper to raise the drawbridge. Yes, sire. Then join me in my chambers. 
There I shall give you my final instructions. My lord? The drawbridge is up. It is. But why do you want it raised in the middle of the day? And what do you mean by final instructions? I want the drawbridge sealed shut. But how will we enter and leave the castle? We won't. No one will. There is no need to. But that is like walling ourselves up in a tomb. You may leave if you wish. I won't keep you. Anyone may go who wants to. But you? I want my armor brought to me, the armor I wore to the Holy Land, and the steed I rode and all my equipage, lance, sword, and helmet. Why? Death will evade me no longer. I am going to force him into combat. I shall wait for him in the courtyard. My lord, will you not speak to me? Will you not tell me why you sit here? I cannot, Matilda. I know not why I have been so marked, what great fault I had that I should be thus possessed. What can make a person feel safe if he is insecure in his soul? My lord. I do not ask you to share my fate. Go with Baldwin. Leave the castle. No, I will stay with you, and so will he. You will be cured yet. Put your faith in God. I cannot. The hag, Gudrun, said I had the cross of Christ burning on my chest, that I was blessed among men. And still it besets me. I am sinking further and further from you. I can feel it, and I cannot stop it. If only I could weep, I could be saved, but I cannot weep. But you will not die. She said you would not die until the sun rose in the west. And how could that be? I won't lose hope, and I won't leave you. Look how he sits there, hour upon hour without moving. His lance resting on the ground before him, his visor down. He will no longer speak. I have sent for the bishop. Perhaps he will arrive in time. He is beyond all help. John, it is growing dark. We must go in. No. Go to your chamber and sleep. I shall stay in the next room. What if something happens to him? What could happen? We will see him when the sun rises on the morrow. Uh, no, oh no Baldwin, Baldwin My lady, what is it? Why have you wakened so early? The room is filled with light But this is not possible It is dawn and your room faces the west But a light shone in my eyes And so it comes in from the window Why look you there in the courtyard. The sun. He catches his armor and reflects in at the window as if it were rising from the west. Or the cross of Christ burning in his breast. The sun rising in the east caught the armor of a solitary knight seated on his horse in the castle courtyard and was reflected into Matilda's bedchamber window, creating the illusion that it rose in the west. The prophecy of the old witch. She said my lord was safe until such a day as the sun rose from the west. Come, Baldwin, we must go out to him at once. My lord, my lord. He does not speak. He won't move. We must raise the visor on his helmet. We must see if he is still alive. Be careful, Matilda. Be prepared for what you might see. His face. Baldwin, look. Aged overnight. His hair as gray as mine. And his eyes open but staring vacantly. They no longer see.
Was it retribution from God for some committed sin? Or merely the blind turning of the wheel of fate? Was he sick in body or in spirit? Will he sleep with the angels or with the demons that tormented him? We do not know. But whether peacefully or not, sleep he will. In the shadow of the cathedral, he ordered to be built. Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, The Master of Harcourt, was written by Percy Granger and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were Fletcher Markle, Ben Wright, and Peggy Hazard. Featured in the cast were Ivor Barry, Valerie Cooney, Larry Moss, and Richard Peel. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tolufson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by Serta Perfect Sleeper Mattresses and Foundations. With the top comfort and deep support for firmness that feels good. And that's a healthy investment in yourself. This is Lorne Green. Join us again next Monday at this time for another new and original radio play about America's past. This is Leonard Nimoy. Our story takes us across a dozen years and 10,000 miles to a time when America commits a generation of her youth in the malarial heat and trackless jungles of Vietnam. Only an airborne conveyor belt of helicopters stands between a giant army and slow, wasting destruction. A relentless aerial machine that feeds some men and devours others. My name's Edwin Cave. I'm a chief warrant officer. That's kind of a happy medium between a staff sergeant, which I used to be before I started flying helicopters, and the pressure and responsibility of being a commissioned officer. I'm getting my first look at the central highlands of Vietnam in the back of a three-quarter ton army truck moving through the provincial capital of Pleiku. Whoever decided to call it a capital was a fast man with an exaggeration. The main part of town is a cluster of soulless cement buildings left over from the French colonial days, evenly divided now between bars and laundries and souvenir shops. Traffic is about what you'd expect at rush hour on the Los Angeles freeway, except here it's olive green trucks and Lambretta scooter buses overloaded with harried brown peasants and straw mats and farm produce and God knows what baggage and flashy oriental pimps on shiny new Hondas. The suburbs are down in a hollow, little hooches made of beer cans pounded flat with corrugated tin roofs, midnight requisition from Uncle Sam. Up out of the hollow, we reach the barbed wire enclosed wooden buildings of an airfield. We pass under an arch with an aviation company designation and the unit nickname Shrimp Boats seems right for the hulking twin-rotor Chinook helicopters that can handle a two-ton howitzer as carelessly as a politician handles your taxes. 
not the spit-polished aircraft lined up for inspection at the training base, working aircraft. Dust-caked gray freighters with dusty bronze windshields. The menacing muzzle of a 50 caliber machine gun poking out of each flank. It's almost dusk, and the flying day is over, and every ship is hunkered back in its own sandbag bunker waiting for tomorrow. In every one, there is a sense of a tough job done right and a sense of tougher jobs to come. And a chill runs up my spine. Burned out 38-year-old hard case. Turns 20 again with his whole life ahead of him. A life I know can end as suddenly as it began. And that's only the beginning of our story. <laughs> Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis's production of the Mutual Radio Theater. Our story, Shrimp Boats by Gordy Donnell. Our stars, George Kennedy and Les Tremaine. Chief Warrant Officer Edwin Cave begins his combat tour as a pilot of the giant and vulnerable freight helicopters with an hour's routine paperwork in the shrimp boat orderly room. He's billeted with a young lieutenant, Steve Barnes. When he is unpacked, Barnes offers to take Cave to the officers' club and introduce him to the man he'll be sharing a cockpit with. So, you'll be flying with the Mad Major, ain't you? The Mad Major? Yeah, everyone calls Major Hunter that. Not to his face, I hope. No, I mean, well, Major Hunter has been with the shrimp boats longer than anyone. He can do things with his ship no one else would even try. I guess they look sort of crazy to the rest of us. He's a hot dogger? He's pretty hot stuff. In the air and on the ground. You'll see in a minute. Major Hunter, uh, sir, this is Chief Cave. The colonel has assigned him to fly with you. Welcome aboard, Cave. Got your GI insurance paid up? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Hmm. The other crapshooter here is Lieutenant Petoskey. Lieutenant? Put her there, Chief. Pete's got a hundred that says I can't roll six or seven in one shot out of the cut. No way, Major. Not even with loaded dice. How's about it, Chief? Want a piece of the action? No, thanks, Major. You don't take chances, Cave? When the payoff is right. Is something wrong with even money? Uh, the odds of rolling a six or seven on the first try are 671 to 625 in your favor, Major. Yeah? The odds against lasting a full tour with the shrimp boats are a lot stiffer than that. You want out? No, sir. I like the payoff. Buy him a drink, Barnes. The Major's cheating, Pete. Isn't he, Chief? Rule number one in the game of warrant officer is never get mixed up in the commissioned officer's social lives. Well, uh, let's just say the lieutenant's buying himself some expensive entertainment. Yeah. You like girls, Chief? Well, at my age, I try to stick with women. <laughs> There'll be a party in an hour or so. Well, if there's any females within a hundred miles, trust the pilots to find them. Nurses. From the 18th Surgical Hospital. The ghostwriters are sending two Yui's to pick them up. One of them your girl? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes she acts like she is. Other times, well, I guess I just don't understand women. <laughs> you and every other man. Marnie. Over here, Marnie. Marnie, this is uh, Chief Warrant Officer K. Chief, Marnie Travers. I'm pleased to meet you, Chief. Uh, likewise, uh, Lieutenant Travers, is it? Marnie, please. Oh, all right. It's a pleasure, Marnie. The Chief is my new roommate. Oh, now I know where to go for a complete report on what he's like to live with. If he ever gets too persuasive for me. I'll be sure to look for his good points. <laughs> 
Just keep it honest. Are you flying with him as well? Yeah, the chief is flying with Major Hunter. Oh, that should be exciting, chief. Well, I'll settle for rewarding. I've heard so many things about the major. Did I hear my name mentioned? Why, Major? Hello. Hello major Hunter. Sir. Lieutenant Travers, you are even more irresistible than usual tonight. Any chance of my stealing a dance? Thank you, Major. I'd love to. Well, that is, if uh, Lieutenant Barnes doesn't object. No, well, sir. He didn't have to do that. She'll be back, Lieutenant. Not tonight. I mean, bird dogging is natural enough. More guys here than girls, sure. But not the Major. He's got too much going for him. Settling down is a big step for a girl. Most of them like to look around a little bit first just to make sure they've made the right choice. Yeah, she's looking pretty hard tonight, Chief. If it hadn't have been the major, it might have been you. Listen, don't listen to me. I've got two divorce decrees to prove that I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to women. Hey, let's hit the bar. You can tell me everything you don't know about them. Come on, Chief, I'm buying. How about a rain check, Lieutenant? It's been a long day, and you've got plenty of friends to drink with. Yeah, friends. Hey, Pete, who's Steve Petoskey? Lieutenant Travers, shall we uh, steal a breath of fresh air? I'd love to. There we are. Too many people. They don't allow me to concentrate on you. Look, a gibbous moon. I think it's your profile. You have a perfect profile. Everyone at home says I resemble my mother. Ah, your mother. <laughs> what a beauty she must be, huh? Are you an only child, Lieutenant? Marnie. Marnie. Are you an only child, Marnie? I have an older sister and two younger sisters and a little brother. Of course. I'm sorry. I, I don't understand. I said of course because only a large family full of love could produce someone like you. Beauty, warmth, intelligence... Tell me, have you always wanted to be a nurse? I don't really know. I, I think so. I don't remember. It's remarkable, really. Young woman like you, it'd be simple for you to stay at home. Not to be near all this horror. All the boys went. It didn't seem right that I shouldn't try to help them. We should go back inside. Why? I promised Lieutenant Barnes I'd dance with him. And so you shall. But not just yet. All right. But only for a minute or two longer. Then I really have to go back inside. I could speak to the lieutenant for you. What? If you'd like. I'd tell the lieutenant that you'd prefer to spend the evening with me. I'd tell him, if you'd like me to, that you'd rather he didn't bother you anymore. You wouldn't. <laughs> oh, yes, I would. If you'd like me to. He'd be offended, hurt. Yes? What would he do about it, do you suppose? It's the strangest thing, Major. What is? I think you'd like to bait Lieutenant Barnes. He has a temper, you know. Does he? Excuse me, I'm going back inside. Chief Warrant Officer Cave has settled in now and become a member of the unit flying the giant shrimp boats. One thing he already has learned, where he fits in all of it. Rule number one in the game of Warrant Officer is never get mixed up in the commissioned officer's social lives. Rule number two is never get mixed up in their lives, period. That's how it is, Cave. 
That's how it's always going to be. Sure, Major Hunter should be cooling it, making sure nothing happens to his chances for promotion. Commissioned officer gets passed over twice, he's out. But you've got a warrant, not a commission, Cave, so it's none of your business. You don't even have to like the man. You're here to fly. All that matters to you is what he can do in the cockpit. It's three weeks today since I first strapped myself into Shrimp Boat 1-4. Ground action has been hotter than an overstressed turbine. Two brigades of infantry have locked horns with a North Vietnamese regular regiment in the jungles where a branch of the Ho Chi Minh Trail meanders out of Cambodia. We're flying wall to wall, 14-hour days, trying to keep them supplied. I'm 10 pounds lighter. I feel 10 years younger. Major Hunter may not be the best chopper pilot in the Army, but he's the best I'm ever likely to fly with. He chews my tail off about once an hour. That's an average. And that's okay. This is no Sunday school. I'm learning more in a shorter time than I think possible. I've got the controls. We've just set a sling load of artillery ammunition down in the striker camp at Play Jaring. It's nervous business flying with a pallet of high explosives suspended under the ship. It doesn't phase the Major. But I'm glad to be climbing when the big 175-millimeter guns open fire again. We're too high to hear them. But I can tell from the way they ride back against the stabilizers, they're shooting long range. I wonder if there's trouble somewhere. A minute later, we've got radio traffic. A shrimp boat one four. This is shrimp boat two niner. Over. One four. Go. Two niner. You'll be working alone. We've been ordered out for aircraft recovery. One four. Who's down? Two niner. Air Force rescue chopper on a sandbar in the Sasan River. One four. Air Force. What are they doing this far up country? Two niner. They were shot out of a hot landing zone north of the river. I guess they jumped on that medevac call. One four. What medevac call? A two niner. Rifle company got beat up pretty bad last night. Twenty wounded, they said. They just now got an LZ cut for evacuation. One four. Who's on the call now? Two niner. Nobody. Dust off ship tried it. Took fire from all sides. They said no way. One four. Call play coup operations. Tell them one four is going up. Get the coordinates and the rifle company frequency and relays. Two niner. Negative. The LZ is too tight even for a UE. No way can a shrimp boat get in. One four. Getting in is the easy part. Getting out, that's going to be interesting. Make the call. Two niner. Wilco. Good luck, Major. Out. Even with the coordinates, the infantry position is impossible to find. The Major gets on the rifle company frequency and tells them to pop a smoke grenade. A minute passes. Nothing. Two minutes. Now, what's that? A thin, wispy cloud of purple shows against the endless green of the jungle. I swing the ship in that direction. God, I don't believe it. The landing zone is a hole in the jungle so small, you have to be directly over it to see it. Down on the bottom is a tight perimeter of hastily constructed bunkers, pockmarked by the impact of communist mortars. American artillery has mangled the thick trunks of some of the hundred-foot-tall hardwood trees that hem in the tiny clearing. Major, you're never going to get this freighter into that hole. Well, you're right there, Cave. I won't, because I'm not going to try you are. You're the expert, Major. I've been in the country three weeks. You won't last four if you don't learn to take this crate where it has to be taken. Major, that LZ is a hundred feet straight down through a hole that's smaller than the sweep of our rotor blades. You sure about that, Chief? Well, you can see that much from here, Major. There's 20 wounded GIs down there, Cave. You're going to write them off on an eyeball opinion, or you're going down to try that hole on for size? We're risking a five-man crew and a two-million-dollar chopper, Major. My decision. My responsibility. How many IOUs have you taken from those dice bets of yours, Major? What difference does that make? I just want to know how many friends this crazy stunt is going to make me when it backfires. This is Major Hunter. True alert. We're going into a hot LZ. I say again, this LZ is hot. 
Anyone saving up for an air medal? We're on combat assault time now. Fifty calibers, full load. Officer Edwin Cave, under orders from his aircraft commander, nicknamed the Mad Major, is trying to finesse the huge twin-rotor Chinook helicopter into a posted stamp landing zone to evacuate 20 wounded infantrymen. The ship doesn't fit. The rotors are cutting brush on all sides. I can see some of it falling in front of us. Look down, Cave. Get your ground bearings. Make sure you've got the ship centered up. If the rotor blade hits anything substantial, this is a one-way trip. Steady, Cave. There are 20 wounded down there, depending on you. I see the infantry bunkers below. Machine gun and automatic rifle flashes. They're spraying the trees, trying to keep the snipers off of us. Maybe it's helping a little... It's hard to tell without knowing how many there are. Keep it centered, Cave. Steady down. I look at the Major and I get a jolt. He's just sitting there looking straight ahead, completely relaxed. He looks like he's in another world. Is he drugged? Well, he can't be. His eyes are too alert. The Mad Major, they call him. Well, maybe they aren't kidding. Heads up, Cave. Watch your flying. Check the ground. That's... God, are we ever going to set down... Ten feet off the deck. Five. We're going to make it. I don't believe it. I... Ah! Touchdown. Infantrymen scramble out of the bunkers. No more than kids. They're kids carrying kids on poncho litters. Kids supporting other kids between them. Kids in scorched, blood-soaked uniforms. Major! That was a pretty sloppy ride down, Cave. Think you can smooth it out a little going up? You're taking us up, Major. I don't remember saying that. I said it, sir. I'm still giving the orders here. Risking an air crew is one thing, Major. We're all volunteers. We all draw flight pay. But we're going to have wounded aboard going up. And they're draftees, Major. Kids who didn't ask for any of this. They deserve the best we've got, and that is you. That's how you got it figured? Yes, sir. You're wrong. No, sir. I am right. Tell me why you're wrong. I am right, Major. I think you know that. All right, then. I'll tell you why you're wrong, sir. What happens if I'm hit? What do you do then? I take over. Before or after this bird wraps its rotor blades around the nearest tree trunk? Well, I'll give it my best shot. With three weeks in the country, your best shot won't cut it. Mine just might. You see, Cave, either one of us could fly out of this trip. If we work at it, the problem comes if the pilot catches a hot round. The backup man has to be quick and sure. You're jumpy and scared. It sounds logical. Oh, hell, it is logical. So why don't I believe it? Maybe it's that serene voice of his, like he doesn't have the vaguest idea of the spot we're in. Or maybe it's because he hasn't looked me in the eye all the time he's spoken. Sure, Cave, and maybe it's because he called you jumpy and scared. All right, you won't take the responsibility of being an officer. That means you live or die by the decisions of men who will. Major Hunter gives me the signal that the wounded are loaded and that we're buttoned up. I get a grip on the stick, I bring up the RPM and begin to crank some pitch into the rotor blades. Now steady, Cave. There's going to be shooting, and you're here to fly... Not to sweat, soldier, just to fly. Twenty shot-up kids are depending on you. Steady, Cave. You're going to make it. You'll make it.
Shrimp boat two niner. This is shrimp boat one four over. The two niner go. One four. Relay to eighteen surgical hospital. En route with twenty casualties, some serious. Estimate arrival three five minutes. The two niner. Roger. Congratulations, Major. One four. Advise play coup operations. Cosmetic damage only. We'll resume our assigned mission as soon as we've made our delivery. Two niner. Wilco. Out. Don't you think we ought to put down, Major? Have the ship checked just to make sure our damage is cosmetic? Why bother? Your amateur flying is going to kill us sooner or later anyway. No matter what we do. Three months today since I signed into the shrimp boats. I'm still flying co-pilot with Major Hunter. He's as wild and unpredictable as ever, but ground action has tapered to the lowest anyone remembers seeing. So he takes his energies out on dice and the younger officer's girlfriends. Where are you off to, Lieutenant? A uh, party at the 18th surge. You and Lieutenant Travers still getting along? Uh, she makes me work at it. Maybe she makes you work so hard you missed the restriction notice on the bulletin board? Major Hunter is going. He's a major. You're a lieutenant. The notice restricts all personnel to base. It doesn't say anything about rank. Anyway, I'm going over with him and Pete. Look, if you're caught, he's still a major and you're still a lieutenant. Did you hear he's getting the Distinguished Flying Cross for that rescue mission? Yes, I heard. I overheard one of the gunners on your ship. He said you flew that mission. I'm not here for medals. But you've earned it. I'm here to fly. Major Hunter gives me all the stick time I can use, and that's all I'm interested in. But after all, Cave, the Distinguished Flying Cross. A Distinguished Flying Cross can get an officer promoted. A Distinguished Flying Cross and a dime might get a warrant officer a ten-set cup of coffee. Well, it still isn't right. Show me something that is. I'll keel over in a dead faint. Well... Anyway, you won't have to put up with it much longer. I hear the Major didn't get his tour extended. No? He had to see the Colonel today. Right after he left, the First Sergeant started getting out-processing papers ready for him. Oh. No cheers? <laughs> after the shafting he's given you? Who's to say his replacement won't be worse? Ready, Steve? Yeah, uh, wait a minute, Pete. Evening, Major Hunter. Arms. Chief? Coming with us? Uh, no, thanks, Major. Why not? Well, with the whole base restricted, I thought we ought to have at least one pilot around just for appearances. Oh, hell, that restriction came from you, Sergeant Saigon. You know why, don't you? No, sir. Lunar New Year. The Orientals celebrate New Year now. All of them do. You Sarv restricts the whole country so no G.I.s will foul up their celebrations. It doesn't really affect officers. I always figured restriction was restriction, sir. It's Lunar New Year, Cave. Just Lunar New Year. Tet, they call it. Even Charlie celebrates it. Nothing ever happens during Tet. <laughs> Here's the fourth act of Shrimp Boats. It's Lunar New Year, Tet, 1968. Every American base in Vietnam is on restriction, but nobody's paying much attention. About half the shrimp boat pilots have made it out through a couple of well-known holes in the perimeter wire. The big celebration sounds like in Pleiku. I hear some shooting in the distance. Vietnamese government troops whooping it up, I guess. A cold beer and a movie will do it for me. It's a warm night. Something called The Sand Pebbles with Steve McQueen and Candace Bergen is being shown to a fair crowd on the outdoor screen at the base. An angry crowd of Chinese were pelting a contingent of American sailors with last week's vegetables when...
The compound had been hit before, but nothing like this. A dozen mortar rounds fall in as many minutes. Tracer bullets rip out across the perimeter wire. Two gunships lift off the Ghost Rider pad and streak away at rooftop level. I've got shrimp boat 1-4 cranked up in our bunker. I scan the confusion of lights and speeding vehicles for some sign of Major Hunter. He isn't back yet. The radio makes it sound like he might not make it. Sappers have blasted their way into the big compound where the hospital is located. There's street fighting in Pleiku, and nobody seems to know who is shooting at who. Shrimp Boat Operations comes on, lift assignments. One, four, sling load of artillery ammunition, Campanari to a fire base south of Contum. Well, that's it. No waiting for the Major now. And the tower clears me. I'm ready to lift off when a jeep zips into the bunker beside the ship. I look back. And I see Barnes and Petoskey help Major Hunter into the ship between them. Chief, the Major's been hit. He took a round in the leg coming through Plague Who. Get him to the dispensary. No, no way. It's a court martial for sure if they find out he was wounded, breaking restriction. I'll have to fly it until we take some fire and I can blame this on. Come on, Pete. We've got to get back to our ships. Well, Chief, here's your chance to pay me back for the medal. All the other times I've dumped on you. Just get on the radio and call for an ambulance. You can even testify against me. Well? Tower, this is Shrimp Boat 1-4, out to Campanari. You're a damn fool, Major. You'll never make light colonel the way you're going. I wasn't going to make it anyway. You're a good pilot. I'm a damn good pilot. Eighteen years I've been flying choppers. Hell, I flew in Korea. You know that, Chief? I flew in Korea. I flew medevac. The Constance. Jackson the brass. I bribed the personnel clerk to lose my rotation record so I could stay in... Fly some more. Stuck it out afterward. Stayed in the army and didn't get promoted when helicopters were a joke. I flew in Vietnam when there was nothing here but advisors. I flew with the 11th Air Assault when airmobile tactics were first being developed. When the 11th was made part of the 1st Air Cavalry, I, I came back to Vietnam with them. Went to school. Learned to fly Chinooks. I came back here again. Eighteen years, Chief. And you know what happened today? Do you? No, sir. I've been passed over for promotion. Were you surprised, Major? It was my second Passover. You know what that means? Uh, yes, sir. Say it. Mandatory separation. Up or out. That's the rule. No pension, no nothing. Up or out. That's a tough break, Major. Judgment. That's what the colonel told me. I've got poor judgment. You know how many ships I've lost, Dave? No, sir. None. Not one. Not in all those years. Not to accident or enemy fire. Not one! That sound like bad judgment to you? No, sir. Fear. Fear. That's the real reason. All the paper pushers, all the jerks who want a nice, safe career, they're scared of me. That fool hunter, the mad major, he's actually trying to accomplish something. They're afraid I'll upset their apple cart. Never occurs to them I can do things they can't because I've been flying longer. All they know is I get mats in their pants. So they replace me with kid lieutenants who won't show them up. How's the leg, Major? You know what happened once? I read an article about some colonel they were promoting to Brigadier General. He said he had more combat chopper hours than anyone else in the Army. I. 
I added my hours up. Over 800 more than that sucker. I wrote the Department of the Army and told them so. Even gave them the names of two warrants who might have more than me. Know what happened? I can drop you at Camp Anari, Major, and say we took fire on the way over. Commanding General called me in. It's just publicity, Hunter. That's what he said. Don't make waves, Hunter. Actual hours don't count. It's publicity. For the good of the service. All those years. For nothing. Not for nothing, Major. Anyway, civilian pilots make good money. At my age, with three purple hearts, I'm flying on medical waivers now. You'll find something. Thanks, sure. Big war hero. Maybe they'll let me run up a flag at some courthouse somewhere. Did you ever think about killing yourself, Chief? It isn't that bad, Major. I did. Loaded my pistol. Sat there. Hours. Just... Just staring at it. I couldn't do it. You know why? It was a stupid idea. No guts. That's why I didn't have the guts. So, I started needling people to do it for me. Crooked them out of their money at dice. Laughed in their faces. Took the girls. Laughed in their faces. Dumped on my co-pilot. All my co-pilots. No guts. None of you. Nobody had the guts to kill me. That leg is starting to get to your mind, Major. Last chance, Gabe. You don't kill me tonight. I'll have to go on living. I see the sprawling 4th Infantry Division base at Camp Anari ahead. I don't see any firing below. Anari is too huge, too heavily defended to make a serious attack practical. My plan is to set down to get the Major to medical attention and have the ship looked over to make sure we didn't take any fire climbing out of Pleiku. Sorry about that cave. This is a big war. Plans of one little warrant officer don't count for much. The sky over Anari is full of choppers. I don't dare deviate from the vector given me by the Anari Tower. On top of that, a tank unit somewhere is spilling over onto my radio frequency, and they're in a firefight, so they've got priority. I can't get it across to anybody that I've got a wounded man aboard. All I can do is pick up my sling of ammunition and lift out for contour. I'll get you to the 18th surgery, Major, as soon as we've made this drop. Too late, Chief. We're over the fire base now. You can see the howitzer pits and the landing lights. Check your oil pressure, Chief. I just checked it by... Hey, it's low. and dropping fast. We must have taken a round over play crew. The sumps must have been dripping ever since. Turbine's heating. She's still responding to... Red-hot turbine. And we're going down... On top of a swing load of high explosive artillery ammunition. We're not high enough to make it auto rotate full pitch, Major. You know any tricks? Like what? Artificial respiration for helicopter engines? This is Chief Gabe. Crew alert. Brace for impact. Brace for impact. Sit back and enjoy the explosion, Chief. You and me. We're going out the way good men ought to go. shells going off. I can just barely hear them. I wonder if I'm in that twilight they talk about between life and death. I wonder if the guy with the pitchfork is dragging me down to hell. Wherever I'm going, I'm being dragged there. I can feel it. My eyes focus. Well, it's not old Nick dragging me. Looks like old Nick. But it's Major Hunter. He's seared black from the fire. And he's bleeding. He's dragging me across the ground while artillery shells explode all around. 
And then suddenly there are hands on us, and we're dragged down into the bunker, and a man yells for the medics. Major? Oh, you blew it, Dave. We didn't hit hard enough to cook off the whole load at once. All I had to do was sit there and wait to burn. But I didn't have the guts. I just didn't have the guts. The medics come, and they say the crew is out and safe. I'm mostly just stunned, so they do what they can for Major Hunter. And I sit there in the bunker, drinking sea ration chocolate from a tin cup, and I watch the big shrimp boat burn. Hunter had given his life to helicopters. He'd uh, known how to use them to save lives and to destroy lives. He'd never found a way to make them take the place of living. Mutual Radio Theater is brought to you five nights a week at this time. Tonight's original radio play, Shrimp Boats, was written by Gordy Donnell and produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Your host was Leonard Nimoy. Our stars were George Kennedy and Les Tremaine. Featured in the cast were Michael Miner, Andre Stoika, and Gay Nelson. John Harlan speaking. Associate Director of Mutual Radio Theater is Ken McManus. Sound effects were created by Bud Tolerson. Mark Trella is production supervisor. Recording engineer, Hal McDonald. Music editor, Lee Ringette. The Elliott Lewis production of Mutual Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. Mutual Radio Theater has been brought to you in part by Sears, a name that means quality and value. A name that you can count on for service and dependability. Sears, where America shops for value. And by Unicap Tea, high potency from Upjohn, contains 11 essential vitamins and 6 key minerals, including iron and zinc. Unicap Tea, high potency for people on the go. This is Lorne Green, inviting you to join us again next Monday when I'll bring you another original drama about the American West.